disease that is coughing and seeing blood in the sputum that is produced. Now, all of these are related to the lungs. Cough, hemoptysis, difficulty in breathing. All of that is related directly to the lungs. But in so many other people, let me just even start by saying that lung cancer presents without any symptom at all in the early stages. So for many people, and this accounts for why it tends to present late, because one could have lung cancer in the early stages and never get to know, would not even have a cough, would not even have a discomfort whatsoever. And for some, what they will just have is what we call constitutional symptoms. They just feel some form of weakness that they do not understand. They get easily fatigued. They get, um, they, you know, they just have a sense of being unwell. All of that could be lung cancer, and in many people, that is how it comes, and they do not show any signs whatsoever. But when it becomes large enough, when it becomes advanced enough to begin to bring out symptoms, that's when we begin to talk about cough, that's when we begin to talk about um, hemoptysis that's bringing out um, blood in the sputum, and then we begin to talk about some difficulties in breathing the person begins to have some difficulty breathing they just feel either some pain when they breathe or they feel some they just feel that the air is not going down there into the lungs the way it should now that is because of the lung cancer but very importantly it could also present as a feature for the first time of what i explained earlier a metastasis so we could just have a patient who suddenly has a headache because the disease has didn't even show any symptom at all in the lungs, but has reached the brain, could suddenly have a headache, could suddenly start convulsing, could suddenly lose consciousness, could suddenly have what we call a pathological fracture. What should not ideally break a bone suddenly leads to you know, a fracture because the bone has been affected by a metastatic cancer and um, is weaker than usual. So a slight pain that shouldn't cause a fracture causes a fracture or some significant pain in a distant site of the body, maybe in a bone or somewhere, and then we suddenly do some further work up and realize that, oh, this is a secondary disease. Where is the primary? Where did it start? Oh, we see something in the lungs and realize that that is where it started from. So it will start from primary, secondary, any of those parts. You highlighted a lot of things, because one of the first things I was going to say was about the, there's a statement I always say, I say, Cancer um, is an everyday illness. And a lot of people always ask me, what do you mean? I say, you can just have a cough. And before you know it, that can be cancer. But, Thank you. And so Precisely. the truth is that anything that is persistent uh, can be cancer. So just make sure exactly. you have any everyday persistent. Then you then highlight it. And I know you don't know me personally. So <laughs> it didn't make sense when you came up to the metastasis and you put the brain because actually, I'm going to now state, I am, I live with cancer, as I said, but I have mm. breast cancer metastasizing in the brain. And all the tumors are wow. in the brain. They are not wow. in the, in the they breast. Are not in the breast. In the primary so, site, yes. Yes, they're not mm. in the primary site. So now you see how you just explained something, and I know you didn't know that. So it's very interesting. Okay, so now let's take this and let's take a break at this point, and we'll come back to this very interesting conversation, everyone. Um so let's just take a break and we'll come back again. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on this uh, cancer with Dr. Denise Ejo. Gosh, we're having a fantastic discussion on lung cancer. And it's quite interesting because even for someone like me who lives with the disease, I am actually having to learn a lot that. I knew, but I didn't know the meaning. So, Dr. Samuel, we're really having a fantastic time. <laughs> yeah, can you talk us through the cancer treatment and its options? Okay. Well, maybe I will just say that there are about um, five, six treatments for cancer generally. The first and the easiest to think about is surgery. Now, surgery entails, like most people know, going in and um, using a knife in the theater to cut out the disease. Um, it's the oldest form of cancer treatment available, 
and ideally it's supposed to be the um it's supposed to be the treatment that offers the patients the highest chance of getting a cure now apart from surgery there is what we call radiotherapy now with radiotherapy what we try to do is to use ionizing radiation this is radiation that has an ability to alter and kill cells focus this ionizing radiation on the cancer cells and kill them i'm trying to be as simple as possible now so we've talked about surgery we've talked about radiotherapy now there is chemotherapy i mentioned the basic characteristic of cancer cells being their ability to grow more rapidly than the normal cells now because they come from within the individual it's difficult to get something about them to target and kill and uh, one of the things that is noticed about them that is very vital to them is their growth. So as they, as they grow and reproduce, there are certain chemicals they produce a lot. So when we give chemotherapy, what we do is to target those chemicals that they produce. So we are targeting their growth. We are trying to halt their growth. I am mentioning this because I will just digress for 10 seconds and say so that is why chemotherapy seems to have a lot of side effects and those side effects seem to affect more of other cells that by nature are also rapidly growing because when you are targeting the cancer cells because they are growing rapidly you will also realize that there are other cells like cells in the bone marrow like cells in the gut that are also by nature rapidly growing on a daily basis so they are like cancer cells but they are within the normal confines of nature so when you are attacking the cancer cells growth the chemotherapy also attacks these cells significantly and that way um chemotherapy seems to have a lot of side effects like vomiting like diarrhea like um you know the blood keeps going down because the chemotherapy affects all of these rapidly growing cells so i've mentioned surgery i've mentioned radiotherapy i've mentioned chemotherapy now there is also what is called targeted therapy now this is a little bit more recent and that is because um, science has gone a little bit further to investigate a little bit more about the cancer cells themselves and try to find out something about them that makes them unique compared to every other cell within the body. Now, whenever any such thing is found, it becomes what is called a target. And that target becomes what um, a drug or a chemical, a molecule is developed to specifically link onto and kill the cancer cells. Now, that way, targeted therapy has significantly less side effect because um, it is targeted to the cancer cell itself. Now, maybe a little bit technically, I'll talk about what we call stereotactic body irradiation. Now, it is a form of radiotherapy, just like I mentioned earlier. But in this case, it happens with lung cancer cells that are very, very small. So instead of just irradiating the whole of the body or irradiating a large part of the lungs, lots of radiation sources are targeted all around that little tiny cancer cell. And as such, you have various radiation sources flashing radiation on a small point of the body at the same time you are able to get a very high dose of radiation to a very limited area of the lungs and that way kill we normally jokingly call it frying it's like frying or totally eradicating the cancer cell but that is because the cancer cell is very small and for some reason the patient is probably not fit to undergo surgery so stereotactic body irradiation could be used maybe the final modality i'll mention is what we call immunotherapy now i mentioned that cancer cells just seem to have a way of surviving within the body such that they could even move from one part of the other from one part of the body to the other how they do this is by um by evading finding ways of evading the body's normal immune res response system so what science is trying to do is to find ways of upregulating the body's immune system so they give what we call immunomod immunomod immunomodulators these immunomodulators tend to modulate the body's immune system upwards and make it easier for the body itself to fight against the cancer I'm going to say something again that's going to surprise you. I've been through Absolutely. every single step you've mentioned. The current chemo I take is for life. So I take it every day mm. for life. And apparently one of them is an immunotherapy. 
So you see, I still have a bit of knowledge. No, so to those no. of you viewers, you are, are watching, living, you are living. I am still right looking all right, oh. So you better don't give up. You better just know that you will continue you to find this. You are living miracle. Miracle. Honestly, I am <laughs> a miracle. Ah, we thank God. So let's go on now. Responsibility of protecting the nation's cyberspace. Pantami commended President Muhammad Buhari for providing the enabling environment for agencies of government to perform their assignments without let or hindrances. The Independent National Electoral Commission says political parties should prevail on their supporters to refrain from acts of violence during the governorship and state assembly elections. INEC Chairman Mahmoud Yakubu spoke during a meeting of the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security. The INEC chairman thanked security agencies for the professionalism of their personnel and the largely peaceful conduct of the presidential election. He said INEC state officers have provided the police with the details for the governorship and state assembly elections, including locations of polling units and collision centers. I wish to express the commission's appreciation to the security agencies and other members of excess for the professionalism of personnel and the generally peaceful conduct of the last election. We look forward to improved performance in the election holding this weekend. The governorship election will hold in 28 states of the Federation. As we are aware, governorship elections in eight states, Anambra, Bayelsa, Edo, Ekiti, Imo, Kogi, Ondo, and Oshun states are held off cycle and therefore not conducted during the general election. I wish to express the... The National Security Advisor, Babagana Monguno, called on political gladiators in the country to call their supporters to order ahead of the forthcoming governorship and state assembly elections. He also said security agencies will work round the clock to ensure the polls are conducted safely in the country. Of course, the elections we're going into on Saturday are going to be much more complicated. Contextually, they're going to be different. But first of all, we're going to have 1,021 constituencies, meaning we're going to have more people interested, more people voting, more coalition centers, and obviously, the dynamics will be much more different than the elections that we that were just uh, concluded. I want to also urge the same individuals, especially at the state level, to demonstrate the same level of maturity, the same level of discipline by calling their supporters to conduct themselves in a manner that is congruent with the expectations of the larger Nigerian society. Of Just few days to the governorship and House of Assembly elections, the Lagos State chapter of the Accord Party has declared support for the re-election of Governor Babajide Songwolu for another four-year term. Addressing a press conference in Lagos, the state chairman of the party, Dele Oladiji, said the decision of the AP is premised on the grounds not to sacrifice various achievements of the Sanwo Lu-led administration on the altar of beta politicking. Coming into the state election, we still push at INEC to see if we can get our legitimate list on the list. But like some few parties, we were unable. I think Labour Party had that issue too. AA had the same issue and ADC. So we can't see sit back and allow imposters to blow the trumpet of a king. Today, we are adopting a gubernatorial candidate of choice. We didn't just choose someone, because this will be a watershed in the history of Accord. We have never, at any time in Lagos State, had any alliance with APC. APC had been the ruling party from 1999. They were AD, AC, ACN, then APC. We've never had any alliance with them. The only thing we've had that is close to them is whenever anybody is disgruntled in APC, they look for someone that can midwife or deliver their mandate. We welcome them and we work for them. So going into this election, we had two options. 
APC, Governor Vajire Sonwolu, to continue in his efforts in governing Lagos State. The governorship candidate of the new Nigeria People's Party in Lagos State, Olariwaju Jim Kamal, has distanced himself from the purported endorsement of Governor Babajide Sonwolu by the Alliance of Registered Political Parties. Jim Kamal said the inclusion of his name and the NNPP was a sign that Sonwolu and his party, the All Progressive Congress, were desperate and had lost the support of the people of Lagos while advising Lagosians to ignore the threats from the street hoodlums and touts and come out to vote out Sonwolu on Saturday, he said the unauthorized use of his name and party could only be done in a near lawless country and by a party that has failed the people of Nigeria. And as Lagosians count down to the March 18th governorship election, the legal team of the Labour Party says Badibo Rhodes Viva remains the authentic candidate for the March 18th governorship election in Lagos State. Lead counsel to Rhodes Viva, or Lagbade Benson, who disclosed this at a press conference on Monday in Lagos, revealed that three cases instituted against its client's candidacy recently had been struck out. Benson, who led two other lawyers, Uchechuku Ani and Kemi Afiso Jaye, in the briefing, noted that claims by the former LP governorship candidate and chairman in Lagos, Ifagbemi Awaru Maridi, had that he had a substantive case against Rhodes Viva is false. Benson also explained that the case against Rhodes Viva by the People's Democratic Party had been thrown out by the Federal High Court for lacking in merit. This absolutely no matter because the, the one at the Federal Echo Fire by Awama ID, Mr. Gwadewo Revival won. Okay. Mr. Uh, Prince uh, uh, Awama ID went to the Court of Appeal. He lost. And what he has gone to appeal to the Supreme Court is whether or not he can compile records and file his brief out of time. He's not even talking about the candidature of Mr. Gwadewo Revival anymore. So if you look at the entire thing holistically, the the matter filed by Mr. Awamaidi, what he's chasing, is like he's chasing the wind. He's trying to resolve procedural matter when the real the the source has been taken away from the soup. The court has held and upheld in three judgments here that the candidature that the candidate of the Labour Party is Mr. Badego Revival, and there is nothing, no judgment has set aside that, those findings. So we will beg the public to discountenance the fake news being paraded. Uh, you can't file an affidavit and use it to overrule the judgment of court. Judgment of court is valid until set aside. As of today, there's no judgment of court setting aside the three judgments we have mentioned here. Ahead of this weekend's governorship and House of Assembly election, the governorship candidate of Social Democratic Party, Michael Lana, has stepped down his ambition and endorsed the candidacy of Governor Shea Makinde of the People's Democratic Party. At a press conference in Ibadan, Lana alleged that some of those at the helm of affairs within the state SDP sold out for a pittance and declared for the opposition without the consent of other stakeholders. According to him, as a result of that, other stakeholders decided to take a decision that would be in the best interests of the neglected aggrieved party members, the candidates, and the generality of the people of Oyo State. People believed only in money politics and victory by vote buying. In fact, I became personal non grata the moment some people within the party realized that the money sourced solely for the purpose of electioneering will not be shared among them. I thank God that this attitude came to the fore now, and not after we might have won the election, as I wondered what they would have done to the Ohio State Treasury. Their interest is not in winning the election and elevating our people from their suffering, but in enriching themselves now. We have therefore resolved to inform all our teaming supporters to vote massively for engineer Shema Kide of the People's Democratic Party on Saturday, 18th March, 2023, and get him elected as governor of Ohio State. Few days to the governorship election in River State. The candidate of National Rescue Movement, NRM in Rivers, Sobomabo Jackrich, has raised the alarm over alleged plans by some people to frame him for rape and child molestation accusation. 
Jack Rich made this known at a media briefing in Port Harcourt. The NRM candidate said his offence is that he criticised certain authorities in the state on alleged subversion of the will of the people during the February 25th presidential and National Assembly general elections. He said the alleged plan was to put him off and lock him up by security agents so as to make sure he did not come out to participate in the March 18th governorship and state assembly elections. Because of my stand, because of the level of commitment I have in trying to liberate River State from the hands of this wicked style of leaders, who can decide not to employ people until when they want to leave in two days. They have now planned again with some persons, some of their irats and their courts, again, to frame me up again with such kind of charges that they did earlier on two years ago. How they have perfected plans to, um, to uh, frame me up with charges like rape, child molestation, and all that now resolved to also frame me up in a way to use security agents to maybe to arrest me and you know uh, 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 you know keep me away from the election. Jack Rich called on security agencies, the Inspector General of Police, to investigate the allegations and avert the plan. He said his party would not relent in ensuring that the reputation of the candidate is not tarnished by cheap blackmail or campaign of calumny. I'm calling on all uh, uh, security agents, the IG of police, the army, the navy, every security agency to investigate this and to avert this evil from happening. For me and my party, by God's grace, we are not going to let go anyone who stands out or who come out with any cheap blackmail or cal of cal calumny against me or against my ad and reputation that I have built over the years. Jack Rich urged the people to come out in mass and exercise a franchise on March 18th and make sure their votes count. The outgoing British High Commissioner in Nigeria, Katrina Lang, has described the presidential and national assembly elections as fascinating and offered future assuredness for democratic governance in the country. The British envoy made a declaration while fielding questions from journalists after a courtesy call on the Senate President, Ahmed Lawan. She said despite contestation on the process of the election by some political actors, it was fascinating and portends bright future for the country. Earlier at the courtesy visit, the Senate President Lawan, in his remarks, commended the British envoy on her positive disposition to the country. Um, I've had some highs, many highs, a few lows, but overall it's been an absolutely wonderful experience and uh, it's a very strong foundation of that has been a really good working relationship with Mr Speaker and his team. We've worked together on a number of very important electoral bills, um, his own initiative, the, the foundation he set up to support young legislators and I was very privileged to, to support that. Um, congratulations obviously on the success of your party, so I'm sure my successor will be working with you in a different capacity of some kind and I will be passing on um, great encouragement to him to continue to deepen and strengthen the relationship in whatever that capacity is. Your, your, your time here, your time here, um, um, sometimes I think your, your passion uh, was, so, was so evident in many of our discussions and um, I hope, my hope and my prayer is that whoever succeeds you will carry on in that same trajectory uh, uh, in building and fostering um, uh, an even more sustainable relationship with you. Ebony State Governor David Umahi says zoning should be used to determine the leadership of the National Assembly. The governor stated this after meeting privately with President Muhammad Buhari in his office. Omahi, who also recently got elected into the Senate to represent Ebony South District, told State House correspondents that the party considers certain parameters to carry all regions along rather than allow everyone to jump into the race. He, however, declined to speak further on the issue following directives by the party leadership to halt conversations on the matter until after the upcoming governorship and state assembly elections on March 18th. The Nigeria police has recovered 182 illicit arms and 430 ammunitions of various calibers across the nation in its efforts to tackle crimes. 
the false public relations officer, Olumiwa Adijobi, announced this in a statement, saying that the arms will be handed over to the National Center for the Control of Small Arms and Light Weapons. He said Inspector General of Police Usman al Kalibaba ordered all commands and formations to intensify efforts towards decimating the proliferation of illicit arms. Baba was said to have also extended additional human and logistic support to commands and formations across the country for effective election security management during the forthcoming governorship and state houses of assembly elections scheduled for Saturday, 18th March 2023. The Accord candidate for the Ogba Igbema Ndoni constituency 2 in the River State House of Assembly, Chukudi Obona, has been kidnapped by gunmen in the state. Obona, who was running for office in the rescheduled March 18th election, was reportedly dragged out of his vehicle by gunmen on Monday night around the Rumigbo area of Port Harcourt. A member of the Obona family, Ifaka Nwaka confirmed the incident to journalists reacting to the incident. Police Public Relations Officer of the Command, Grace Iringe Koko, said they are aware of the situation. The police command in Bochi State has declared Yakubu Shehu, a member of the House of Representatives, wanted over alleged homicide and a case of criminal conspiracy causing grievous hurt, inciting disturbance of public peace and culpable homicide as police places a bounty of one million naira on anyone that finds him. The lawmaker is representing Bochi federal constituency in the lower chamber of the National Assembly. Ahmed Wakil, the Bochi police spokesperson, released a special police gazette bulletin declaring him wanted on Tuesday. Tension has gripped residents of the Toru Angama community in Pantami local government area of Delta states as three farmers were killed by suspected herdsmen who invaded the community. Many farmers were also reportedly abducted during the attack. The hoodlums killed one Mr. Dennis, his son, and one other person while they were working on their farm. The deceased were slain while trying to fend off the gun tartan herders and the cattle from grazing and destroying crops on their farms. A former president of the Ijo Youth Council, Dr. Chris Ekio, who hails from Pantami local government area, appealed for calm among members of the community, advising them not to take laws into their own hands. When contacted, the police public relations officer for Delta State, DSP Bright Idafe, could not ascertain if a report of such incident was formally lodged to the command. The Edo State Police Command has arrested four persons for posing to be military personnel to rob innocent citizens of the state. Parading the suspects to journalists at the state force headquarters in Benin City, the state capital, the police public relations officer Chidi Mwabuzo revealed how the suspects committed the said offences. The suspects also spoke of the level of involvement in the crime. Robbery, unlawful position of military camouflage, and arrest of four suspects, whom you are seeing here as military personnel, but they are not really military personnel. They are armed robbers. These four suspects, on the 4th, 14th of February 2023, at about 1:52 a.m., that is morning of that day went into a woman's apartment named Grace and burst into the house through the ceiling found their way into the house and robbed them of their personal effects this woman please when dinner and when is bring home Understand? I say, okay, I will take go there, and I want to see money for them because me and I know say we only get money for all this plan. So we can say, ain't no idea of all those things. See, I transfer. If we reach, we could go ask the woman the phone, a pin number, then we we'll go to transfer. It is a friend of mine that brought the car. They come on out. We went there to go and invade. We do the evasion and we collected the money from the from the woman, which we collected the pin from her to transfer to make a transfer. So we transferred the money to the aboki and they gave us the dollar. 
So the dollar they give to us, we exchange it to between ourselves. Money that rich man is up to it, but let me just say it's 100 plus. Frontline anti-corruption civil society organizations, numbering over 130, have resumed their call for the sack of the chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, Abdul Rashid Bawa, over alleged politicization of the commission, disobedience of court orders, and infringement on human rights of Nigerians, among others. Speaking at a joint press conference in Lagos, the anti-corruption activist led by Mogbojuri Kayode of the Citizens' Rights Advocacy Group noted that the desperation of Bawa to save his face after dishonorable acts in office had taken a laughable turn. They insist that no amount of purchase CSO's vote of confidence will cover the truth about the abnormalities being condoned in EFCC under its current leadership. Up to now, he has not cleared himself of all the allegations against him, and he's been made to catch other people who committed offenses that are not as grievous as the ones that he had been accused of. And on top of all of this, on top of all of this, he has been behaving as if he's an authority to himself. And we are not saying that, look, no matter how highly placed you are, no matter how influential you are, no matter how powerful you are, you still are duty bound to operate under the ground norm of our own country. And that is the Constitution. Nobody is above the law. Everybody should be equal before the law. As we speak to the best of our knowledge, there has been no other judgment by any higher court that has upturned the conviction of Mr. Bauer on the basis of the disobedience, of his disobedience rather, to the you know, rulings of the various courts that have convicted him of contempt. If you also remember that during our last time all meeting, we requested from the Inspector General of Police, given a seven-day ultimatum, that the court have asked that Bauer be arrested and be sent to jail, having been convicted you know, for contempt. But as we speak, it's been over seven days, and the Inspector General of Police have not enforced the order of the court. The Adamawa State Government has launched an empowerment program tagged Fintiri Business Wallet. The first category was targeted at 10,000 women who received 50,000 Naira grant each. The business wallet is expected to empower at least 20,000 women, petty traders, and another 30,000 youth annually with cash to either support or start up trading. Speaking at the event in Yola, Governor Umaru Fintiri said the program is a part a point where about three cardinal items on the administration 11 point agenda converge. We must say women and the entire people of Adama State have never had it this good because you have not only empowered women economically but also socially and academically by making work and neko free in the state for our children. Seeing that the entire civil servants of the state are well catered for through the means of timely payment of salaries and making the state safe for each individual to go about his or her daily activities uninterrupted. To that, we have been having series of empowerment from training, from social support, from that is empowerment of small and medium enterprises across the state. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you may wish to be informed that this empowerment is not coming at this time as a mistake. Yep, still ahead. Cyclone Freddy kills 190 people in Malawi. Details when we return.
What did I say before still ahead? No. <laughs> oh my god. Always show. for upcoming artists to blow in Nigeria. Welcome to Plus Trending. I am Wiki November, your host, saying thank you for joining us on today's episode. Welcome back. It's tea time on Plus TV Africa. Practice makes perfect. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. He's a king. He's entitled to marry a hundred if he wants to. I want to welcome you all to this maiden edition of the program and we hope that you will enjoy and start to pick up tips and understand the journey of cancer survivors across the globe irrespective of the type of disease. So today in the house I have three of us cancer survivors. Um, we'll be talking about it. The first part of the building and five security guards died in the blast. Adam said at least five people were killed and 11 others including a regional governor. There was no immediate claim of responsibility for the attack, but the Islamist groups Al-Shabaab remained a potent force in the troubled horn of Africa nation, despite multinational efforts to degrade its leadership. Although forced out of Mogadishu and other main urban centers more than a decade ago, Al-Shabaab remains entrenched in parts of rural central and southern Somalia. Guinea's opposition has resumed contact with the military-dominated government after months of no dialogue. The meeting does not seem to have dispelled the opposition's deep suspicion of the ruling junta, further heightened by the arrest of one of its members on Saturday. Representatives of the forces vives a coalition of the main parties. Trade unions and non-governmental organizations agreed to meet Prime Minister Bernard Gomo under the auspices of religious leaders. One of the intercessors, Jean Boston Bogora of the Anglican Church, admitted to reporters that it was a contact. Egypt's President Abdel Fattah al Sisi has received the Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Denmark, Met Fredriksen, at Al Itahidia Palace in Cairo. The two officials held a bilateral session of talks followed by an expanded meeting attended by the two countries' delegations. The two sides looked forward to the first official visit by the Danish Prime Minister to Egypt to contribute to strengthening the friendship, particularly as they marked the 65th anniversary of the exchange of diplomatic representation between the two countries. Tropical Storm Freddy, one of the most powerful storms ever to hit the Southern Hemisphere, has killed 190 people in Malawi after ripping through Southern Africa for the second time in a month. The commercial hub of Blantyre was the hardest hit district and severe flooding and rains have broken roads and bridges, hampering relief operations. Freddy has also left a trail of destruction in Mozambique after it made landfall for the second time over the weekend. The Queen Elizabeth Hospital's mortuary was overwhelmed with bodies while families stood in long queues under the heavy rains waiting to identify their relatives. Gabon has begun three days of national mourning following a ferry accident that left six dead and around 20 others missing. 
The Esther Miracle Ferry, a mixed passenger and freight vessel, sank off the coast of the capital, Libreville, on Thursday night. The government has since suspended four officials and the public prosecutor has announced the opening of an investigation. The search continues to find the missing people. Civil society organizations plan to file a complaint against the Gabon estate and the ferry owner, Royal Coast Marine. President Ali Bongo announced three days of national mourning in a brief address on national television on Monday evening. A group has urged the Burundian authorities to immediately release five human rights defenders arrested on charges of rebellion and undermining state security. The activists were arrested by the intelligence services last month as they were about to fly to Uganda from the economic capital Bujumbura and subsequently charged with these offenses. Among the four activists arrested at the airport was Sonia Nduku Masabo, president of the Association of Women Lawyers of Burundi and former vice president of the Independent National Human Rights Commission. The fifth detainee, Prosper Ruyange, a member of the Association of, for Peace and the Promotion of Human Rights, was arrested in Ngozi. President Vladimir Putin has hailed what he described as Russia's economic strength in the face of Western sanctions and the fallout from Moscow's military campaign in Ukraine. Speaking to workers at a factory that makes helicopters for the armed forces, Putin said Western companies that fled Russia expected the economy to collapse, but instead its financial system had gotten stronger and the country had boosted its economic sovereignty. The Kremlin says a peaceful resolution in Ukraine was not possible without taking into account the new realities of the situation. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said Russia's position regarding an end to hostilities was well known. Moscow has repeatedly said that Ukraine would need to accept Russia's claimed annexation of four regions of Ukraine that it partly occupies. Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki says Poland could give Ukraine MIG-29 fighter jets in the coming four to six weeks. This suggests that Kiev's allies were moving closer to an agreement on the next step in their military support for the country. Poland has said it will prepare to send Soviet-designed MIG-29 jets to Ukraine as part of a coalition of countries. However, with Kiev's allies taking a cautious approach to the transfer of fighter jets, it has been unclear how long such a process might take. The European Commission has proposed a revamp of Europe's electricity market rules to try to increase the use of fixed-price power contracts, shield consumers from price spikes, and speed up the shift to renewable energy. Last year, the EU said it will overhaul its electricity market after cuts to Russian gas supplies following Moscow's invasion of Ukraine drove European power prices to recording highs. We aim to make the energy bills of the European consumers and companies more independent from the short-term market prices. To decouple consumer prices from the short-term markets, we propose to expand the role of long-term instruments. We introduce measures to boost the market for power purchase agreements and enhance the flexibility of the electricity system through storage and demand. Two girls are suspected of killing a 12-year-old schoolgirl who was found dead in a woodland area in Western Germany at the weekend in a case that has shocked Germany. Police found the body of a girl named only as Louise near a cycle path in Woodland on Sunday. Her parents had raised the alarm the previous day after she had visited a friend. Prosecutor Mario Manuela said investigations found that Louise had died as a result of knife wounds. However, no weapon has been found. There was no evidence that anyone else was involved or that there had been a sexual assault. <laughs> Up next, e-payment falls to 37 trillion naira as failed transactions mount. Well, that's on business news. We'll be right back.
increase in failed payment transactions in February cost a 4.83% decrease in the value of cashless transactions to 37.67 trillion naira from the 39.58 trillion naira that was recorded in January 2023. This came as the usage of e-payment gateways recorded a 41.29% month-on-month increase, according to new data from Nigeria Interbank Settlement System. The NIBS has not updated its efficiency platform portal, which states the number of failed transactions and more since 2020, making it hard to report the number of failed transactions. Some experts have also stated that a lot of failing transactions are as a result of poor network infrastructure. The president of the Bank Customers Association of Nigeria, Dr. Udu Ogumbonka, recently told reporters that the banks do not provide network services based on what they find out there was a failure in the network system. In line with this consumer center approach to telecoms regulation, the Nigerian Communication Commission, NCC, has directed mobile network operators to commence implementation of approved harmonized short codes for providing certain services to telecom consumers in Nigeria. According to a statement issued on Monday by NCC Director of Public Affairs Ruben Moka, the Commission has already set a deadline of May 17, 2023, for all mobile networks to fully migrate from heat to diverse short codes to the harmonized codes. The statement added that the use of harmonized short codes is aimed at achieving uniformity in common short code across networks. And this means that the code for checking airtime balance is the same across all mobile networks for the same function, irrespective of the network a consumer uses. With the new codes, the telecom consumers using over 226 million active mobile lines in the country can now use the same codes to access services across networks. And this underscores the importance of the non-oil sector to Nigeria economic growth. Ghana's embattled CD has rebounded 5% against the dollar in March as the government's decision to suspend external debt payment eased demand for greenbacks in the local foreign exchange market. Economists of RNB Global Market Research told clients in a note that demand for foreign exchange had eased after the debt suspension. The West African nation unilaterally stopped payments on eurobonds and other external debt in December, pending an agreement with creditors that is needed to unlock an international monetary fund bailout. Traders said the impact is beginning to filter through to the currency after it lost ground the first two months of the year. Stopping debt services means Ghana will not have to pay $516 million in eurobond coupons over the first half of this year according to samuel parker longdon a trader at fidelity bank limited in accra the lebanese pound sank to a historic low against the dollar on the parallel market tuesday which is the latest summer milestone and economic meltdown that has plunged most of the population into poverty the Lebanese pound officially pegged at $15,000 was trading at 100000 against the greenback. Dealers said a decent plunge from 1507 before the economic crisis hit in 2019. The currency's market value was around $60,000 to the dollar in late January, despite the gravity of the crisis. The currency market value was at around $60,000 to the dollar in late January, despite the gravity of the crisis. And up next is entertainment news. Nigerian superstar Ashake has made his debut appearance on the Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon on Monday as he entertained the audience with his new single. The award-winning artist performed his new single, Yoga, which is his first release of 2023, before performing organized of his debut album, Mr. Money with a Vibe. 
Ashakia was assisted by the composers who provided live instrumentation as it dazzled listeners with his performance. The performance sees Ashakia become the latest Nigerian act to perform on the show after Burner Boy and Whiskey performed Last Last and Money and Love in 2022. Ashake has kicked off 2023 with a new chart-topping single, Yoga, and he recently teased another unreleased song as it's set to continue his domination. Nigerian singer Thames has reacted to the backlash that trolled the view-blocking outfit she wore to the Oscars. The Lift Me Up co-songwriter cast a stir with the perceived enormity of her Oscars gown. While the show-stopping piece landed the 27-year-old on several best-dressed lists, it also took on a life of its own on social media, where the discourse focused on how it adversely affected Oscar's attendees. Indeed, Thames was visible in several aerial shots inside the theater and when cameras panned across the room to show the audience. The discourse has been an assortment of sartorial praise, light-hearted memes, and allegations of disrespect. Reacting to the criticism that trailed the outfit, Tam shared a photo of her in the same outfit with the caption, Oops! It also came with a blush emoji. American visual effects artist Eric Sindon, who won an Oscar on Sunday for Avatar The Way of Water, was transported to a hospital during the ceremony with severe pain. Doctors speculated that Sindon could be dealing with appendicitis and kidney stones. He eventually had to undergo surgery for a rupture in his small intestine. According to his mother, he would not be cleared to return to his home in New Zealand for around a month till he fully recovers. Sindon won the Academy Award for Best Visual Effects with Joe Lettery, Richard Bainham, and Daniel Barrett at the event on Sunday. He served as a senior visual effects supervisor on the blockbuster motion picture from James Cameron. Supermodel Kendall Jenner and award-winning singer Bad Bunny were pictured leaving Beyonce's and Jay-Z's 2023 Oscars after-party together on Sunday night, fueling rumors that they are romantically involved. There are no paparazzi photos to show Jenner and Bad Bunny arriving together, but they were photographed leaving in the same vehicle at the end of the evening. Kendall and Bad Bunny have been at the center of romance rumors since last month. They were first seen out at dinner in mid-February, though they made sure to leave from separate exits. Days later, Jenna's ex-boyfriend Devin Booker unfollowed her on Instagram, with fans believing her budding romance with the Grammy-winning singer led to the action. And up next is sports. Arsenal's manager and players dominated the first award ceremony of the season, just like they have dominated the English Premier League so far this season. The league leaders swept all top four award categories at the London Football Awards, which took place at the Roundhouse on Monday night in England. Gunners captain Martin Odegaard won the main award of the night, beating Tottenham's Harry Kane, Brentford's Ivan Toney, Fulham's Alexander Mitrovic, and fellow teammate Bukayo Saka to clinch the coveted Premier League Player of the Year. Similarly, Arsenal's coach, Mikel Ateta, won the Manager of the Year, Bukayo Saka won the Young Player of the Year, and Aaron Ramsdale clinched the Goalkeeper of the Year award. Meanwhile, still staying in the Premier League, Alejandro Ganacho says he will miss a very important part of the season for Manchester United after suffering an injury against Southampton. Ganacho was pictured leaving Old Trafford in a protective boot after a challenge from Southampton's Kyle Walker Peters in Sunday's stalemate, which leaves United two points above fourth place Tottenham with a game in hand. The 18 year old's absence adds to manager Eric Ten Hag's selection woes after it was confirmed that Casemiro would miss the next four domestic matches through suspension due to picking up his second red card of the season against Southampton. And just before we go, look at the headlines again. Federal government said 12.9 million cyber attacks were recorded during presidential election. Police have recovered 182 arms as IGP ordered mop-up of illicit weapons. Somalia suicide bombing has killed five, injured 11, including governor. And Russia said no peaceful resolution in Ukraine without acknowledging new realities.
Well, that's the news now. For more stories, follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And do subscribe to our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa and Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. You can also view us from Limex on Limex.tv and Glow TV apps anywhere in the world. I am Maureen Menongwe Zigwe. Many thanks for watching. It is engagement we need to have. Those who suffer miscarriages are never taken into account. Members of the National Assembly are also influenced by the last. You are sitting on Nigeria's money. From the Babin, I pay my land. From the Babin, I send my, my children to school. A consultative engagement. No any tangible notification before the banners. It's one thing for people to be at your back and listen to the moment. And I'm letting for them to still be able to be when push comes to shore. I had no desire to study law, none whatsoever. Um, I was more inclined to fine arts. My only ambition, I would say, was to become the chief prosecutor. For me, politicians are a bit too playful. That's what I believe. And since 99, we've seen how much investment in social events, in um, launching some street that you just start and the whole day will be spent on this occasion. Rich people are generally law abiding. We are not law abiding. So another problem of administration is that people don't follow the rules. Timeless Conversation, showing on Saturdays at 8.30 p.m. on PLOS TV Africa. Fever is a clinical condition where there is an elevation of the body temperature um, above normal. Um, many times, the, the regular body temperature is between 35.5 degrees Celsius to about 37.4 degrees Celsius. Anything above that can be classified as fever. In some cases, there's a difference between fever and hypertemia. Um, especially when the person has been exposed to a hot environment, coming down, coming out from a hot sun, or a natural raised body temperature. But aside that, um, once there's a raise in body temperature beyond 37.4, you can classify that as fever. And there are several causes of fever in children. One of them includes um, sepsis. Sepsis means the invasion of the body by microbes, by bacteria, or by microbes generally, which could be either bacteria, fungi, or even virus, right? That is um, sepsis, okay? Um, it could be parasitemia, especially more in our local environment where there's malaria, okay? It could cause fever. Um, other conditions could be um, dehydration is one major cause of fever, just like your regular car when there's an overheating you know that the water is drying up same way it is even in a child especially when they are dehydrated they are prone to being to having fever these are the major causes of fever there are several other um, causes of fever that can happen um, but key is key factors are one 
sepsis, which is the invasion of microbes. And especially when there are open wounds, but maybe there's poor hygiene in situations where there's stooling and vomiting. Um, there could be um, inhalation of microbes. For example, in cases of asthma, bronchopneumonia, there would always be fever. So most of these clinical conditions where there are infective causes will produce fever. Other causes, like I've just said, parastemia, things like especially malaria, will produce fever. And lastly, um, dehydration will produce fever. Well, practically, fever in itself is a symptom. So what are the symptoms to look out for in fever? Is the raised body temperature. But more importantly, when there is a raised body temperature, it comes occasionally with some degree of weakness, some degree of unwellness. And many other times, the fever could come with thirst. There could be a need for a lot of tests. That's when you also know that dehydration is one of the causes. Um, one of the other things to look out for is any other surrounding symptom around that um, fever. And um, of course, any other surrounding symptom. For example, open wounds, like I've said, and um, um, any form of infection. First, every mother should have a thermometer. You don't say that my child has fever because you touched the child. Oof, it's hot. Uh -uh. Fever is not measured by your hand. It's measured by a certain device called a thermometer. And it's simple. There's a handheld thermometer and there is the thermometer, the axillary thermometer or the mercury thermometer. Now, this particularly tells you this fever. The moment you notice fever in your child, that's not when you're rushing to get all kinds of syrup. The first thing is to expose that child. Now, one thing I, I, I failed to mention is that fever sometimes could come with chills, depending on the age of the child, come with chills. In, in, in worsening situations for older children, it could come with rigor. So that person, the child is feeling cold and asking to turn off all the fan and in other conditions is already shaking. Now, this shakiness is because the body is trying to produce heat and so is vibrating, all right? Now, when you notice that because the child is feeling cold, doesn't necessitate covering and turning on the fan. No, that's even when you expose, that's when you want to tepid sponge. Tepid sponging means dipping a towel into normal water and tabbing over the body. It's not batting with cold water or ice blocked water, right? So you use normal water and tepid sponge, wrap around until that temperature comes down. If that temperature is not able to come down with that, you can advance to the use of simple um, drugs like paracetamol. The use of paracetamol has almost no, no contraindication, especially if you follow the prescription. So when you use it the first time, you could do as much as six hourly, all right? But if you do for one, two, three times, and this fever is relapsing and going and coming back with the use of paracetamol, I think that's the right time to go to your doctor. Now, many times people, many mothers want to use um, ibuprofen. I don't recommend that you go as far as using ibuprofen. You could use it, but use it on your way to the hospital to see your doctor. So basically, fever is one of the most um, predominant conditions in children and it can, if not properly managed, especially in children between the ages of six months to six years, it can result into something we call febrile convulsion where the child begins to shake and, um, and of course that damages the brain. So in other words, you must prevent the escalation of fever by constantly controlling it. And if you do that for 24 to 48 hours and that child is not getting better, advice you go see your doctor my final word is that fever is not a symptom on its own many things cause it you don't treat the fever you treat the cause of fever fever many times comes with association and you want to find out what are the other associations and when you take a close history you see that that fever has progressed into something else maybe cough maybe stooling maybe diarrhea these symptoms help the clinician to find out what is wrong with the patient Increase the reach of your events or business services. To advertise on Plus TV Africa, please call 0906 
0005719 or 0909-040-8408 or send an email to marketing at plostvafrica.com. Plus TV Africa. Big stores live here. I want to welcome you all to this maiden edition of the program and we hope that you will enjoy and start to pick up tips and understand the journey of cancer survivors across the globe irrespective of the type of disease. So today in the house I have three of us cancer survivors. Um, we'll be talking about it and we're using this opportunity to make people understand that people still live with cancer and still have some sort of good quality of life irrespective of the disease. So I'd like to welcome on Firstly, Anastasia, let me introduce you properly. Anastasia is a stage two breast cancer, triple, that's what it's called. It's a stage two, triple negative breast cancer survivor. And a widow with three children. And she enjoys singing and reading. And Kali, Sun Kolia Obi, is a stage three breast cancer survivor. She's a woman with a dynamic vision of reducing cancer and mortality rates and creating awareness. My name is Denise Edjo. So within the four of three of us here today, I am what you call a stage four breast cancer survivor metastasizing in the brain with this disease metastasizing in the brain. I'll explain to you what metastases mean as we go along. Welcome. So ladies, how are you today? Fantastic. Very well. Well, Very well. Thank you. now let's sit down and let's have a chat and make sure that we get the message out and help save lives because that's the essence of all of this so very briefly i'm going to ask you both to share your story um and let us understand so that we can pick up the differences and now share mine as well so my journey started in 2018 when uh, i was um to be precise march 2018 when i found a lump on my left breast i was very enthusiastic in going for my holiday and didn't um, think about the the lump. So what I did was I thought, okay, I would it, it, it possibly would not be anything. And by then, my mind was never on anything cancer at all. I'd, I've never thought about, oh, it could be cancer, it could not be. I've never even heard. Cancer wasn't something that I was too familiar with, even though I've heard the word cancer. So I went on my holiday, got back, and I um, got a letter to speak to my GP uh, to do what is called a smear test, which is for to detect if there's any um, kind of cervical cancer. So I did say to them, oh, I found a lump on my left breast and it's quite big and um, it's solid. So they asked me, can you come in immediately, which I did. And um, to cut the long story short, uh, I went to the doctor. He looked at it, referred me. And I did, I went to the hospital. I did what is called a mammogram which was, um, it's a, a machine x-ray to check the um, uh, the size of the lump, if there's any lump at all. And they detected a lump. And afterwards, I was asked to do what is called a biopsy. So they took out the tissue, sample of the tissue to do, um, to take to the lab. Uh, went back and I was told it was um, stage three breast cancer. And... Lo and behold, what did I do? I told the doctor to cut the breast off immediately. Thank you. I'm going to stop you here. So I'm going to give you a briefing of my journey. And my journey was very easy. I was also not. I was actually, to be honest with you, all I had was a headache. So I'm not going to say it as if it was a big deal. I had a headache, a headache that just wouldn't go. I did all the tests and went through, I mean, hospitals all over Nigeria, from Abuja to Mina, where I was living to Lagos, to about four hospitals in Lagos, and no one could tell me what was the cause of the headache. And eventually I had um, a doctor say, you know what, everything looks very okay with you, Denise. We can't find anything, but so we are sure that we have addressed it, we are going to do an MRI scan. And lo and behold, we had cancer that had spread. No, So how did they put it? 
you had they say you have lesions that's it that's what nigeria call it because you have lesions so i said what does that mean they say well it's more than one i didn't understand all that and i just thought you know what i'm out of here and i left and came out to the uk and found out that i had to have brain surgery within seven days having brain surgery was where they picked up that it was they didn't know it was cancer because once you see more than one, apparently I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a patient of cancer who has become very, very knowledgeable. Um, I'm a teacher. Let me put it nicely. I'm a teacher. Because I like <laughs> being a teacher. <laughs> and then I found out that I had breast I had breast cancer metastasizing in the brain. Collie, what's the role of family in supporting this journey? Family actually should play a vital role in any cancer journey but sometimes that's not the case uh, so you find out that sometimes some people shut shut um shut out uh family members from uh go when they're going through this when they're going through this journey so uh, when i mean shutting them out it doesn't mean you know not whatever but at the end of the day they tend not to tell them especially if you're going to be getting kind of a negative vibes from them mm -hmm. we decide okay these are the family members i know that when i say xyz or oh, i've got cancer they would not judge me and they will hold my hands to go through the journey but their family members when you tell them in my case, I have somebody who is supposedly to be a close family member. When I told the person, the person asked me, where did you get the cancer from? So you see, when it comes to family, you have to be careful. For me personally, I have to be careful who I disseminate the information to. So when I was going through my journey, I know how my family dynamic works. So the only people that knew I was going through cancer treatment were just my sister and my mom's younger brother. Uh, it's very interesting because family, friends, I think there's going to be one common thread amongst all of us. And I think it's amongst all cancer patients is things that are said at the time of diagnosis. And a lot of people not realizing the impact of what they say at that time. I remember somebody saying, who sinned? <laughs> and I thought, really? As a Christian, he was even a pastor. So I can imagine. And that's why I asked you, because I'm coming back to another question and I'm waiting for her to come on. Uh, would you say um, cancer is <laughs> stigmatized? Would you say what? Cancer is stigmatized. Yes, I would. Why? Why I would say cancer is stigmatized is um, when they see somebody who's gone through cancer, the way they treat that person is totally different from the way they treat maybe somebody who's gone through malaria. And again, the, m most people are very myopic in their thinking. So sometimes they think cancer is, um, what do you call it? It's, uh, contagious. Contagious, yes. So they tend to stay away from you and try to, you know, avoid you. And when you come out and say, oh, um, I've been through cancer, they'll be looking at you. Okay, maybe it's the sins you committed that God struck you with cancer. Or maybe it's uh, your past life or whatever. So by the time they start, unless you allow them to label you, and that's why you find out that most people don't come out to say anything. They live within, their, within the shells of themselves. So, uh, yes, cancer is very stigmatizing. Thank you. Interesting, because... I don't think that a lot of people realize that and a lot of good intentions come out of trying to care for people with cancer, thinking they are good intentions, but we we have to accept a lot of people walk away from you 
um, a lot of things are said that are very hurtful. A lot of people don't navigate the journey properly because of lack of knowledge. I always stand there, and that's why awareness is very key. So I'm going to talk about the cancer disease itself now. Um, uh, talk me through your treatment. The first uh, thing I had was uh, the removal of sample of the lymph nodes. So it was, I did a surgery on the local anesthet uh, anesthet um, anesthetics and it was a day surgery and where they took out samples of the lymph nodes to test. Afterwards, I had the big one, which is the mastectomy and which is the removal of the breast where I had my whole breast chopped off. Then uh, on the same day, I had what is called a reconstruction. So they took tissues from my, uh, from my body and reconstructed, a des I have a designer breast. So <laughs> super proud of it. What the devil thought, you know, uh, that the devil thought we used to. So in the process of it, I had to get a boob lift to make sure that the reconstructed one, which obviously will be firmer than the other one, synchronizes with the new one. Afterwards, I had chemotherapy. I had eight cycles of chemotherapy, which was the most dreadful one because I lost, um, I wasn't afraid to lose my hair because I thought, okay, I've heard, I was warned you could lose your hair, that ex, um, your, your nails could turn black, you will lose your taste and everything. And ev all of it I experienced. But to be honest, when I was going for my chemotherapy, my eyelash was on fleek. <laughs> Even when I had my dreads, as soon as I finished the first cycle of the chemo, by the second one, I saw one dread had already fallen off. And I went to my brother and I said, can you shave the hair? And I shaved the hair properly. And I wore my wig. So anytime when they see me coming for my chemotherapy every three weeks, they're asking me, are you going for a party? Are you going somewhere after this? I said, of course, I'm going somewhere after this. I've come for a cocktail. So what do you expect? You have to look pretty to come down there and not look gloomy. So, you know, I I, I was more like putting Bob, uh, smiles on the faces of the women there. And it took a turn because there were some other younger girls when they are coming, they're just coming on, uh, you know, just like that. Let me just come and get this now. But I noticed some of them, one girl went to do her nails. And when I saw, I was like, what's going on? She said, you taught me how to come to, to come to take chemotherapy and I've taken the steps. So, and I had a ready, I had um, a one month, one full month of radiotherapy. And after that, I'm now currently on what is called a hormonal medication, tamoxifen. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Um, Anastasia, very briefly, can you summarize what stage two breast cancer is all about? Thank you. Yes. Um, stage two triple negative breast cancer doesn't have a receptor. Uh, like the doctors told me, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I started off with a lump. I had a mammogram biopsy. And that was all brought out um, the stage and told the doctors what way to go. I was told I'll have four cycles of chemotherapy and then a mastectomy. That is the complete removal of the breast. I did that. At the second stage of my chemotherapy, my hair started falling off. And so I had a complete shave. And after the fourth cycle, I went for the mastectomy. I don't have a reconstruction. But when I dress up to go out, you don't know I have only one breast. And so I, I have um, decided to tell people that cancer doesn't kill if you detect early and if you receive the treatment early. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I can say this. And to those of you watching us and listening to this, we are trying to make this discussion quite light because a lot of people are afraid of the word called cancer. Cancer yes can be a killer disease but doesn't have to be and we want you to know that you don't have to fight on your own so long as you know what you need to do to get through this journey uh, i'm going to talk about mental health because one of the things that we've had is the challenges to do with mental health and um there's a, because of the denial let me put it this way because of denial 
I think we lose more people. And statistically, globally, one in two people will get cancer all over the world. Um, when I was at the World Cancer Congress, it was also identified that 2%, 2.4% of Africans um, are the ones that live. They remain, um, so in currently we've got 80%, 70 to 80% of um, cancer, cancer patients do not survive in Africa. So I'm going to ask you a question now. Looking at your journey, and both of you will have a shot at this. Looking at your journey, give me one or two things that you would give to you would give as a tip very quickly to anybody that is going through cancer. Two tips I'm going to give uh, mm -hmm. in respect of um, to people going through cancer. It's number one: when you're going for your cancer treatment, have a positive mindset. That's number one. You must have a positive mindset. And number two, do not live in denial. Tell yourself the truth. When the doctor says X, Y, Z, take it back, process it, and tell yourself the honest truth. Fantastic. Okay. Mademoiselle, Anastasia. Two tips I'll you. give. Yes, two tips I'll give. Surround yourself with positive vibes. People who are positive, um, people who will tell you they are ready to go along with you, not people who will who, who will want you to fit it. A lot of Nigerians or Africans, you know, they, they, they want to fit it. Um, it's not my portion, it's not my portion. If you are diagnosed with cancer, face it and then surround yourself with positive vibes. Two, eat well, be happy. It's not a death sentence. Thank you. So I'm going to add to you. And my two are, be honest with yourself. Yep. And I will say why. I have stage four cancer. Stage four cancer means it has metastasized. So I said I will explain to you the differences. When cancer has metastasized, it means it has moved from the origin to somewhere else. And what I have is breast cancer that has moved from the breast to the brain. I have undergone three, three cuts to the brain. I have had over 10 tumors removed from the brain. And I'm still here. So focus is what I'm saying. And listen to your body. Your body tells you when you are sick. Cancer is an everyday illness. That's how I put it to the layman. That means it can be a headache. It's headache that got me here. It's nothing, there's no lump. They've never found a lump. It's a persistent headache. People who have um, head, um, colon cancer, it's continuous diarrhea or constipation. Do you know? So I'm saying to the general public, no matter anything that is persistent, that is the rule. Anything that does not stop, that you take medicine, it stops and it starts again, can be cancer. So please, if you find yourself with a persistent illness, and it's everyday illnesses, so not all this complicated named, men, men, it's like cough, cold, that's the type, a headache, a diarrhea, those are the type, they, do con they start to build and can become cancer. So before you find yourself in um, stage two, please make sure that, you know that stage one and two apparently is curable, totally curable. So once you are in a small pace, please try and address it. We agree, awareness is pivotal. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Give me one thing that you think we need to go forward for the general public. So you tell me, each person, uh, Anastasia, you go first. One thing we need to go forward for the general public um, in in Nigeria, where I live, uh, funds are very, very scarce and religion uh, is a bane. I, I think we should start the awareness from the pulpit. Let us start letting people know that everyone has cancer cells in them. Everybody carries cancer cells in them. It is only the ones that now become uh, um, malignant 
that 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 needs to be to to be addressed. And mm -hmm. so we we should have that that um, consciousness, you know, of uh, um, always wanting to. Um, I, I I think go for checkups. Basically, mm -hmm. we we don't we don't do that. So my belief is that we start from the grassroots, and the grassroots for me is the rural areas. Talk to the women who don't understand English. Speak to women who are selling pepper. These are the people that when it hits, it hits hard. And by the time they present to the hospital, it's too late. So awareness from the grassroots. Okay, and where would I come from on this one? I will come from it from a totally different um, thing. I would say that um, all stakeholders make sure when decision is being made, cancer survivors are in it. It was shared even at the World Cancer Congress in 2022 this year that there was a drive, or there is now a drive, that in the entire running of cancer, issues around the globe, cancer survivors should be part of it. And so committees that are being formed are now taking on people who live with the disease to be voices. Because unless we talk, a medical doctor does not know what we are feeling. I am taking chemo as I'm talking to you today, and somebody else will look at me and think, oh my God, she's taking chemo. So, yeah. So, what's the big deal? It is not, it is a big deal because we do have a lot of challenges that go with us. So how do you think we should do something differently? One thing we can do differently. I think that there should be a way in which there is a register of all those who provide support and to be checked. So checkmates that we only we have less than 100 oncologists, qualified oncologists in Nigeria. If you cal calculate 100 and then the population, you know that we are very understaffed, which immediately raises the alarm that that means a lot of people will be taking cancer treatment from non-specialists. Yes. Okay, so we need to think about how to work this differently. And to do that, I think we need to recognize the power drain that is going on in our country and how that is going to be resolved by the government, by all stakeholders in making a difference for the lives of cancer patients. Okay, and I says, yeah, you go for um no, uh, colleague, go for this one, please. What we uh, what I think we can uh, do differently is to for um when patients go to the hospital for them to be more involved in their treatments and to be able to ask questions. What I found out is that most Nigerians, I'm going to use Nigerians uh, because they are the most widely people I've dealt with, most patient, uh, cancer patients in Nigeria do not ask questions. Most of them, when you ask them, the f my, usually my first question when I meet somebody is what stage and what grade? Most of them don't know what stage. Most of them know, don't know what grade. So when you don't know the stage and the grade, how do you navigate your treatment? And when you go to a doctor and you're able to pose questions that they are unable to deal with, that will automatically tell you that you're not dealing with an oncologist if you're very clever. Most cancer patients, whether newly diagnosed or or, or in, con or in um, active treatment or in remission, in quotes, mm -hmm. should be involved in their treatment, fully Thank involved. Thank you. Anastasia, can you give me your own view? Yes. I will say we'll separate facts from fiction. People are sick, they go to church, believing the pastor can do perform a miracle. And like Kolya said, we as um, uh, 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 as people in remission who have once gone through the treatment should be a part of the treatment. We, we, we are stakeholders, so we should be a part of the cancer patient's journey, the cancer patient's story. 
separating fact from fiction is actually very very key and i've come to realize that it is a point where we don't always get it right so now as we draw to the end of this um i'm going to give you one of op- everybody an opportunity to give uh, give advice um either advice to a cancer patient or speak to the government or speak to the population as to what you think what strategy or improvement whatever that will make a difference for a breast cancer survivor in Nigeria and across the world. Cancer doesn't have to be a death sentence. If you notice any change in your body, please go to the hospital and listen to what the doctor says. When I was diagnosed, a lot of people became doctors. They told me not to take chemotherapy. They, they, they had one negative thing to say about chemotherapy. We should start, you know, the, the government should start getting hold of these people. They are killing people. Whoa, okay. Colleague, go on. So, um, my advice would be to the government. Uh, don't wait until people start dying before you take a decision. You see somebody who's come to uh, to you and you've told, you would categorically tell the person you have to drop 25 million naira for a start. And when you're looking at the person, the person is not even worth up to 5,000 naira. Where are you expecting the person to get the funding from? And this is why people resent back to churches, to taking herbs, to taking different kinds of all sorts of nonsense just to say they are curing cancer. And the government needs to step up to do something. Uh, either they reduce the cost of treatment for people who go to the government hospital, reduce the cost of treatment for them, or subsidize it. Listening to your views, both of you, I really appreciate it because one of the things I think people don't realize is that a lot of people will look at me now sitting on this screen and be wondering, <laughs> this woman, she's just enjoying herself. But if they had the opportunity to see what I have looked like over the years with my bald head and very big, my head was very, very big, only because I had to take steroids. And to have to go through that every time, every two years, and they have the cuts and then take the steroids and the head now becomes two times the size and is very heavy. It's a very interesting experience that a lot of people do not even know cancer patients go through the illnesses that come with it and everything, it's left for us all as as survivors, as patients, to just keep a positive, please, a positive mindset. Learn to laugh through your pain. Learn mm. to praise through your pain. Learn to thank God through your challenges. And trust me, um, you, it only gets better. No matter what it says, no matter what the decisions are finally, you've got to find space in yourself as a survivor or as a patient, because all patients are survivors until the day you go home. I want to say thank you very much for joining me on this today. As we get to the end of the year, it is the aim that we make people know what to do, how to do it, and get through, because together we fight, together we win. Join us on Comod Cancer Foundation on this program and watch the videos. They will be shared online for you all and you can share it because awareness is key. The more people know what to do and know where to find information, the better it is for us to reduce the challenges and reduce death mortality rates across the globe. I want to say thank you all for joining us on this meeting edition and look forward to seeing you again soon. Welcome to another edition of Cancer with Dr. Denise Edjo in partnership with Cross TV Africa. We want to thank you for joining us again and welcome you back. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, thank you. And for those of you that are just that have been with us 
us before. We welcome you back and we hope you have a really nice time. And it's the season of goodwill. So let us now think about those who are going through cancer and the mental health challenges that they face as a result of the disease. Uh, thank you for joining us and let's go. So today in the house, we've got Dr. Ralph Emeka Ubulu. Doc, thank you for coming in. And throughout the conversation, I will refer to him as Doc for the entire conversation. Um, and we'll take it from there. Doc, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Welcome. And thank you for accepting to come on because we don't take people like you for granted. I'm not a medical doctor. I am just a doctor of book. So I want to say thank you for coming on. So let me give you a brief background of who Dr. Emeka is. He's a native of Aniocha South Local Government of Delta State and started his school in Washington, D.C., USA, where he grew up until 1978. He served as secretary of the Medical and Dental Consultants Association of Nigeria, Lagos chapter between 2012 and 2014, and then chairman between 2014 and 2016. He is currently actively engaged in psychiatry work in the UK and will be joining us to talk about cancer and the mental health, the psychiatry or psychology, whichever way we look at it. Um, he's going to guide us and tell us how we need to navigate. So doctor, welcome. And once again, I want to say thank you for engaging with us. We appreciate your time and we do not take it for granted. Um, so are we ready to go? Yes, we are. All right, so let's start with this. What is the role of a psychiatrist in the journey of a cancer patient? So a psychiatrist is um, meant to be part of what we call the psycho-oncology team, which is a specialized uh, field in psychiatry that deals with um, the psychological aspects of people who have cancer. So the, the, the psychiatrist is one member of a multidisciplinary team, which should include a psychologist, uh, counselors, and other therapists. And so the journey usually should start from the period when the person is going through the diagnostic process, because there are, there are four, there, you can say there are four stages. The first would be, of course, the person first experiences symptoms. And because uh, most cancers have non-specific symptoms, it's a journey before eventually someone says, oh, let's investigate this person for cancer. And so that's where the journey actually starts. Ideally, before, when the person is going through the diagnostic process, they should have psychological support because there's a lot of anxiety uh, provoking uh, exercise. The person is going through what we can call a grief reaction all through. That is, the person first could go into denial, okay? And then after that, some people will go into um, anger. They're angry angry at God, angry at things, you know, and then some will go into the stage of bargaining. And then that's when they bring in religion. Oh, if you, God, if you heal me, I will never do this. They're trying to negotiate with God. And then eventually they go into the stage of now accept that well this might just be what's happening to me and then the final stage is acceptance now people could go through this in the diagnostic phase or actually in the treatment phase or in the recovery phase so the the the, the, the involvement Movement of psychology and the psychiatric team is really crucial right from the beginning once the diagnosis has been made through the period of treatment, which can which comes with its own uh, psychological challenges as well, and then also the recovery phase. Uh, thank so that's you. It. You just woke me up now. You see, it's whenever things like you ever start like this, it makes me very happy because you start. You start helping me. So I'm going to ask you, so is the role of the psychiatrist the same? It's not the same as the psycho psychiatrist and psychologist. They're not the same. No, it's not. So can you differentiate no. just shortly? They're, they're not. So, so, yeah. Yeah, so the psychologist mainly deals with um, 
helping the person by way of non-medication approach. Okay, so talk therapy, um, uh, supporting them. And then if the person is going through mild periods of depression, just talk therapy. The psychiatrist gets involved when the person now needs medication for psychological issues they're going through. So the psychologist does not prescribe medication. The psychiatrist prescribes medication. So some people may only need the help of the psychologist, but if it's getting more severe, then the psychiatrist gets involved. Wow, that's, that is an eye-opener because you've just differentiated. So I've always had the psychologist in my journey as the cancer su um, survivor. It's, it's interesting because, you know, when I talk to you uh, medics, you help us, you help me to be able to help all of us that go through it understand that it's not about just, there's no one, one size fits all and there's no particular um, process that works because exactly. I've had counseling um, during yeah. COVID and I think that was as a result of having my um, five year, you know, where you get to five year mark and you're trying to see, am I going to cross this line? Because apparently five years yeah. is a key line for cancer patients. And then I've just gone to book myself back into, psych into the cancer law and I've said to them, look, it's a, I'm not coping anymore. And so to all those who are going through cancer, please be like me. Accept it when you're not coping. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, people say it's stigma. Cancer already is stigmatized. So just take the best help you can. I'm going to ask you the next question. So at what stage of cancer treatment is a psychologist needed? Because based on what you're saying, we have different stages. There are different stages of the process, which is correct. I think almost all of us will say we have gone through two, maybe three of the five you mentioned. So at what stage do we really need to say, look, 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 it's getting hard. As a cancer patient or family members of a cancer patient looking at their relative or friend going through it and can't identify what is it they need to, where do they need to know they need help? Ideally, once someone is going through the diagnostic process, the psychologist and counselor should be involved because there is pre-diagnostic counseling that helps people go through the difficulties, the anxieties, you know, the sleepless night, the insomnia, all of that. That's where they should be involved. So you don't wait. It should be right through the, the beginning of the journey, through the diagnostic process, into the recovery process, through the treatment process. So it's from the very beginning. That's mm -hmm. the answer. Whoa, okay. Okay, okay. So what emotional um, disorders can a cancer patient develop? And I'm asking this, I'm trying to think to myself, would that be where we start crying? Is that the stage where we're yeah, so Yeah. Yeah, so so it's it's um the 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 common ones are anxiety, okay? The illness anxiety, the person is worried. Uh, some will have uh, physical symptoms of anxiety, tremors, palpitations, and all of that. Then there's insomnia, sleeplessness. Okay, that's also one of the common conditions. And then you have depression. People go into clinical depression, where that's when they're crying, their mood is low, and all of that. And some may, at some point during that period, um, especially if they're not able to get to the stage of acceptance, some of them feel suicidal. And then um, also some have what's called adjustment disorder. Okay, this find it difficult to adjust to uh, the, the changes that come with the, con with the treatment and sometimes the condition itself. So it's, it's like you mentioned before, it's not one size fits all because um, the treatments, I, I mean, as you know, are various, uh, varied. Some will require radiotherapy, some chemotherapy, and some surgery. So these treatment modalities themselves come with their own challenges, which some people need support getting through. So the common things are rarely, very rarely, you have people who experience things like a delirium or psychosis. Uh, where they're, they're, maybe you may hear voices or things that lose touch with reality. That's you, that may be related to the treatment or the progress of the cancer itself, it, if it's such that affects the brain. So these are the common ones. 
if it's such that affects the brain. Yes. So some some yeah, in the sense that you know some cancers are localized, especially if they're picked up early. So in those ones, and that's those are the ones that they will usually recommend surgery or targeted radiotherapy. Now, if so, for, unfortunately the person has maybe stayed in, stuck in the stage of denial and they haven't started treatment early and the cancer has now disseminated, has spread through the body. If one of the parts of the body that the cancer cells get to includes the brain, then the person could have more severe psychiatric conditions. That's what I mean by that. That's why early treatment is really crucial. Thank you. You know, you're bringing a reality to me, which I'm hoping that other people who are going through this will understand that they're not on the journey alone. And it's nothing, it's not just about them. Because, okay, I'm going to, let me put a question that's just come. You know, there's this challenge with, um, it's not my portion. And it's a very Afro-Caribbean statement um, where we bring in religion. And that is what you call denial. However, for us that go through it, is it really about denial or is it about all we can see is dying? Because no matter how we want to be politically nice or correct about it, cancer patients live in the fear of dying. And it's a reality that we have to accept. So in your in your from what you're saying, what how do you think we should? Yes, uh, you see, it's 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 those the processes, the stages that I mentioned, they are natural. There's hardly anyone who will not go through those stages. It, it's normal, but it's being stuck in those stages. That's where the problem is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the denial it, it comes naturally. Nobody wants to immediately accept. But will, should you stay stuck there? If you stay stuck there, then that's where your dread, which is dying, becomes a, a, more, a greater likelihood because you've not started treatment. I, I remember um, when, when, as a young doctor, one of the when I was not into psychiatry, so um, we we're doing all, all 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 fields then as a young medical officer, and I, I had a cancer patient who had breast cancer. And she told me she was so she was in this ward because um, her cancer had um, had spread and she didn't come for treatment early, and so they thought she had now developed stroke, so she went to a stroke ward. Now, whilst there, I was uh, of course as a young doctor, we would administer the medication and all of that, and so she told me she had gone through these stages. She had now gotten to the stage of acceptance, and she said that the, she it's funny to her that. The fear, just what you said, is always, oh, am I, is this going to kill me? Am I going to die? But she was in that stroke ward and saw people who didn't have cancer, people who were younger than her, who had stroke and died right there. And she said, so she's living, she's alive, fearful of death. But these people who had suddenly had high blood pressure, had stroke and died, they, you know, so death can come. But it's the risk that's, I mean, it, 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 it is now the difference. Yes, we know that there's a there's slightly, I mean, there's a greater likelihood when you have some conditions compared to others, but everyone's in the fear of dying. So it's how you address that in terms of doing what you should do, which is receive treatment. That's what reduces your risk. That's what reduces the likelihood. So, so to stay stuck in denial, you're only increasing the likelihood of dying. And thank you for that nice starting because it's 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 quite relaxing when when I'm not stressed thinking about what's what's what am I supposed to be doing here. So how can a diagnosis of cancer affect the social life of a patient? And this is important. So I'm going to let you start, and then I'm going to add to it. Yeah. The, so the diagnostic process involves. Again, it, it, it depends on the type of cancer that is suspected that the person has. So that will guide the how invasive, that is how, how um, intrusive the diagnosis is. Some may require surgical you know, diagnostic procedures. 
Some may just require blood tests. Some may require x-ray. That's, that's difficult for a lot of people. And, and, and people go through emotional challenges, anxiety, that, that's called illness anxiety. Should I, should I not? Should I go through this? Or what about, it? and sometimes the procedures themselves come with their own risk. Okay, so that's also things that the people have to deal with. Oh, is this is is it this procedure? Is it worth it? Should I go through it? Not forgetting that the cost, especially in our society where people have to pay out of pocket, that costs a lot, and you can drain people doing several tests. You have sometimes you have to journey to different centers from where you were far from where you live, and that takes its own toll on your finances, your family. Okay, your, your caring role, if you, you have children and things like that. So these are things that the person is having to go through. So beyond the illness itself, there are associated factors, stressors that can affect one psychologically. And that's why the need for support, organizations, systems in place that support people, which unfortunately we don't, we don't have enough of, but these are things that we have. Ah, Doc, you know, you hit a lot of key points for me going from this point. Um, and I think this is where a lot of people get it wrong. Because one of the first things that I picked up from the World Cancer Congress 2022 was when I had to be asking about our finances. A lot of people do not realize that statistically, globally, cancer patients become broke in two years. So they lose their homes, they lose their means of livelihood, they become poor from a very comfortable place. All of a sudden, cancer has hit them. And yes, you are right. Living in where, for instance, we come from, it is why we hear stories from survivors about having to take what they call half cocktails and this cocktails. And you're wondering, what, are, what is all this? The disease is... I'm, um, I get sad every time I think about it because somehow it's like our lives don't matter. It's a shame to have to say it, but if we don't have the money, we don't, it's just, that's it, you know? And it's sad to accept, but it's a reality that we have to be aware of. And with this, therefore, comes emotional disorders, which you then have to treat. Am I correct? Yes, that's it. Yeah. Okay. And how would you now go about that? Because a lot of it is emotional, it's, it's how we feel. I mean, when I found myself last week with my, my team and I was told my chemo had to stop because it was affecting another organ, I, I woke up and realized that, huh, what does that mean? And no matter what, I'm still human. And no matter how strong you want to be, you're still human. You've got emotions and you've got to get past them. That's it. And that's why the support is key, because there's no prescription. There's no, I mean, that fits all, you know, so it comes with the circumstances. And so that's why it's like you need someone to hold your hand through the journey, because there could be different turns. Some people's journeys are different. And uh, that's where, that's where, you know, the uh, one, one other thing that's really important, why it's, it's, it's key to, I know it's difficult, but to be hopeful because there's a lot of where we are in terms of cancer treatment today is not where we were 20 years ago. It's not where the world would be five years, 10 years down the line. There is constant research because we recognize it's a big problem. Uh, but the thing, so one should be hopeful, first of all, that yes, you can beat that five year line. You can beat the cancer. Because if you don't go with that mindset and you already give up, then you won't see the, you won't you won't get there because you've given up. And this is not just with the person who has the cancer, but with the people who are treating them. Because we have um ju not just the person who you said the, the word cancer what comes to mind is for a lot of people is death. You understand, am I dying or mm -hmm. sleep? It's not just the person who has the cancer, but even people who treat them. Some people, that's why we talk about the, the, the need to train those who are treating people 
Because the body language of some people is like, oh, well, what's the point? And if that's the body language of the person who's supposed to be giving you hope, who's supposed to be treating you, then that's a problem. So, that, and that's where the whole stigma is. The stigma isn't just the person who has the cancer, but even people who treat the person who has cancer. Some of them feel stigmatized, okay? They make you feel that this is, this is, a, is a waste of resources, which is, which is wrong, which is a very wrong a message, which um, some people, not, by, not necessarily by what they say, but the body language. And if you're passing that body language to someone who has cancer, then what do you want the person to feel? So that's why it's that's where the role of psycho oncology services come into play. Unfortunately, we don't have much of that in our country. And that is a key issue that we have. And we have to yes. accept. Yes. Yeah, because if you look at it and I, I look at it from I'm very realistic, which you appreciate, um, about this challenge because we are stigmatized, no matter what the world says. And I think the world is now learning to understand that cancer patients are stigmatized because even in our own Nigerian culture, there's already an issue. Once you, once somebody knows a member of the family has had cancer, you find people saying, oh, you can't marry into that house because that person, they will give you cancer. As if cancer is moved from one person. And that advocacy really has played a big role in that. I'm going to ask you, one question that uh, it's not so much or is it about how people cancer patients access psychiatry and is it a very expensive access for people you know because we already have to pay the khaki mobile we have to pay our transport around we have to pay all these blood tests we have to pay yeah we have a lot to pay Psychiatry as well, is that also part of the costed bills that we have to pay, especially in Nigeria? It's It adds to the cost. I, I, mean, that's, I, won't, I mean, we, we can't deny that. It's, but it, you now have to look at the cost benefits of it. Being in a better state of mind improves your response to treatment for the cancer. So therefore, if, even if it's going, it's going to add to the cost, on the long run, it's more beneficial. If your mental well-being is better, okay, is in a better place, you're more likely to respond better to it, whether it's chemotherapy, whether it's um, radiotherapy, all the treatment modalities, which means you're likely to live longer, which means your quality of life is likely to improve. So that's where the issue is. Would you want to not do that because the immediate cost now is, is, is a challenge, whereas in the long run, it would make you better? So no, without a doubt, it, it would add to the cost. But I can tell you that it's less expensive compared to the other treatment modalities. Now, how do you get access to it? Right now in Nigeria, I mean, most cancer centers or treatment centers do know how to reach a psychologist or psychiatrist because most of them one are largely situated in teaching hospitals or multi-specialty centers so usually what 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 we what we're trying to do is work with the oncologists okay the radiotherapists and all the others to get them to spot signs that will alert them to the need to oh i think you should see a psychologist Oh, I think you should see a psychiatrist. So all the all the person needs to do is ask them. If they've not spotted it, ask them, do you have access to a psychiatrist or psychologist I could see? Do you have access to a psychology team that can support me? Ask. That's what I would say. I was just about to ask you my actual big last question. Give me three things that will help. So uh, the three things I'm going to try and narrow it down. I want one for the government to do for us, because honestly, with, like you said, the cost implication is, is one of the most heartbreaking, which, which is why statistics is saying 70 to 80% of people with cancer in developing countries um, are more likely to die, especially places like Nigeria than anywhere else, as against like England, where 70 to 80% are more likely to live. Um, give me three 
points that we want to take away that we hope people will hear. One for a survivor, one for the government, and the government is the first one, is the major one, and one for um, the medics, the people that care for us. Three things that we so, need to get right. For the government, I would say they should expand the national health insurance scheme to include cancer treatment. That would go a long way in easing the financial burden. It is not it is not covered currently. If they can't get cancer treatment covered, at least to an extent on, in the National Health Insurance Scheme, they should ensure that psychological treatment is covered. So that's what I would ask the government to do. On the on the on the part of the survivor, I would say, during this festive period, try some mindfulness. You can go on YouTube, on the internet, and see short, you know, talks or trainings on mindfulness. Mindfulness will really help anyone who's a survivor. Okay, then for the people who treat them, I will say. Mind your body language. Be psychologically aware and psychologically minded. Even though you're not a psychologist or psychiatrist, do some training in the emotional disorders that are associated with uh, 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 cancers. It will help you to provide better care to people you're treating. So those are the three tips I'll give. Thank you very, very much for your time. I am very, very, I've run out of a lot of time, but uh, let's see how we'll get all this together for the general populace so that we can actually learn. It is a season of Christmas uh, and the new year. And I want to say to all our viewers, we really hope you have a lovely, lovely Christmas. And I will be speaking to you before the end of the year when we will also look at other things that are important for you as cancer patients. To our uh, special guest today, Doctor, I want to appreciate you, appreciate your time and everything and the time that you spent um, guiding us. And you will see this program on. And everyone else, uh, you can follow us on the Commode Cancer Foundation. We have it on the web. We have a website. That's the name. We have it on um, we have a YouTube channel and this video will be out there and all other videos that allow you to uh, engage and find the facts about what's going on because there are always medics or patients that are talking, not um, qualified medics that have recognized, that are recognized in Nigeria. So don't worry about it. The facts you're going to get are from professionals who are specialists in this field. Um, you find um, snippets and stuff on our Facebook page, our YouTube Follow us, share, us, and um, click on the share button. Also, also subscribe because together we get the message out. We save lives. I hope that we will see you again before the end of the year, and I wish you all a lovely Merry Christmas in advance. Please pop in and visit somebody who's going. To
Shimori Badejo holds a first degree in mass communications, master's in communications arts, and a PhD in social psychology specializing in mass mobilization. He cut his professional teeth at the old Lagos State Broadcasting Corporation, where he worked as a reporter and a news anchor. He later worked with the Guardian Group of Newspapers as a journalist and writer. In 1991, Shimori joined Magnum Gold Advertising and later moved to two other reputable advertising agencies, working as copywriter and client service manager. He was a pioneer staff of the first financial corporate communications outfit in Nigeria. He established Concrete Communications Limited in 1998, a communications consultancy outfit positioned as communications auditors for corporate organizations and government agencies. It is on record that his professional expertise has sustained a lot of brands introduced into the Nigerian market and are currently leaders in their categories of business. He conceptualized and produced the first MTN-sponsored Yoruba radio program titled Tenin Teni. The program, which ran on six popular radio stations in southwest Nigeria for 13 weeks, was nominated for the prestigious Nigeria Media Merit Award under the category of Radio Program of the Year. For many years, he was a part-time lecturer at Wesley University Ondo, teaching advertising and public relations. He has also been a facilitator in so many fora on community activities. Shimori is a registered member of the Advertising Practitioners Council of Nigeria, APCON, Nigerian Institute of Public Relations, NIPR, and a fellow of the Institute of Information Management, Africa. He is also a knight of Charles Wesley. Let's welcome Shemuri ba de jo Thank you for having me here today. Yes. It's a pleasure. It's, an, it's, it's very nice to have you here. You know, uh, I've always seen you as a man of many parts. I can't say too many parts because mm -hmm. I see you are still acquiring more and more. Not too long ago, you got yourself a PhD yeah. in, of all things, psychology. Yeah. What led to that? Well, um, I like I have a background in communication, mm -hmm. and I practice communication. And basically, we just I just feel that it's it's a behavioral science, mm -hmm. and for you to be able to understand your audience, you really need to go into reasons why they do some things. Mm -hmm. And then, so that was why the interest in psychology was developed. And not just psychology as a broad one, mm -hmm. but social psychology with special emphasis on mass mobilization. And again, because I lecture, mm -hmm. I like impacting knowledge. I like marrying the classroom with practice, okay. you know, theory with practice. So I chose to embark on that so that I can tell my students this is reality, this is theory, mm. so, and it has helped out. Now that you're still practicing oh, as yeah. a lecturer? Oh, yes, I'm, I'm practicing, and then I'm also a public relations consultant. <laughs> Let's talk about public relations. Yes, now, good. How do you marry it? You're a public relations consultant, you're a very strong person in church, yes. you're a lecturer. Uh, yes. In today's PR practice, Yes. A great deal of uh, networking, contacts, and all that. Sometimes by bordering on almost uh, corruption or the old old boys syndrome. Yeah. We went to school together, so he's the one we're giving the job to. How are you surviving? Well, let me first say that we have we have been lucky to have loyal clients. All right. Loyal in the sense that we build relationships. Right. We practice what we preach. We don't cut corners. We are not marketing here. But I keep telling people that I think the artistic instinct in me, mm. it's, it, it comes to play mm. in situations like that when people think I don't need money. You know, I walk away with my integrity and my head screwed straight up mm. than to compromise. So in situations where I find myself compromising. I rather walk away. Okay. So a lot of people think this guy does not need money. I say, well, uh, I need money, but I still keep my integrity intact. So 
It has kept us, you know, it has given us loyal customers, loyal clients. We have built brands from the scratch to what we call competitive stage. Okay. And we are enjoying their patronage. Okay. We don't want to be the biggest. We just want to add value. And, uh, and yes, and that's what we've been doing. Now, you see, there's the, this thing about one's background and the upbringing in character building. Yes. How has your background as the son of a reverend gentleman yes. impacted on who you are today? Well, it, 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 it's actually the whole thing. Mm. Because I grew up in a home where the fear of God was actually implanted on us. Apart from there, that, my father, my mother, they were teachers. And then we had, we were like living in a barracks, hmm. you know, regimented lifestyle. And then again, my father being a lover of music too. So I had no choice than to just pick up, you know, from there. It's so funny that when I tell people that I had no social life growing up as a child. Everything was about the church. And even my, my place were church. Mm. I, I recall that we lost a cat and I was conducting a mass. For the cat? For the cat, wow. because that was all I knew. Yes. You know, until we started having some level of freedom and then we're going out there to see the other side of life. And our inquisitiveness also took the better part of us to see Mm. what's happening there but that background that always drawn us back into conscience you know working on our conscience to always do the right thing so it's a passion for me to serve god it's a way of life because mm. that was what i grew up to know okay so, so it's 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 a it's a, it's not out of the ordinary you know all that i do these days to serve God. Yeah, but, but you know, some people may have re rebelled against that kind of rigid or regimented background. Yeah. You chose to stay. We tried. I tried. Oh, you tried to? I tried, but it didn't work. Oh. My father, who was, God bless his soul, a disciplinarian. Tell me about we it. We will, I mean, I had I'd received 100 and 14 strokes of the cane as an, as a, an 11 year old boy. And 114. I did, yes, I counted and I didn't steal. All because I was late for prayers, early morning prayers. So I was stacked. He removed all my clothes and I was beaten naked. My mom could not stand it. She had to walk into her room and she was crying. In, in those, those days, mm -hmm. you know, mothers would not have a say. You know, she would just keep, you know, Mm -hmm. So, and um, what happened, I slept off, <clears throat> he rang the bell for prayers, I was not there, and they were banging on my door, and I had locked from behind, oh, no. and that was the offense. You actually invited the beating. Then. Yes, I knocked from, <laughs> so it was a banging, neighbors had to come, uh -oh. in fact they had to climb the ladder to draw my cover clothes before I could wake up. Ha. So while they were doing all of that, my father just went into the nearby bush and was just cutting cane. The right. And immediately I came out of it. He said, just come to my room. Wow. Remove your clothes. And that, as an 11-year-old boy. What was that like for you? Well, it got to a point I was dead to pains. Hmm. I was just lying down there, being beaten, and I was not feeling pains anymore. By your dad? By my father. And at some point, and that's what made, that toughened me in life. Mm. So, there is no challenge. I would say, what other pain can be much more higher than my father asking me to go and bring the cane? Let's play a bit of psychology now. <laughs> <laughs> that experience, yes. how did you see it even as you were growing up? Let's say when you now were, say, 18 or 19. Well, the only, the only thing I, I, I was determined, I told myself, I'm not going to train my children this way. Okay. And I could hear the man too also say, he was also saying that the way his father trained him was not the way he yeah. would train his children too. So that means I would not be too far from the truth if I also choose mm -hmm. not to train my children the way he trained me. Yes. And uh, you know, there is this story of a, a drunk mm. 
who had two children. One of them became a drunk too, using his father as an example. As an example, okay. The other guy never tasted alcohol, using that same father as, as an, an example. example. So it's a matter could, of choice. <laughs> it's a matter of choice. Yeah. And so I chose to take my father as someone who knew that was what he knew, knew best, best as yes. how to train a child. A child. Spear the rod and spoil, and spoil the, child. the child. And I did not, yes, when I was growing up, I didn't like the idea. Mm. But after, some, after a while, I've, I, I give him credit for all that I have become. Sure. Even those tough situations that I found myself, mm -hmm. I look back and say, if not for my father, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't be able be to here. weather this storm. Yeah. Because he, he, he toughened me. There's no, even when we're growing, we're trying to, to be rascals. You know, no, don't we're say still... we're trying. We, we, we <laughs> just admit it, own it. We were rascals. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> but and then the... I face, when, once I look back, I think, what, what challenge could be? Could there as, be? You know, so, so, so he toughened me. I, I saw the positive side of, of, of those. The experience. Th yeah, those trainings. That's what, that's what I saw. But there's something else that you got from your father yeah. that I found out that you are also passing on to your children. Yes. You're a multi-instrumentalist oh, yes. and you're making sure they are too. I remember, even it was also not easy, Yes. I remember, I think 1974, he was traveling out, he was going to Britain and he was asking everybody, what should I bring back bring for that you? As a secondary school student, and then, and then maybe from one or two. I said, I want a piano. Hmm. While my brothers were asking for shirt, mm -hmm. trousers, and all of that. Yeah. So he, he, he actually brought the piano. Great. So, and he brought a, what they call small wood piano tutor mm -hmm. as a guide for me to learn. So, and he gave me a deadline. While my brothers and sisters were enjoying their, their clothes shirts. and their. <laughs> <laughs> and I was busy studying music. Yes. And it would be, you know, those days, our parents would serve siesta and yes, all of that. Exactly. Those things, we don't know what you it is know, these days. It is their age. <laughs> so, so, so it would be serving the siesta in the room, and I would play a key wrongly. I wake up. It would just, I would just hear that knock from me. I, I have told you not to look at the keys while playing. And I was like, is it an offense to ask for this? <laughs> so even my gift also attracted punishment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but later in life, I, I started enjoying it because yeah. now I'll go to some churches, I'll find myself valuable, mm -hmm. you know, even as much as I try to hide, yeah. you know, my gift will actually, expose you know, you. expose me. Yeah. And I'm enjoying it. And I discovered that it has, it has, it has also you know, helped mm. in my literary appre appreciation. Appreciation, yes. I think so. I just chose that. Okay, fine. My children too. My they they don't have a choice in ah, this matter. They don't have a choice. They really don't have a choice. So you because, copied your father? No, I have. I didn't. I did not give mm -hmm. them a knock. No knock. No, nothing. no. Uh, uh, they, they don't have a choice. You <laughs> took away their choice. No, no. But of course, they enjoyed it. Uh, uh, if no, that's. If, Okay. Admit that you took away their choice. I will choice. tell you why I said they don't have a choice. Okay. Yes, it formed their background. Good. My first son naturally fell in love with piano. Yes. And my second son naturally fell in love with sax. Uh -huh. And my daughter with a violin. I see, you know. So at some point, I was not pushing. Mm -hmm. You know, they were just trying to, and they had been performing as a group, the three of them, since they were young. So. Right now, the, the, the one that, that, that uh, the saxophonist don't even want to touch the saxophone anymore. But he knows it. Yeah. He can read the note, yeah. and I believe that it will still be useful. You yeah. know, for that time future. will come. So, so I, don't, I don't, my doctor reads, all of them, they read notes, they play very well, and we blend, you know, and they, play, they all play the guitar too. Oh, so, so I just have left them to okay. now take a decision on what they want to do with it. With the, yes. with the talent they have developed. I remember, I remember, I was so, that was the day my first one, when it was in UI. It was a, a, a choir, it was a pianist with yeah. a choir, youth choir. So he said there was a day he went to play squash. Mm. And, um, squash, which is also which picked I up also, from you.
they want to be. You know, so you, you, you hinted at the future, yes. and that brings to mind something that you started doing, yes. and which we at Plus TV are collaborating with you in further expanding, yeah. which is the good old days, the concept of comparing what's happening now yes. with what happened when we were growing up, yes. right? And we'll take a break very soon to talk about I mean, and then come back to talk about what led you to the good old days. Yeah. Why the concept? What are the challenges related to it? And yeah. what it is bringing forth as a tool of communicating with the society, especially the younger generation. Okay. We'll take a break now. Welcome back to Timeless Conversations. My guest is Shimori Badejo. We were talking about what led you to that decision yeah. to do something about the good old days while I was growing up and related to today, yes. like teaching history to the younger generation. Yes. Actually, let me first say that it was also another passion. Okay. And it was a challenge because... I was um, discussing with one of my children. I said, when we did our NYC, our allowance was 200 naira per month. And he said, it's not possible. He said, it can never be possible. Mm -hmm. that because how, he was wondering how we were surviving. So I realized that they lacked sense of history. Mm -hmm. Nobody was actually telling them anything. And they felt he never knew who Muritala was. He never knew... They all knew about the second coming of Obasanjo. Mm. They never knew anything about it. So I now look back and I felt that, look, how are we going to? Our children will lose that sense of history. So you don't blame them mm. if they see, if they become aggressive. They grew up when Nigeria was not as good as when we grew up. So they, they are aggressive. They tend to question and query everything we do with anger. Mm -hmm. So, I just chose to say, okay, fine. Even if history is, is, is not allowed in schools anymore, let us see how we can bring snippets of this history mm -hmm. so that by the time you tell your story, I tell my story, they can piece it together mm -hmm. and be able to say, this man, even if he's lying, this other person cannot be lying, mm -hmm. this one cannot be lying, and there is a common ground for them to begin to see what what we are talking about yes. so and it is actually it's 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 effective because now in this age of google yes in this age of google they are now they are now you know once they listen to something mm. they will want to go and, and google cross check and cross check yes. i remember when one of my guests talked about the muritala the assassination of muritala mm. and all of them I recall that one of them called me and said, ha, ah, so did we ever have a head of state that was assassinated in oh. Nigeria? I said, that's a graduate of about three years or four. Mm -hmm. Yes. I said, yes. I said, you can Google it. So it came back to me with information that I even never knew. Mm. It was now telling me about how Babangida, Dimka, and, uh, and one of them were Great friends. Mm. Uh, the, the Dom, um, no, what was it? Oh, Mama Mama and Vatsa. Vatsa. Yes. yes. How they were great friends. How it's because of their closeness that Danjuman had to ask Babangida to go and foil the coup. You know, he was now giving information about what happened. Now, what led him to that, that research? It's because of that episode. Yes. Now, he, he was now more educated about that era mm -hmm. of Nigerian history. Yes. And, I, and that encouraged me to want to continue to go on, check the values, check. Someone came and told me about how they were being flogged in school, mm. in his days in secondary school, for their inability to pay school fees. So one morning he told his dad, I'm not going to school today because, you know, you have not paid my school fees and I don't want to be you know, receiving canes every morning. Right. And if dad said, no, I'm going to follow you. 
He got to the school, he went to the principal's office, he said, well, I have come to take this guy's portion of cane this morning. And the principal said, why? He said, because he's a student, he doesn't work. It's my fault. Hmm. I'm the one that has not paid his school fees. So I'm the one that deserves to be punished, hmm. not this not boy. boy. I am not begrudging you for your position, for your, for what, for your decision. Hmm. But please, let me take this stroke of cane on his behalf. And I'll be coming every morning until I pay, pay. that school fees. And they said the principal just said, no, 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 I won't do that. So he exempted the boy from caning every morning. He said, in fact, from that day, they stopped caning them yeah. in school, in Elisha Grammar School. Mm. So this guy came to tell his story about how his dad used wisdom to change a system, a seemingly faulty system. system yeah. These days, there's going to be a problem mm. if you beat any any ah, child in school. Big time. These days, you know? <laughs> so we had, our fathers had some wisdom of, of, of addressing these issues. Mm -hmm. And we need to bring back those wisdom. We need to let them know that everything is not about protest. Everything yeah. is not about, mm. it's about looking at it holistically and finding a way. It should be to, a, a matter of constructive yes, engagement. So, so I'm happy that for over, over a period of time, we've had over 100 mm -hmm. guests mm. coming to talk. And I keep telling people, because this is a question I always, you know, I'm always faced with, what is the need for you? Why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. I said, I'm happy when this message is getting across to who it mm -hmm. is getting across to. I am not, it is not financially driven. Mm -hmm. It is just patriotically driven. Yeah. It is something that I feel that our children need. Yeah. And then, so that maybe you can reawake. Um, the Englishman said, comparison is odious, but it is the parameter for measuring progress. It's the, old, the, known, the best known parameter for measuring progress. Because you have to compare two things. You have to compare one error with another with one to another, say, okay, yeah. okay, if we started this, day, this way and we are here, so how do we move forward? Yeah. So I think the, the, the future, there is no future without our past. Our past so yes. we need to actually look back. Yoruba say, if we don't know where we are going, we should we at least know, know where we are where coming, coming from. from. But so, you know, I, in watching the series, and I've watched quite a few of them, uh, in fact, quite a number, I noticed something. Most of your guests are... Yorubas, or they grew up in the southwest, yeah. because I've seen a few people from Calabar, from yeah. uh, who are Ijaws, who either grew up in Ibadan or, or Lagos or Belkuta. Yes. Why do you plan to expand it to have a more national uh, yes. outlook? Yes. Actually, it was supposed to be a pan-Nigeria project. Mm but you start from your comfort zone, yes. those that you know. And because it is not commercially driven, we are actually not marketing it. Mm -hmm. We are not expending funds mm -hmm. into it. We just want people who believe in the idea to join us. If you actually feel that you have a story to tell, join mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And then what we have found out is that a particular sector, a particular section of the country they are more interested in this than others. Um, it's an eye opener mm. for us because once I mark, I invite you once, twice, thrice, I stop, you it's know, disturbing you yeah. because it is also conveying another meaning. You know, people now begin to feel, why are you so interested? Why are you so? Why are you this forceful about me coming on the program? Is there anything? Mm. Are you looking for political appointment or something? So wrong meanings are being read into our insistence or our persistence at times, yeah. when we particularly from some part mm -hmm. of the country. Yes. And I felt that, no, I would rather want people who will voluntarily want to. And we have been getting voluntary uh, guests. Yes. Those okay. who call from U.S. and say, look, I'm coming to Nigeria on social day, and before I return, I must, must. record my own episode. Okay. And we are getting all that. Yeah. And I believe that we just need to just sustain, we just continue. Mm -hmm. Those that are interested will have them on. Mm -hmm. 
And then I believe that over time, you know, we are going to get more people from other parts of the of country. The country to also come and tell their story. It's not like they don't have a past, they do. Yeah. And uh, shockingly too, I just found out that also, you know, there are, our level of patriotism, you know, it's, uh, some don't even believe in a Nigerian dream. Mm. Some don't feel that it is necessary. So why are you talking about Nigeria? This is Nigeria, there are so many nations in a nation. So some of, some people, their own uh, out, uh, out view, or what do I call Outlook it, is fundamental. It's yeah. fundamentally different. Yeah. So, but we will continue to push for as long as we have guests, we'll continue to go on. Okay, uh, I wish you the very best as you do that. Thank now, you. let's uh, look at the development of character. You narrated a story of how your dad yeah. disciplined you. Right, yeah. 114 strokes of the cane yes. at the age of 11. It was actually, even when he died, it was in my uh, eulogy to okay, him. Okay, to him. It's, it's, it's printed, it's yeah. written. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, that he, he, and you were his biological son. Yes. These days, people don't, or people hardly met out corporal, corporal punishment. punishment. Are you in that uh, school of thought? Well, I'm also for discipline. Mm. I believe in discipline. I believe that you have to train a child they had way the, in a way that you would not even want. But in future, you will, 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 yeah, will be thankful for it. But I also feel that it's not everything about caning. Mm -hmm. There are so many ways to skin a cat. So yeah. you can have, so we, we, we development has shown that you don't have to, you know, fool your own weight on beating and all of that, mm -hmm. you know. So discipline, yes, I am for discipline. But the mode of discipline, now we can begin to talk about, mm -hmm. okay, that was, that era, that was what they knew. Mm. Because I had bruises. I don't think I want to have any child go through that well, anymore. Well, <laughs> thankfully, they're all, they're all grown so, up now. So, 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 even when they were growing up, yes, I did some, some little, spanking. little bits in spanking and yes. all of that. But of course, I was conscious of the fact that it, it should never it should get not, to that. It should not get up to 50 <laughs> strokes. <laughs> no, no, not no. to talk of no, 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 no. Maybe the highest was six yes. or something, you know. Yes. But, but at least they, they had a feel yeah. of that punishment too, but yeah. it's not. And then we try also after maybe what our parents wouldn't do is after that punishment to find a way of reconciling with you mm -hmm. and then let you know where you went wrong. But we have moved beyond. So one, once you discipline, you also call them to let them know that, look, if you don't want this again, these are the issues. That, so, that brings to mind something. Yeah. In parenting, no matter what you read in books, and there are quite a lot of yeah. books out there, you find that there is a core necessity of ingenuity on your part as to how to engage. Yeah. Growing up, it, you, it must have happened to you, it happened to me, you would have been disciplined or reprimanded wrongly for something you were not responsible for. Yeah. And nobody would apologize to you. Severally. <laughs> <laughs> would you apologize to a child or would you advocate that, look, you need to apologize to that child in trying to build a relationship? Oh, oh, yeah. You see, I, I always say this. When I feel like this is the way, I tell, I tell them, this is how I feel. Mm. This is how I feel. You do it. I'll be the first to apologize if it's not working. Mm -hmm. So I think it builds some form of confidence. Okay. In them. I said, look, I don't hate you. Mm. I just feel this is the right way for you to. And if you insist you're going to have it your way, we'll look at the dangers involved in having it your way. So if you take that decision, if it boomerangs, mm. then the next time I advise you, you will take it. Mm. So, so vice versa. Yes. You know, so I think it is more of interaction now, mm. these days. 
It's more of interaction. It's more of persuasion. Mm -hmm. It's more of uh, making them see reasons why, convincing them on why mm -hmm. you know they should follow a path. We are also not always right. Yes, yeah, we are also not always right. So mm -hmm. I think it is engagement that we need to do more of engagement for us to even be able to understand them. Yes, you know we need to understand them. It's not just to come and lord it over them. Yes. We can talk to them, even the kind of music they listen to. Yeah. By the time we we'll talk to them and they will find out that some, some, some to me, some music, I would engage them and say, what is the guy actually saying? saying. Let's analyze, is it making any sense? Mm -hmm. Are you gaining anything from it? Yeah. You know, at times we we'll laugh over it, they say you are old school, old you don't school, understand. Yes, uh, Some, they can't even, under, they can't even interpret, yes, uh, but they are enjoying they're it. Enjoying it uh, they're the, enjoying it. They're enjoying it. It's the rhythm. Yeah, it's <laughs> just like someone told me, he said, uh, uh, one military officer years back, I said, why do you guys like um, music from Congo and all of that? Yeah. He said, eh. Is we are just enjoying the rhythm. Oh, yes. Because if you dance too well to Fela, they will say you are a rebel. Yeah, a rebel. So, <laughs> so, so, so let us, it is safe for us to listen to the music we don't understand. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But we just dance yes, to the uh, rhythm. Yes, so nobody uh, can accuse us of anything. So, yes. <laughs> so, so, which, which brings me to mind the fact that music, you, you are a music practitioner, maybe not on a commercial basis, yeah. but to the extent of understanding music, playing music and all that, church music, and yeah. even folk music. I'm yes. seeing some of the stuff yes. you do yes. these days. And I'm saying to you that as a practitioner of music, how would you describe the change that is building up in church music, for instance? You love singing hymns, performing yeah. hymns and all that. Many churches these days, they hardly do the hymns. Yes. Yeah. It's some music that was frowned on years yeah. back that now, that, the, that form is the accepted form now. Yeah. I, let me just summarize it. Say it is a struggle for membership hmm. that is driving a lot of innovations okay. in, in, the, in the, uh, the church uh, Certain. the settings. Um, like you rightly said, you know, some years, some sects don't even consider music. Mm -hmm. Some did chants. Yes. But we now find out that even in Orthodox churches, yes. we are moving away from these hymns that are so rich. Mm -hmm. I call them ministrations in songs. Yes. Some of these hymns, all you need to do is just read them. Mm -hmm. And then you begin to see that it's even more, it's even more it's spiritually robust. feeling. It's yeah. robust when you read than when you sing them. Mm. But you see, with the age and time, mm. we don't find that our children, they, they are now, they want to move into more funky pied things. And mm -hmm. that is why you will see the Orthodox churches losing membership to the Pentecostal set. Mm -hmm. Because the Pentecostal set have identified the niche and that gap in how to get, you know, people, Membership. members. Okay, fine. If I funkify the gospel, if I funkify these hymns, I'm likely going to get a lot of this, this audience. With me. So once they chose to do that, you know, our children now begin to feel that that's a comfort zone. For so well, they, they now move. Now you now find Orthodox churches fighting back mm -hmm. to say, okay, if that is the reason why you are going there, let me also we do, we do let it. me also do the same thing. <laughs> then you now find the Protestants yeah. also saying, okay, don't worry, enough of losing our members. Uh, we too. So so you now find out that at the end of the day, everybody is trying to retain their membership. Mm -hmm. Everybody is trying to see how they can get their congregations back. Wow. So. And that is the reason why you have a lot of, but some of us still believe, while we try to understand, we still believe that we should not lose sight of those richness in those hymnals. So that's why occasionally we find ourselves doing that just to take us back. It is all about good old days too. Yes. It's all about the good old days of, of, music of, of music in the church. hymns and all of that. All right, so, so we'll take another break now. Yeah. And when we come back, We'll continue 
our discussion with you, our conversation with you. Please stay tuned. Welcome back. It's still Timeless Conversations. Shimo Ibadejo is my guest. Now, Shimo, as we call it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I find that more convenient <laughs> and comfortable. <laughs> so, Even the gate man in my office calls me Shimo. Shimo, yes. So I'm good. <laughs> now, in your practice of communication, what have you found missing in our national life? that could be easily incorporated at little or no cost? Well, let me say, we have not documented our achievements so far as a nation, even as a company. Mm. I feel that the simplest definition of public relations, which also relates to a nation, is doing good and letting people know. Hmm. It's the simplest definition of public relations. And it cuts across, even as a nation. Yeah. Now, what we hear, it's people demarketing even their country. Hmm. You know, talking about, you know, ah, this country is finished. Yeah. This is that. That's scary. As, yeah, it's scary. And, and, how do you, and then you still want that company, and you are still hoping that it will be better when you are demarketing it. Mm -hmm. And then how do you want outsiders to see? How do, it's not a lot of things happen in the US that we don't get to know. Never. We don't get to know. But here, we are the first to first condemn our system, condemn mm -hmm. our country. Uh, there is this quote that says, for all forms of government, let mm -hmm. fools contend. Whatever that is best administered is best. We have our own situation of doing things. I remember I was the a technical writer to Nigeria's Vision 2020. Mm. And um, I, I, I wept when I realized the enormity of the richness, mm. you know, that is deposited in us as a nation. My submission then was that America is not God's own country. Nigeria is. Mm. Because we, have, we are endowed. Mm. Let's leave oil. In fact, oil should be like 3% of our natural resources. Mm. Go to Ondo State there. We have the second largest deposit of bitumen in the world, in the world. that are untapped or that are illegally being mined, being, being, being taken Tapped. away. Mm. Go to Elisha. Mm. That's why the radio station there is Gold FM. Yeah. Elisha has the third largest deposit of gold in the world. Are you kidding? Oh, yes. And then we have some Lebanese feeding fat illegally mm. on those things there and giving villagers peanuts and all of that. Go to Shaki. Mm. You have iron. Before you dig six feet into the ground, you get iron. And a lot and lot of it. Go to Oshobo, where we, have, we used to have old glass. Mm. Oh, the, 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 the raw materials, the new, the, 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 what you need to do that, it's just drive towards Oshobo from the Is that Oshobo, Oluwa glass? Is that in Oshobo or in uh, Okitipupa? No, no, it's in Oshobo. Really? Yes. If you drive towards Ikwetu to Oshobo, you will find that the soil that you even see yeah. are shining. Mm -hmm. these, these, these mineral resources are there in abundance. A lot of it. You want to go to the north? There are so many things that we have we have overlooked. We are all pursuing crude oil and all that. Or that we don't That's understand. It. Or we chose to because we feel that crude oil is giving us easy money, free money, good money, fast money. Mm -hmm. And we are not looking at those areas. To me, as a nation, we must continue to push our good side, our, our potentials, yes. so that the whole world can see that it's not hopeless. Yeah, our nation, our, our, see, that, that's something that we need to play into our communication arts. Yes. And I'm referring now to our movies, our plays. Oh, yes. They don't portray so much or anything of positivity. Yes, it is sad. 
There are so many ways we can communicate our essence as a nation. Even in the movies, to me, I tell my, my son who read the other, I said, Nigeria is still a virgin when it comes to telling our story. Mm -hmm. We have not said enough. I mean, what we do is even unreal. Mm. When we now, even if you look at the movie today, you see accident scenes, you will laugh. Yeah. You know, so we are, we, 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 we are jokers when it comes to even the way we present our story. Mm. So there's a, there's a lot of vacuum in that area. It is not even the way we tell our commercial story. Yes. Even when we do hard bats, mm. at times they don't portray reality. Yes. So in all spheres of communication, we should continue to strive to want to portray reality. We want to be able to have in mind that look, this is coming this is a Nigerian product. Mm -hmm. How do we I was telling I saw an advert. It, I went to South Africa, a Cape Town, there's a bank, and I saw that advert, black women, they were, you know, filing out from a bush path. Some of them were carrying bananas, mm -hmm. yam, and there was this white man in their midst carrying portfolio and with suit and tie. Mm. And the only copy that you had on that commercial, we understand the African market. Huh. That shows that, look, we are coming to do business with these people well, and we are. understand them. We know the way they are. But what, what do we get here? We are always trying to want to be like them over there. Mm -hmm. Why can't they come and be like us and see that value mm. that we are presenting? Yeah. So we have a lot to do in communication, in orientation, mm. in mobilization, in sensitization. Yeah. We have a lot to do. And it's, it's so vast, it's, it's, it's unending. Mm. As long as we continue to, our, our TV stations, our radio stations, what are we doing? Is it, ah, those days, yeah. there are a lot of commercial messages, social, yeah. messages. social messages. How yeah. many of that do we have today? Yeah. How many of such, such are we having, yeah. even on television? Even on, how are we helping our nation? Mm. Fake drugs and all of that. There are social messages mm -hmm. on that. But how much of that? We have allowed commercial considerations mm. to take over our role as a moral guide here mm -hmm. to the people. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I want to see a situation where we begin to have such, yes. and then it will help uh, to, to, to develop our psyche mm -hmm. as a nation. And then people will now be, I want it to go viral. Mm -hmm. Things like that, social messages, let yeah. it go viral, let people know about the val I, I, the BCOS when it started, there was one man said, Good name is better than gold and silver. Yes. You know, and he was singing it he in that area, yeah. English. Even OGBC used to do stuff yes, like that. Yes, something like that. Yes. So, so how many of that are we doing these days? Mm. And if we can still recall all these things, that means it had some influence on us. Sure. It does. There were even some that were done by late uh, icon Ray Mike Wachuku. Yes, you yes, understand yes. That, that were played on RN2. Yes. And you identified with them. Uh, your highway is not a road, a track. Yes, yes. No, yes. Matter what, no, matter no matter how, how tempting, tempting. Never yes. Speed, yes. remember uh, those you left at home oh, are waiting to, to welcome, welcome you, you safely say. back home. How we wish you a safe journey. How many of that? That was we, engagement. How many of that do we have these yeah. days? How many? And then all we want is. Oh, viewership, one million. Yeah, but you could also think, could it be that at those points in time, those stations were government owned? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Even now, yeah. and now, now, yes. we must not, that is why I said everything is on commercial, yeah. you know, value now. But at least, we are agents of change. Mm -hmm. Yes. The media is supposed to, generally, whether mm -hmm. it's privately owned or we are agent of change. And then even if, they take it as a CSR, mm. a corporate social responsibility, yeah. and devote some time, you know, to those. So it's not That's all about true. money, you know, it's all about impact in the society. Which is why we are running 
Yes, I know, and yes. that's, that's, that's why it's I just I, I, I appreciate that. Okay, yes, let's because our audience is a young audience, yes. so we want to say, okay, some there was a time that this was like that. Yes, you know, talking about a time when something was like that, I recall that Elisha means a lot to you. Oh yes, right. Uh, and I was have, born you were and born I grew up there in Elisha, <laughs> and then there's Ijebu, Ijebu which yes. is your yes. a, hometown. A hometown. Yes. So if you were to take your children to the hometown, where would you take them? Of course, Ijebu, because that's the, that's my town. No Elisha. No Elisha. They heard about Elisha, but you see. There is a, you know, we still tell me stories in Lisha that you are not one of us. So. Oh, then actually they do that <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> so there is no place like home. No matter how long you stay in you stay the place, yeah. the people will still tell you that, look, you better go and find your father's house, you know, and all of that. So so and my parents, after retirement, and they went, back, went back home. home. That's so, good. So, so, that's good. So, so, so that's, that's the... You, you, you yeah. see, I asked that question because we have a problem with this issue of you belong here, you don't belong there. Yes. Where you find yourself living for a particular number of years, say anything beyond 10 years, you pay tax there and all that, yes. should be home to you. Oh, yes. Oh, but yes. politically, sometimes it's difficult to engage. It is. It is, particularly in Nigeria. Yes. Particularly in Nigeria, when you aspire mm -hmm. to, that is when people will remind you of your roots. Yeah, exactly. You know, meanwhile, you have you have spent the better part of your life in a particular. But when you aspire for a leadership position, mm -hmm. or and then people will tell you, not you one of us. You don't. It's not one of us. It also, you don't. But you don't been, if, how do we get out of that bind? <laughs> well, like I said, it's also a mindset thing. Mm. It's a leadership. It's a leadership thing. Mm. If our leaders can actually say, "Look, enough of this," we are also going to use. We are going to. Whatever we're doing here is based on merit. Mm -hmm. It is not about where you come from. It's if you are the one that can deliver, so let it happen. Mm -hmm. um, until our leaders begin to take decisions based on merit and not from where you come from. We can't on our own do that we'll since do we that. don't we have couldn't. a choice. So it is a collective resolve from the leadership to say, look, I'm going to... I'm going to uh, I'm going to allow the best to have a say in mm. this matter. Once it's it's like that, then we'll continue to, you know, to 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 thrive. So, in conclusion, let me ask you a question that takes you back to your relationship with your dad. Okay. Right, and what you took away from him. I recall the story of when he was ill and all that. Yeah. You had to go there. Yeah. You played. Uh, yeah. Uh, some hymns to him. He yeah. raised his hands in recognition of those. And when you played the ones that were s sounding hope, mm -hmm. hope, he dropped his hand. <laughs> yes. And when you played the one that was saying, okay, okay. Uh, take the name whatever of Jesus with you, whatever, you, whatever, whatever it is, it is with just, you. Yeah, and then he yeah, raised his hand that that's where you should be going. Yes. And then you were called that comeback. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you refused to go see him. Yes. When, uh, oh no, not, that's not the right way. You refused to taint your image of him, yes. right? That I'd rather see him as a victorious person yes. than when he's dead. I'm How not was that like you? I'm not you? sure I would have survived seeing him give up the ghost. Okay. You know, because we were so close at, mm -hmm. you know, later part of his life that mm -hmm. I can't even, I can't even, I won't be there to see him just take that last breath. <laughs> I mean, it's going to affect me. So, you. so I felt that the best thing I could do for this man is just allow him to go in peace mm -hmm. and retain the picture that I saw while he was alive. Okay. And I think it, it has to do with the emotion, yes, you know, the understand. emotional attachment that I had mm -hmm. with him. And when, when he was taken to the morgue and I got there, I saw him, I actually ran away, for, you know, but something just held stopped me, held me back and said, look, this man died at 88. Mm. He had done his bit. Yes. You know, one day, someday, your children will bring you to, if not this place, yes. somewhere, somewhere like this place. Yes. So go back and celebrate him. You know, and that was how I was able to get out of, 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 out of it. So I just went back and said, sir, you have done your bit, we will celebrate you. Mm. And we will continue to celebrate you. That's, that's, so that's, uh, did you both share 
the love or preference for particular or similar hymns? Oh, he was actually my influence in all my choices of hymns. Yeah. And that's why for eight years now, we've been running a musical concert, okay. but we, a musical competition mm. in the whole of Ijebu land, okay. all Methodist churches in Ijebu. Every Easter Saturday, we always have a competition amongst all the members of the choir okay. to donate musical instruments in his name. In his name, okay. Yes, in my parents' name, my mom too. Yeah. Was a singer. Yeah. Like she had her compositions. Mm -hmm. that also tried to produce, yeah. you know. And we do that. Give musical instruments. Give cash prize and all of that. And people are. We are building a generation of hymn lovers. Mm -hmm. Those who would who would see hymns as ministration in songs. Okay. And then those who are also. Who want to learn one or two musical instruments, but they can't afford it. So mm. we give them, we give them out every year, and then they are happy. And I'm sure that in the nearest future, we'll begin to see them as stars in gospel music. We produce a gospel artist a year, oh, you as do a that? free of charge, oh, okay. and then we we'll do it to the point of launching their albums with musical videos. Oh. This is the third year we're going to do that. We've been now. doing that. We've been doing that all free. Oh, pro bono. And we also like to celebrate our icons too. Yes. Like uh, Jimmy Sholanke, Onkutuju yes. Yelano. Uh, mm -hmm, we want mm -hmm. to celebrate some of them. We don't want to, them to die on song. On song. We don't, we, 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 I remember, I recall what we did for Onkutuju Yelano during his 83rd birthday. Mm. That song, he never recorded it. Mm. It was when the military took over in 1983. Yes. Oh, yes. And sure. then we did it, sent to him in UK. He wept like a baby. Oh, wow. He said he thought Nigerians have forgotten him. Hmm. And I was happy we were able to do that when he was alive. Yeah. We did for Orlando Julius too. Mm -hmm. He was happy, yeah. you know, in his, in his weak moment. Hmm. You know, we thank God for the life of Uncle Jimmy Shulanka. He's still healthy and, uh, yeah. you know, and he did also, we did. So yeah. I like to celebrate our icons. I like without, I just use my God-given resources to do all okay. of this because I believe in the fact that we don't have to, because how do we want the ones coming up so if they feel that nobody will reward them for what they are doing, they look for quick money. Yes. And drop substance. And even it's uh, funny that uh, these days the, um, the mu level of musicianship is dropped. Yes. You understand me? So there's a lot of sampling and all that. Uh, yeah. Everybody yes. gets in and then he sings it. Some songs you can't even relate to them. Yes. But they say we are old school. <laughs> so <laughs> I had cause to, to deliver a lecture in yeah. Dubai for corporate players. Yeah. I won't mention the name of artist oh, now, sure, so sure. that it's not going to look yeah, like yeah, I'm sure. promoting an artist. Sure. And I, I addressed this, this, the, the corporate players, and I told them, I said, look, it's good to have a popular artist to drive your crowd, mm. to have 10, 1 million audience who will come and sing what they want to hear. Mm. Have you considered just one artist that will sing morals. Mm. Even if you just want to infuse him, if you just want to give him 10 minutes mm. to address that audience that mm -hmm. you have. That massive audience. That massive audience. Mm. You might be surprised that maybe 100 people will go home with a message. Mm -hmm. Not the kind of vulgar ones that you want mm -hmm. to, because that's how you want to pull your crowd. Yeah. Fine. But do you think as your own CSR, get an artist that is going to at least appeal to the consciousness, to the mind of this youth. Yeah. So that when they get to it, this man is making sense. Mm -hmm. They said no, hmm. that all is about bottom line. Okay. okay, well, the bottom line for us is that we are out of time now. So, yeah, let yeah. me thank you so much, Emo, for coming. It's been it's a lovely a session talking to you. And uh, we wish you the very best as thank you, you keep trodding the path of the good old days. Thank you. And contributing your own quota to our nation, Nigeria.
Thank you very much for coming. Yeah, it's been it's nice. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, same here. Yeah. My guest today has been Shemore Badejo, PhD, and the Knight of Charles Wesley, that's KCW. Yes. All right, and he's someone who is a multi-instrumentalist and a committed uh, artist and uh, communications practitioner. Thank you so much for coming. Until we bring in another guest, stay tuned and keep with us. On the breakfast, the Central Bank of Nigeria has directed commercial banks to dispense and receive the old Naira notes as legal tender across the country. But what effect will this have on the cash crunch being experienced all over Nigeria? Also on the breakfast, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has said the reconfiguration of the bimodal voter registration system will be completed today in preparation for the March 18 governorship and state assembly elections. We'll look at some of the reactions that are trailing this action by the electoral umpire. And as usual, we'll be taking a look at what the national dailies are saying today, we'll bring you analysis of some of the headlines on front pages of today's newspapers. All these ahead on The Breakfast, right here on Plus TV Africa. All right, a very good morning to you. It's another day of discussions and interesting analysis right here on Plus TV Africa. The Breakfast is live. My name is Kofi Bartels. You're welcome. And I am Messi Boko. It's good to be back on your screen. Good morning. All right, uh, lots to talk about uh, today, Mercy. Uh, we'll be looking again at the Beaver situation and, of course, uh, also looking at the latest uh, as far as uh, the um, Naira is concerned. Of course, we all know the breaking news from last night uh, with the Central Bank of Nigeria. So we have a buffer package and we implore our viewers to sit down, relax, and be a part of the conversation. We usually start things off uh, with uh, trending uh, stories and, of course, um, we have something for you. Can we roll the tape? Uh, this is something that uh, a lot of people have never seen before. All right, there's nothing that some of the lot of people have never seen before, uh, but it has to do with the Naira and also has to do with um, shredding. You know, when you have uh, papers and you want to, you know, 
you know, make waste of them. You don't want to just keep them, especially sensitive documents, you take them through a shredder. Well, um, there was um, a dump site that was located of, of shredded Naira notes, old Naira notes, and it caused a lot of Nigerians on social media to express some frustration and anger uh, when this uh, dump site containing old shredded Naira notes uh, were found or was found. Let's listen to this, and when we come back, we'll give you more on the background, and then we analyze it. What is this? this? All right, so that's a, an interesting one. Um, uh, what happened there was uh, some persons stumbled upon a, a dump site of um, shredded Naira notes and uh, was surprised and put it on video, went on social media, and then uh, shared it. And people are commenting, saying, you know what, uh, this is really sad. Amidst the scarcity of uh, Naira, uh, you are wasting or throwing away uh, a hard-end money, if you want to call it that, uh, money that we can use to buy stuff or that can be given to the public. So that's that. And uh, I mean, I'm just looking at that. I'm just I'm still thinking about it. I'm not sure that, you know, picture would ever leave my mind. And uh, I'm just wondering what's really the rationale behind all of that. I mean, is there no other way uh, that we could probably have um, attended to that without having to shred it, just like you have mentioned. Now, if you also look at that, just yesterday you had the uh, CBN giving that directive. It feels like everyone has been waiting. So what, what exactly now happens that, you know, all of this spawns? And if you look at it, there were the old Naira notes. I saw a bit of a 500 and 1,000, and that's gone. So um, wouldn't there be, or wouldn't we have had, or those involved had other options rather than shredding, you know, the funds uh, as they have done? and. Um, I'm just asking myself what exactly uh, could be the rationale behind all of that. So, but... Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the question on my mind will be, um, is that a private shredded, shredded, shredded dump note, uh, Naira note, or, uh, or is this government shredded dump note? I would like to know. Because uh, if it's private, of course, it would be really stupid. Why am I saying it's stupid? Because... It's public information that you can take your Naira notes, despite the uh, uh, the expiration of the old Naira notes, to any commercial bank or the Central Bank of Nigeria, anytime. All right, and then it will be redeemed in the current currency according to the Electoral Act. So it's it's there. The the Central Bank has made that known. Uh, the government has made it known. The, um, the lawyers who uh, challenged the Central Bank said it before. And the media has been discussing it. So it's not people have been taking their notes to the central bank. Videos are all over the place. So I, I, I mean, I would like to believe that is not a personal stash of cash. Someone said, oh, no more Naira note. Oh, Naira. I could not be the deadline. And they destroyed it. Now, second thing is, you remember last month, there was a viral video of um, some destroyed old Naira notes. I don't know if you remember that. And people were making a lot of noise about it. And then it was revealed that the central bank, from time to time, um, redraws uh, 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 um, mutilated, uh, disfigured, and old Naira notes from the system and prints new ones. They have a budget for this. And actually, the people who are giving contracts to dispose of the old notes, that's their, their contract. They have that con They pay them okay, to, to dispose of these old notes. Central bank doesn't do it themselves. You know. So... I think people should not be alarmed. Nobody's money is being shredded. People's monies are safe. If this is still an official thing, then it may be the dumb sight of one of the contractors of the central bank who um, has, has had to dispose of old notes before now. Okay? So I think there's nothing to be alarmed about uh, you know, in this situation. Um, if the gov government says they're going to increase, the, the central bank says they're going to increase the amount of of um, a liquid in circulation, or amount of currency in circulation, they will increase it. There's nothing that stops them. If they say they're going to reduce it, they reduce it. There's nothing that stops them. But your money is intact, 
Okay, so I don't think this is a problem for me, Mercy. I don't think this is, is a problem. Well, we have to move on. Moving away from that, let's quickly take a look. Now, as we inch closer to the elections that was uh, postponed, uh, if you like to say, to the 18th of March, it was supposed to be on the 11th of March. Now, uh, this weekend, all things being equal, that election would happen. The governorship elections and the State House of Assembly election. Now, in some states, not entirely, because there are some states that are not uh, within that calendar. Now, a lot's been going on. Politicking has not ended. And so we have seen the Lagos State Governor, who has been really, really on the news, I mean, almost everywhere. Now, this one is quite interesting because he went to church. So let's take a quick look at this video where Sean Wolu, uh, the Governor of Lagos State, went to church. Okay, so I, I'm being told that we don't have the tape to roll, but uh, he, according to the reports and all that we saw, he visited two churches uh, here in Lagos, and apart from the churches, there's been other places that he's been visiting. I mean, sometimes I see this picture or, or pictures, and I begin to ask myself, could this be a Photoshop, or is this real? Yeah, yeah, messy. Uh, so, 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 so the, the, you're absolutely right. The, uh, the, the governor of Lagos State um, uh, is a Christian. He goes to church. Okay, so I think we can we can see. We, can we listen to what? Okay, we can, let's just let's just listen to this, and then we'll come back for the analysis. It's, it's such. It's great to have you here. Uh, you know, I just got the. You know, I didn't know it was going to come, but it's a pleasure. And, more than the fact that he's a governor, he's also our brother in Christ. Yes, he's also our brother in Christ. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Please, we may have our seats. All right, but the pastor said something which I, I'm hoping we can still air. You know, he said something which I'm hoping we can still air. What he said was, Governor Babajiri Saolu, you're welcome to church. Great to have you here. Um, he said, uh, as a pastor, I wasn't aware that a governor was coming to service. And um, I was really happy to have him, you know. Uh, he's uh, a governor of the state. That's number one. Number two, he's a brother in Christ. So you're welcome. Now, this the first tape we rolled, if we can do some 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 silent rolling. Now, you see that the governor was um, uh, doing a, a meet and greet at the church. Fantastic. We see the governor was doing some meet and greet at the church. We can see that uh, he's um, greeting the... Uh, the congregants. Mercy, can you see the surprise on the, some of the faces out there? Um, some people coming out and being shocked that, oh, the governor is greeting us. Now, some, some persons say, ah, why is the, the governor so desperate? Uh, he's going out to greet church members, you know, uh, look at how desperate he is. But you can see possibility, though, of Harvesters International Christians, and we must point out that's the name of the church, okay, also beside him. And I said to people yesterday, what if, you know, the governor was leaving and Pastor Baji was, so Pastor, please, I have to go and greet my members. This is what I do after every service. And the governor said, oh, I'll come with you. Okay? Or what if the, the pastor said, oh, Pastor, uh, your excellency, can you come with me? I'm going to greet some members. I'm sure they would like to meet you. You know? <laughs> what about that? So, 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 so people, people cannot sit you down in their bedrooms and paint a story that, oh, the governor went and then was started begging to greet people and wanted to... No, we don't know. We yeah, don't know. You can see the pastor by his side. Kofi, um, Kofi, see, <laughs> you and I, I'm planning not to, because from the way you're sounding, I, I'm almost laughing, but I don't want to laugh. It's not because, you know, I shouldn't, you know, well, I shouldn't laugh. It's to prolong your life. So, so uh, my, my point here is, Kofi, please, and please, and to every other person, let's not even uh, try to make a fuse about this. The reason why this, we're talking, we're even talking about this is because it's extraordinary. I mean, yes, we know he's a Christian or every other person is a Christian. So, but how many times, you know, has he been to church and or just visited any church within the past how, uh, years? Uh, let's look at it before 2023 is the question. And so that's the reason why everybody's talking about this. And if you walk in church very well or you understand how the church operates, there's a unit called the meet and greet. Tango, you're the one who said it. These persons are usually outside to welcome people when they come to church and also greet them when they're out of church. And that's it. So I wouldn't really understand now in typical church setting, because I grew up in church and I understand the dynamics of church, especially the Pentecostal churches. Now, this is not to even say, oh, there's anything wrong with what he has done. But, you know, this is speaking to the fact that there's a lot. This might just be because he is 
um, you know, vying to come back or to retain the position that he's currently, uh, you know, holding. That's uh, been the pastor, I beg your pardon, now you hear me saying he's been the pastor, that's been the governor of Lagos State. And so that's really where this is coming from. Now, usually in churches, the churches that I have seen, and in, you know, the doctrine seems to be like the practice if you have someone very prominent visiting the church. There's always where the pastor takes them to the, you know, their offices and then they sit down and before you say X, Y, Z, they're not usually in company of people and then they, you know, zoom into their cars and then they're out of it. So it's very, very difficult, including very prominent pastors that visit other churches, you know, to have them stand and greet. How many times? What was the last time you saw that? So I don't think that if people are beginning to express concern and then they are beginning to wonder and saying, oh, this is an act. Apart from that, within the past few days, you, we have also seen, I'm asking if these pictures are real because I don't want to believe them. And not to say that it's not possible to happen because I have seen pictures of him making, you know, like in the salon, he's in the phone shop fixing the phone, he's in the car, you know, the mechanic stores is fixing what exactly is okay. responsible for all of this yeah. gesture mm. just as we inch closer to the election. So I'm not sure, but I'm being told that we have another yeah, table. Mer Mer Mercy, we will we'll go over to Zion, uh, the Zion Prayer Movement Outreach. Have you heard of them before? I haven't. Now, um, the Zion Prayer Movement Outreach is, from what I gather, one of the, the churches, the church in Lagos, so the, one of the largest Igbo dominated uh, population. Let's, let's take a look. Thank you very much, Zionists. People of God, thank you very much. 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 Thank you, thank you. On behalf of the government of Lagos, I want to first thank God Almighty, the giver of life, the Lord yesterday, today, and forever, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one that was, that is, that will always be, the Rose of Sharon, the I am that I am, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, for bringing each and every one of you here today. And secondly, I want to thank the man of God, my very good friend and brother, the great evangelist, Zionist of our time, Evangelist Ebuka, I want to thank God for his life. I want to thank God for his ministry. I want to thank God for the friendship that he has shown to me. And I want to thank him that he has continued to put us in prayers. And I'm here to see things for myself. I've sent people here on two, three occasions, and I know that indeed, the Zion is, God is with you. God Almighty brings all of you here together. I want to thank you, and I want to thank him. And I want to say that it's indeed an honor to have allowed me to come in here this afternoon. And I can see the great work that is happening here. These are men, these are women that I've chosen for God. And miracle, this ministry will continue to grow from strength to strength. And the man of God, his anointing will not diminish. Your prayer on him will not diminish. He will use him for greater and bigger things in this ministry. And so shall it be. For us as a government, you know I'm your humble servant. I've come here to thank you, Avrance, to say to you that I am a governor that will work for all of you. That will work for all of you. That's a lot of prophecy there. Uh, yeah, prophecy. Mercy, I wish we had the opportunity to see when he walked in um, uh, to the ministry. Oh, we need to hear the song they were singing. They, they actually were singing some nice Akanshawa music, you know. It's a and, yes, and then the old people were dancing. And then they, they, they switched it to the governor's name. Really? And then when he went in, it was so overwhelming. The love the governor was shown, mm. the, the overwhelming support, you know, and love. And, and then they were singing his name. Mm. And it was so overwhelming. The governor could not help but he had to dance. Mm. Oh, you know when they said David dance? Mm. The only difference in David's dance and all those dance was that David took off his clothes. Mm. That's the only difference. But the governor really danced. Um, you know, I saw some, some, some clips on some, some comments on, on Twitter. Someone took the governor dancing and then cut a part of where the crowd, you know, waving their hands.
just just a, a, a second or two seconds, and or three seconds, and then she said, "Oh, that obedience were rejecting the governor," which was a blatant lie. Mm. The question is, who went to put that video on Twitter, mm. and okay. then and put that caption that obedience in the church were rejecting the governor? That's why the hands were up. Well, in actual in reality, they were actually dancing with the handkerchiefs. Mm. Well, well, and, well. and and then, sorry, Mercy. Another thing is, people said, "Oh." He's going about uh, to this church, and you know, these churches because it's election time. For crying, for God's sake, when is campaign time? What do politicians do? They sit at home. Mm. You know, when is campaign time? Do politicians sit at home and drink tea? They go out to campaign. So, so, but, but, but I'm, I'm coming. But uh, in, interestingly, um, evangelist uh, um, uh, Ebuka mm, okay. of um, this uh, Zion Prayer Network Outreach. He said that someone has been participating in their services, in their programs for some years now. Mm. Now he sent he, he sent his uh, chief, uh, his uh, chief of staff or secretary of the state, government of the state, and sometimes he will send a uh, commissioner with with a speech to come and read from him at their services when they invite him. So he's been going. Mm. I have it on good account that that someone has been attending other churches, mm. you know, programs for harvesters. I hear he's been even inviting uh, Pastor. Uh, um, uh, Bolajido to government house and all these things. Mm. Can we talk about um, House on the Rock? He's been going. Pastor's appreciation. He was there. Mm. Um, the experience. He was there. The only reason someone didn't go for the last experience is because his commissioner after insults in 2021 went to House on the Rock mm. and was booed and probably had it on. He was advised, okay, stay away from but the government of Lagos State still gave a speech at the experience. Mm. So it would be un unfair to say Samolu is only going to church only because his campaign. We've not been seeing him before now. Of course, he's going for campaign. No, so, so but but the, tru the truth Kofi, is that, Kofi, uh, just to buttress my point, the truth is that he has been going to churches before now. Where he has been going to churches when he is invited to go to church. And that's on a different, oh. you know. I don't think that you oh, were, were messy, Kofi, messy. Kofi. Let's, let's not see, so you say he's been going to church. Uh, it, it's not that you were there and you saw when he went to these churches. But if you say, it's yeah. just very normal. What do you say? Uh, normal, should, should I show you? Kofi, Kofi, it's, Kofi. It's, Kofi, the Kofi, is free. Kofi, uh, okay, just like you were making your point, yeah? Um, usually in churches, it's just very normal that uh, in church service, especially the Pentecostal church and other churches, that it's okay to have you. you were, I'm sure that you probably would have been invited as a guest to honor some, you know, church uh, denomination and gathering. Did he and not which go? is, no, wait, wait, I'm, I'm trying to put a point here. That yes, he's been honoring invitation because he's a public figure. And most times you have, like you just mentioned, appreciation service, all of that, the experience. It's not that, you know, in some of these gatherings and experiences or, you know, congregation, it's not that these persons voluntarily show up like every other regular person does in most cases. They are usually on the, you know, the list of invitations. I mean, you're usually invited as guests. And so, yes, he's been in the honoring his invitation, but, you know, is there anywhere that you have said that he just sat down voluntarily and he told you that he went to these churches? And it's okay. Look, just like you have said that, you know, people politic, politicians politic when there's a period of politicking. And so that's exactly what's going on. So I just think that it's okay for the people to express their concern. It's, it's a wonder. And my grandmother and, and, would say and, and, it's and an American wonder. it's not okay for people to express. What no, else? no, no. I'm just saying that if people are saying, that's oh, he's, he's actually going there because of the election, isn't it? No, no, <laughs> are you no. I've also said that you know don't, during don't get me wrong. I'm no not during saying, not, during campaign yeah, and yeah. politicking that you know politicians campaign and politic and so if the people are saying oh he's going to church now uh, we're seeing him visiting church did you hear what the pastor uh, pastor Bolaji said and unfortunately we're able to play that tape where you you also you know recounted some of the things that he said he said I didn't know he was coming so no but it was a different thing when he went to Zion Church apparently they knew he was coming. And it wouldn't have been a coincidence when they started singing his well, song. Yeah, and Messi, praises. interesting point. I really do not have. I really do not have. I really do not have any when, problem. Whether, whether you I mean. were you were invited, Mercy, sorry, whether you were invited or whether you were not, you know, the fact the point the point I'm making is this: that there are arguments out there. Some people are saying, "Oh, it's only because his campaign that's why he's going to church." Look at his desperate. He seems to be greeting people, shaking their hands. Then the first thing I say, we don't know how that meet and greet occurred. Whether he was dragged there by the pastor, whether the pastor was going to do his thing. He said, please, but the election say after. He said, I will join you. And then it just happened to be uh, a spur of the moment con thing. Con conjunction. Not, well, not con oh, con I want to greet your people so I can shake down the campaign. No. He actually gave a speech in the church. That's number two. 
um, the narrative that he does not attend church functions or he's not been going to churches before now is, is debunked. Whether he was invited or whether he went on his... What I'm saying is he's been going before now. Thirdly, some of these people who are criticizing Saulo for going, the candidate that they support has been going to churches left, right, and center, and nobody complained about it. So what is the hula baloo? about you, you know the reason oh, what is the no, halabaloo, halabaloo no, i mean about, kofi before this all the time you remember that when i started you know reacting to this like for as, as a person and i really i really i think that the reason we're talking about this is because it's unusual <laughs> we get to talk about what is unusual that's what news is about that's what top trending is about now and it's top trending because this is actually what we've not seen in a very long time how many governors have you seen it's, it's, governors, it's trending Kofi, because people are talking about it no it, yes because yes. they haven't seen this kind of wonder and yeah, my grandmother would say it's an american wonder she well. says american <laughs> wonder <laughs> I, I remember vividly you know see we see governors i have been Kofi, you know how these things actually work. And I don't think that we, you know, anybody should lose sleep over this. We already understand that politicking, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people would you know, take any strategy, any, any kind of form. So how about, okay, let's even move away from the church that we saw and all of that and the statement that he gave until he was even praying. He, he was so spiritual. And okay, where was he prophesied? Where was prophesied? Oh, he said, he said yeah, he prophesied. He <laughs> said, you know, he said your, your prayers will be answered. Yes. It was actually prophesied. Exactly. You know, and it was, it was interesting. <laughs> you know, and, and there's election, nothing wrong with that. There's election there's period is where that. you see politicians <laughs> preaching. My mother was one time, God's like, Pabio, was, he started preaching. I was like, my God, <laughs> you know. But we have to, we have and, to. And these messages are very powerful messages. I'm, I'm you know, these prophecies are I'm very powerful, you. you know. Okay, we have, we but, have but to But we move need on. to go. Yeah, uh, a fire action. incident very quickly at, um, in Kanu State, Kanu State Fire Service uh, uh, yesterday confirming that the fire had raised um, uh, some improvised shops uh, in the upper building of uh, the old Savannah Bank. Do you remember Savannah Bank? I heard of that name. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, the old Savannah Bank at uh, Singer Market in Kano, um, according to the uh, public relations officer of the fire service, you know, the inferno started at about 2.18 a.m. These things start at very early, you know, when nobody is awake. Uh, and they received a distress call at midnight uh, that there was a fire outbreak at the market, which is in Fage, local government area of Kano State. Remember Professor Fage who comes on? on the program. I don't know if that is uh, his local government. So they said that they sent their personnel uh, to the scene of the incident at about 2.22 a.m. Uh, to put up the fire so as not to affect other shops. Um, so you, that's that. Messi, we just add to this, the oil mill market in Port Harcourt also experienced a fire uh, yesterday. And that also started at, at, at night or at dawn when no one was in the market. So these market fires are back. Mm. And, and really, Kofi, just like every other time we, you know, lend a voice to fire incidents across the country, whether it happens in Lagos or Kano, Abuja, wherever it is, it's almost one and the same thing. And I'm hoping that, you know, in 2023, we'll build on, uh, all hands would be on deck, we would be, we'll take responsibility. Now, as for firefighting or the firefighters, uh, we have them across the 36 states of the Federation. I'm sure that also with the FCT. But there's always a challenge as to whether we have the resources to fight this fire. Uh, apart from having a firefighting you know, station and what have you, an agency of, of, of government, are we also living up to the expectation of educating the people? Are we also looking out for... Um, making provisions to ensure that those who are caught in the issue, I mean, because most fire incidents are not just, you know, accidents. You have cases of arson and what have you. And so what are we doing in terms of education? So it's okay to say, hey, we have a responsibility to fight fire. But it's also your responsibility as a fire agency to ensure that the fire doesn't happen in the first instance. And that's what we talk about, education and awareness. You know, whatever means that we have to reach out to the people constantly creating awareness, especially in our market. Now, if you also look at the kind of structures that we have over time, for the lack of planning and, you know, structures, you find out that you have a cluster of structures. I mean, everywhere seems to be very clumsy, and that's also an issue. So uh, if we grow big on it, this is not, you know, uh, a situation. This is not a, a phenomenon that we should leave to the hands of government alone. All hands should be on deck. Everyone should be concerned. And I think by this, we're going to have... 
at this point in time, I'm looking at our markets across, which we ought to have like fire stations in the market where we are able to, you know, take care of the fire, take off the fire whenever, you know, there's an incident of fire, you know, set up all of the alarms, the structure, have, you know, security and all of that. But we can't continue like this because government's responsibility is to ensure that lives and properties are protected. And that's very encompassing. It cuts across everything. So every other time you have a fire incident wherever it is in the world, uh, not in the world necessarily, but in Nigeria, you find out that persons will lose properties. I mean, persons are talking about, you have a lot of people who will be losing their goods, uh, uh, you know, their money and what have you. And that's not nothing to write home about. But our hearts and our prayers are with those who have lost their properties and uh, those who have also sustained injuries. We're, we're also asking that we need to wake up and be very deliberate about fighting fire in Nigeria. We need to move, and that's the size of... Messi, hold on. Before before you go, um, just to, uh, to, to do what we normally do, which is uh, uh, I'll just give a little take. Um, uh, my take on, on that is that today is your birthday. <laughs> There's no fire here. <laughs> yes, today's your birthday. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, mercy, happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, um, we wish you all, all the best, many returns. And um, we don't have a cake on set, okay? Okay, that's But fine. We, we will do the cutting of cake after now. So yeah. I'm going to sing for you. Happy birthday to you. Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear I can hear Mercy. I can hear the background. Happy echoing. birthday to <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you. How old are you now? We have to go. <laughs> we need to go. This is Winston because of that. <laughs> All right. We'll be right back. When we come back, we have a look at what the papers say today. Please stay with us. Welcome to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. Chris Kane, the one who joins us this morning uh, for Off the Press. Chris, it's good to have you join us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And happy birthday to you, Mercy. May God continue to bless you and all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I think Thank we will have to add them. Um, uh, Pastor, Pastor, um, Pastor Chris. Pastor, Pastor to your name. No, uh, no, no. All Chris are pastors. Pastor oh, yes. Chris are here. Pastor yes. Chris are good to me. So even even my pastor in the uh, even my pastor in Port Harcourt is Pastor Chris Hugo. Oh, we are all men of God. Yes, mm. yes, yes. Uh, but, but Chris, before we go into the the papers, I I believe that there's some old narrow notes that you may have wanted to discard. Um, can you send them this way? Uh, or can you send them this way? Those of you that are owing me, this is the time to give me back my money. <laughs> <laughs> oh. For mercy, but it, it cannot come at a more time. Uh, period that now her birthday because I've been here to say no Naira Naira day now makes you so we must celebrate so yes <laughs> <laughs> Chris I mean it's so good to have you on the show it's always a delight but let's uh, quickly run through the papers this morning we start off with the punch and of course you can predict what the headlines will be talking about this morning and Mephili uh, finally bows to pressure says old Naira notes illegal tender I mean I like how the punch you know captions it MFLA finally bows to pressure, says Old Naira notes legal tender. CBN directs banks to accept and disburse old 1,500 and 200 and redesigned bank notes. This obeying court order undermines rule of law, constitution, and democracy. That's what the MBA president is quoted to say. And then you have the AGF, Central Bank of Nigeria governor, don't need Buhari's directive to obey Supreme Court, says the presidency. And I mean, it's a question that I, we have constantly raised as to whether we need, if the Supreme Court is totally, and if we say the Supreme Court is supreme and is the final uh, you know, court of the land, then do we need another directive? Do we need the president? Do we need uh, the CBN, you know, whether as a person or as an organization to put a word as to the ruling of the Supreme Court? I can't wait to share your thoughts, Chris Kainde. Uh Federal government probes... 
thefts in $1.1 billion oil well, Nigerian to pay 1,000 NIN fee for passports. I mean, that's a lot of stress right there. Federal government shorts Lagos airport runway and diverts international flights. And uh, just before we move away from that, you say, Tunibu has no preferred candidate for National Assembly leadership. Uh, that's according to the vice president, uh, vice president elect. I was going to say vice presidential candidate. Well, he's elect now. And that's it this morning on the punch. All right, let's go over to the next uh, papers. And uh, of course, we'll look at. Um, all right, we'll look at the, 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 the Guardian up next. Um, Buhari absolves self as CBN finally obeys Supreme Court. Before the CBN's um, secular or press release was uh, <coughs> excuse me, shared, the presidency, in quote, released a, a statement signed by Malam Garba Shehu saying that the President Buhari had not um, uh, told them not to obey the court. Um, and the writers there uh, say it all. Uh, Africa, the first window caption, Africa's energy crisis raises fresh health environmental concerns. Uh, 10th Assembly leadership, I have no preferred candidates, says Tinubu. CBN debunks report of a mere feeling plotting against Tinubu. They actually put up a, a, a tweet um, with, a, a, with a, a stamp of fake news on that, uh, the Nation newspaper headline. You know, it put out a tweet and then put out a statement saying it was fake uh, news. Bonu Yobe risk acute food shortage, World Bank alerts. Okay, so those are some of the stories on the front page of The Guardian. Rhodes Viva remains LP candidate. Party's legal team clarifies uh, election materials. We have nothing to hide. Uh, INEC uh, chair tells LP legal team. 60 lawyers stormed the INEC office yesterday as members of the OB LP, uh, that OB Dati LP legal team. 60 of them uh, maybe dwarfing. The one that uh, the ones representing the uh, other candidates. Well, let's quickly take a look at the Daily Trust newspaper. Uh, it talks about the old naira notes saying old naira notes legal tender again. That's what the Central Bank of Nigeria is quoted to say. And then you find you have no reason not to comply with the Supreme Court judgment, Buhari. Uh, okay, banks struggle to meet customers' needs and pensioners decry naira scarcity. Say we're in pain. It's good news, traders and POS operators, <laughs> especially POS operators. Tunibu's election, rejection of religious uh, hatred, sectarian politics, that's what the presidency is saying. Nigerians to pay 1,000 euro fee for NIN integration verification. Okay. And uh, you also find fire destroys 100 shop stores in Kanu Singa Market. That's what we talked about on our top trending and National Assembly leadership. I have not endorsed anyone, says President-elect. We have nothing to hide. INEC chair tells OB's lawyers and seven states to watch ahead of the governorship polls. Why we're afraid, residents are quoted to say, and how to avert crisis. This is according to experts and CSOs. Well, um... Oh. Yeah, so we'll take the nation very quickly before business day. Uh, just a few from the paper. CBN OK is 1,500 uh, Naira old notes after Buhari's rebuke. President, I never asked the BFLA Malami to flout uh, Supreme Court judgment. APC to decide uh, uh, zona, zoning rather of National Assembly offices uh, after elections. Uh, ADP and NPP, uh, ZLP, others, six others endorse Somolu. Uh, Lagos runway shut for repairs. That's the Mutala Mohammed International uh, Airport. Flights will not be affected. So over here, uh, appeal court reserves judgment in a delicate suit to high energy cost affecting manufacturing, says uh, MAN. That's the uh, Manufacturing or Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. Well, we'll just quickly run through um, the business day and just take one or two. Then we have Chris Kende wanting to share his thoughts. And on the business day, you find the cash chaos crunches farmers okay buhari's 13 trillion or 13 million agri jobs on the threat and then inex budget for beavers surpasses market costs by 30 percent nigeria's biggest drug market six relief from fx pain inex grants labor party access to inspect election materials now this is some of the headlines we find this morning on the business day Oh. All right, uh, Chris Kane, I want to, uh, over to you. Thanks again for your time. Uh, let's start off with this um, uh, uh, sort of 
sort of confusing situation where Nigerians have been saying, look, President Buhari, give an order, give a matching order to the CBN to obey the Supreme Court uh, uh, ruling. And yesterday, the Supreme Court, uh, the presidency coming out, not the president, but the presidency coming out through Malam Garbashe, who's saying, see, Mr. President has never said to to uh, Emir Feli or Abu Kamalam ESA and the Attorney General, the Minister of Justice, don't obey the Supreme Court. So we are not part of it, which was uh, surprising to some people. I don't know if you can understand the surprise of uh, many. Um, but the rest is history. The CBN has located. What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, thank God the nightmare is over because this is just a nightmare, not just um, ordinary. Um, and uh, for the records, the CBN don't need the directives of the president to implement the decision of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is the final call of the land, and immediately it makes a decision, it takes a decision. So shall it be, and that's what it's supposed to be. So waiting for the president um, to give a directive to the central bank, um, uh, to me, um, is just like um, an affront of the um, judgment of the Supreme Court. This have taken close to about 10 days, going to about 11 days or thereabouts, since this judgment was um, issued by the Supreme Court. That you expected that the executive uh, of which the uh, Central Bank is part of is supposed to have obeyed. But is it not curious enough that it was just a few minutes or an hour after the president has issued that statement that the um, Central Bank of Nigeria on this one came out to issue the statement that it has become a So, uh, it's so obvious that where this decision is coming from is that not that is not that of September, but that of the president. Don't forget the president in his, in his address, as all the ones that have been talking, talking about this issue, has said, I directed, I directed the central bank, I directed the central bank. So, only not um, to the fact that it is his, he is the one issuing the order. So, um, at times I just wonder what people say, Oh, let's do this to the NAPA, let's prosecute it. Yes. He, 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 he had a, a, a program, a, a, um, to me, uh, a policy which is good, but it's so, it's so obvious that implementation was his problem. And that is, if you don't know where you're going to, it's always good to go back to where you're coming from. But instead of going back to where he was coming from, he continued going to uh, on a journey of no return, a, just a, a, a journey where he does not even have a destination. So, um, but I, I have said it, that um, the president, what he did or what he didn't do, uh, is tantamount to what he has always done. And this is not the first time. We have seen instances where the president has disobeyed Supreme Court um, uh, judgments on several reasons. We saw what happened with Ezazaki. We saw what happened with uh, uh, Dasuki. We saw what happened with Nam de Kanu. And everybody kept quiet. So now that it has, he has to, it's affecting, it's affecting the governors, now all of them are not shouting, oh, the president is not being. What of the ones that have been given in the past? But I, good reasoning have, um, um, to me, have come to sustain here, and um, we will see what will happen from today. But what I, why I continue to ask is that, you, do you know how many Nigerians have died because of this policy? It's just that we don't keep data in this country. If there are countries that keep data, you'll be shocked by the number of people that have been affected, poverty, death, or people that even died for... Uh, from health-related issues because they could not. Because if you go to the, uh, there were instances, you remember what happened, at, I think it was in Kano, so, where a pregnant woman died because the woman could not pay the money. They, pay. they said that it was that uh, they were waiting for their last until they come, that they were not going to treat the woman. The pregnant woman died, and died. So that is part of the problem with various. But I hope this wouldn't, I don't know, but I hope this wouldn't, uh, wouldn't happen again. Uh, we have to 31st of December to face up the old Naira notes, and um, and that is what it is. And I hope that the bank will start accepting and release money as quickly as possible. Well, um, Chris, let's move away from that and look at the Punch newspaper this morning. I I'd like you to, you know, react on this. How do you feel about the fact that Nigerians are expected to pay a thousand Naira uh, for verification of the NIN? Now, uh, I want you to also think about the fact that, you know, this body uh, is actually government agency and so when you say verification does it mean that uh, there's some sort of fraud what's the essence of the verification and why uh, should nigerians be paying a thousand naira? to me that's double taxation as well as i'm concerned because if you realize that some even when the initial one was done that they said um when not came when the uh, what do you call this 
the telecom uh, companies are saying that, oh, you have to verify your number, we have to do this. Some of these telecom companies also collected money. I know one telecom company that I had to, after trying it on my own, I couldn't, I had, to, I had to go to the telecom company. And I was charged about, I think I was charged 2,000 or 2,500 naira uh, 2, for them to be able to verify that, and I paid. There are businesses where people were going for, to use it for passport, for using and resting, and they had to pay again. Now, why should I be paying for the verification of my name? And that is the problem with policy about this country. People just come up with policies and look at ways of exploiting Nigeria. I have been of the school of thought that all our so-called, um, um, what do we call it now, uh, identity cards should be collapsed into one. Why would I have separate um, passport, separate um, uh, driver license? Um, you, you want, uh, this thing, if you want, um, what is it now, NIN, you go, you go to for, for BVN, for bank, they call it this. Why don't, in most countries, in practically all countries, everything is collapsed into one. And that is how they get a good database, because if anything happens, if, or whatever it is you commit a crime, you are traceable. They here, we will want you to have identity, identity. Even if you go to the, whatever, to, what is it, the FIRS, and uh, even the loss, um, uh, what they got now, uh, the revenue service. They say you should, they, they, they also want to, if I want to give you, a, that does not work. But to me, this is this is highly unacceptable. Why should I be paid one thousand naira for the education? At the point, they were saying that uh, for the uh, was it for in, in, uh, international what they call now? Is it international? What they call that? That it has a time frame. Yes, that can be renewed. But you don't ask me. You don't have, you don't come and tell me that I have to pay again for verification one thousand naira for verification of the name for what? What what is the sense of that? I think the relevant minister in charge. Who should I be the minister of? Uh, Minister of Finance, as also the Minister of um, Communication and Digital Economy, should be able to come out and verify that. But to me, that is very, very unattainable. And this is just taking Nigerians for a ride. All right, Chris, thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, go on to some other stories. Um, on the front page of The Nation, the paper tells us that uh, the governor of Lagos State has received an endorsement of six political parties, uh, ADP, NNPP, and ZLP. NNPP is a party of... Uh, uh, Rabbi Musa Kwan no, Kwaso. Nine, eight. nine, not six, nine. Okay, the paper, paper says six. Uh, you're saying nine. Eight, six others. A, A, D, B, N, M, Sorry, sorry, I apologize. I apologize. I apologize. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, six nine. others. That makes it nine. True, truly, that's, that's the case. So, so what are your thoughts on this? Do you think this will have any reflection on the, uh, uh, on the elections uh, result, governorship election results come uh, Saturday or Sunday? I don't think, I don't know, I, I bet I agree that. We have to go back and what these political parties, what was their numbers at the last presidential election and uh, National Assembly election in Lagos. So if you go and look at and calculate all their numbers, uh, they have the votes they got, that that will tell you whether they have a, they going to have any impact on the election coming up. So there's, there's nothing wrong with those The thing that the governor is doing well, fine, it's all well and good. But I've always known that most of these political parties don't have any interest in contesting. They just bear the name. All they are interested in is trading away um, uh, the, their tickets when it comes to election like this. It's only serious-minded parties that... Um, the one I'm even surprised about is the NM, NM, uh, NMPP, right? Mm. Uh, because now, for me, as far as we're concerned, there are only, only four basic uh, major parties in Nigeria, which is the APC, PDP, Labour Party, and NMPP. All the other ones seems to be flowing. But there's nothing wrong in it. But whether this is going to bring any level of um, votes, more votes for the candidates of the APC, I don't know how that is going to be. I really doubt it. But as I, I will say, that what I say is that the dynamics of similar Saturday's election may be different from what we saw at the presidential election. There may be some kind of changes. Um, you know, the policy shall I say. I think that most of the political parties are going to fight, especially the governors, sitting governors uh, in most of these states, we fight to the last blood of their blood to make sure that people really come out and vote for them. Um, so, but let's see how this pans out on. My own challenge is especially area like Lagos, this issue of security. And I hope that the security agents um, are doing what they need to do. Uh, you saw what came out yesterday, where the Nigerian army has to come out to debunk. Um, a story that was um, um, that was written and uh, published by a newspaper, uh, one newspaper, the Nation, 
the fact and some other and online where the military was accused of backing one political party or political candidate with the fact that it was even you know, that it, it was even said that the governor of central bank has released about 500 million naira to a particular uh, uh, governorship candidate in Lagos. The army came out to debunk that. The central bank also came out to debunk that. But this is time of politics, and you know, politicians are their way. But I just hope that the election on Saturday will be far, far better than what we had uh, on the 25th of March, where Nigerians voted, right? Their results were not transmitted, especially with the data of the presidential election. And I think it's coming out to tell us now. Over 170,000 polling results has been transmitted and uploaded. And I asked, what happened? Why didn't you do that before the, as the cost, the cost of announcing the result? But let's wait and see what happens on Saturday. I think that um, some sort of um, uh, something needs to be said, maybe by the NUJ or by somebody about um, some of these stories floated by, by the papers, especially the papers that have um, some affinity with a, a candidate or two, you know, a number of them out there. Um, the, the, in order to ensure that there's some sort of sanity um, within, within the polity, especially as far as the ethics of journalism are concerned. Yeah, that's why, uh, personally, um, if, I'm, uh, if I'm in charge of certain TV stations, and also some, some radio stations as a professional, there are certain papers I will not review. I will not review, I will not ask to be reviewed this time of politics, maybe after politics, because as polit uh, most of our colleagues have become instant politicians by their way, their manners, and they threw them um, to, to, uh, to out of the window to dogs, um, just to be able to please their political godfathers, ownership, and the rest of them. So uh, when you see certain, there are certain newspapers you pick up in the morning. And you see, you see that their editorial policy has changed, and they're basically all out. Not only even, not only news, but even television stations. There are some television stations that are owned by politicians, radio stations that are owned by politicians, and they use that. You know, the smart thing most of our politicians, what they've learned in the past 10, 20 years is that they know the power of the media, and most of them invest in media for whatever reason, so that they can use it when it comes to their politics, and they use it effectively. So. Um, some of these editorials, and I was thinking, and I've been thinking that um, you know, born, you know that just few few days ago, um, the NBC issued um, a warning to all TV stations um, and radio stations, broadcast stations, warning them on, on issues of politics um, that they should they, they should be very careful of the sanction. Although that I totally disagree with them on that threat. There's no reason for anybody to threaten any radio or TV station, or any broadcast station. Or the broadcast. If you have any issue with them, then you go to the relevant uh, authority, which is born. Or if you have, if you go to take them to court, rather than just issuing threat every time and trying to sanction people with five million naira, ten million naira. But um, it is obvious, as I said, that some of our colleagues have taken a stand, and that in itself is not ethical at all. It should be as neutral as possible. But it is not only in Nigeria. You remember that <laughs> CNN is pro Democrats and Fox is pro Republican in the United States of America. So it's not only here. In as much as they don't make it as glaring, but our own people here, the way they go about it, it doesn't, it doesn't sound well. And doesn't look good. Okay, um, I'd like us to also look at uh, uh, another paper that's still the punch where the president elect says he has no preferred candidate for the National Assembly leadership. Uh, I'd like to ask you if you think that this is a statement of truth or it's just a mere statement. Messi, I'm sure you said you didn't believe in that. You said believe that kind. That's how they say it. Kofi, Kofi, you didn't laugh at me. You said believe that kind. <laughs> so, you, you know, they've they been having some that. meetings. They've been having some meetings, uh, yeah. I think, yesterday or so. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Messi, my politician goes, don't say today now your birthday. <laughs> my politician goes, ah, Messi, your politician, your, you know that today's your birthday. You say, Messi, the, your bed is actually tomorrow, it's not today. You will be saying today, your bed you listen at the politician will tell you, say, no, not tomorrow. And he will show you every evidence to be there. Say, in the time, he, maybe when you are born, and uh, your mother, they didn't calculate it well. And can you imagine? A politician, a young politician will come and tell you good morning. Better go outside and check whether his money actually online. Because if you say good morning, and you try to rush out to go to work, 
I realized you need to come out and drive out. I realized that three is just three a.m. You're on your own. So don't believe these politicians. How can they? He said that he doesn't have any. He has a candidate. He don't just doesn't want to say anything. They already they already sharing the offices, and that is it. That is where it's done. The fact is that there are going to be a lot of realignment within the National Assembly because now that the president is coming from the southwest, it's obvious that the House of Representatives speaker will not come from the south. So Bajabi Amila will not return. Um, return to the uh, as speaker of the house. That is busy. Then also from the north, I doubt if the uh, Senate president will be sealed, um, uh, uh, be assigned to the north. Being that the vice president is also coming from the north, probably has to come to this. I, I, I don't know which part of the south to south to come to put it. But it is time. It's high time. Um, uh, high powered politicking going on and the rest of them. But for anybody to tell you that he's not interested, if he doesn't, if he's not interested in who becoming, won't you remember what happened um, at the first time of um, President Muhammad Buhari, we are Saraki out of no and gave him serious problem in the first four years as a Senate president. So definitely, I don't believe him. But that is the way they talk. So don't just believe our um, politicians. Mm. I think we can also uh, remember the uh, the battle to uh, make sure Femi Bacha Biamila was made the speaker of the House exactly. of Rep. The first exactly. part one yeah. and then part yeah. two. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So mm -hmm. basically you're saying Messi can take that to the bank. All these politicians are saying mm -hmm. no pun intended. No, no, no. No it, pun intended. In fact, <laughs> it should not even take it to any bank. Even if it's just say uh, all this uh, not even uh, CBS bank. Make it not take a good deal. This is bank. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much for your time. We have to say goodbye to you now. Um uh, we'll be reaching out to you so we can we can continue the celebration uh, of the air. Yeah. Uh, but we're once, counting once down again, to Saturday. Happy birthday. Yes, yes. Happy birthday to me. Thank yes, yes. you. Thank ladies so are born in, in the month of March, so happy uh, birthday to you. Thank you. This thank month. You. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris, thank you. Uh, Chris Kenewando is a chartered arbitrator, okay. UK trained chartered arbitrator. He's been a guest uh, on Off the Press. So we'll take a break. When we come back, we have more discussions. Definitely. Uh, please stay with us. We're back. It's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. The Central Bank of Nigeria, as you may have heard uh, last night, has directed commercial banks to dispense and receive old Nara notes as legal tender uh, across the country. The Central Bank of Nigeria gave the directive at a bankers committee meeting held on Sunday. Uh, according to a statement by the acting director of CBN Corporate Communications, Isa Abdul Mumin, uh, on Monday. This uh, statement was released on Monday. Now, this is coming hours after the presidency Monday evening said that the CBN had no reason to comply with the ruling of the Supreme Court on the Naira redesign policy. It stated that the president, uh, Muhammad Buhari, did not instruct the CBN governor, Corinne Emefili, and the attorney general of the Federation, Abubakar Malami, to disobey any court orders involving the government and other parties. That was what the statement is quoted as saying. Now, the Apex Bank in a statement, however, titled Old 200, 500, and 1,000 Naira Banknotes Remain Legal Tender, uh, the CBN, said the directive was in compliance with Buhari's administration's obedience uh, to court orders. I'm glad to say uh, joining us to analyze this development is a lawyer, legal practitioner, Shola Lamid. Um, Shola Lamid, good morning to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good morning. Well, the, the, the presidency released a statement last night, um, yesterday evening, saying the president had not ordered, uh, had not directed uh, 
Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Aburka Malami, SAN, and the Central Bank's Governor, um, Gordon Mifflin, to disobey court order. But the question some are asking is, did the President give them the marching order to obey the court order? It's a bit confusing for some people out there. What do you think? Uh, yes. Uh, the immediate the speaker of gives our order, president, the president need not give an order to CBN to obey the order. I, I, I was the opinion that it was too late for the president to be talking. It's not even ready for the president to talk. If the president that was giving, the CBN does not would comply. But if you then understand that CBN is under the presidency, and he wanted to hear from the president, notwithstanding the order of court. And don't forget that CBN was not a party in that case. And it was the FG that was a party. No, but so, yeah. go ahead. Hello? Can I, can I go ahead? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Go ahead with your thoughts. Uh -huh. So, my, 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 my opinion is that I'd already and I knew that if they had no choice, they would comply with that order. And, and, I, and I was opinion that even if they are in the position to make the order, they are going to be arrested and sent to prison. Because Nigerians as, were suffering, are still suffering from that denial of their access to their, their, access to their money. So if the order by the presidency, uh, or the directive yesterday night was not surprising. It was not surprising. It was, it was a, a bit today. in sort of a mic. It's a little bit of a thing now, but by the end of the day. It's have been immediately, immediately the order was given. We we'll to comply with our order. Well, I'd also like to ask, if you, I mean, according to what you said, that the CBN, uh, you know, the ruling of the Supreme Court didn't need an extra directive, maybe from the CBN or the president, then what exactly uh, was responsible for the non-compliance uh, to that particular ruling from the uh, Supreme Court? Uh, the, no, this is like Nigeria. Yeah, we you know, all this people uh, under the employment of the, the federal government. They fear their employment. Even the other, even the other decision by the court, they will still have to hear from their their principal or the boss. You don't forget that when the issue of uh, extension came, came up, it was the president that directed that two hundred naira notes to be continue to continue to be used as legal tender. So I immediately without without seeing the two hundred notes. So the Supreme Court is a judiciary and directed against the federal government, which head of it is the, the, the president, who is under immunity. So the president, and if you look at the Supreme Court uh, judgment, there was support against the, against the president that it was really, uh, it was the authoritarian and uh, it was dictator. Uh, that to, or not to comply with the interim order that was just granted. So the president has the choice to give instruction or directive to, to the CBN. So, and the delay in non compliance was because of the non compliance job. Because the president can try to move the order. Although it will, be, uh, it, will be, it will be wrong in our democracy, it will be against the rule of law, it will be content, but the president is under immunity. So the president, the CBI had to wait because of his job, not to fall out from the, the press government and to hear from the president. All right. Um, uh, um, Mr. Shalal Amid, what do you expect yes, um, to be the, the, the impact of this uh, CBN or the Supreme Court's ruling or judgment on this matters? Um, uh, given in favor of the governors who approached it. Uh, with this uh, a, a allowance or approval for the Naira, old Naira to be used side by side with the new Naira note till 31st December 
2023. Do you expect to see uh, the cash crunch, the narrow scarcity, and the unfolding economic hardship around the country that we've witnessed? Do you expect to see it um, reduce and things get back to normal with this this, this court, um, court, court judgment and the subsequent uh, directive by the Central Bank of Nigeria? Yes. If, it, if they comply fully, but I'm thinking about the old note, I think we should, the things should go to, uh, go, go to normal. And they will leave the, 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 the current uh, suffering of Nigeria. We, oui. yes, I think so, we. Oui. Yes. But, you know, the, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people are now, are now cautious to, to use the old note. But they are still, but for me, I, I don't think that, that there's no, no reason to fear anything because if you think that I was giving and the and the and uh, the, 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 the whole note will continue to be the people tender. So if they bring out the money, the, the whole note that be in the bank, eventually the bank, once the money is released, all the whole notes, the two hundred, the five hundred and the, the one thousand dollar note, if they if they if they bring them back to calculation. The, the problem with it, yes, I agree. I, I, I'm of that opinion, anyway. Uh, okay, so do you ex because some are saying that the, um, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court never addressed the issue of um, the amount of the currency in circulation, you know, and therefore, yes, the old and new narrow notes may live side by side, uh, but, but, and it could be accepted as legal tender around the country. But since a lot of people have taken their old notes back to the bank and don't have any notes at all, if the central bank decides they don't want to uh, increase the amount of money in circulation, there will still be scarcity. So do you expect in that regard now, do you expect anything, things to change significantly? Yeah, that's where I said, if there's a full compliance with that full point. You know, before, the the money in circulation, yeah, it's determined by 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 the CBN and then the the commercial bank. You no, know, your your the money that in your account is your own money, you have the right to it. No bank can deny you access to your money. Yeah, I agree that if the, the CBN can sit a bit frustrate the the availability of that man or that no reason enough enough uh, cash to the system. But that would still be against 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 the judgment of the court. Because the, the reason for that judgment of the court is that the policy is a is is is, 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 a, is a violation of the fundamental right of citizens to the fund. The fund in the bank account in your, in your everybody's bank account it's, my, it's your property. Nobody can deny you how you're going to use that money. So if the, if the, if the CBN, the first bank must comply fully with that judgment in Supreme Court and make the money available in the, in the, system, in the, in the, in the system. So if they, they don't comply, then I'll see the problem. But I know that, like you said, from now, without the first, it will be. It will not go to normal. It will not. It will not go to normal as it was as it was, it was before the, the the policy. Because they will try to proceed. Because there's some benefit of this policy. That benefit. That benefit. benefit that we share with you. So they they, they will try and they will just receive the money in circulation, and then it gradually deal with it. Well, um, I'd also like to ask what you think would play out uh, following, you know, this uh, directive from the CBN, more like endorsing the ruling of the Supreme Court. Do you think that all of this would solve the cash crunch that Nigerians have been faced with for the, you know, the past months? Yeah, it depends on the CBN compliance. By releasing enough cash into the system, but don't forget the policy has been notified. They, 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 before, the problem of the policy is that you can that the limit you can withdraw every every week. The, the limit of cash, the limit of cash can withdraw every week. They are expected to do transfer for all for other transactions. 
So everything is depends on the EPM to release enough enough cars in the system. Without you know, even enough cars in the system, there will still be there will still be problem. All right. Um, uh, what what what, do you, what are your take? What's your take on on the constitutionality of um, certain governors in in Nigeria before the CBN uh, press release yesterday, uh, making statements, you know, telling their residents that the old Nara notes remain legal tender in their uh, in their states. Um, do you think there's some sort of um, treason somewhere here? You know, trying to usurp the power of the president because we are aware that. Um, and no matter what the presidency, we know that after the Supreme Court's initial, uh, the, sorry, the court's initial um, order, uh, the first one, um, that the president on, the interim, on the interim. yes, the interim yeah injunction, yes, or the interim yeah. order, that yeah. the president, in defiance to this interim order, on February 16, gave a national address, a national broadcast, where uh, he he insisted that uh, only the old 209 notes will be. Uh, accepted as legal tender, whilst uh, 500, 1,000 will be phased out. You know, so the president had already said this, but governors had gone ahead, starting with Aero Fire, most recently, uh, Babajide Samuel of Lagos State yesterday, to say the legal tender, uh, the old notes remain legal tender, and anyone who bank rejects them will be shut down. So do you think there's some sort of, some have said maybe there's some sort of treason here, um, some governors trying to usurp the powers of the president. Uh, what, what do you say to this? Uh, the, the, the two governments, the LFI and the uh, uh, they are their statement it is, it is, was made for some to spring court judgment and order. You know, the, 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 let me say, no, the interim order that was made. What well, does the interim order? That means the, everything, the status quo remains. Because all the the, 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 the the deadline for the old note was suspended and that it remains a legal tender. So their statement was made for sure to those order that was made by school court and they were justified in making that order. And don't forget that even the, 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 the statement of the president that was contrary to the interim order, because it's still based on finding on that one. I say it was dictatorship for the for, for the for the president to say to contrary to to, to, to the other. I don't say any that don't that no that don't see no offenses there. You know, you are justified in making that statement. All right. So um, so generally, what would you say this would uh, mean on our economy? What would be the implication for the Nigerian economy? Or the policy, the general policy. Exactly. Yeah, no, the the policy has some benefits. But I think the problem is the, the, the position of the of the of the policy. Because if you reduce cash in the system and you do a lot of transfer, well, it will increase uh, the bank revenue, it will increase the federal government revenue, it will reduce Insecurity, it will reduce corruption. But I think the timing for the election, and as well as the fact that even the, the limit that was given to each individual was not available. So it affects all the other sector, the former sector of the economy, who, who, who rely on cash, cash transaction. The, so it, it was no, the money was not available to them. So it, 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 the implementation of that policy has, has affected the economy drastically and drastically. So for me, I believe that uh, the, if the policy is well implemented, and then the, the cash, no matter how little, as, as they said, is, 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 is available, it will be very good for the economy. But let me make the cut up All right. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Shalal Amid, legal practitioner, thank yeah. you so much for your time. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, that's the size of that conversation. We have more discussions ahead. Of course, when we come back from our break, we'll be looking again 
are the bimodal voter accreditation system machines uh, and their reconfiguration of mixed reactions still trailing that. We'll be right back. And we're back with The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. Let's continue the conversation with the reconfiguration of the bimodal voter accreditation system, by the way. Uh, the ongoing reconfiguration of the bimodal voter accreditation system machine used during the presidential National Assembly elections on the 25th of February will end within 24 hours. That's from yesterday. Apparently should end by now. Now, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, uh, had said that 170,000 polling units results of February 25th pre presidential and National Assembly elections have been uploaded on its result viewing portal and the commission had postponed the governorship and state house of assembly elections that was scheduled on uh, or scheduled to hold on the 11th of March to 18th of March in order to be able to reconfigure the beavers. Now, consequently, all activities pertaining to the polls were rescheduled, including the inspection of sensitive materials at the Central Bank of Nigeria by the political parties. However, the reconfiguring of the beavers device also, I mean, continued to generate mixed reaction from Nigerians, and that hasn't ended. As we inch closer to the elections, we have our guest joining us this morning, George Omosu Jr., uh, joining us from Lagos. Good morning. It's good to have you join us. He's the CEO at Black. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yes, I'd like to ask you, I mean, we see the reason why, uh, according to the umpire, the state of that, the reason for the postponement of this election, one of it is that uh, you can't have the beavers reconfigured within a certain you know, time. We're just close to the election. And so uh, the argument was that that reconfiguration would be, uh, would need some time. And so the, that's the reason why the elections were postponed for the 18, so giving it some time. Now, but orders have argued that the beavers can be reconfigured real time at the same time. So do you agree that the beavers can be reconfigured in real time without having to say we need extra day, two, three, four, five days to reconfigure the system? Um, thank you so much, that's a very good question. Um, I believe that that is the case. Um, however, uh, the commission did communicate across that they had been experiencing some glitches, which um, from what I gather, um, I believe would be from the IREF portal sort of consummating um, that data from the Beavers devices. So uh, the delay that we are currently experiencing in terms of uh, the upload and consequently the reconfiguration of the Beavers devices, I would say is most likely linked to uh, the glitch that uh, the INEC experienced. Um, however, they have assured us that we will um, not experience, you know, the same thing in the state elections as they have been able to uh, learn from the uh, experience in the presidential uh, elections to resolve some of those glitches. So we're hoping that, uh, you know, this time around, uh, the Beavers will uh, function as it was designed to which is to essentially uh, upload and, you know, reconfigure itself uh, in real time. No, but, right. but um, yeah. I mean, I, I like to get back to that again. But the, you know, because we have spoken to a couple of persons, we've spoken to legal practitioners, we have spoken to, you know, analysts and uh, political pundits themselves. And we're yet to understand if what the umpire has stated as to having to postpone the election because we know the cost implication this have uh, on the economy. And so can the beavers not be reconfigured, you know, in real time, like just immediately, just like you reformat or reset your phone? Do we need like five days, 10 days to reconfigure the beavers? Uh, so w when we talk about reconfiguration, we need to understand that it's basically uh, the process of um, making the beavers device available again for the upcoming state elections. However, due to the design of the device itself, um, it will not allow itself to be reprogrammed or reconfigured until it has successfully pushed um, the data that had been captured in the previous election um, over to the online IRF portal. And I believe that this is a security mechanism that was implemented in order to preserve the integrity of the data on the beavers. So to answer your question, the reconfiguration itself 
I don't think that is what is taking time. I believe because of the glitch that, you know, INEC communicated that they had been expecting with uploading the data onto the IRF portal, and since that is a requirement before the reconfiguration can happen, it sort of stands as a bit of a blocker, um, and that, I believe, has constituted to the delay in the reconfiguration process itself. So uh, contrary to what a lot of people believe, I don't, I, I, I don't think the delay has been as a result of the reconfiguration because like you already rightly mentioned, that is something that should not take this long. You know, however, due to the dependency of um, the upload needing to happen first before the devices can be reconfigured uh, for the state elections, that is why uh, you know, we're experiencing some of these uh, delays. Okay, uh, I mean, the, the, the independent national, I would like to know the, the source of your information when you say, you know, that um, the, the devices, you're a tech guy, you're a tech bro, like we call it in Nigeria, and people need to understand why you're here. Uh, um, Black is a technology-driven solutions company. Um, so you know about this stuff very well. What's the source of your information uh, when you say that this, 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 um, do you have an good account, a good authority that these um, BVAS devices or machines uh, or tablets can't be reconfigured until they push out all the information that was stored on them? You know, that's, that's, that's uh, what I'd like to know. Then what exactly is the reconfiguration? Because people are trying to understand. Some have said they want to format uh, the, the tablets. And I, I told someone on, on a program some time ago that you can't put words in the mouth of INEC because formatting means you're wiping the information. So um, do you have a good authority that this, this is the way it works, that you can't reconfigure the devices until you upload the information, push it to the back end server? Number two, what is this reconfiguration about? You know, so, so just to speak to those two. Issue, yeah, absolutely. Um, so to answer your first question, um, regarding the beavers, we've sort of had to rely on, you know, the information that the INEC has made available to us publicly. As you know, some of us are already aware, they have been rather particular about um, exposing some of the intricacies of how the beavers technology actually works. And I, I believe that this is, you know, in order to protect um, the security layer of uh, device, although I have some, uh, you know, mixed opinions about that personally. Um, however, um, my source would be the um, information, like I said, that the INEC has made um, available to us publicly, you know, which is that for the device to actually be um, reconfigured, uh, it, it has to, first of all, you know, move all of that data onto the IRF portal um, so that, you know, the, the, the Nigerian populace can be able to inspect and scrutinize um, the election, you know, on a polling unit level. Um, so that's to answer, you know, your first question. My source is most likely as good as yours. However, from a technology standpoint, it is very achievable, you know, that such a thing or uh, such a mechanism would be in place. And it makes sense because if the device in itself could be, you know, reconfigured at will um, without necessarily having to ensure that that information is moved elsewhere, then you can probably have a case of data loss or, you know, you know, which could lead to um, certain uh, issues because people start assuming, uh, you know, where the data has gone and questioning the integrity of any new data that is introduced into um, the space. Um, to answer your question about what the reconfiguration entails, it is very much um, likened, in my opinion, to um, a typical device reset. You know, um, the Beavers amongst others, is a data capturing device. It captures the data of the uh, registered voters, and this is, you know, including personal information, some personal information, as well as biometrics, which are utilized as uh, verification mechanisms at the various uh, polling units during the election. But not, not only that, it also captures, um, you know, the electoral forms that are used to record the tallies of, you know, the vote counts at the various polling units. So this reconfiguration is essentially just wiping this information uh, from the beavers device so that it can be used because the, the, the device I believe is configured in such a way that it can only record um, information from one election just to avoid any sort of mix up in the data um, from happening. 
you know, so that's what the reconfiguration entails, uh, in my opinion. Be, be just a quick follow-up to that. Does this, uh, what can you say, therefore, about the fears expressed uh, by Nigerian voters, particularly the supporters of the two opposition parties that lost the elections and their candidates who are going to court, the fears that uh, in any case of, is about to steal the election to change the the results with this you know reconfiguration people are against it um as a, a techie what do you say to that with all the information you have uh i think those are very very valid fears um and so in my experience you know uh running a tech company i realized that beyond a tech solution or beyond a tech product it's important to be as transparent with your stakeholders as much as possible. So what the Nigerian people, I believe, are, are, are having you know, difficulty accepting is the level of transparency that, we've, you know, that has been displayed so far in the process. It's not a question of the technology itself. It's a question of you know, the systems in place to ensure that the technologies are you know, carrying out what we have been told they would carry out. So, uh, I mean, if, if I were to make any sort of suggestion, I would strongly, uh, you know, recommend a little bit more transparency into some of the intricacies of not just the beavers, but the entire system, you know, from the beavers capturing the data at the various polling units, you know, to it being made available on the IRF portal, so that people can have their own um, understanding of um, how this system works, as against having to form, you know, various opinions that lead to um, a lack of trust in the system itself, you know. So um, in technology, we have something called open source, which is essentially a mechanism or a practice where, you know, the technology is made visible or made transparent um, to the stakeholders or to the general public. And I, I believe this is very important, particularly in technologies that affect a large number of people, because you, you, you want people to be able to trust this system, uh, this system which is responsible for uh, essentially determining who uh, would run the country for the next, you know, four years. You want this system, system to be as transparent as possible. And, you know, even for you know, people who may not necessarily have all of the tech experience, I believe if the information is readily available, then they can sort of fall back to, you know, the tech institutions or the private tech players such as ourselves yeah, to John, interpret. I, I you know, think that because, be, because we're almost out of time and uh, so we're yes. able to touch on that. You have spoken to, you know, the next question that I was going to raise. But however, I would like that you be more emphatic on it. But just before then, uh, I wanted to also speak up to the issue of uh, the back end. Uh, INEC has said that they are very sure that there will be transfer of data. Everything will be sent to the back and or, or the server, as it's been called. I'd like you to speak to that. A lot of people, just like you have mentioned, the issue of transparency, trust seems to be the issue. And people are saying, if you have the umpire who should have uh, you know, transmitted the results in real time, according to the electoral uh, laws uh, that were put down, from the polling unit, because results were not transmitted at the polling unit. This is part of the issues that we're having, and people are having doubts in the entire process and all that transpired. So I, I'd like you to speak to that. Uh, do you think that they have what it takes now, uh, technically and in all ramification, you know, to send this data to the back end and to ensure that, you know, this data cannot be tampered with. That's on the one hand. Now, another, I'd also like you to speak to the, our use of technology. So far, we have witnessed the introduction of technology, partial technology in the conduct of our elections. And all the persons are already proposing, we need to go e-voting, that e-voting will be the solution. So, so do you really think the kind of system and structure that we have in Nigeria, that electronic voting, you know, would take care of all of the malpractices that we experience and the errors in our elections? Uh, thank you so much. Um, so just to explain <clears throat> to the layman what, you know, the back end entails, uh, the back end is essentially the parts of, you know, any application that is the most uh, opaque, so to say. It's not uh, very visible to, uh, you know, non-technical uh, persons. Uh, so as regarding uh, the security or um, the trust components to it, uh, it, it still boils down to how much you know, the commission is willing to open up, like I said, to um, the general public as to the intricacies of this component. I, I believe that typically whenever the backend is 
you know, made open to the general public, a, a non-technical person may not necessarily be able to uh, make much of an opinion on that, you know, so they might have to sort of rely on the private or, or independent uh, technical expert, experts to be able to sort of make meaning of those informations. To answer your other question about the, uh, the you, you know, whether the, the data um, will not be tampered with, the, the BVAS is designed in such a way that it, it should discourage this as much as possible. Um, so since you, you sort of have to uh, upload the data before the device can be re reconfigured, it really encourages that, you know, once even after the device is moved from, you know, the polling units, contrary to a lot of popular opinions, it, it does not necessarily affect the, um, the, the trust factor. The uh, voting data that has been captured can still, you know, be uploaded even at that point. Um, to the IRF portal. So the fact that um, unfortunately we were not able to have a, a you know a case where um, this data was uploaded real time does not negate the, the the trust factor. If you know, I don't know if if I'm making sense. It does not really negate that trust factor, provided that you know the commission um, ensures that the data that was captured you know at the various polling units is what is you know, uploaded onto the back end um, and made available via the IRF portal, then we shouldn't have, you know, any issues, uh, you know, whatsoever. Um, so as regards your second question about um, the, uh, you know, application of technology in the electoral process, um, I mean, being a tech uh, person, I might be considered a bit biased on this. I believe that tech is the only way to go um, as regards the uh, voting um, practice that we have, especially in this part of the world. And the, the, the truth is that tech sort of introduces the potential for transparency. And there, there are lots of technological um, sort of methods that we can employ to ensure that, you know, once voting is done, everybody can sort of have access to that information in real time. You can't really have that with a non-technical solution because there, there has to be, you know, the voting data captured on, you know, physical um, voting materials and then moved over to a collision center where all of this data is aggregated and, you know, so on and so forth. So it leaves a lot of room for uh, election malpractice and, you know, possible um, disruption in the election process. As against if we had a system that would, and I understand that the Beavers was supposed to help introduce this level of real-time transparency, uh, but, you know, technology has actually uh, progressed, you know, to the point where we, we can actually have it even more real-time, uh, you know, and people can be able to even use mobile apps and virtually um, authenticate themselves on their mobile apps and vote directly from, you know, from their homes. It's possible with technology. And I think this will drastically reduce any sort of uh, disbelief or distrust in the system because, you know, people sort of can see how the, the, the system works. There's more transparency to it. And, you know, the commission can even go a step further to make some of the codes or the architectures of these systems, you know, open source available to the general public so that technical experts can be able to scrutinize, even give suggestions, you know, on some of the things that can be employed. I believe that if the system we had now was open source, you know, the chances that a, an independent expert or um, a party somewhere would have probably be able, been able to identify. Uh, well, we, we, we don't know if you can hear us, George. I'm sorry. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. We don't know if you can hear us. A quick I one. Think... Yeah, quick one. If you were uh, to advise the political parties, um, the People's Democratic Party and uh, the uh, Labour Party, I'm not saying you should give free, free advice, but generally speaking, uh, they have been given leave by the court to go inspect the sensitive election materials and people expect that the beavers will form part of this. How should they go about that? Because uh, as we speak yesterday, the uh, head of voter education at the uh, Independent National Electoral Commission, Fessel Koye says that uh, the political parties will not be allowed to look at the cloud, INEX cloud, or look at the IREV, or look into the brain of the beavers. Now, he says that they have, their agents have the result sheets. So how can they go about this? Very quickly, very briefly, in a sentence or two, to be able to verify the, the results. Um, just to keep it short, uh, in summary, it has to be end-to-end. -end. 
you know, from the, the, the Beavers device itself up until the portal. Um, I'm not clear on the extent to which, you know, INEC is, you know, willing to open up some of these um, intricate information to the political parties. However, I will suggest that it has to be end to end. Every step of, you know, the flow of data from the point where it was captured, which is the Beavers device, um, and as well as the, yes, the Beavers device essentially, uh, you know, as well as the um, IREF portal and everything in between. There has to be a lot of diligence put into the right. scrutiny of right. the flow of data. All right. Uh, George, thank you very much. George Amosu Jr. is uh, Chief Executive Officer, or as he likes to put it, uh, Chief Servant at Black, uh, Technology Driven Solutions Company. Uh, he joined us via Zoom from Lagos, where we are. George, thank you for your time. We look forward to having you again soon. Thank you very much. All right then. All right. Well, that's the size of our conversation this morning on at The Breakfast. And if you missed out on any part of it, would like that you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And do subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're at Plus TV Africa at Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. My name is Messi Bopo. Have a fantastic morning. And uh, my name is Kofi Bartel. So all roads lead to Plus TV Africa. If you don't know where the office is, you have to find out uh, where uh, Messi Bopo uh, will be throwing a big birthday bash as we celebrate her plus one. Mm -hmm. See you tomorrow. All right, Good then morning. be sure to join the newsroom at 9 o'clock for the news brief. My name is Adeyemi Shoroye. Here is my good old day story. I was born in Ibadan to the family of Adekunle and Fola Shade Shoroye, both of blessed memory. I had my early childhood at Ayoni Day Street, Ekotedo, popularly known as Ekotedo Iyaolobe. Two things struck me about my good old days, which I will share here. First, my primary school was at St. Luke's Demonstration School, Molete Ibadan. Ekotedo to Molete was quite some distance, but at a very tender age, I would follow my elder siblings from Ekotedo to Molete, hopping from one bus to another, sometimes trekking part of the distance till we reach Molete. No fear of kidnappings or molestation. In fact, safety was never an issue. Life was generally peaceful. We would leave home after a meal of hot rice, beans and dodo. Bought from Iyatewa's makeshift canteen, the popular mama put cellar down the road. Leave for school between 6.45 to 7 a.m. And after dropping from one bus to another, we would arrive at school around 8.15 a.m. And the return journey would be equally peaceful. There were some days when we would spend part of the transport money and trek some parts of the journey. It was so enjoyable. Our parents didn't have to fear nor worry about our safety. Life was peaceful and safe. Those were the days of fountain pens with ink and blotting paper. I recall there were special holes in our desks where the ink containers were fixed. You must be an exceptional student to have come home daily without soiling your school uniform with inks. Those were days when teaching good handwriting meant a lot to our teachers. Today, text messages have taken over. The other thing that struck me about my good old days was the spirit of communal living. You see, in our house, we lived upstairs as landlords and we had some Igbo families living downstairs as tenants, but you hardly tell who was a tenant's child or who was a landlord's child. We were all the same. In fact, some of the Igbos who were born about the same time as me spoke Yoruba fluently. To the extent that Stephen, my age mate, 
wrote Yoruba as a subject in his work and passed with flying colors. Yes, there was no discrimination of any sort. We all lived together as a happy family, irrespective of tribe or tongue. On Saturdays, we would go to Scala Cinema in Sabo to watch mostly Indian and Chinese films. Sabo, the Hausa community in Ibadan, is a short trekkable distance from Ekotedo, where I equally made some friends among those Hausa children of my age group, majority of whom were still friends to today. What a glorious childhood. Can Nigeria still go back to that old days when our children will be safe on their own? And we don't need to worry about child kidnappings or molestation. Can Nigeria still go back to that old days where tribe and tongue will be inconsequential? Can Nigeria still go back to those wonderful days when you were not defined by religion or religious affiliations? Can Nigeria still be a nation where merit is more valued as a determinant to your success than your place of birth? Yes, our nation can still rise above those primordial sentiments. We can. I believe with good governance, those days will come again. As I round up, strongly resonating in my mind is our first national anthem, which said, Though tribe and tongue may differ, in brotherhood we stand. We can still recreate a nation where Nigerians all will be proud to serve our sovereign motherland. I am a believer. To this end, I join Sashimo Rebadejo in this collective drive towards a greater tomorrow. Thank you very much and God bless. Welcome to The Advocate, the program that keeps you educated and informed on current events around you. I'll be talking about constructive politicking, competence and brotherhood above tribalism. Olu Dolakpo Ojilabi will be talking about how the new Nigeria starts with you. Stephen Agiode will be talking about beavers, election management and black holes. Today, expect interesting conversations that concerns all Nigerians. We will be back after this break. Constructive politicking, competence and brotherhood above tribalism. The ongoing general elections in Nigeria demonstrate the need to rise above tribal sentiment and prioritize reliability in decision making. Using Lagos State as a case study, the overshadowing conversations regarding the forthcoming gubernatorial election are much centered around the tribal affiliation of majorly the candidate of Labour Party, Gbadibo Redisvivor, in comparison with other candidates, including the incumbent governor, Babajide Sanwulu of APC. In the same vein, the threats and targeted attacks on businesses owned by persons of different tribal affiliation in a bid to suppress their right to exercise their franchise. This is rather an unfortunate scenario as the tribal sentiment obliterates the importance of brotherhood in our society and the proper competence-driven decision-making process that would fast-track our common growth and development as a cosmopolitan city. However, Nigerians have spoken and we must accept that and work with our choices while reflecting on the irrelevant social divides that we allow to hinder progress. In Nigeria, competence should be prioritized over tribalism in all aspects of life, 
especially in politics. It is heartening to see the emergence of Iriti Kingube as the first elected female senator of the Federal Capital Territory in Abuja under the auspices of the Labour Party. This achievement is a testament to the importance of competence as well as the need to break the gas ceiling across various fields and celebrate the achievement of women. Dr. Ngozi okonjo Wiala, the Director General of the World Trade Organization at the 2023 International Women's Day Summit held in Geneva, was, has called for more inclusive policies regarding women in the economy and other sectors of the human endeavor. This measure should be heeded not just by parasatas, but also by all kinds of community. We must strive to create a society that values competence and inclusivity over tribalism and division. As we celebrate Women's Month, let us continue to break barriers and create opportunities for women and men to excel in all areas of life and continually break the bias of tribalism, patriarchy, ethno-religious sentiment. Let us conclude by pondering on these words of Idu Koyeni Kon, an international acclaimed organizational consultant and author in the US. You can no longer see or identify yourself solely as a member of a tribe, but as a citizen of a nation, of one people, working towards a common purpose. So I said two things. One is about the importance for um, raising our consciousness of brotherliness, good neighborliness, national cohesion, and nationalism are both tribal sentiments. You saw what happened this period. The election is coming up, the gubernatorial election, and there is much talk about the tribal affiliation of the Liberal Party candidate, Jerry uh, Badi Boros is viable. He has, um, a, according to findings, his father or his parents have been, or his, his ancestry, they've been in Lagos for over 400 years. But no, in this time, his father got married to, or his, his mother is an Igbo woman. So his father is a rubber man, a Lagosian, married to an Igbo woman. He himself married to an Igbo woman. I think his wife is the daughter of the former military governor of Borno State, Major General Igbo. Now, this issue, rather than seeing our, our politicians, rather than seeing how to come together and, and tell us what you want to do and why convincing us why we should vote for you. You see them downplaying the politics by bringing tribal sentiments. Like, why will you vote? Why should Lagosians vote for Badibo? That's what they say. So there's no, there's much talk about tribalism, tribal tension, and then you see the attack on some persons from mostly maybe Southeast extraction doing their businesses here and being um, threatened by persons that claim that they are Lagosians for them to vote a candidate of their choice. And I'm saying that this is not a very good thing. And then the issue of um, um, Dr. Onkoju Ogonjo Iweala delivered his speech during the International Women's Day, and she was emphasizing the need for competence. Women should be given a chance, not just because they are women. Competence, anybody, man or woman, should be given a chance. That's how we can deliver Nigeria. So I want to hear your take on this. Uh, well, um, <coughs> um, it's unfortunate that uh, we have come to this um, I, I think it, the issue that arose was not even the, the fact whether Rose Vibo is a, is a Lagosian or not. It was more that he was not a Yoruba man. And um, it's unfortunate that uh, after we have gone through a civil war, we should be still talking like this. Some of these elements that are making this call are forgotten that only recently, and I'm, I know many of them celebrated it, in Nigeria, a person of Nigerian origin who had lived here with us for long, Kebi, Kemi Badinoch, yeah. who not long ago left for the UK, was contesting and almost, in fact, won the, the UK producer. prime ministership. Nobody in England was talking about uh, Nigerians coming to take over London. Wow. Nobody was talking of us taking over Britain. It's unfortunate that, uh, and in, in fact, the British Prime Minister is of Indian origin, and nobody talks about it. Yeah, Rishi Sunak. Uh -huh. The important thing is his competence and his ability to govern in the country. It's unfortunate that uh, at this stage of our national life, we should be talking like this. Um, I think we should have got a 
a stage where we recognize that the most important thing is the competence of the person. And in any case, what are we really talking about? Who can be more negotiable than a, a root virus? Yeah. Uh -huh. We have been existing uh, for a very long time. If you Lagos. go back in our history, Lagos was a colony. Yeah. And some of the people that are saying this were in what would have qualified to be called the hinterland. But no one wants to go there. Today we should recognize that we are all Nigerians. We are all brothers. Uh, we stand in brotherhood even though our origins may be different. So I'm surprised that uh, such an issue should be coming up at, at this time. Sure. So I, I want to say something that before you come up, you know, during the last, you, you cited Kemi Badenok and the yes. Richie Sunak emergence as the yeah. Prime Minister of UK. Yeah. Richie Sunak is from an Indian and says, um, Indian, uh, is a descent of Indi yeah. an Indian descent, yeah. let me use the language, an Indian descent. Yeah. His parents um, migrated to, the, to Britain yeah. and uh, he schooled there and the rest. Yeah. But you see, he still have much tie towards his cultural heritage from India. Yeah. But he's the Prime Minister he's of prime minister. Britain. No, nobody and then in, in America, during the last election, the, la the midterm election they had last year, there were instances where I saw Nigerians, some Nigerians contesting other the Republican no, Party, yeah, some it. Republican we Party. Even it, though when yeah. even though maybe some did not win, but for the fact that they even clinched the ticket in the first place. Yeah. And then if you go to um you see the you see the hypocrisy here. This this person, the uh, Simon Ikpa, right? Yes. Yeah, the IPOP, one of the IPOP chief team, he's handling a very important office appointment in Finland, right? Mm -hmm. If you go to Canada, there are a lot of Nigerians handling political appointments or being elected into office. And nobody is talking about African invasion or Nigerian invasion. And we go there, we Nigerians, we travel to this country hoping that we we'll one day become president of this country or even, and you know, and also contribute their quota to the role of yeah. this country. But mm -hmm. in our own country, we wouldn't want to allow our fellow brothers simply because you say you are from so -so tribe, yeah. don't come and dominate here. One, so <laughs> one famous writer said, one of our, uh, Nathan Joy, one of our writers said, if ethnicity were racism, we will, the way we are carrying on, we will probably carry the banner of the most racist people in the world. Sure. It's unfortunate. Uh, these are the things Obama was talking of when he visited Kenya the other time. You, you are not going to get anywhere if you emphasize tribe. You are going to get somewhere if you emphasize competence. competence. We are all from somewhere. Sure. Uh -huh. sure. We Historically, we have not gained anything from emphasizing tribal conflict. All we get from it is tribal conflict, tribal, tribal division, conflict. and all that. It's and a time no, we, no good reason. No, no. There's nothing so good you, that comes a, out a certain it. president expects, uh, for instance, the, the, the president of um, the candidate of the uh, APC, mm -hmm. Ashwa Dubola Ametunubu, he expects to get vote from the southeast and other part of Nigeria. Yeah, of course. And then yeah. Peter will be also expect to get vote from the southwest yeah, and other part yeah, of Nigeria. Exactly. So if you are playing tribe, there's no need of us having a president yeah, exactly. and seeking for vote from anywhere. Yeah, exactly. So I want to hear your thoughts, sir. Um, Ola, mm. Okay. So I think the first thing I'll say is that racism is everywhere. Uh, racism is the senior brother of tribalism. Exactly. It's the same thing. <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah, the same thing. <laughs> yeah, they are siblings. Okay. Um, the important thing is that it's human nature to default to your lowest level of identity. So, for instance, when Nigerians go out, of, when they meet outside the country, tribalism is not as emphasized, you know, because we are Nigerians. When you're in Nigeria, then you fall into um, yeah, yeah, tribalism. You know, even within the tribe, there are divisions. Yeah, exactly. You find the Yorubas, the Oyos, and the Ibadu people, and they all have differences. If you go within the city, there are differences in families. Your family is this, your family is that. So it's human nature. What is unnatural is actually taking the time to build bridges. So that what we are focusing on is what we have in common. If you say competence, that's still, um, I mean, for me to know you are competent, then I must be able to assess what you've done, you know, score it, make sure it's measured. Mm -hmm. um, what is critical is building bridges. If we say we don't expect that we're going to do to, to respond this way, my question is, what have we done 
to make sure that people don't default to this behavior. You understand? What do we have in common? We're all humans. We feel emotions. We have the same desires, fears, you know, at the end of the day. So I'm not, in, in summary, I'm not surprised what is going on. And, and I think it's a wake up call to, because it's showing us fault lines. When we are pressurized, this is how we react. We fall back to those identity levels. And we need to consciously take the step to build bridges to make sure that, um, like you said last week, I think, travel, get to know people beyond what you've heard, um, you know, form personal connections and get deeper insight into the humanity of people. Okay, um, I'm going to ask you something, your thought on this. What's the constitution, according to the Nigerian constitution, a Nigerian can live anywhere. And Nigeria is an indivisible territory, right? Yeah, yeah. You lawyers are good with yeah, these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an indivisible territory, right? Yeah. Every part of Nigeria is Nigeria. Yeah. If you're in Lagos, you're in Nigeria. As a Nigerian, you can live, thrive, and work in any part of Nigeria, right? Yeah. Now, I also want to understand, a Nigerian can also be vote and be voted for in any part of Nigeria, exactly. irrespective of tribal background. Exactly. Why is it that we have not realized the full potential of this? You still see people giving birth to their children in one part of... Let me use Lagos ex again as a case study. Let's say, for instance, now, many of us we are giving birth to in Lagos, a lot of us. Mm. But your parents will tell you, oh, your state of origin, when you are feeling from state of origin, you call your father's state. Mm. But they gave birth to you in Lagos, mm. right? Mm. So the question is, why can't we just realize the full potential of that clause in the Constitution? Mm. Anybody, maybe it means if you are if you are a descent of Hausa, mm. Fulani, Igbo, Yoruba, what have you, mm. Ishekiri. But if you are living in a particular side, especially when you are giving birth to in that side, you are supposed to be able to play your role in that part. Or you've stayed, you've contributed to the development of that part of the country. You should be voted and be voted for. In in, in the early days in Nigeria, I think a Malam or this is a Fulani man was one time mayor in Enugu, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. This thing happened. That was Nigeria. Why can't we have this repeated? Why is much emphasis on you are from social states? And Why? I might, I might add, an Igbo man was once uh, uh, head of the uh, Lagos City Council. But the point I, I want to make, we have been independent for, say, over 60 years now. The point to Lou makes is important. But the truth is, I also see that at the level of ordinary Nigerians, a lot of us have come together and we have intermixed. In front, in front of many of your houses or your neighbors and all that, you find you live with evils, you live with houses, and you really have no significant problem with them. What is dangerous and what we must not allow to continue is to use our divisions as a political strategy to win votes. That's, that's what is dangerous now. Toxic politicking. Toxic politicking. That is what divides people, creates the situation, like what happened in Rwanda, like what happened in Bosnia. Yes. It's, it, when you use, um, when, when you manipulate people politically to win votes, that's the dangerous thing. It's happened before, and we are seeing it happening again. At the... Um, at the lower levels between people, our people don't have problems within themselves. Yeah, poverty has no drive. No, the Igbo man and the Yoruba man and the Hausa man and the Bibio man, really, they have no problem within them. They, they deal with themselves. They relate, they trade together. It's not as if there's a major problem between us, but it is dangerous for politicians to keep dividing us, manipulating us. Because uh, if you look at it, at, 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 at the top, they are actually united. Sure. So it's unfortunate that any politician will think that he wants to use to divide us. And it's dangerous. We it's shouldn't it's go this way. It's a strategy. Mm. But people just manipulated them. And look at what happened. Look at the, in Bosnia. You, can, you can't tell a Muslim from a non-Muslim. But political manipulation can do anything. I personally can't tell a Jew from a German. But look at what political manipulation did. did. So, so it's very dangerous. And it's something that, that we should guard against. It's a road that we should not pass. Very unfortunate. Yes. So that means there's no need of we crying foul of racism when we are committing the same thing, tribalism. Exactly. Exactly. It's like Keto calling Port Black. We, 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 you, we, you accuse the British or the Americans for allowing racism to thrive in their country. And yet, in your own country, 
African countries, you, you, yeah, you tribalism, yeah, yeah, which is yeah, so. How, how do we guard against it? You said. Yes, I think um, uh, polit our political actors recently signed a peace accord. Uh, the president was there, and everybody was there. I was, I was saying at the time, ah, you, if you don't have mechanism for enforcement, why are you signing any form of accord? So the issue is now on the ground now. There is a peace accord, but people are using tribe and to cause confusion to breach the peace. I don't know what that peace committee can do to step in now. Because now we are seeing it, like I said before, there was no mechanism for enforcement. Yeah. But the peace committee ought to speak up. It's supposed to be a special tribunal yes, the, the, to look at. Yes, no, the, the peace committee is supposed to be the one that uh, comes out and talks and enforces these things. I see some of them talk. Father Cook has been uh, yeah. has been talking. Yeah. He has been yeah. criticizing the Bishop Cooker. Uh, yes, Bishop Cooker. He has been criticizing all the uh, spokesmen for the political parties for for, uh, for, for for their principles, the betrothal language they have been using. He has been condemning it. But beyond that, the peace committee needs to come out and say this kind of politics is not right. And perhaps they need to name names. Yeah. Need to point they to people. To and, uh -huh. people and shame. Yeah. Maybe we yeah. need to shame people so it's that they Exactly. So that the principals call their people to order. That some of these things are not. Uh, Imagine an audacity uh, someone order. had put something on social media and was making reference to the Labour candidate, Labour uh, Party gubernatorial candidate of Lagos and said he's not going to be made as governor. And in fact, threatening him. Yeah. And you know, the police is not supposed to wait, yeah. they are supposed to apprehend such individual yes. because it's a crime the police That's will have a, a, a role to play hate because speech. you see we are seeing the beginnings of people burning places and all that destroying people's know, houses uh, threatening voters threatening telling voters, them you must vote for social person but more than that the political leaders too need to step in the peace committee needs to step in and uh, I, I think what we are what we are seeing more is uh, toxic manipulation of of uh, uh, tribal sentiments to end votes and that should stop all right thank you very much before we round up this is women's moon we will not stop without saying something to encourage all the women yeah. in nigeria yeah, okay. so and in africa and the world mm -hmm. you know i said you um dr okunjo mm -hmm. i said some things about um, the need for giving women a chance and encouraging them women are competent competence has no gender that is the, i'm trying to paraphrase what she said in geneva mm -hmm. during the international women's day celebration held march 8th and then i listened to christian amapon on mm -hmm. cnn too mm -hmm. she was recounting her experiences you know as a cnn war correspondent you know going to where especially where there are crises like if you go to afghanistan iraq the issue of uh, hijab suppressing women's rights to education and other things so let's just say something to encourage women oh. especially we have some women that just emerged for the first time, like uh, Yeliti Kingibe, mm -hmm. as the first uh, senator elect of uh, Abuja, and some other women too, trying one way or the other to do something positive in the country and the world at large. So I just want to hear one thought from you to round up. Let me start with you, Mr. Oludulapo. Just say something positive, and we will move to Mr. Agyode. Okay, uh, something positive. Mm. <laughs> um, I think. If we focus on competence, above all, uh, the opportunities are going to show themselves. And as society becomes better, you know, it will become more accessible to, um, you know, the female gender more than it is now. Mrs. Guadabe was once in in that position, I a think, long a long time ago. Kerat Guadabe was the first. A senator from Abuja. Yeah, FCT, right? FCT, yes, yes, yes. So it's a good thing that um, King Gigby Iriti is continuing in to, that track. Yes. yes, although it was broken, right? Yes, the, it was the broken yeah, in between. Yeah, yeah, in between yes, okay, yes, yes. all right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your inputs. So let's try our best to see how to encourage politics that had void of tribalism, hatred, any form of bigotry against one another. Nigeria belongs to everyone. I know Nigeria is more Nigerian than any other Nigeria, both within and outside Nigeria. Oludulakpo Ojilabi is next after the break.
new Nigeria starts with you. Politicians can never change this country, not without you. You are the most powerful person occupying the most powerful position in Nigeria, the office of the citizen. The success or failure of Nigeria depends on you, not the politicians, you. I know what you're thinking. I can see that you are frustrated with the current state of our country, and it's understandable to feel angry and powerless when we see problems around us that seem beyond our control. But I want to remind you that there are things you can do in the office of the citizen to make a powerful difference, even if they may seem small. Firstly, remember that you have direct control over your own actions and behavior. You can choose to be kind, compassionate, and respectful towards others, even if you disagree with them. You can also choose to stand up against discrimination, prejudice, and injustice whenever you encounter them in your own life. Secondly, you can get involved in your local community and work towards positive change at a grassroots level. Now imagine 50 million citizens who are just like you, doing the same thing and working on change within their local communities. No political party can change cause that kind of change. Now this could involve volunteering for local charities or advocacy groups, joining a neighborhood association, or attending town hall meetings to voice your concerns. Thirdly, you can make a difference through the choices you make as a consumer by choosing to support companies and products that align with your values. You can send a message to businesses that they need to prioritize ethical and sustainable practices, practices that help create a better country for everyone. Finally, I want to encourage you to stay informed and engaged with the issues that matter to you. By staying up to date on current events and seeking out diverse perspectives, you can better understand the complexities of the challenges facing our country and the world. And by sharing your knowledge and insights with others, you can inspire positive change in your own community as a powerful individual in the office of the citizen. You have two options. You can choose to focus on the negative aspects of our current situation, or you can choose to look for opportunities to create positive change and make a difference in your immediate environment. I know that it can be overwhelming to think about all the problems facing our country today. However, I believe that by recognizing the power we have as holders of the office of the citizen, focusing on the things we can control and working towards positive change in our own lives, we can create a brighter future for ourselves and for future generations. All right. So, I'm coming from a direction where I can tell you that over my decades of existence as a Nigerian, there's been constant focus on how powerless we are to make things change. And we're always looking to the powers above us. And there's, you know, there's this different perspective where we're not focusing on what we can't do at the negative, but what we can do at the level of the individual. When you said um, the issue that, you know, amongst each other, we don't have, we don't really have issues, but it's those from above, you know, I was saying in my mind, that's exactly what we need for the individual to know that with him lies the power. And if you take all these small things that seem Irrelevant. Now, imagine everybody in this room, for instance, let's assume we're a country. You know, let's assume you're Aosa. I know you're not, but let's assume you're Aosa. I'm, I'm Igbo, you're Yoruba. I could be. <laughs> I possible. could have Aosa blood, I don't know it. That's it exactly, it's exactly. You actually have Aosa blood, I don't know it. It's true, it's possible. Uh -huh. so, so, you know, if we have, if, if, we, if we relate with each other based on the human level, you know, and I'm looking for how can I do things that will benefit the three of us, mm -hmm. you know? I'm thinking about how I can strengthen the values that I hold, you know, to be very strong, that I hold to be very important 
it's, it's you viewing what I'm doing cascades upwards. And before we know it, we have a great effect in the nation. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to start with you, Elijah. Um, in what ways have you, um, you know, worked on the positive side of what could be in the country? Your questions are always very thoughtful. <laughs> well, my, my personal capacity, right from my university days up to now, I always have a sense of service and leadership, an exemplary living, a model in Nigeria. So I've worked with several organizations in time past to foster unity, maybe through programs that encourage young people to understand the excellence of leadership and community development within their environments up to this moment, I still like to interact with other young persons and make them to understand how they can be better. Because when you are better as an individual, the country is going to be better. It's going to be a summation of every other thing. So we are crying today about issues facing us as Nigerians. We have poverty. These are the major issues, poverty and uh, maybe uh, not lack of uh, enough opportunities for young people and the rest. But in our own little corner, we should try and encourage other young people, young people to young people, mentor people you can, skill transfer, skills transfer, you know, treat, teach people you can, train people, and then those people that have the means to. You don't have to be in government to um, support young people or women or anybody. You can, if you have the means to, you can maybe work with relevant government agency just to push this through, maybe by creating awareness, funding opportunity for women and youth for their businesses and all those things. And above all, drive national consciousness. The, the tribalism you see is a, is, is, a, is a thief of our democratic processes. We are facing insecurity and poverty. These two conditions have no tribe, have no religion. And yet you see some people whipping up religious, ethno-religious sentiment thereby be clouding our sense of reason that we cannot even solve our problem. We don't even know where to start solving the problem. Mm. So above all, if you, those people that are seeking political office, if they didn't give you an opportunity to run for an office, mm. that thing you said you want to do, try and do it in your own personal capacity. It's achievable. Mm. It's achievable. If you go meet relevant government agencies, you do the right thing. I'm sure if you try to tell them this and this and this, no, no, there's no way they will not want to buy into your, and give you some sort of, it, it might not be easy, but it's possible for you to work with the government when necessary to encourage young people and women in a large scale. I'm using young people and women because these are the um, demographics that are more affected by our problems in Nigeria. Insecurity is affecting a lot of young people and women. You know how many women that have been married off to terrorists, killed, mm. raped, and young people killed too, or even kidnapped, or used as, as thugs, social vices involved because they want to survive. Even if you, cannot, you don't have the capacity to reach out to government institution for partnership, at an individual level, you can help your neighbor, inspire people within your community to be a positive Nigerian, a positive change. That's what I think. Thank you very much. You know, uh, it's from the citizens that we end up getting the leaders. So a lot of times you hear that we, we, we get the leaders we deserve because mm. they are us. A yeah, reflection know. of who we are. Some of us, when we get there, we'll do the same things because we've not, we've not mm. built that office where, you know, mm. what, you, what you do in a small way is what you're going to do in a big yeah, way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So mm. what's your take on this? Yeah, okay. Um, very interesting issue. Um, I, I, I feel, when I think of these things, I remember Chinua Achebe, <laughs> God bless his soul. You know, he used to say then that... He seems you're an audience reader of Chinua Achebe's work. Oh, I work. love him. Yeah. yeah. He, he, seems to, he used to say then that the problem with Nigeria is simply and squarely that of leadership. In fact, that was the first... He sent first sentence in his book. But you are right. The citizen is important. You go down the street, you look at what citizens have done for their country. 
Um, Martin Luther King held no office till he died. Mahatma Gandhi held no office till he died. He didn't hold any office. Mm -hmm. it's, it's strange, but he never held any office. But he was very influential in the affairs of his country. So there's a, there's a place for the citizen and the influence they can bring about to bear on this country. Mother Teresa was just, uh, she was just a nun. In fact, she lived most of her life in half seclusion. But each time she went into society, she impacted society. We can impact society. When I was young, younger, uh, younger I'm, okay, <laughs> you think I'm still young. Yeah. <laughs> when I was younger, in my professional life, uh, we were part of a loose association of, of uh, groups. Uh, my principal then was the head of, uh, was the director of legal service of CLO. And I, I remember I, when I was doing some of those cases uh, in, the, in, in fundamental human rights, I felt uh, maybe this is why I came to read law, not because of, not merely because of the money. Because I took, one took particular joy in, 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 um, in doing cases in which you, f you could identify some wrong had been done and you needed to cure it and all that. So it gave us some particular sense of joy. Then during the military era, you remember, there were so many citizen groups which tried, in fact, this democracy we have now owes much to many of those groups. If you remember, some of our military uh, rulers actually wanted to be permanent dictators. And it was switching over from military to Agbada. Exactly. Like, to Agbada. In, in fact, we were lucky. We, with Abacha, he was so determined that he set up five parties. And they all said it was him they were going to give me man, political manipulation. <laughs> they all said it was him and so only him. Step down and become yes, it was him and only him that him. could become. We were just lucky that the man just died. <laughs> uh, if he had not died, perhaps right now we'd be li living under dictatorship. But all those groups gave him and others before him, IBB, also it was rumored that IBB, that was his intention as late as 1990, that it was his intention to become a permanent ruler. And citizens pushed him to the wall, gathering of citizens. The problem I'm seeing nowadays, and I ask often, where are the gathering of citizens like that, that group that can be called civil society? It's vanishing. You see, if you, you say rulers come from followers, but recently I read an article, and you see the number of governors who become senators, who become governors, who become <laughs> presidents. It is, it, you, you, can't <laughs> really, you can't now truthfully say that follow, leadership is coming from followership again. No, it seems that now in Nigeria, Leadership is recycling itself. <laughs> but where are the citizens? That's the problem. Where are, where are we? Where is the citizen? That's why Olu's uh, uh, talk is very important. We need to awaken the office of the citizen, whether as one or in the collective. So you find the uh, Caucasian race. As an individual, they are not strong, but they are strong as a collective. We need to awaken the office of citizen, joining hand to hand. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your input. Mm -hmm. Stephen Agyode is next after the break. Mm -hmm. engagement we need to have. Those who suffer miscarriages are never taken into account. Members of the National Assembly are also influenced by the last. You are sitting on Nigeria's money. From the barbing, I pay my land. From the barbing, I send my, my children to school. A consultative engagement. No any tangible notification before they ban us. It's one thing for people to be at your back and the heat of the moment. 
and I'm waiting for them just to be able to when push comes to shore. Beavers, election management and black holes. On the 25th of February 2023, Nigeria held its seventh in the series of presidential elections since the advent of the Fourth Republic in 1999. Even before the Fourth Republic, elections in Nigeria have been a matter of great contention with allegations of rigging of results and other forms of electoral malpractice often leading to violence. In an attempt to curb this, INEC in 2015 first introduced the permanent card reader. It since replaced this with the ZPAD. Then the ZPAD linked with IREV portal. Then now Beavers, all of which it only experimented with, with in off cycle elections, the last of which was the election of Oshun State, which at the time of the February 25th election was still the subject of litigation. The presidential elections of February 25th also now is the subject of litigation upon which significant issues to be decided in the Oshun case will impact, such as what the status of Beavers machine is in the law of evidence. What is clear in all this is that Beavers technology, which was deployed to solve the problem of rigging, is creating new problems relating to the sanctity of information stored in a machine for the purposes of legal audit. This is aside the fact that nothing is known of whether or how INEC has been updating the software used in these machines in, to the level necessary to prevent hacking. Even INEC has confessed to having experienced glitches in the management of this system. We know, of course, that in order to avoid the black hole to which the use of technology can descend, many of the nations which pioneered its use for elections have moved away from it. But this is far from the only black hole that threatens election management in Nigeria today. We now know that out of the, a projected population of 200 million or more, only 9 million voted for the declared winner. We have about 93 million registered voters and about 87 million are reported to have collected their voters' card. Yet, only 24.9 million actually voted. It is a patently false argument to attribute this that makes us about the lowest ranking African nation in voter turnout, merely to crash, uh, cash crunch due to the disastrous implementation of the Naira redesign policy. Because year after year, Election after election, our voter turnout figures have gone down, as if our people have been disappearing in plain sight into black holes. Clearly, there is a cause for concern in all this. Deployment of technology in election needs to be preceded by a broad national debate and understanding and agreement on all the details involved. As a German court pointed out in 2005, in suspending its use, it must be possible for, ordinary, for the ordinary voter to understand all the processes surrounding its use without resort to experts. The maximum information about them ought to be made known in advance. INEC also ought to be concerned and investigate the issue of the disappearing voter because low turnout raises serious issues about the legitimacy of governments and the future of this democracy. We have not had a civil war in recent years, and allusions to a large number of dead people in the register just won't cut it, given the number and magnitude of the disappeared. Mm -hmm. So there are two issues in this. First of all, what is called into question is the use of technology. Uh, we know, all of us, from our private lives, that the use and maintenance of technology is an expensive thing. Um, but it's an effective and efficient Before process. we go to that, it's an expensive thing. First of all, in order to prevent hacking, you have to update constantly. You have to, uh, in order to avoid glitches, you have to make sure you are constantly updating and all that and all that. But <coughs> beyond the update, 
it is important that whatever system you are using, the average John on the street should be familiar with it, should understand it. It is important there should be agreements about it. It shouldn't be that uh, we get to election day and discover <coughs> something you said you would photocopy and transmit immediately to your server. Your server is not working. It, this, this doesn't cut it. Uh -huh. These are things we need to have agreed on before. We need to know it, and we need to stick by it. That's on one hand. Then the, there's the other issue, uh, other important issue. Since 1999, if you look at the statistics, mm -hmm. the number of people voting have been coming down. I mean, how can you have, say, 93 million registered voters, and your winner is someone that won with 90 million? That means the majority of people did not vote for him. It's a serious issue in democracy. Where are all the people going? Year by year, it's reducing. So we can't say it's because of this cast crunch. What is happening? It's something on a national scale and I next should be worried about. What is happening? Why are people seemingly vanishing? Do you get my point? Mm. So these are the two issues I think we can discuss. And then beyond this place, I think there should also be a national debate about it. <laughs> if I might go, um, mm. the second issue, mm. which is, you know, reduction, it, it's not easy to attribute a particular cost to it. Um, we can say, yes, people are not so confident that their vote matters anymore. We could say that's, that's a point. We could say so many people have left the country. We could say people have died. But what I find interesting from what you just said is that INEC has not really looked into it. I, I noted it in passing when I was looking through some of the data, you know, that it's actually reducing, you know. Um, if INEC is really interested in carrying out all its full functions, you know, they should be able to find a way to gather information. And then let's check all the parameters because a lot of times the actual reason is not what people think when data actually comes you know, to it. So what I'll be interested in is how one could get INEC to own up to that responsibility and spell out the steps they will take to address it or at least to find out what the cause is. Because we can, we can finish this conversation right now and then it's not until another four years when we are recording the figures that will now say, oh, it has reduced further. You know, so that, that would be what I want to look at. You know, what, what tools do we have to really push for, for um, a, an analysis of, of this, this, trade, this trend we are seeing? Well, I, I think first and foremost, the issue of low voter turnout. This time around, I won't speak of other elections. I want to speak about this election. Mm -hmm. uh, voter apathy is one where the process is to even register your. There are a lot of people that try to register, but they could not. Maybe due to That's an, an INEC issue. Yeah, uh, INEC issue, large queues at the um, INEC registration center and some other mm -hmm. one or two things and the rest. So. Mm -hmm. Many of them that actually had the votes were either scared or worried or mm. about their security or they were just not just interested anymore. Voter mm. apathy, mm. tired of mm. the status quo, mm. where no much encouragement, no much sensitization election. Mm. And then the other aspect of it is, I'm going to talk about um, the use of technology. Yes, I want to applaud INEC chairman initially. I said, okay, bringing out beavers is a good idea because it's going to curb this process. But then we don't know whether beavers is not a blessing or a cause. <laughs> because you see what has happened. Everybody was uh, applauding, oh, well, this, that. But the, what I'm going to say to INEC um, chairman now is that if you can resolve this beavers issue, let's think bigger. I was expecting, at the day, the day of election, I was expecting that when I get there, I'm not going to thumbprint anymore. I will just click on, after they verified me, I will just yeah, click on something, yeah, punch yeah. a button, and, see, that, and this is, so they should think about that. That's that the process you are talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah they that's should solve this problem. problem. That's in that, the general court was actually pointing out that if you want to use anything, 
average Joe should know. Explain. It should but they can explain to them in local languages. Most exactly. Know it should, they understand I, I shouldn't need an expert. They can be, they can be, a, they can have like maybe your polling center, mm. a, a certain polling center that has the necessary facility mm. where powered and lighted have these machines. Mm -hmm. Go and stand there. When is your turn? Line up, go and stand mm. there. Punch a button. At the moment you punch that button, it's been transmitted and it's, yeah. it's registered in the database. Yeah. If you don't know, if you're not computer literate or you're not literate enough, yeah. INEC officials should be there to guide you and it should be properly guarded in, by security operatives to fact, avoid the law from interfering. An important point that because Yeager, this uh, thumbprinting will not cut There was away. an important point that Yega Africa pointed to. It, it pointed out that maybe INEC, being that the technology was new, should have tried to do a mock Mock trial. National trial. Wow. They didn't oh, learn from yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't learn from the Oshu State you know, election. Yeah, yeah, they should have yeah. learned from that one. The yeah, Oshu State yeah. election. You saw what happened. Yeah. The argument between both sides, PDP and APC, yeah. over the yeah. result. Yeah. No, it's they in have the not court. learned from it. It's yeah. still in the court yeah, now. Yeah, court. So just imagine. Look, okay, the same process. Mm. It's not like a repeating. Yeah, exactly. Now yeah. the presidential election, they are going to court. Yeah. How do we know the gubernatorial election? They will not still go to court. Yeah, exactly. So they are stressing the judiciary. Yeah, exactly. So why don't we learn from our mistake? And if possible. I don't know. It's my opinion. I, it's not a bad thing if they suspend all elections until this issue is resolved. Well, it's for us to learn learn from it for the future. In future, when you are introducing something new, maybe you need to do a mock trial of it on a large scale. A dry run. Yes. Mm. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Mm. The end always seems to come too soon on the advocates. However, the advocacy continues on our social media platforms, on Facebook, Plus TV Africa. Hashtag the advocate ng or on Twitter and Instagram at plus TV Africa. Hashtag the advocate ng. To catch up with the previous broadcasts, go to plus TV Africa.com forward slash the advocate ng. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel plus TV Africa. Till next week, same time on this station. Let's keep advocating for a better society. Bye.
Hello and welcome to What Are You Saying? Hashtag Ways, where we talk about topics in the news as it affects us all. I am Usaiwa Mesali and today is a special day. It's supposed to be our ladies' night out, but we have a gentleman in our midst. So let me start with him first. The Honorable <laughs> Olumide, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You're looking amazing, by the way. Thank very, you. very Lagosian. I can thank see. You. Thank you. <laughs> how are you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. So how was your day? How was the election? Fever coming up. Uh, my day has been long so far. Um, just trying to cover as much ground between now and Thursday. Uh, but the process has been really enjoyable. I'm learning a lot and I'm really optimistic for a Saturday. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I have NJ with me and Adiola. They're ready for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, ladies? Good. How was your day? Well, long day, but productive, yeah. very productive. Yeah. yeah, long day. Same here, same <laughs> here. I had a very long mm. day, honestly. Mm. But we signed, we, we signed at least one deal. Oh, so great. With payments. Great. great. That, that makes us uh, happy. Makes but hey, happy. I mean, it's a fantastic season where, mm -hmm. I mean, rounding up this uh, election fever, because let it just yeah. come and be going. Um, and again, Saturday is almost here, so yeah. it was important that as much as we can, we accommodate a lot of candidates, you know, yeah. just to hear. You in particular, a lot of people have a lot of problems with you. <laughs> I will we'll probably bring that up during the mm -hmm. conversation. But yeah. we're discussing, I mean, a continuation of what we had started yesterday on governance, you know, we're talking about the race, you know, so in this case, we're talking about the race to the assembly. And here's what we are repeating our quote for yesterday, because we think it's very apt and very relevant for, you know, for the season that we're in. So the quote says, we cannot be mere consumers of good governance. We must be participants. We must be co-creators. I mean, this quote is so apt, right? Very. It's not enough for you to say that. And that's why when I heard some people argue about Olympiades candidacy, for me, I just feel like, mm, but hey, freshness, first of all, is what we want. True. In the ballot, we want to start to see fresh faces. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you can't complain about if, the process and true. you're not involved. Involved, in so yeah. For, yeah. For, for the fact that some people have decided to just step out of their comfort zone to participate, true. that is enough ground to say, well done, you know. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm backing you up. Thank first. you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, all right, so the Nigerian 2023 governorship and state house of assembly elections will happen in exactly four days. And now more than ever, Nigerians should, um, should Nigerians, especially the youth, pay attention to how they are being governed, right? That's the question. Now, Olumide Owaru, that's right, is a Labour Party candidate for Surulere constituency one. <laughs> so he's joined us. And he'll be discussing with us as we um, discuss the issues around, you know, the assembly, the state house of assembly. And also later when we open our phone lines, we really love to hear what you have to say. Please don't attack our guests. <laughs> Normally we don't bring guests on open mm -hmm. days, but don't attack our guests. But we'd love to hear. And if you have questions for him as well, it'd be nice to also ask those questions, right? We'll do all of that. But first, let's quickly go on a break. When we come back, we want to quickly check what we found in the news. Stay with us. For upcoming artists to blow in Nigeria. Welcome to Plus Trending. I am Wiki November, your host, saying thank you for joining us on today's episode. Welcome back. It's tea time on Plus TV Africa. Practice makes perfect. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. He's a king. He's entitled to marry a hundred if he wants to. All right, thanks for staying with us. Now, celebrated March 7, National Be Heard Day is an occasion for small business owners and aspiring owners to make their voices heard. The day celebrates small businesses and encourages them to stand up for themselves and their ideas and lay claims to their share of the market. Omar, 
whether we like it or not, small businesses are the drivers of our the economy. economy. Absolutely. Globally. Absolutely. And, you know, they are the ones that employ the most. Yeah. You know, it seems small, but they actually contribute heavily to the GDP. And the thing about small businesses is that even they themselves don't respect the power that they wield. Yeah. You know, the people they employ don't, ex don't respect the power that they wield, right? They I do not know. Yeah. They don't know. So, yeah, you, you know, for yeah. instance, as a small business owner, you employ someone and you're paying the person, let's say, 50,000 naira. Mm -hmm. The person will not respect you. But the same person will go to a bank and the pay bank is paying them 30,000 naira. Mm. You know, but because I'm working yeah. for you, big organization. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but hey, I think it's always nice to, to hear small businesses and that's why for us here every Friday we try as much as possible yeah. to dedicate you know to talk about the challenges around small businesses and see how we can improve them it'll be nice to know what you plan to do for small businesses in your mm -hmm. constituency mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. Surya is one of the industrial and um, what's it called com commercial capitals of, yeah. of Lagos, of Lagos a lot of yeah. activities I remember when I first moved into Lagos it was uh, what did they call it? everybody there's one particular salon and make it, um, make it are you no, make, make, now make me if you've not gone to that bobbies if Bobby's. you've not gone to that salon you see, really, you've not you've not gone to you know the salon <laughs> because it was like the whole of lego yeah. lego uh, lagos yeah. girls would always go to so it was like the hub yeah aggregating until lucky opened up yeah. you know and they started you know yeah. um, sharing their market mm -hmm. but it mm -hmm. really, really has always been you know, so that's why hey, you have a lot of work on your hands. <laughs> I think <laughs> he's ready. He's just smiling. You <laughs> he's just smiling. smiling. <laughs> he looks very chilled and calm. Yeah, but chill oh, well. <laughs> She's also there. Don't even worry. Denise has, you know, well, he has a plan. plan. Oh, look, yeah. has a, a, I am actually a, very, a, very, very interested. So the question is, that what, what plans do you have for small businesses in Surrey? Oh, that's the question. Yes. Have you started? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things about, about Surrey is it's a one-stop shop, right? Literally everything you need is in Surrey. And one of the things that we need to start promoting is the value of small businesses and small business owners. Um, just off of how the economy has been, especially of recent, um, it's been a bit of a chore, especially for people that are just trying to start um, their own businesses. So one of the things that uh, we have planned to do if elected into office is to make sure that loans are easier to be accessed. Um, also incentives um, for small businesses in, in terms of um, what they would like to do to give back as their um, social responsibility and also involve bigger players um, from the corporate sector to come and really set up more of their corporate social responsibility in um, Sri Lanka so that we can just make the environment um, a, lot, a lot better to work in. For example, if we work on things like, say, um, transportation systems now and set up um, grants or, or involve um, existing transition businesses to come and set up shops working with the network of small business owners. That can help to ease some of the amounts that they spend in terms of getting goods from one place to the other. So that's just some of the things that we have planned for. I'll ask more questions later <laughs> because there's something around multiple taxation. Mm -hmm. So maybe you should breathe on that. Right, of course. Yeah. Yeah, but I'd, let's quickly go. Quickly, what did you find oh, for us in the okay, news? So. Um, waiting game as lawyers argue CBN's compliance with Supreme Court's verdict. So, of course, um, there is the talk about Nigerians may endure cash squeeze for weeks despite Supreme Court ruling. And um, But this is what I find particularly interesting. So, I think the problem is there is for and against, you know. Some, some people are on the side that uh, because... Um, the the suite or you know petition to supreme court it doesn't involve cbn you know some legal minds are of the opinion that well cbn is not particularly um obligated, obligated you know that to clear. oblige that and then some people so really again the law is such that um you know they have exactly it's interpretation. interpretation exactly so while we wait i can't do lawyer work <laughs> While we wait, the CBN is very silent on this. And, um, of course, we know that Emefile cannot really say anything. He has to um, get his instructions from the president. And, um, well, the president has not said anything. CBN has not said anything. Supreme Court is talking. 
Governors are talking. Governors are talking. <laughs> so they need money for elections. We are wait <laughs> and let us see how this right. just plays out. You know. Right, so. right, right. Angel, what did you find for us? Oh, in the so news? my what's in the news is a peculiar story about uh, four U.S. citizens who got mm. kidnapped in northern Mexico border of Matamoros. Now what's that in mm. After gunmen opened fire on their vehicle, um, according to the FBI, the four had crossed the border into Matamoros on Friday and were traveling in a white minivan with North Carolina license plates when their vehicle came on the fire shortly after entering Mexico. The FBI um, San Antonio division stated that all four Americans were placed in the vehicle and then taken, to, taken from the scene by the armed robbers. The conditions were unknown. I think as of today, that's the that's the video playing. Mm, yeah, as of today, I saw dead. in the news that two have been found dead mm. and two are still alive. And the incident resulted in the death of a Mexican citizen. And the FBI is currently offering a fifty thousand um, dollar reward uh, for the return of the victims and the arrest of the culprits. Mm. You see. Um, yeah, I think something similar, a similar incident happened um, a couple of years, uh, I think last year, actually in October, where a certain lady called Shequila Robinson went to Mexico in company of seven of her friends. I think there were seven and they went there for, I think, a birthday party. And there was an altercation with, between the friends. And um, eventually this resulted in the death of Shani, uh, Shequila. Shankwila. Yeah. You know, the thing is, they actually said, because I was watching the news, and they said that these are like part of, you know, the way the U.S. give advisory. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they had given them advisory to say that there are no-go areas, that you don't just, you know, um, go to certain areas, you know, for... So I'm just wondering, what did they say in Mexico? Where did nothing go for another place? No, because freedom. This no. incident they were going, the lady was going for a tummy talk and had um, three of her friends escort you know going along so with because her. now because it's cheaper there yeah now you know the, the government is just wary that when they give travel advisory yeah. like that it's, it's not listen. because they just feel like telling you not to, to avoid they have intelligence this, they have actually, some yeah. information that mm. says this place is a volatile area mm. it's prone to kidnapping and they still go ahead most of even mexico is it's gangs yeah. and yeah. you know cartels and Absolutely. what have you so so my story is actually tied somewhat to dollar zone. Traders are saying that they cannot do transactions mm -hmm. without, you know, cash. Yeah. Um, the people they trade in, um, what's it now? These farmers that yeah. trade in Z rice or something, mm. right? So they don't want to do anything called electronic transactions. And their claim is that most of the transactions that they do, they buy from rural farmers and those mm -hmm. rural farmers yeah, don't they're know not inclusive. what yeah. bank accounts mm -hmm. are right mm -hmm. these are grain traders they, they trade in grains in abuja mm -hmm. so they are saying that most of the people they they buy this um grains from the farmers the local farmers they don't do transactions with um electronic means that it has to be cash so mm -hmm. they, ca they cannot see themselves going you know, cashless and doing transactions like yeah. that. Mm. So this thing is actually, so I keep on saying to CBN, it's a fantastic policy, but uh, we just have to find a way to make it all inclusive because yeah. Nigeria is not really, really fully ready for, yeah. you know, see today now, this transaction, I say I sealed, two, tra because it's, it's a big transaction, <laughs> Two a lot enter. The remaining two now, I don't they use corner eye, they check oh. whether it's coming I mean, that's in or not coming. That's even a day. And I had to let them go. Yeah. Just imagine, can I would I have left them to stay with mm -hmm. me until I see a lot? I can't mm -hmm. leave, leave yeah. them now yeah. Yeah. since been, 1 p.m. There have been certain in incidences just yeah. now while we were, we were doing makeup. I was just talking about it. I was trying to do a transfer and it was urgent. But I was stuck. Mm. I couldn't do with quick teller. I couldn't do. Well, so it's, it's, it's. And also here is your your your, your thought <laughs> of this no cash. cashless. <laughs> uh, it's not the most convenient <laughs> of times, mm -hmm. uh, but I am of the belief that the purpose of the entire thing was really just to make sure that the election period was free and fair. Those are the underlying factors that I personally think are the driving factors for a whole new Naira uh, design, design or the redesign. Um, the only problem is, is the back and forth. 
Um, that's where it's, it's a bit confusing. Today, some notes are legal tender. Tomorrow, they're not. Everybody's trying to go um, to the banks to access the, the, the uh, notes that you say they can get. First of all, you can't even use the ATMs that you manage to get to the bank. They're telling you you can't have more than 2K, 5K. Um, POS operators are building a house in Nikoi yeah. <laughs> off, of, of, off of the rates. You know, you're using the Naira to buy Naira. It's, it's ridiculous. So... I would have hoped that at least they would have tried to make it a much more comfortable transition for Nigerians because there are certain people that are really living on a day-to-day -day basis off of the monies that they get in cash. Um, and I think they're the ones doing you know, worse off in, in this situation. Absolutely. All right, so on that note, let's take a break. I want to face all the video words. <laughs> Let's, let's know his why, right? Mm -hmm. Let's know his why. Stay with us. We'll be right back. All right, thanks for staying with us now in Nigeria. A House of Assembly is the state-level legislature. Um, all Houses of Assembly are unicameral with elected members who are designated as members of the House of Assembly, Assemblymen, or MHA, and who serve four-year terms. Principally, um, the State House of Assembly is to make laws for the peace order and good governance of the state in respect of matters not in the exclusive legislative list but in concurrent list it could also legislate on other matters with which it is um, empowered by the constitution to do so so how much do you know about the house of assembly and how it directly impacts you as a citizen right that's the conversation now please let's hear what you have to say remember you can join us Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 0 You can also tweet at us at Wayshow Africa 1 with the hashtag Wayshow. So I must confess that, first of all, I am a very, very, how do I put it? I was not very um, interested in political issues until I was forced to, I mean, you know, until I, I was fortunate to be part of a breakfast show where we had to review the papers every day. And all of a sudden, you are now really focused on issues around what is happening, governance mm -hmm. and politics. And I think it has really transformed my life, you know, because, again, now I see a lot of things and I know where the problem is. You have a very critical um, and unique opportunity because, again, when voters go to the polls, all they are thinking of is governor and president. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And they forget that the people that make this people's job, whether good or bad, are the people that are the lawmakers. Mm. And in your instance, is on the state level where you're running to um, the House of Assembly. So in case people do not know, let me reintroduce our guests. All right, so Honorable Olumide Oguru is the Labour Party candidate for the Lagos State House of Assembly, Surulere Constituency 1, as a public figure and a, an actor. He believes in accessible leadership and youth inclusion and strives for betterment of the Surulere constituency. He attended King's College and the University of Lagos and graduated from Babcock University. So, let us officially welcome him again <laughs> to the show. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> Thank us. You. So, I mean, as I said, it's a critical role that you're going into. And I think one of the major routes that people had had was that, where did this one just come from? Right. You know, because all of a sudden it was like, okay, Labour Party won in Lagos, and you know, there's a wave of Peter B. Everybody's, you know, all the youth are, you know, you know, trying to support him, and all of that. And it's like you are trying to just, you know, ride on that wave, right? Maybe you should help us understand first of all why, why you decided to run, and you know. What exactly is, if you say you have certain issues in Surulere mm -hmm. that made you to come out, right. what would that problem be? That's why you're coming out. Right. So the main reason why I decided to run is I recognize that we are in a very um, significant period 
in, in Nigerian history. Um, this is the first time that the youth have had a mass awakening in terms of wanting to be politically aware and participate in, in the government process. Now, it's always something that I thought I would be doing, but I just thought it would be more later, later on. Yeah, so my friends and I would joke around and say, okay, maybe when we're 35, we'll join a party. Then around 40, we'll say maybe 42, we, you know, we'll contest and all of that. But the happenings in, in recent time have really just suggested that um, tomorrow isn't promised. Um, I've, I've lost uh, people really close to me. You know, my best friend passed uh, two years ago. And the, the, the period before he passed, the week before he passed, this was towards the end of 2021 in, um, in November, we had just talked about our plans for 2022. And we had done a whole breakdown, okay, January, I'm going to do this up until uh, December. He's a music producer, so he had given me his rollout plan for the year. And he passes the very next week. So I'm like, if we want to make impact and we're planning for the next, you know, 10, 15 years, what's the guarantee that we are going to be here in the next 10 or 15 years? So we need to start now. That's one. Number two, I also recognize my influence as a young individual in Nigeria today. And I understand that by just virtue of running for office, um, it will go a long way to inspire a lot of young Nigerians to also aspire to be in these positions. Um, so it's, it's bigger than just me. This is really me trying to be the voice of young people, trying to encourage other young people that we cannot be passive anymore. The policies that are being put in place now are going to affect us directly. We no longer have the canopy or the covering of mommy and daddy helping out. I remember back in the day, I would just go to my parents, I need X, Y, Z. How they get the money, don't really care. I just need it by 4 p.m. today. Mm. And if they don't give me by 4, problem. Mm. But now I'm understanding as, I, as I'm getting older that there's a lot that goes into getting money, especially in Nigeria. It is not the easiest to make money. Mm. So whatever policies are in place now are affecting us. If the exchange rate goes up and Naira is $1, one dollar to 2,000 Naira, that's affecting my buying power. I want to buy something online. I'm going to be spending way much more. Uh, so that's the reason why I really decided to change and um, to run because I feel, actually, I know that as young people, we have innovative ideas. We have more modern ideas in terms of problem solving. And the reason why Nigeria has been going around in circles is we've been recycling the same leaders with the same ideas and the same ideologies. So why not balance their experience with our problem solving skills more in line with what's going on now. It's 2023, there's advances in you know, technology, the tech space is doing amazing. We are more connected, there's social media. So mm. our angle to politics cannot be the same as their angle. So we can definitely collaborate and make things better. Um, mm. As regards Suruleri, um, I, yeah. I grew up in Suruleri, I've spent all of my life so far in Suruleri. And I know that I have turned out how I have turned out because of the things I've been exposed to in terms of people I've met, people I've worked with, um, schools that I've gone to, uh, and, and things like that. So I look around Suruleri and I see that there's so much potential because there's people that are, even with the situation in Suruleri, trying to make things for themselves. You, you talk to the average person in Suleri and the average person in Suleri is very optimistic, very hopeful. But there's not that much of recent in terms of any aid or any active help for people in Suruleri. You look at uh, the, the schools in Suruleri, you look at the students on their way to school and they don't really look excited to be going to school. They don't even look like they're going to school. Even just their general approach to attending school and their, and their general demeanor and conduct, how their uniforms are worn, uh, that just shows that there's a lot that we need to do even mentally to really just change the mindsets of young people in Suruleri. And because I'm young, a lot of what I'm trying to do is to try and nip the problem in the bud early. Because a lot of the things that we have wrong in Suruleri, I believe, are, are, are mental in terms of our outlook to life. Uh, you see some of the people on the road. I don't like to refer to them as thugs or area boys. Mm. I think they are victims of circumstance because that could easily have been me. I didn't pick my family. I didn't pick the circumstances I was born in. And you, you talk to them, and a lot of them are not very happy about what they have to do. Sometimes they even do these things reluctantly, but they feel like they need to do it to survive because the system in place right now um, is built on them getting handouts to, to live. So... I'm looking at Suleri from a more holistic point and seeing if we 
work on building human capital development, if we work on making the amenities in Sulere work, mm -hmm. um, even things down to street lights, if, the, if Sulere is lit, that could go a long way to even reducing the crime rates. Um, you have better um, academic setups in school, um, better trainings, creating mentorship programs where young people can see people that have come from Surulere and have gone on to make amazing things. So we know it is possible regardless of the situation around you. Um, these are some of the reasons why um, I'm running for office because there's so many times people, you go to National Stadium, there's people on their own time, on their own money, working out every day, training, um, but they, they never really get scouted or that never really goes anywhere. So imagine all the jobs we could create, all the opportunities we could create with having a better structure to help people nurture their natural talents and also create a situation where uh, things that are positive are made appealing. So even people that had no idea that they wanted to go into coding, for example, you present it in a way that's interesting and eye-catching and young people want to hop on that. Uh, as opposed to just say, okay, we're building schools and we're buying laptops mm. and all these other things that, that we're seeing. But even with all these things that have happened, if you really look at it, you don't really see the impact. So we need to just have a change in government. Also, just access um, to leadership. You don't really have forums where, you know, state leader or local government chairman is actively trying to engage with the people. Government isn't attractive, especially to young people. Um, a lot of us just think it's very boring and hmm. whatever they want to do is what they will do Absolutely. and it's, it's not for me. And that's what we really, really need to change, especially if we're talking about where Nigeria is going in the future. We have hmm. to start now. Too little. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, okay, I mean, you said quite a whole lot and, um, and they all sound really pretty. I mean, but... Um, I also think that you're speaking about this. What I hear you say is a lot of, um, is, 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 is more geared towards empowerment. Mm -hmm. However, the, the position that you're going mm -hmm. for is more about policy. Of course, of course. You understand? Of course. So it's not, the, the, the empowerment is, I mean, everyday people come, even mm -hmm. private sector, mm -hmm. people are always doing things. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. But is this sustainable? The, I would feel that where we should get to mm -hmm. is where there, there are laws, you know, there are policies that make these things binding. Mm -hmm. It's not so much as... Oh, so whether you are there Exactly, or not, or not mm -hmm. it, it, it becomes the standard. It becomes law. Mm -hmm. It becomes the law. So it's not about handout. You're not waiting for some private public partnership or... It, it, it is a standard. Mm. So you know that, okay, if you come into this constituency, this is how it goes. Of course. Mm. And then, of course, again, there is government in continuum. Mm -hmm. So another person who comes, because it is, it is, it is not sentimental, it is not pretty, it is not, um, what's, there's a word, it's not sensational. Mm -hmm. yeah. It becomes easy, you know, to be sustainable. And everybody would now agree to say, oh, no, no, no. You can't do anything outside of this. This is the standard. Mm -hmm. Anything else you do. So I'm, I'm hoping that mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. you know, being here, you, you're able to say that, okay, when you get into that position mm -hmm. as a policymaker, I mm -hmm. mean, this is what drives you concerning education, right. concerning mm -hmm. health, concerning MSNEs, you know, concern, concerning Everything. general living. Okay. Well, if I had actually exactly. point, um, uh, noted that mm -hmm. I was going to ask that, you know, if you had prepared, you know, policies that you, mm -hmm. I mean, um, what's it called? You have policies that you, you intend to propose mm -hmm. in the house, mm -hmm. you know, that would help with all the things mm -hmm. that Diola has listed in Surulere constituency. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't mind to share those with us. Okay, of course. Uh, so, um, I, I fully do understand at the end of the day it is a legislative position, um, but just because, again, uh, I'm not sure how long some of these policies will take in terms of implementation, mm -hmm. because, again, it also depends on, you know, the numbers in the House, majority, mm -hmm. minority, and all of that. So, in the more immediate, there are things that, you know, we can do as constituency projects to at least kickstart um, the change that we want. And... Because I am uh, fully youth-centered uh, um, as well, um, I feel like there's some things that we need to start doing immediately, mm -hmm. especially if we're trying to catch them young. Mm -hmm. um, but also in terms of, of policies, uh, I'm very particular about education. Mm -hmm. uh, I am, I'm, I'm a direct recipient of a good education. 
Uh, and I even spent time just going around, um, you know, on, on this campaign train, just really trying to understand what the people actually want and need, as opposed to um, preferring solutions that I think are the way forward. Uh, for example, when we're talking about small businesses, um, I went to a couple of marketplaces and I had certain conversations with some of the market women and they really did speak on, as you, when you mentioned the, the double taxation, um, that they are paying a lot of you know, taxes yeah. and, and levies and they don't really see where these monies are going. And even to the point where um, some tribes uh, feel like they are even being exactly. you know, extorted, exactly. extorted, basically, um, just because um, you know, their counterparts from other parts of the country don't really have to pay mm -hmm. you know, certain amounts and, and things like that. So um, there definitely will be a focus on you know, education, mm -hmm. um, um, on, on small businesses. We also need to make the amenities work. I remember there was a time where the street lights were up and running. You know, I would be driving home and I would be happy. I'm getting to Suleyan. Now, um, you, you get to Suleyan and it's dark. Sorry, what part of Suleyan do you uh, <laughs> I don't know if I can say that right <laughs> now. <laughs> okay, let me, let's take a very short break. I'd like to open our phone lights. <laughs> right, I'd like to open our phone lights and I will come to you and then <laughs> Stay with us. <laughs> All right, thanks for staying with us. Now, if you just tuned in, we are discussing the race to the House of Assembly, and we have with us Olimide Owaru. Uh, please, let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 81 You can also tweet at us at Wayshow Africa with the hashtag Wayshow. Now, our phone line is now open. It's already ringing. <laughs> Number to call is zero. Please don't insult our guest, you. I beg you. <laughs> 70 That's the number to call. Be very civil with your contribution. And let's um, have a great conversation. Please turn off the volume of your whatever um, you're watching us, the device, so we don't have a feedback. NJ, quickly. Um, well, I have several questions. Ah, please make yeah, it short. But I'm going to just make it short. And maybe while you're answering, you just, um, you know, summarize. Right. Um, one thing. I want to know why you moved. Why, why you got into politics? Mm -hmm. You were an actor, mm -hmm. you are an actor. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what, um, what encouraged you to mm -hmm. go into politics? Aside, because um, on a daily, we all have different things that we do and mm -hmm. we see the country, we leave the, um, mm -hmm. the situations, mm -hmm. but not all of us even, are even members of the Okay, party. so hold that question. <laughs> <laughs> Our first caller from Bombay, Obina, you're live. Hello? Okay. Good evening. I'm with you. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Yes, go ahead, you're live. My greeting to all of you in the studio. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Especially to the obedient in the house. Uh -huh. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm lucky to be the first, winner, the first person to call you this evening. My question is to the guests, please. Mm -hmm. The slogan of Lagbo Party is take back your country and a new Nigeria. And I've carefully listened to you about what and some certain things you want to do for your constituents. But I want to ask you, please, 
Because if you do not know where things go wrong, you will not know where to correct it. Mm -hmm. Have you sit down and get some loopholes, areas, where Lagos State is getting it wrong, especially in the education system of Lagos State? Now, coming down to your constituency, my question is, do Lagos State government have any social intervention on students of Lagos State? And how are you going to fully involve your constituency in that uh, program? Number two, I'm always going to ask you, please, before you go there, do you have any plan or do you have already bills in your mind that can address drainage system or failures in Lagos State as it is today? These are my questions. Thank you. And I know you I think, yeah. do that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. So right. do you have bills, you know, do you have you identified the problem? Mm -hmm. And where do you think Lagos State is getting it wrong? Mm -hmm. Uh at the end of the day, the, that is the reason why there is the House of Assembly. Uh and that is why we're all representing different constituencies. The entire point is for people who know these constituencies and have experience with these constituencies to come together, table what the issues are and figure out the best way to solve these issues. Mm. I also know that different areas will require some different type of techniques in some situations, depending on what it is that we're trying to achieve. Yeah. So it is very important that as, as House members, uh, we all work together for those who are opportune and you know mandated by the people to represent them at that level. Mm. Um, with that being said, um, something on uh, waste management. Um, that is one of the issues that, you know, is faced in Lagos generally, mm. which you can um, relate to uh, drains being blocked and, you know, people sand filling certain areas uh, where should be the natural path for water to flow through. Yeah. So what we need to do is find a way to have, and, and this is one of the things that um, GRV uh, has has um, on on his on his agenda as well is have wetland protection. So there's certain areas where you know you cannot be constructing to um, interfere with you know the flow of water. Um, another thing we need to do is incorporate uh, the private sector into waste disposal because there are certain areas. Oh, I'm looking for trouble. What? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not for my <laughs> I'm going to try it. <laughs> Loma, you're alive. <laughs> yeah, good evening, my sister's stuck in the house. Hi, Loma, good evening. Good evening. Uh, as I'm watching this fine gentleman mm -hmm. in the house, I know he will do well. Okay. Um, but I want to ask you one question. Um, now, you see the type of policy the executive are bringing out. What policies that we put the, the masses are now being victimized. The masses are in pain. Now, what will you do as a legislator? Because here, if I am talking in other sister station, I tell them that what is happening now is the spirit of antichrist and one spirit. We need us allow the spirit of Africa to enter them, they bring in policies that affect the masses, they themselves just feel it. As a legislator, what will you do when the executive go reckless? How will you call the, the executive reckless when they bring policies that Absolutely. will affect masses? Look at what is happening in the vaccine sector. I tell people this is exactly what I call anti-Christ that has entered from leaders that made them to bring out policies that Thank affect you. the market and they are not feeling it, the pains of the market. What Thank will you, you do? That's so everybody's asking you because, <laughs> for you. I mean, yeah. um, it, it's, it's nice to have freshness, like I mm -hmm. said, on the ballot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but again, I don't want us to see like be seen that because we want to support our own of with course. our young people, yeah. we're supporting mediocrity or we're supporting yeah. people that are not prepared for the job, mm -hmm. right? You have an uh, what do you call them? There's a there's a historical 
candidate mm. that you know first of all he was in your industry mm. that is now the what they call that everybody is not particularly happy because mm. they i think they feel like he wasn't prepared for mm -hmm. that job yeah. mm -hmm. he didn't know the job it's different mm -hmm. from going on camera and live mm -hmm. camera sure. action no mm -hmm. these are real life issues these are mm -hmm. like you you're bringing up laws mm -hmm. that would protect us mm -hmm. you know especially your constituency mm -hmm. in right so i mean uh, we would like to hear because I mean, I, before you, if you say you're running, you're going to the House mm -hmm. of Assembly, you should have said, okay, I have proposed like 15 bills. These are those 15 bills. I can just tell you maybe two or three. Say, mm -hmm. okay, these are the ones that I know that are pressing mm -hmm. in Surulere constituency. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of level of preparedness that we are looking of forward course. to yeah. having. Of course. Right? You know, so. I mean, when you hear the callers asking, 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 mm -hmm. it's almost like they're repeating the same question. Mm -hmm. What exactly are your, you know, your policies that you have penned down to say, these are the policies I intend to propose mm -hmm. when or if elected in the House? Mm -hmm. For me, one of the things as well I, is, is also the execution of, of policies that are already in place, which mm -hmm. is why, for me, it is the transparency and the style of government that we need to first address. Mm -hmm. um, if you are more on ground in your constituency and your constituents have access to you, then there's more conversation, there's more dialogue, and you, at that point, are more in touch with what they need. Um, so that also does help in formulating policies gearing up into the house. Also, there have been certain policies that should have brought about some sort of change. But the problem is how these policies are then executed and the fact that nobody is being held accountable in terms of delivery. Mm -hmm. So you say, for example, okay, we're going to pass this bill and this bill, it took us, say, six months to pass, but um, expected period of execution is, is eight months. And after a year and a half, you know, whatever projects that were supposed to be put in place or whatever partnerships were supposed to be built or roads supposed to be constructed and contracts are supposed to be giving out, um, either have been given out and haven't been supervised or monitored, or we just don't hear about these things anymore. anymore. Mm. Uh, so it's not necessarily about formulating new a laws. whole new they set of laws. They are yeah. existing. Yeah. They are existing. Well, that's a major problem. In, yeah, isn't that. yes. yeah, there are existing um, policies yes. mm -hmm. that have not been properly implemented. Yes. The ones yeah. that have not been properly... Yes. There are some that have not been implemented at yes. all. True. Then the ones that have been implemented right or, or yes they've been under incremented so I, I i get you i mean it's a valid point yeah. so i mean it, it will be it, it's nice to hear the sincerity yeah because again sometimes people feel like oh if i come and i bring seven you fold are, agenda yeah, 20 yeah, fold agenda yeah, yeah. you know don't take me seriously yeah. but what you said is actually deep, deep because yeah. truly we do have some very nice policies on paper mm. Where are the um, um, signs that these mm -hmm. policies have been translated into reality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, NJ, you wanted to go. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I was initially just asking about your background, just right. going a bit back mm -hmm. um, and asking why you decided to transition into, you know, politics. Mm -hmm. And what I guess one of my questions was, was your immediate plan for, you know, the constituency mm -hmm. one <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a yeah. Well, I'm not. Uh, Sulele one is. Um, uh, that's, a major, that's a major. Oh, that's a major. That's a major area. That's not my constituency. Right. Why, why? Why did you? Why the transition? Mm. So the transition, again, came from realizing the opportunity that has presented itself. If we're being honest, before and now. Regardless of the number of registered parties, Nigeria has been part practicing a two-party system. True. Uh, and none of the parties have really appealed, appealed to, me. to me personally. Because we are in the situation where we are in, where we have tried out both parties mm -hmm. with their manifestos and with their ideologies. And we still spiral to this point. So I personally did not believe in what any of these two parties stand for. Uh, but then, with Peter B switching to the Labour Party, uh, he's somebody who, just from a natural standpoint, um, is very relatable. Yeah. Uh, and there is a sincerity in, in his tone when he speaks. He, he doesn't try to present any grand ideas or sell, this is my opinion anyway, sell any major dreams of, oh yeah, elect me and you know, in two years time, everything is going to be sorted, there'll be flying cars and, and whatnot. Basically, what he said that appealed to me the most is, 
there's a problem. We cannot fix this problem overnight, but we need to get on the path towards the problem being fixed. And that is what appealed to me the most. And that really is the entire reason why I did join the Labour Party. And upon joining the Labour Party, uh, there was an environment conducive enough to encourage participation to run. To, to run. So I'm like, okay, this is a good opportunity. Um, let's, let's see how this goes. And mm -hmm. the fact that the party even trusted somebody like me with my background um, to even be um, given the ticket to represent the party at, at this level is, is an amazing honor that um, I, I feel uh, very blessed to have and also very optimistic that the youth can do um, something towards national development. Because you look back at Nigerian history and the people that were making decisions that have affected the entire country were uh, close to my age, late 20s, early to mid 30s. Yeah. So that's so, what we're afraid of you yeah. now. No! <laughs> 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 That's why we are played. No, no, no. It's, it's, again, again, you know, we're, we're human and, you know, it, it's okay to make mistakes as long as you don't make the same mistakes multiple times and you do own up when you make these mistakes. Mm. There have been a lot of mistakes in the Nigerian political um, scene. scene that people have not owned up to True. or apologized for and attempted to learn and move on. I think that is the problem. So mm. it's just changing the, what it means to be a politician, mm. really. Uh, demystifying all the bravado around the office and all of that. Just, yeah, house boy. So do you think that you, you have done your part in being visible enough to the people in your constituency that, um, you know, they, they would, they recognize you and will be willing to vote for you? To a certain extent. Uh, also because I did announce candidacy a little late because of you know some some back end things that just needed yeah, to be sorted out. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, yeah, you yeah had it some was. Cases yeah, there was. Yeah, there was some cases with you know candidacy and we were in court for a while. Um, and just because of what I had going on, I honestly wanted to be sure that everybody was on the same page yeah. before mm -hmm. announcing and then having to go back and forth and explain what was going on. So mm -hmm. that process took a lot longer than I was hoping for. Um, but okay, that so being said, yeah. uh, I do believe that I have done enough to put myself out there in terms of what I'm made up of and where my head is at and, you know, the, the plans that I have, the hopes and dreams that I have. So if the people buy into that idea um, and they think that I am fit to be their representative at the House of Assembly, I'd be more than honored to do my best to make sure so nobody's let down. I will not know the last of this one if I don't ask <laughs> And this was from one of our audience. When she heard, I mean, sorry, one of our co-anchors, mm -hmm. when she heard that you were the guest for tomorrow, she mm -hmm. said, ah! Please, 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 go and ask him. <laughs> Let me ask you. Mm -hmm. So she's, I mean, she looked at, she looked through your social media, because mm -hmm. we're in the age of impressions, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she looked through your mm -hmm. social media, mm -hmm. and she felt like, for somebody that is running for this kind of delicate mm -hmm. position where you're going to be cre um, um, reviewing policies, mm -hmm. the issues around you, mm -hmm. people, your social media handle doesn't tell that mm -hmm. okay this is what this person stands for yes so for instance you go on mr macaroni's page mm -hmm. you see that he stands mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. you go on Faust's page yeah. you see mm -hmm. that so mm -hmm. that it would be easier of course if mr macaroni or Faust of came course. out to say they want um, for like, this yeah. No yeah. Yeah. Of course. Of course. who is olumide of course. what is he passionate about of course who has he like who what kind of impact of course mm -hmm. has he left you know what kind mm -hmm. of prints has mm -hmm. he left in the you in know his local that, community, in his local community yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah the kind of impact that he's done mm -hmm. that is giving him you know um the, the credibility to mm -hmm. say okay yes he can actually handle right. the pressure because right. that seat is hot of course you know there's a lot of things that will happen in that allows of course <laughs> a lot of matter of course, of but course. So, i mean i mean if you were speaking to jennifer now mm -hmm. what would you say to her mm -hmm. right because again it's social media of course we have to see you and see you. of course of yeah. course of course so the thing is uh, my my approach to social media has been very passive um up until this period i never really paid attention to my social media i didn't really care for it. i just used it to use it to promote my work um, but what I've been more concerned about is personal growth and personal development in terms of engaging with people in real time. So for people that know me personally or in spaces where I've been opportune to meet more experienced people, I'm always asking questions, always trying to learn. Um, most times I sit in a room and I don't say much. I'm just taking things in, I'm absorbing things, really trying to understand 
um, how systems are made up, how does this work. Even when I'm on set, I'm asking, why is this light here? What lens is that? Why is this working? Um, just so I really understand how that is set up. Another thing is, I believe that we all have different roles to play in terms of, in terms of development. Yes. Now, we already have people like, you know, Files and Macaroni, who are my good friends, who we do discuss, um, you know, things relating to politics on, 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 um, in times when we do see. And they already have the social media front covered. I mean, if Files and Macaroni are talking about politics on their lives, people are engaging, people are commenting. And we have other people, even on, on Twitter as well, who are already driving conversations on wow. social media. So we have that on lock. So we need to do this simultaneously. Mm. So we have people on social media. We have people who are setting up NGOs, uh, you know, people who are really trying to help people set up small businesses. We have people who are trying to make an impact through different avenues. So we need to all be doing these things at the same time. We all can't be on social media. We all can't be in politics. So as long as the goal is understood, we can work in unison. Um, if I make it into the house, I'm still going to have conversations with Files and Macaroni. If something is going sideways, they can reach me and be like, bro, when you were going in, this is what you said, this is what you so said. They can hold, you they can hold me accountable. And, and that's what we do as young people. I've, we are a lot more honest with each other. Mm. And we check each other mm. a lot. If, if any of your boys are going left, you so call, guy, yeah. So, so we do that. So as long as we're all um, in agreement mm -hmm. to what the end goal is, and we have as many people in different areas really trying to implement that goal, I think that really is what we need. Okay. So we just want to plead that we're putting small, small things on social yes, media. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Not just reach and get no. friends and cannot see your face. That, that, <laughs> hey, okay. <laughs> This is um, good evening, my dear beautiful sisters of what are you saying? Hashtag ways. Race to the Lagos House of Assembly. Not too much talk. I believe wholeheartedly that Labour Party is determined to do well and will do well. I pray that my dear brother Olumide Owaru will be voted for and also win. Because I can really see his zeal and determination to deliver. I pray this time there is no rigging. I'm so glad and excited to see this handsome gentleman in the studio. I happen to be his fan. Oh. I like the role he plays in the Johnsons, Tari Johnson. Oh. I want to ask him that how can he cope with politics and acting? My name is Daniel Elo. <laughs> um, good evening, my, dear, uh, my beautiful sisters of ways. It's great to see your guest dressed as a Lagosian. His dedication in his Johnson's role gives me the light that he would deliver in the capacity of his political So quickly, ambition. how do you want to manage? Will something suffer for it? Um, the priority right now is the political Politics, office. Okay. That, that is the immediate thing I'm going to immerse myself in. So as, as we go on, if I am elected into office, you know, we'll figure it out. But right now, I think my husband is, is a fan, by the way. Ask something I want to yes, say. Quickly, oh. Okay, so this is um, me having my eyes on you Please. as a Suru Lyric constituent. Yes. You do not get to move out of Suleri. Yes. Why are you in that Not move to VI. No. I will personally <laughs> check <laughs> that you are still in Suleri. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah. That's the whole point. Yeah. I need to be able to do it. Because if I touch you in Lake, I will your house. I will put it we'll on social media. We'll send you back to Suleri. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Ensure sure you follow us across all our social media handles at Wish Africa. You can interact with us further. Drop a comment and more importantly, follow all our engagements on social media. Like, share, invite your families and friends to watch and follow the conversation. Now, if you missed our very important quote, here it is again. We cannot be mere consumers of good governance. We must be participants. We must be co-creators. You have to be part of the process, okay? There are great people stepping up to the plate, so join I will right, we'll see you guys tomorrow at 8 p.m. It's International Women's Day tomorrow. So we'll bring another great conversation to your screen. We'll have another interesting guest so you stay with us. We'll see you tomorrow. Wow. <laughs>
Reading is an essential habit and a culture that must be developed. Nigerians are generally believed to have a poor reading culture. The role of government in promoting reading and equipping reading spaces and libraries in Nigeria cannot be underestimated. But first, we must look at the development of reading habits from the home and the role parents play in encouraging their children. My parents, my mom used to be a teacher, so reading was obviously part of a curriculum. And then my father used to be a professor and is an author. So I started reading very, very early. And I started reading books that were higher than my age grade. Um, I was reading African writer series from age seven, age eight, and reading encyclopedias by that time. So obviously my parents had a huge part and encouraged, encouraged that in me. In the Nigerian book market, there's a high influx of foreign authors writing for children, but very few Nigerian authors telling relatable, homegrown Nigerian stories. If you start out reading stories, even to your baby, even for their one, and then as they get older, buy appropriate uh, materials that are colorful, um, with easy to read words, and read with them. I think that helps. Adi Dotsuenyade, a co-founder of Robin Heights, a leading bookstore in Nigeria, has tips for Nigerian authors and how they can improve on their work and get into the hearts of readers. The story has to be good, right? You know, if you're writing, you know, whatever you're writing, if you're writing fiction, if you're writing non-fiction, it has to be like, you know, really, really compelling, you know, one. Uh, next thing would be like in terms of like the packaging, right? You know, um, you know, people have gone past the era where you just take your books with just about any printer to print for you. You know, I think, you know, publishers, um, self-published authors as well, they need to invest in, like, you know, ensuring that in the quality of the of the book, you know, the final output is one that will, you know, stack up with any or any book, you know, published, you know, elsewhere in the world. So that's really important. Then I think, you know, what would be, like, the most important tip for me uh, to them would be um, just, you know, the need to invest in marketing. The book business, like any other business, is challenging. If you ask anyone who's running the business in Nigeria, they will tell you capital, of course, right? Uh, you know, it's, um, I mean, book selling is also, as, as with any other business, is also quite capital intensive, like, you know, um, getting, getting to pay your rent, um, getting to actually buy the books and stock up, like, your shelves when you have them. Um, uh, you know, hiring good people requires, like, you know, decent amount of capital. So um, I would say it's 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 cap you know um, getting the, the startup funds to you know to set up something, and then if you're looking to do do it at scale like we're hoping to do, then it also requires you like you know raising funding, uh, which isn't readily available in commercial banks, right? I don't think a bank would say they want to give you a loan to set up a bookstore. They probably will be skeptical about the number of people who read. Um, so for us, I, I think it's it's just um, you know. Um, I would say capital is, is, you know, is at the top of the, of the temple. It is commendable that certain individuals and organizations are making concerted efforts to revive the reading culture in the country. The government should also redesign the school curriculum to incorporate more reading activities in primary and secondary schools. From north to south and east to west, life in Nigeria has become dangerously unbearable. The country is faced with what seems to be endless waves of homegrown security threats and violence. Nigerians live in fear, from terrorism to kidnappings, armed banditry, former header clashes, ethnic violence and separatist agitation. To better understand the causes of the unrest, as well as the true agitations of the people, such light travels across Nigeria. The bandits, I use the dark place, I mean the forest place, to hang around. When our drivers read there, they will come out and start shooting them. In fact, if I can give an estimate, I can say that in a week we used to treat not less than five not less than five gunshots. I look uh, uh, people and people living under siege. Now, 
or where it's too hot. No rest of mind. If you sleep now, sleep with one eye closed, one eye open. Be vigilant. This is Igora for you. is one of the seven communities that make up Ibarakwa land. Ibarakwa land comprises of Igongo, Irua, Ayete, Takpa, Idere, Lanlate, and Ibuora in Oyo State, Nigeria's southwest region. There is a long-standing history dating back to the early 20th century between settler headers who are mostly of Fulani descent and local farmers in the Ibarakwa axis. Recently, however, coexistence has become increasingly problematic as the communities are now plagued with kidnappings, farmer header clashes, reprisal attacks leading to the forceful ejection of Sarkins and Fulanis in the area. I have been back home here in Ibora since January because of the armed herders and farmers crisis that has been rocking nearby villages and farms. Although the Sarakin Fulani of Ngongon, Salihu, was evicted in January on accusations that he was helping evade justice, not much has changed. There are still incidences of kidnappings and attacks on farmlands. This is Shekere village in Ibora. We live in fear. I do come earlier in the day and could enter the farm. You would find their cattle eating crops, and when confronted, they attack the owners of the farm. If perchance they meet a woman unaccompanied on the farm, she could be raped. There is no safety on farmlands. The nomadic ones are moving around. The residential ones, we know them. Some of the residential ones are still within the community. They are peaceful. One incident occurred when uh, our people uh, are they, they, they are outraged and uh, they burnt all the caras in the old Ibarapa land, even that of Irua. In the border here now, there is no cara again. If you had burnt all the caras in the whole of Ibarapa land, I want to think that cara is a place for residential Fulani. No. Kara is a play, a spot, a market for them to come and buy and sell. So you have bonds. Do you, do you know come, their see, economic let me, let me, let me, spots? Let me tell you some things about that Kara. Some things we discover about that Kara. Especially that of Igora here. That spot is a spot where they do hide their uh, ammunition. And in the night like this, they will pick up those ammunitions, go out, kidnap, rob, anything they can do. And when they come back to town the following day. Kabir, you've done a lot of work out of the Barakwa land. What did you see? What do you know? Can you share your first hand experience? Not just in Nibora. Not just in uh, Lanlate, not just in your states, but from my experience across the Southwest states, I realized that most of the killings, the kidnappings being perpetrated are being done by the Bororos, who are who mostly are referred to as um, foreigners. The, some of these Bororos. They come into the country through Benin Republic, some through Cameroon, and you get to realize that in the essence of it all, some through Niger, that many of them are not uh, the traditional Fulanis. And uh, the reason is this. We've had cases where 
traditional Fulanis, those who are Nigerians, some of them who came from, I mean, who are from a uh, Quara states, also alleged that they have also been kidnapped. They've also been victims of the attacks of these persons. Most times, those that perpetrate this are, they don't even have any cattle. All they have is gun, sword, and other weapons. The violence doesn't end there. Nigeria is faced with the Boko Haram insurgency in the northeast, banditry in the northwest, armed separatist agitations in the southeast, amid communal clashes in the Middle Belt, southwest, and south south. Increasingly, violence between herders and farming communities is spreading from Nigeria's central belt southward, while kidnappings are rife nationwide. What exactly led to this? When you see a failure of this scale, of this magnitude, and spread right across the country, the first um, uh, thing that comes to your mind is that somebody somewhere who has responsibilities to secure Nigeria has failed in their duties. There's no other explanation for this. So the, uh, we have uh, a country that is poorly run, poorly governed, and therefore unable to master the requirements to, of securing both citizens and the country itself. That is the first one. The second one is that there are a lot of opportunists, opportunistic criminal activities going on. People understand the weaknesses, they perceive a weakness at, at the level of the state. They think the state is weak or the state is incapable of protecting citizens from all sorts of attacks, bandits, uh, kidnappers, um, insurgencies, um, uh, insurrections, um, secessionists, irredentists. All these people actually exist because the state has not been able to assert its obligation and responsibilities to protect citizens. And they are, they are emerging and increasing by the day. Uh, the third one is the failure of the Nigerian elite to must to get together and demand that the Nigerian state does what it's supposed to do. The leadership does what they are supposed to do, that is to protect citizens. The voices that are supposed to be heard are not being heard. Too many people are quiet, either out of fear or because they think that uh, they are not likely to make any impact if they don't raise their voices. Traveling by road is now an extreme spot. On our trip to Kaduna State, we drove along the Kaduna Beninguari Road. The 123 kilometer road trip seemed easy enough, but we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. From Buruku Village, right on the outskirts of Kaduna, there is a fully armored vehicle with soldiers who lead drivers three cars at a time from Buruku to Odoa Town. This stretch is considered to be the most dangerous. Drivers have to wait their turn, as they stand no chance of traveling safely to and fro Beninguari without these escorts. From Odoa, the journey to Beninguari is considered safe from the kidnappers and terrorists, whose victims are not just travelers, but also villagers and farmers in and around this long stretch of road. Our major problem in this area is insecurity. These terrorists have wrecked our town and destroyed our source of livelihood. Nobody sleeps in this town anymore. We take refuge in the neighboring community and come here every day at 8 or 9 a.m. and then leave at 3 or 4 p.m. Look at me. I'm the village head of this community. I used to own a car. But these criminals made me sell it to pay ransom for our children. I can't estimate how much we have paid to bandits as ransom because this community has been attacked more than 25 times. We have a lot of problems in terms of insecurity on our road, more especially in between Burku and Udawa. So we have a lot of insecurity. We have only one vehicle which is mobile police. They are the one escorting our members to, to carry them to Burku. Let's say from January 
of to now. At least we lost more than 30 of our members as a result of the bandits. Forests in Nigeria are now hideout for cattle rustlers, highway robbers, kidnappers and terrorists due to the absence of state capacity or political will to exercise control. From Binigwari Forest in Kaduna to Rugu Forest in Katsina and Zafe in Zamfara, these forests are now referred to as ungoverned. Irena is in Niger, Shururu. From there you cross over to Zabafana. You cross over to Kolwe. Um, what security measures have we put in place for farmers and the indigents that are easy prey to this um, bandit? Well, I have explained to you that Kaduna is very vast. The state is so huge. We had over 46,000 square kilometers. And I have also explained to you that we are having this problem mostly in locations that are remote. You know, boundaries with Niger State, boundaries with Zampara, boundaries with Katina State. You know, the locations are very remote. Uh, even if there's a, a distress call before you get there, uh, it takes you time because of the terrain, mobility uh, problem. But the Air Force uh, is complementing the ground troops and the police as well. Once we receive a distress call uh, from a location that is very far, what do we do? Uh, the Air Force move while the ground uh, troops and the police form a blocking force, you know, and uh, it is really uh, yielding positive uh, Mark, we don't have enough boots on the ground. There's a need for us to scale up recruitment. Uh, there's a need for security operatives or our security agencies to outnumber the criminals. Uh, we are not relenting. We are working and we are making progress. In the first quarter of 20. Uh, 21, we were able to neutralize uh, 64 uh, bandits. Our schools, just like our roads, have become hot spots of violence. Across northwestern Nigeria, from Zanthara to Kebi, Kaduna, and Niger, about 1,000 students of primary schools, secondary schools, and even universities have been kidnapped since December 2020. Most have been released after payment of ransom, while scores are still being held in forest camps. Some of these students have died in captivity, and some killed during the abductions. Earlier this year, after the kidnapping of students at Government Science College, Kagara, Niger State, I asked the governor, Malam Abubakar Sonibelu, if a state could guarantee the safety of school children, no one can guarantee that unless we have, uh, uh, unless we have the numbers, the, the manpower of security personnel required. Kagar, the Niger State, for example, uh, during the military administrations, Niger State had fourteen thousand policemen. Today we have four thousand. Same Kagar, Rafi local government where where this kidnapping took place. Kangara town itself has less than 10 policemen. So how will it work? How? What magic could you do? We don't have the, we don't employ or appoint, employ policemen. I understand in the past, uh, uh, the state police command had the powers to, en to employ policemen from the states, but it is no longer like that. And that's probably the reason why we're having problems. That was back in March. Not much has changed since. Many have said that the present centralized structure of the Nigerian police is too detached from local communities. 
of votes conducted by NOI polls indicates that many Nigerians are in favor of state policing to bring security closer to the people. Experts say there is a need to reflect on the current security approach across the country. The various institutions need to sit back and you know, reflect that the current approaches that we are deploying to address security concerns, are they adequately addressing these issues? What are the intelligence mechanisms you know, that you need to put in place to really get information on how crime you know, is happening across um, various communities? So I think critically it is the model, it is the approach that seems to be a bit defective. We are practically waiting for violence to happen before we then react. Uh, we talk about community policing, especially for the police especially. I keep making reference to the police because they have the mandate when it comes to internal security. Community uh, policing is very important. Then intelligence-led policing. You know, we are not emphasizing that so much. Intelligence-led policing is that strategy through which you just want to get intelligence of what is happening in a certain community. In the Southeast, insecurity takes a different dimension. According to authorities, Agitators for the Indigenous People of Biafra, IPOB, a separatist group campaigning for Biafra independence, have been responsible for a spate of attacks on security forces and innocent people since December 2020. Olu, a local government in Imo state, has become a flashpoint of trouble in the region. On the 25th of January 2021, Many house are speaking traders in a market in Olu were going about their business when gunmen invaded the area, killing some and setting shops ablaze. It is very, very unfortunate that this kind of thing would happen in a, a 21st century Olu, 21st century Imo, 21st century Nigeria. People are not happy with the things, with the way this country is being run. When you talk about security, there is no security in Nigeria anymore. We are here at the Islamic Central Mosque, Amafeke, and this is the third Friday without holding a Jumat service here because of insecurity issues. There is a lot of apprehension amongst the Muslim community. This is my third year living in Olu, and I have never had any ugly experience living here until recently. During the NSAS protest, they burnt our mosque and killed some of our members in some part of Olu town. For three weeks now, we have been unable to observe our Jumat prayers in this mosque. We now live in fear. More worrisome is the absence of security operatives in the town. Despite all these incidents, the governor has not visited us to assure us or condole with us. Since the January attack, all who has had no peace, the people are in constant fear as these gunmen, time after time, unleash violence, destroy shops, kill and even behead people in the community. In the southeast and south-south regions at large, dozens of security officials have been killed. Biafra agitation and the violence going on in the southeast have been said to be an untoward's way of expressing dissatisfaction about leadership failure on the part of all tiers of government. Well, you know, I feel that um, there are many voices in the conversation to deal with the disaffection that people have about the Nigerian state. There are many voices. And evidently, his is just one of those voices. Um, but, you know, that may not be the optimal route to go. You know, there, there are so many benefits of a functional, um, democratic, uh, sound constitutional state. But where there are imperfections, you will now begin to see the voice that's you know, Nam Dekanu um, echoes or propagates. Um, war is terrible, you know. I, you, you know, sometimes you think about it from a more glamorous point of view, but it's, it's bloody, it's, it's heinous, it's, 
It's damaging. It destroys families, societies, and so on and so forth. So my preoccupation is for peace. Okay, peace arrived through um, legitimate constitutional um, routes. That's what that is what is most paramount. No society can develop without peace. And in terms of the 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 uh, a disaffection of those of us who are from the southeast goes, there's a need to hear us and to look at our grievances and to consider them on their merits. The South is substantially mirroring Boko Haram. We have not been able to understand and deal with the issue of IPOR. The evil leadership allowed IPOR and ESL too much ground <clears throat> to, take, to, to, to take too much ground to, to control the, what is going on in the South. So they misread the threat of the uh, organizations like that UOP. There was opportunism, crass opportunism. People thought maybe this IPOB will do for us what we want. They will get for the Igbo what the Igbo didn't get through the political process. Um, and eventually now we are creating a monster. And it's, it's a monster that is eating up the local environment. The same way Boko Haram ate up Borno and Yobe and parts of Adamawa, IPOB and ESN are eating up the south. Um, there we are, the federal government is throwing the military at them, the same way they threw the military at Boko Haram, rather than trying to understand the real issue. What is behind IPOD? Who supports them? Why do they support them? What is the issue that has become, that has made IPOD attractive to a large number of young people? Can you do something about it? Is it something you need to do about it? I would say that the Southeast government can do a whole lot better, the state governments. They can do a whole lot better in delivering services to the various uh, constituent parts of the Southeast. Um, we don't see enough of government in our rural communities, uh, in the local government. We, we need to, to, to raise the bar as per the effectiveness of subnational entities, all right? Once we have, once we've got, once we've gotten to a point where we can say for certainty that the state governments are operating optimally and delivering their own share of the of the of the uh, governance dividend, then we can look elsewhere to seek uh, inputs. But state governments in the southeast need to up their game. The Nigerian police force on Wu's shoulder, the responsibility of protecting the nation lies, is unable to perform its basic functions, forcing the Nigerian military to step in. A society gets the kind of police that it pays for. Over the years, successive administrations have not made a connection around policing and development. So they just see the police as, oh, that is uh, the police and not critically putting it in the position of primacy because people need to be safe internally first. You need to take care of the internal enemy before you begin to look at those ones that are threatening you on the outside. So um, over the years, there's been consistent underfunding, which is very, very um, critical. You want to undertake police operation. It has to do with funds. It has to do with state-of-the-art um, um, technology, equipment, and all of that. And then the manpower less than 400,000 police personnel currently police uh, a country of over 200 million. So what it means is that there is inadequacy somewhere. The police right now is overstretched. The country is very big and diverse. And then if you look at the scale of insecurity that is happening, you know, it changes rapidly. So what it means is that the security landscape is not constant. You understand? So the police is trying to really grapple with all of this in the midst of very meager resources, resources in terms of training, in terms of um, equipment, in terms of manpower and what and, and every other thing. Um, government's approach in trying to address some of these inadequacies by the police has been to set up committees, you know, police reform committees. But the question again is that each of these successive government that comes in set up a committee, do they make reference to the last committee to say, okay, what did my predecessor, you know, found when he talk about policing challenges. How can I build upon that and actually implement this to make the police effective? But no, our approach has been that, okay, I get into office, 
and then I'm setting up my own committee. Though the carnage isn't over yet, in more recent times, the joint military effort of the Nigerian Army and the Nigerian Air Force has recorded more success in combating terrorists and criminals. In the last few months, the synergy and jointness among the three services has been cordial and overwhelming, which has resulted in the decimation of most of the criminal elements we have in this country. While Nigeria may or may not reform its police soon, critics say the new conception of security now places emphasis on human and non-military variables, saying even the best of soldiers and policemen may be unable to maintain security in a country with a whooping 33% unemployment rate. Nigeria cannot solve its insecurity problems in isolation of other developmental issues. Where we go from here depends on our ability as a people, a government, and a nation to make the urgent steps needed to pull our country, Nigeria, from the brink. Hello and welcome to One on One. I am Maureen Menong Wezigwe. My guest today is Bridget Okonofowa. She's the Managing Director of Unique Ventures Limited. She's an agribusiness consultant, a trainer, a coach, and a mentor. Welcome to One on One, Bridget. Thank you, Maureen. Thank Will you. I be right to call you a farmer? Of course. You know, you remind me of my mother. She used to be a farmer. It's a very strong woman. Although during her time, we, don't have, we didn't have what we have uh, today, which is the mechanized farming, um, and, which I think forms my first question to you. What kind of a farmer are you and how do you go about it? Okay. Thank you very much, Maureen. Um, 
Yes, uh, I, I often hear people ask me that question, what kind of a farmer are you? They expect me to tell them, I have cassava farm, I'm farming, you know, like I have a bush that I've, that I've prepared and that I'm going to the farm to till the ground and grow some things and all that. But what people do not understand is that agriculture, the agricultural space is very wide. It's a wide space. Mm -hmm. And they have so many spaces in the agricultural space that you can play in, all right, so mm -hmm. without even having to touch the ground. So I play in that area where all I do is coach, tell people how about agribusiness. One thing for sure is that people always, when you talk about agriculture, they just think it's agriculture, but there is the value chain in agriculture, you know. Um, so I play in the circle of the agribusiness where I teach people what to do, how to do it, and what, what or how or where to go, right? And how to make and the money. how to make the money, right? Mm -hmm. Because now you, we, we have things we call agricultural tourism. Mm -hmm. People are just playing in that space and they are just making money. We don't want to even begin to dive into that. because Tell, tell us a bit of that agricultural tourism. Okay, agricultural tourism is yeah. like, okay, let's take... Uh, you know what tourism is. You mm -hmm. know, if I decide to go into tourism in Nigeria, I, I look for locations, places I want to take people to. Mm -hmm. We have the uh, 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 Ayade man who's built the big rice factory in Calabar. I want to take people there. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a lot of farms, Obasanjo farm. We want to take people there. We want to get them to relax in the agricultural environment and take a ride through the farm and see what is possible. Because, you know, Agriculture was our first baby. Mm -hmm. For some reason, we forgot. The oil came, took over. And when we went to school, you come out thinking about working in a bank, working in the insurance, working in all these beautiful places with blue color, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, but suddenly, we realized that we have gone far behind where the world is now coming to Nigeria to take what we produce here add value to it, and bring it back for us to eat. Very unfortunate. Very. It's annoying. Mm -hmm. You understand? So suddenly the government is saying, let's get into agriculture. Now, what they didn't realize is that the oil has eaten half of the Nigerian man's mind. <laughs> uh -huh. So they forgot to tell you about agriculture. They don't know what to do, where to go, how to go about it. All right? So this is where we come in. We try to tell people, look, it's not just going to the farm. Because today, even with the insecurity in Nigeria, people don't want to go to the farm. The farmers are even afraid to go to the farm mm -hmm. because they don't want to get killed. So right now we're saying, creating more awareness in the upper areas where you can use your compound as a farm. For those who have compounds. For those who have compounds, right? Okay, where you can use your garden, where you can use even your house. There are things you grow even inside your room. People do not understand this. Mm -hmm. So we give out this information. But my focus right now, really, in agriculture is uh, the mushroom cultivation. Okay, we're going to get to that. We'll, to, we'll get to that. We'll get but to let, that. Let's, I, I just needed to establish your type of farming, yeah. which you have tried to, just ex to explain. Yeah. Mm. So let's look at how uh, technology has changed farming in the 21st century. Because like, as, I, as I started, I told you about my mother. Yeah. And during that time, they didn't have mechanized farming, yeah. so they had to bend and till and all yeah. of that. Yeah. How has technology you know, change all of that today in Nigeria. I'm not talking about the West, just, but I was Nigeria. just going to ask you in Nigeria. You mm -hmm. mean? <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, technology has played a very huge role, but we are not even close at all. We are not close. When we talk about technology in farming, we are not close. The farm farmers in Nigeria needs to enjoy what we call mechanized farming, mm -hmm. and the, this mecha this this agricultural equipment doesn't go round in Nigeria. The farmers are still lagging behind. Why? Before we, we, before we got on set, I was just telling you, when we talked about, um, uh, you, you asked a question, I can't remember the question that you asked, and I said, because there is no transportation in the agricultural space. There's something we call agricultural transportation, mm -hmm. logistics. Yeah. Agricultural log logistics. That's a business for someone, which is part of what I teach people. Mm. Me, what do farmers really lack in Nigeria? Farmers lack 
good road network. Farmers lack transportation. Farmers lack coal system. Mm -hmm. And without these things, we're talking about technology. The farming will not work. Talking about the coal system, you're talking about preservation, right? Yes, preservation. Because we have a, we suffer um, a, a situations in this part of the world where once any fruit is out of season, it's it's gone. Yes, you were talking Instead about the organic. You were talking right. about the you know the uh, uh, organic uh, versus food GMO. getting spoiled. Mm. That was you know the discussion we had. Yeah. And I was telling you why would food not get spoiled? We don't have enough transportation, agricultural logistics. We do not have it in Nigeria. People need to know that. They, they should invest, you know, because oftentimes people come to me and say, what should I do? Mm. I have money. I want to do agri. I say, do you want to go to the farm? Oh, no, no, I really don't want to go to the farm. All right, I do agricultural logistics. Go and rent vehicles or lease vehicles or buy vehicles. And farmers need these vehicles to bring their produce from the farm to the market, mm -hmm. right? And we don't have enough. And I just told you, I said, if a farmer harvests Ugu, for instance, or vegetables, for instance, which are actually perishable produce, right? Yeah. And you harvest in the morning. And in that village where you harvest, maybe only two people have pick up to come and pick fruits. Mm -hmm. And they are already engaged with other farmers. Meaning that you don't have transport for that money to get your vegetables to the farm fresh. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So by the time the pick up comes, you get to the market, it's near evening. All right? And th th the produce would have. I don't know. Loss. Yes, the yeah, taste. Freshness. The nutrients. Well, yes, you talked about you the know, nutrients. No, I was going to ask you much later yeah. how farmers sell their products here in Nigeria yeah. and how they export. Yeah. But let's, I think because of the point where you are right yeah. now, this is a good time to bring it in. Sell their how do Nigerian farmers sell their products in Nigeria and how do they export them? Hmm. Let me first talk about how they sell and before we talk about exports. Because... Yeah. I just came back from a trip, you know, Maureen. Mm -hmm. In all the shops, grocery shops I went, yeah. I saw food, I saw produce from Africa, mm -hmm. but not for Nigeria. Hmm. Okay, so let's talk about how they sell. How they sell? They sell by going, taking them to the markets, right? Because you know, again, we don't have the storage facilities for common farmers to store their food. So farmers take their produce from the farm, all of it at once. Yes, to the market. And then when they get to the market, you also have the people they call the middlemen. Mm -hmm. All right? And I'm going to talk about that later, yeah. you know, in this conversation. The middlemen. The farmers will sell. Farmers in Nigeria attend the poorest. When in the world, it's not like that. They're supposed to be among the rich Farmers people. are supposed to be the... What do you mean they're supposed to be among the rich people? Farmers are supposed to be rich. Mm -hmm. If you produce food for 200 million people in Nigeria, you are a rich person. But unfortunately, our farmers in Nigeria, um, that word, farmers are poor, has even gotten into the farmer's head themselves. Mm. You understand what I mean? Of course, now, you know, it's changing now because the big boys who probably got retrenched from ExxonMobil, all these people with Jeep going to the farm. Mm. You know, we now have all these people. Mm. But how many of those people do we have? We have still the common farmers you know, and all that. So farmers take their produce from the market, from the farm to the market, to sell in the market. Mm. Sometimes, maybe the market people will go to the farm gate to buy the produce. And then you see, the, the difference is, when they go to the farm gate to price, the, the price is different, it's lower. Mm -hmm. When the farmer takes the produce to the farm, the price is higher. Though, the middlemen are there. The transportation cost is there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a whole lot of things that has kept the farmers poor. Mm -hmm. So how they sell their produce is take it to the market. What other way would they sell their produce? And so what about taking it abroad? How did they do that? Who are those involved? It, well, I don't know really because the Nigerian, I, I said to you earlier before we got on board that we are not as serious as we talk. So talk is cheap. Talk is very cheap because the Nigerian government should be forward thinking and forward looking. Because a government who a couple of years ago said we should get into agriculture by now should have done something about the export mm -hmm. of produce from Nigeria. Now, it beats my heart each time I go to shops in Europe and I can't find Nigerian products 
produce on the shelf. All right? Mm -hmm. I saw beans. I saw yams from Ghana. I saw all kinds of produce. They are from Ghana, from uh, Ivory Coast, from all kinds of places. So you're telling me that and all I can't those find African Nigeria. shops will find abroad. I can't None find of Nigeria. the products there are from Nigeria. The, the produce you will get abroad that is from Nigeria are actually kind of smuggled in. It's not in large quantity because do you know that quite recently they banned a lot of produce from Nigeria? Yeah, I, I read that. How come the Nigerian... chemical? Yes. In the yam, I remember no, one that has to do with the yam. It's not just about chemical. It's not just about chemical. It's the handling. Okay. Best practice. Okay. You understand? Mm -hmm. It's not just about that. We don't meet the standard. And so that brings the question or begs the question, the regulatory agencies. Do we have that? Who regulate to see and assist these farmers to... Package their things properly to handle well, these things properly. Well, we have. They are, are they doing effective? what they can do, but it's not really effective. Because if it's if effective, I would see Nigerian produce on the shelf of Ocean in Paris. Hmm. Okay? I did not see no... And each produce you buy, if you go to Ocean in Paris, you see carton. They put it there, Kenya. They put it there, Ivory Coast. They put it there, Ghana. They put it. I see the countries, but and Nigeria is not Nigeria. there. Nigeria. How come? Just recently, while I was in France, we bought pineapple for five euro and some cent. As at that time, euro was eight hundred and something. So if you do a calculation for five euro, let's just say six euros, right? Mm -hmm. For one pineapple that is not as big as the smooth cayenne that we have in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. It's five, six euros. Six euro by 800 is what? For one pineapple. And that pineapple is not from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. It's from somewhere in South America, in France. You know, someone like you who is involved in the value chain um, and seeing all these challenges that farmers, local farmers are facing, because their interest is of, should be of utmost importance to every one of us, and most importantly to the government. Um, is there anything the Ministry of Agriculture is doing from your understanding and probably your communication with them to help these local farmers in any way? Well, they say they are doing things, but I still say we are not doing enough. Because if we are doing enough, it will show. You will see it. I will see Nigerian produce everywhere. If it's not in the world, if it's not there, Believe me, we're not doing enough. How can they ban fish? How can they ban this? How can they ban that? Too many things that they ban from Nigeria. Why? It should be a big worry to the Nigerian government mm -hmm. or to the regulatory bodies. If they exist. If All right, that, that, that also brings, brings me to the point where I ask, what do we import? Oh, no. Mm -hmm. We import a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean virtually almost everything. All, yeah. Are they all checked? Because I was discussing with some nutritionists some time ago, and they told me that most of the fruits and vegetables we eat in Nigeria have lost their nutrients uh, because of fertilizer and pesticides. Mm -hmm. How true is this? If it is true, how worried because should we, we be? Because we haven't really embraced organic growing and organic living. Organic in this part of the in world? This Nigeria. Organic? We haven't embraced organic in Nigeria? Morning. If we have, it's just a little. I keep saying. What happened? I don't know. We don't know. I'm just saying to you right now that in the world, everybody's tending towards organic, healthy eating, healthy growing, and all of that. Now, who is regulating it in Nigeria? Why do we still use chemical fertilizer in the foods that we eat? Mm -hmm. Why would the food not lose nutrients? If the farmers cannot get access to liquid organic fertilizer or whatever organic fertilizer, if they don't have access to it, they will use what is available. Right? Okay. So why would the produce not lose its nutrient? Again, I also say to you, the problem again is that even if you grow organically, you still have to get the food to the store. You still have to get it to the market. All right? Mm -hmm. And if, if, if we don't have enough, uh, enough transportation, we don't have all these things. There's no how we will not lose our food. You know? There's a huge post-harvest losses. You know that. 
the farmers take their produce to the farm because there is no storage. The farmers doesn't have really have to be at the mercy of anybody mm -hmm. or have to sell their fruits off when the evening comes mm -hmm. because there's hope for cold chain or cool system. But it's not popular. We don't have it. We don't have it. And so that's why when mango is out of season, we don't have mango. You can't to have eat. mangoes. But ordinarily, we should have mango you throughout have the ma year, yeah. as you have we mangoes. find in other yes. parts of and the world. And when the farmer takes the produce to the farm, to the market, and he or she can sell it, they take it back to the cool store. They don't have to sell it. Yeah. Do you know some people have formed the habit of going to the farm uh, market in the evenings? Because they know that's when that's the farmers when will sell cheap. off their things. Because they can't. Where are they taking it to? If they bring it back tomorrow, it's, then it has lost its, its nutrients. Oh wow. oh, wow. This is really sad. It's sad, Maureen. It's sad. Because the farmer goes to the farm and till the ground, fill the ground, grow, and all of that at the end of the day to be prized for nothing. Or sell off. All right? Mm -hmm. It's sad. Government should really do something about that. This is why, again, I, I just use the word government. I don't, want to, I don't want to focus much more on government. Government have so much on their table. They have tried, the government have tried by saying, let us get back to agriculture. One thing I love about Nigeria is that the Nigerian government does not have an idea of what they are good. They just come up with something, and only the smart people can benefit from that thing that the government comes from. Because mm. government does not even have an idea. Meaning we, that we may not be having the, the right people in the offices that yeah, you know, they'll yeah, apply. Yeah. Because if the government have an idea of what agriculture truly is, they will be playing like the other countries in the world. Nigeria can feed the world. A Nigerian government who is forward-thinking, forward-looking, should know that. And we should capitalize on that. You know, since I was a little girl, I've heard how that Nigerian farmers lack storage. And how that the reason why we only eat mangoes in this part of the world during mango season is because the Nigerian farmer lacks storage. When Unlike you were a child, right? When I was a little it's girl. The story changing. Unlike has the counterpart, he hasn't changed. Uh -huh. uh, their counterparts outside of this part of this, uh, the world have storages where they store fruits and vegetables. And so nothing is out of season. And we're still here, 2023. I want to give you a... I want to share a little uh, experience I had with you. Mm -hmm. And I think the Nigerian government, again, forward thinking, should know that having storage and cooling system for our produce is what can give us the sustainability that we're looking for. A couple of years ago, uh, let's say, to be precise, 2018, I was in Tucson in Arizona. Mm -hmm. I was on a two weeks agricultural trip. Mm -hmm. And my itinerary was loaded because I visited different agricultural bodies. All right? Mm -hmm. I visited factories, value chain, people who do value chain in agriculture. Mm -hmm. I visited. I went to the Mexico War, uh, the war, you know, the much talk about Mexico War. Mm -hmm. And I stood there for 15 minutes because they told me I should come and see how the produce that comes out of Mexico gets into America. It was quite interesting. So I got to the wall, and I stood there. I saw trucks coming in from Mexico. You know, it's a border, mm -hmm. right? Now, that is the border of Nosgalis, right? So I visited, you know, we talked about the middlemen in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. They are in the market. But in Nosgalis, in the border of Mexico, that I visited an association called Produce Brokers Association, mm -hmm. all women. All women. All Produce people. Brokers Association. It was all women. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Produce Brokers Association. Do we even have that in Nigeria? No. Now, let's put that aside. I saw how trucks were coming in. Believe me, in 15 minutes, I stood there. I saw a long, 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 long chain of trucks waiting to, to go through the border to get into America. Mm -hmm. And you know, the interesting thing is they don't get into America. They get to the border of America, between Mexico and America. Mm -hmm. There is a border they call the Nosgalis border. What happens there? The Nosgalis border is like between Lagos stretch and Ogun stretch, right? Mm -hmm. Lagos Ogun stretch, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's how it is. On the one hand of the of Nos, you can check this out on the internet. On the one hand of Nosgalis is a long chain of 
cold facilities. Cold, cold rooms. Cold rooms. So I visited the, the, the president of the Association of uh, Cold Chain Owners. Mm -hmm. I sat there with them and we talked. And they told me how they started this. Some of them are family businesses that they started years back. So they serve, the border of Nosgalis serves as a distribution center. Mm -hmm. Right. So the trucks come from Mexico. They take the produce of the trucks and they distribute to America. I don't know if you get what I'm I mean. getting you. <laughs> so, the, and that makes me uh, that will make me ask you: How do we replicate that here? And how do you, as a consultant, encourage investors to do that? It's simple. You know, I was even telling them because I, it was so beautiful what I saw, and mm -hmm. I was like, "Would they come to Nigeria?" And believe me, to do come we and, need them to, to come, come and do that? For well, us, you know, Bridget. sometimes you know people have to set the pace for you. In Nigeria, sometimes we just I don't. know. Anyway, let me not go into, into that. All right? It's frustrating. It is, yeah, it is really frustrating. And then, the, while I was sitting with the president of uh, Storage Facility Owners Association, the guy pressed his computer mm -hmm. and he says, you have two uh, seaports in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. One is the Tinkan and the other one. They gave me the name mm -hmm. while I was sitting there. Yeah. And then they started thinking. Like, hmm, okay, Nigeria. You know, because, you know, when I'm outside of the country, I love my country so much that when yeah. I'm outside Nigeria, yes, we have all these issues. I am also looking at a way people can come into this country to help us, really, if the government is not looking for help in that direction. Mm -hmm. All right? And they were also thinking, I could see them thinking that, oh, would Nigeria be one of where they want to go? Mm -hmm. Right? But let's not deviate from what we're saying you just asked a question yeah how can we encourage investors yeah yeah we are encouraging investors every day every time do it we have the land to do it one of the facility i entered one of those facilities i entered was built with two hundred and fifty thousand dollars mm -hmm. independent from National grid. I tell you now, it we was have all solar. who can do this. It was all solar. Mm -hmm. No NEPA. Do you understand? Yeah. So, and we have one Nigeria mm -hmm. who can do, build one facility like that. I have the pictures, the videos, everything. All right. How did you get into farming, Bridget? How did you get into this? Oh, well, okay. Yeah, how did I get into farming? Yes. My father worked in the Nigerian water resources. Yeah. And then ended up being a farmer before he died, right? My mom was a serial entrepreneur. Don't ask me where I learned it from. I learned it from my mom mm -hmm. because I sold everything when I was young, right? So, and my mom became a farmer. And, you know, actually when I was young, I didn't like farm. I didn't like to go to farm. I know we ate food from the farm. We ate fresh from the farm. Everything we ate from the farm. And that's why I'm going to talk to you about how I got into mushroom cultivation, mm -hmm. you know, and all that. You know, but we ate everything from the farm. But I saw my mom, even at her age, it was just quite recently we said, Mom, don't go to the farm anymore. She's 93 now. And 93? That, yeah, and before 93, she was still going to the farm. They're always very strong. And then she comes to Lagos, she brings food, she says, I want to go to the farm and approach cassava. She was still <laughs> growing cassava. So anyway, yeah. let's just say I got encouraged by my mom, by my dad, because when I see my dad then, we had this, I don't know how they call it now, you know, the band, they the, call it the, the yam band. band, you know? The, my father was a my, farmer Yeah, too. my father, we used to have this band that we never had to go to the market to buy farm, mm -hmm. to buy yam, you know? So I started getting back into agriculture. Actually, the interest finally came when they said, get back to agriculture. Before then, I had, I travel a lot. I had visited events. I love agricultural events, okay. you know. So I got ideas. I got so many things. And I know that there's something that is missing in Nigeria, mm -hmm. especially with the youth. You just hit a nerve. The youth, there's this unemployment challenge in the country. And it's in crazy. spite of all these opportunities that can be found in agriculture, the youth are, the not, youth interested. are not interested. How mm -hmm. do we change this narrative? Agriculture has to be sexy. Hmm. Mm -hmm. It has to be sexy. You have to make, to get the street, the youths of the street, or of the schools, or whatever, you need to make agriculture attractive mm -hmm. and sexy. Mm -hmm. All right? Because why would? We're talking about mechanized farming. The world is gone 
like what, 100% past where we are right now. Mm -hmm. And you see, I attended November in Germany, the world's biggest agricultural mechanization, uh, mechanized uh, event, agricultural machinery event, which is a, a, an event that I take people to every year, right? Mm -hmm. So this time I was there. Maureen, you will not believe what you see there. They have days for students, for youths, you know? You will see youths in agriculture, you'll be like, are these really farmers? Hmm. You will see them talking, you will see them, look, look. And in all these, your travels, have you come across Nigerian officials doing anything, learning anything, and, you know? Mori, don't let me tell you about that. Because every time this event comes up, we write to all states, governments, mm -hmm. because we think that, okay, they've been traveling abroad, but they don't really bring things back. Because you see the Nigerian government, the Nigerian leaders, sometimes you ask, I just wonder what they go to do abroad. Maybe they shouldn't even go abroad. Because I... As a common Nigerian, I feel pains in my heart when I go abroad and see things that could be replicated in Nigeria and it's not done. Mm -hmm. Right? I feel pain. So what about these leaders? What do they look at when they go abroad? The way I talk about Nigeria abroad, sometimes they ask me if I work for the federal government. The way I promote Nigerian agriculture, the way I talk about Nigeria, they all ask me, do you work for the government? No, I use my money to buy my ticket and come to this place just because I'm looking for opportunity that I can use to improve myself and improve So the how can the images. youth be attracted? The youth needs to be attracted because government needs to make it attractive because mechanization is key to agriculture. The youth won't come and want to go to the farm and start and to dig holes like and ground and and did it. That. They don't want to do it. And you know the youth of these days, they like the fast ways to make money. But you see, they are intelligent. That's why government need to harness, need, need to harvest their uh, what energy, their strength. Yeah, their strength, their energy, their intelligence, and convert it. Mm -hmm. And away from the youth, what about someone who is just retiring from a civil service or whatever, who just wants to invest or wants to you know, look for something to do with him, him or herself for the mm. rest of his or her mm. life? Mm. What would you advise that person right now? I just advise retirement is not retired, mm -hmm. okay? When, when they retire, I would expect that they have saved up a little money. All right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. They have saved up a little money. You can invest in agriculture without going to the farm. Because there are people in Nigeria that are still doing well in agriculture. Mm -hmm. There are groups. There are associations. There are people you can give your money. Agriculture is the petrodollar. Mm -hmm. One of my guests from the U.S. said, said that to me. He said, agriculture is a, pet, it's a petrodollar. It's the next big thing. Come on, Maureen. It's the next big thing. It is. Everybody in the world eats. It really should be the big thing because yeah, everybody, like you said, food always sells. Yes. People must eat. If we don't man eat, man must we'll die. As we say, <laughs> man must, must work. work. <laughs> so what are we not benefiting from? From it. The Do government needs to wake up. Yes. Well, it's a clarion call, Nigerians. We need to really begin to hold our people more yeah. accountable. Yeah. It's not enough to talk about this on radio and television alone and write, you know, on the, on the daily papers. We need to really hold our so-called representatives accountable. Do they know what they're doing? Are they really representing us or are they representing themselves? Mm -hmm. These are questions we need urgent answers to. Well, thank you so much, Bridget. Thank you. It's been so, I wish we had more time. Yeah. I wish we had more There's time. There's never not enough time. You need to come again. <laughs> you need to come again. Bridget Okonofua has been my guest on One on One today. It's been a very beautiful time with her. And time is just not enough for us to exhaust all that needs to be discussed regarding agriculture. I am Maureen Menonwezigu. Many thanks for your time. Join us next time. Bye.
Hello and welcome to Plus Politics. I am better qualified to rule Lagos. Lagos SDP Guba candidate Kunle Utman says ahead of governorship polls. And Boot Party collapses structures in Lagos, Southwest Nigeria, forms alliance with Labour Party. Once again, this is Plus Politics. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. Kunle Uthman, who is the Social Democratic Party SDP Lagos governorship candidate, last week promised to make water transportation effective if voted into office in 2023. This is said at an interactive session with political party candidates in Lagos. He says among all other candidates running for the position of governor in Lagos, he is better qualified. We're now joined to discuss this tonight by Kunle Utman himself, governorship candidate of the Social Democratic Party. Well, thank you for uh, joining us on the show this evening, sir. Good evening. Okay, I'm, I'm, a lot of people are surprised because uh, you have said the things that you are going to do if you are elected into office as governor. In the meantime, we have heard rumors, these are still rumors until we confirm from you, that your party has collapsed its structures and are joining the APC. How true is this? Well, I don't think it's rumor. What has happened is the APC has given this supposed rumor a rubber stamp of the fact that it is true. And that creates a lot of problem. Because first and foremost, we have not joined the APC in this election. And we can never, ever join the APC. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we can't join them is we believe that they have failed. Governor Babagdi Sonwolo has failed to serve the people of Lagos State in the last four years. And we believe that his failure is such that anybody who associates with that political party in the forthcoming gubernatorial election is also going to have the stain on himself as a failure. And because the Social Democratic Party will know as a fact that we have the manpower, we have the competence, and we have the cerebral personalities to do the job, and we have a manifesto that is citizen-friendly, poised for a change. So we cannot be seen to associate with a failure. And why it is a failure is this announcement that we have joined them was made on their own official platform. They have this platform they call Lagos Focus on WhatsApp. They are all there. Every one of them is there. Deputy governor down. Even the governor's wife, I think, is there. It's being administered by a young guy. His name is Kofa Bodu. And they always speak from this platform. So it is not a rumor. They have put us in a situation where it has become obligatory, imperative, that we must tell the world that we have nothing whatsoever in common with APC in Lagos State, and it is not an option that we have. I've spoken with the chairman of the party, I've spoken with the national secretary, and we know that whoever or whatsoever they are doing, they are on their own. It is fake news. And if a political party at this stage of election will engage in fake news, we can as well also say it is a fake political party that is determined to rubbish other people, to interfere in the politics of their party, and begin to go around and say they have joined us. Now, the APC in Lagos State is obliged to show us, number one, who are the members of SDP that joined them? Number one, because... I am the official leader of the Social Democratic Party in Lagos State. Nothing happens in this state without my consent and information. When I don't have any information, my consent was never sought, and I know all our House of Assembly candidates. Keri Marufu, Esere, Mrs. Oshodi, the man in Ekpe, Olatuji, every one of us, we are intact as a political party including uh, Fashi Abin Bola, who is in Amu World of Him. I've asked everybody. Nobody was part of this rogue arrangement. Now, the APC must tell us why. The people, the document that was signed. Because if two parties come together, 
there must either be a memorandum of understanding between the two of them or they must take the coin. If they don't bring that out, then I actually feel sorry for them. That in their desperation to get this Babatunde Sowolu uh, re-elected, they are actually doing everything that is wrong. They are playing the tribal ticket. They are playing the religious ticket. They are tensing us in Lagos State. This is a place where all of us, we are, we are very happy. The Ibo man is happy here. The Yoruba man is, the Aose man is. All of us, we have been living together. We are intermarried. So what is this nonsense that they have impl simply brought in because of re-election? When it was time to campaign and we are debating, Babatunde Sawolu was everywhere, following his political godfather to chat him out to clap. While he was in England, some organization organized the debate. We are all there. Janda was there. I was there. Dwati was there. Akin Dixon was there. And the one was organized at four points by charity. By a group of cerebral people. He never ever attended in any debate. We don't know what he wants to do for the state. His 21 year rail project is a complete failure. He cannot start the blue rail. His hospitals are in a mess. The roads are in a mess. The traffic gridlock everywhere. But instead of him to tell us what he's going to do to change the narrative, all we are adding is, is Majin with this one, he's going to this church to campaign, he's in this select church, he's going to complete, have a complete nonsense. Okay, uh, well, because of uh, the showing uh, from the last election, the presidential election, uh, SDP didn't make such a huge impact, but the story could be different now. Uh, I'm asking, if you're not having an alliance with the APC, are you having any alliance with another political party? First and foremost, let me deal with the first part of your question. SDP did not make any showing before we had no senator. We had no House of Representative member. We have, it was just all of us. Using our resources and the support of our friends to sustain the party, now we have senators. Now we have House of, House of Representative members in the two houses. So it's not a zero level free. We have made progress. Number two, we are building a political structure. We are building a party from scratch, right? And by the time we finish this election, we also believe that a couple of governors will emerge. Lagos State might come to us. There was one says Sarumi, Agbala Jobi problem in this state, and I thought an Otodela emerge. Maybe we are looking at an Otodela arrangement. Because the first call that this APC is engaging in shows that the chances of them winning this election is a little bit small. Now let's go to the presidential election. Yes, it's also an APC problem. They lost woefully in Lagos State. If they elected a president who says Lagos is my home, he has been saying this for a long time. And we have been saying, you know, if Babadide Sawolu was in Lagos State and his party lost in Lagos State, then they have a problem. And that is why they are engaged in this political frenzy, that at all costs, they must win. So what are they doing? They are chanting war songs everywhere. This man must wait for me if they don't chant war songs. They are chanting religious songs. No, let it be a level playing ground. For us in the APC, we are convinced beyond doubt. APC or SDP. The Social Democratic Party, we are convinced APC can never ever be convinced. We are convinced beyond reasonable doubt that number one, we have selected very good people to participate in this election. We are not everywhere. We are not in the four, 40 hours of assembly seats. But the ones we are going to contest, they are good people, they are nice people, they are cerebral people. This is number one. Number two, we believe that Chief Kulotman, you know Chief Kulotman, right? That is me is a fit and proper person to govern the state. And I've been, I have displayed it in terms of my cerebral powers at the debates. Everybody says, Kule, you are simply excellent. So for me, I am, not, I am not desperate. Power belongs to the people. What democracy means is a government of the people, for the people, by the people. On Saturday, the people of Lagos State, whether Igbo, whether Yoruba, whether Aousa, whether Kanuri will go to the polls. Huh? And they will vote. At the end of the day, we have to respect the decision of the people. There is going to be mass youth participation. We shall allow the electoral process to go through. So only will not be the first governor in Lagos State to spend one time. After Babatunde Fashola, who did two times. And by the one time. So only, maybe, you will join the one-time people. And even when 
The political godfather attempted to remove Fashola. The people came around and said, no, you can't, because he was popular. The only reason why this man is running around and lying everywhere, and he asked the media team that is putting forth wrong information into the public, is because he has performed woefully. Sangros Market, he didn't do it until I started shouting, Sangros, Sangros, they are building it now. And where they are, he didn't do anything there. Commuting in Lagos is a traffic problem. And four years ago, when he was going to be sworn in as governor, the interview preceding the debate, he promised, if I don't solve, if I don't solve the traffic deadlock in Lagos State, I will not be justified to be governor anymore. He has not done anything. So his F9 card should make sure that he goes back to Ijebu Imushi, where he comes from, and allow us to breathe. But uh, he would say that the rail lines have come up. No, it hasn't though. come up. A rail line, line come up started. means that the trains will move, my friend. It will move. Have you ever entered that train? The only train we enter is the one that belongs to National Railway Corporation. It's not a rail line. It's a monoline. And this monoline started by Fashola eight years. I'm about there four years, 12. Himself four, 16. CNS to my two. Disaster of a government. How much do you spend on this project? Okay, uh, well... You said you did well in the debate. Yes, you really did well in the debate. But it goes beyond uh, doing well in the debate. What are the in antecedents that people will look at to say Kunle Utman is a good person to rule Lagos? Check the profile. I don't want to be, I want to be humble. But in my humility, I'm obliged to reveal certain information. Mm -hmm. In 1995, I was in the ING government, interim national government of Anishinaabe as the personal assistant to the Honorable Minister of Transportation. Thereafter, I proceeded as the personal assistant to the Honorable Minister of Power and Steel. I returned to legal practice after that, and I was called upon during that period to be part of a team that drew up the planning law and regulation for legal state. And the purpose of that regulation is that buildings should remain up. And it is interesting. I, I don't want to repeat it that Mr. Babajide Sonwolu was the vice chairman of this committee. General Rees was the chairman. General Rees was a gentleman that built a cooperative villa. I'm sure you were there. There is a Solomon Maja Kudumi architect. Nice man, he was there. Professor Kedele, he was there. Ade Dira was there. There are people from Ministry of Justice. And we sat for almost two years, looking holistically at the problem of buildings in Lagos State. And we put in place a legislation whereby buildings will never, ever fall. Interestingly, and by way of a complete turnaround, when Babajide Sonwolu had administered the state for so many years, buildings have not stopped collapsing. His tenure has been christened as the governor of collapsing buildings. But buildings were collapsing before he came. I'm sure you can tell me the ones that collapsed. But the one I know that I'm telling you, 21-story building collapsed. It has never happened in Nigeria before, 21. And those buildings were paid for in dollars. We later discovered the buildings were never insured. Those people, it was a colossal loss. The man who was in charge, he died in the building. We don't have information. The deputy governor came out and he said to us, it was 21 stories that was approved. The man who was in charge of the AJ said it was 16. So believe me sincerely, 21 came down. Seven came down in Unuru. Five came down, building collapse in every. And you see this man, for me, considering the amount of revenue that comes into this state, the amount of revenue, internally generated revenue, and considering what is received from the center, we don't have a business having this kind of state. Our uh, water transportation is almost zero. When Jack Conde was there, he did better. He had Baba Kekere Ferry, he had the Tafaji Ferry, which was there on the water. It will commit to you if you had a good ferry service. The commuting time between Lagos CMS and a papa who is not more than 15 minutes. You don't have to be on the road at all. If you have a functional ferry service, you can also do the same thing with Badagri. You don't have to come through all this first stack, be on the road. So we need to think outside the box. There are places in the world, more than 15 years ago, I was in Amsterdam. I entered the ferry. It's called Ulysses. It's a three-day car ferry. Under is a car park. You drive your car, you can sit down there, between Dublin and, and London. It's, it's, there are many ferries everywhere. I, I've done my investigation. My friends and I, we have looked at it because I do a lot of maritime work. And we know that there are ferries everywhere in the world we can repair, we can fix, turn around, and bring into our waterways. So that if you are moving from CMS to Ikorodu, you don't have to be on the road. If you are going from Ikorodu to Ijede, you don't have to be on the road. If you are going to Badagri, you don't have to be on the road. 
What does that do? Lagos is not a landlocked state. Eh? It's a state that is blessed with water everywhere. And that is the reason why we see the customs and everybody. We are a generating revenue state for the federal government of Nigeria. At a point, the internally generated revenue of Lagos State was that of 30 states of Nigeria. One small state, 30 states combined. So we don't have any reason for us to be in this state other than the fact that we are very corrupt officials of government. They look aside. They don't do what they have to do. If everybody will have to earn their own pay. And they exist so this company they call Alphabeta. Alphabeta belongs to one of them that has consistently been collecting revenue on behalf of government. We don't have any business with Alphabeta. Okay. My friend, Executive Order 01, upon swearing, I will terminate that useless contract. Okay, uh, well, okay, maybe that is part of the question I'm, I'm going to ask yes, you ask. now. Because um, when you talk about uh, corruption, it's like it's an establishment, it's something, it's an institution that uh, no one man can, can, can abolish. How do you intend to fight this corruption that is bedeviling you see, uh, cor uh, Lagos you State? See, the word corruption itself has different meanings and usages. It depends on the way you want to apply it. So I am now speaking specifically of the corruption inherent in the bureaucracy. I am not defining corruption everywhere. I am limiting this word in its applied times by way of a juxtaposition to corruption in government. If everybody did what they ought to do, if a man who is going to approve the building plan knows that he has to approve it, you don't start building until you have your approval. If the people who are supposed to inspect floor by floor, they do their job, things should be okay. My brother, eh? if the money we are getting in this state is going to be applied for the benefit of the state, we are going to get somewhere. We have this problem with uh, local government. Lagos state government is one of the states that is leading the opposition to local government autonomy. Now, what is the reason for that? The constitution is clear. We are a tripartite government. The federal, the state, and the local government. And allocation should go directly to each. The federal takes its own. The state takes their own. Local government should have their money directly. Why is it going to the executive? It's an abnormality. So it has to be corrected. There are things that we are doing in this state that is not making the state grow. We have a last man. Very corrupt organization. Last man. How will you get these people to, to turn around and Which not be people? corrupt? The people that you say are corrupt are making these things the way they are because you can't be everywhere yeah, at the because, same time. You see, the bureaucracy does not assume that one man is going to govern everywhere. What the bureaucracy tells you is that there's a functional system. The man who has the bureaucracy in the ministry is not the commissioner as it were. It's a political appointee. It's the permanent secretary. And it is assumed that is well grounded in the bureaucracy. He knows what to do. So what do we do? We also ensure that we have a retraining system, a, a retraining system, whereby each person should understand that we are paid to do a certain job. The way government works, if you are given a, a contract, there is, also, there is already factored into that contract your profit margin if you did it best. But you find people, they do shoddy jobs, they work away. In Lekki, they have been removing the paving stones on the road now for like four or five times. Who did that job initially that didn't do it well? So we must have a corporate responsibility system whereby we have a sense of accountability. The bureaucracy can be more refined. We can also do a rewarding system. We can also encourage people. If you did X, Y, and Z, we are going to do so, so, and so. We can also look at the possibility of recalibrating the salaries of the civil servants and giving them enhancement. What we have in the system now, in Lagos State and in most parts of this country, is just a bureaucracy that is dysfunctional. You and I now, we live in Nigeria. Today, I've not seen Naira for the last seven days. I've not seen it at all. I don't have cash. People are stranded. They can't go to work. And that is because we have the system of a president and a CBN governor who don't understand the basic rules of macroeconomics. You don't do this. In other countries, there will have been real problem. We're not at war. You go to the bank, the bank is not even open. You go to the bank, you cannot even enter the bank. What kind of country is this one? So we need to actually tell ourselves that we are, we are operating governance at the level of the subhumans. 
And that's where anywhere we go in the world, we are, so, we, are, we, are so, we are subjected to these people. These are bad people. We are not bad people. We are very good people. Cerebral. We can think. We write books. We are professors. We are lawyers. We are good media people. So what we are having is a fake version of who we are. So we need to develop, evolve an educational system. Do you know in this country they don't teach history more in schools? If you don't know the history of your people, how then do you understand what your grandfathers did for the development of your country? So there's so many things that have taken place that we almost now look at it and see we don't have hospitals. When this new president, whenever he had a dick, he will go to Europe. People will go and start visiting him there. The one that has just been elected, the one that is there now, the same thing applies. Even when the vice president had issues with his, with his, he didn't go to General Hospital. He went to one, one Ajebota Hospital in Ikeja. When you enter the place, it's as if you're in England. We must develop our health system in such a way that we are part of what we are. I have never, ever been for health treatment anywhere in the world except in Lagos. Whenever I was ill, I'm ill, I go to I go to Creek Hospital, Minico. If I'm not there, I go to Air Force Hospital. If not, I go to Luth. I have cards of all these people. Even last week, whatever option I have, and if I become governor of Lagos State and I'm dying, if anybody takes me anywhere in this country, the person will my ghost will be chasing him all over the place. Okay, um, <clears throat> because our, our time is up, let's uh, try to round off uh, in the, the shortest possible time. What are the first three things that you will do if you are elected into office? I will reform last man. I will reform last man. I will employ more people and I will make it a human traffic friendly organization because with that I will be able to decongest the road. I will create for them an eight hour shift system so that at every point in time I, the traffic will move. There's some areas in Lagos that we have traffic gridlock almost the whole day. So we need to look at those areas. VGC, Okoko Maiko, Ikorodu, Badabri. Certain areas we will need to look at and we will employ people. More so, I will develop our agriculture. You know this fish we eat. We do agriculture, um, fish agriculture shows now that you don't have to even actually go into the sea because you have a system now whereby you can have a tank system and you can actually build the fish. I will encourage our young people, our youth, to engage in that agriculture. I will provide for them small, medium scale industries, facilities that they can actually use to start this business and they can make money for themselves, they can be self-employed. And more importantly, I will correct the mistake that this administration has made and they, will, they are making. They have this university mentality. Do you understand? That whoever goes to school must go to university. It is complete nonsense. It's wrong. Because you see, polytechnic education offers a different education than the university. So people can go to the polytechnics, they will be engineers, they will be accountants, and they will be very, very successful. And also, more importantly, this question of collapsing colleges of education into universities is also something that they have not well thought out. Because the colleges of education, they're actually there to train teachers. Teachers who will serve in the schools. They are professional teachers. They get their NCE. Later, they may want to get other degrees. But we don't have to make every institution university. And more importantly, like I said, the education system, the schools are not, the schools are, they don't have teachers, they don't have pupils. So I will encourage our teachers and whoever does well in this country, in my state, especially the doctors, they are going to have a special scholarship scheme. Do you understand? We are going to ensure that we have more people in science. We are going to be training them from the hospital. And you see, if you go to Aula Road there, there used to be a nursing, a nursing hostel there, huge. If you go there now, you will be surprised. They have allocated it to themselves. It has become their campaign office. How does any government do that? The school of nursing is located there to feed the general hospital. The nurses, they stay there, they go to the hospital. But Sawe Olu and his political godfather, they have turned it into campaign office. They brought it down. So me, I will again revoke that license. That's of all. I'll put the school of nursing back. 
Okay, yeah, we've been hearing lot from... More, uh, lot more. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Uh, I know there is a lot more to say, yes. but uh, we can only, only wish you good luck on Saturday. Thank you very uh, much. When the polls open uh, for voting for the people of Lagos State. We've been listening to Kunle Utman, who is the Social Democratic Party SDP Lagos governorship candidate, and he has promised a lot of things. Everything lies in the hands of the people. Saturday is another day for election. Go out and vote for your choice. If he's the one, then choose him. If he's someone else, less hope for a better Lagos than what we have right now. would like to say thank you to you, Mr. Utman, for coming on the show. And we are, like I said, we wish you well. I, I, <coughs> I reciprocate the gesture. I'm clear for, grateful for this opportunity. And like I said, the Social Democratic Party will contest this election. Let the people decide. And whosoever emerges will shake his hands or they will shake our hands and we hope for a better Lagos in the next four years. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we well, thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, we will be taking a look at the boot party and plans for Lagos ahead of the governorship election. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is still Plus Politics. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. In a ceremony held in Lagos, Southwest Nigeria, the governorship candidate of Boot Party, Olawale Oluo, disclosed that he had a sh to shelve his ambition to support the Labour Party presidential candidate to win Saturday's presidential poll for the greater interest of Nigeria and Nigerians. Ahead of Saturday's presidential and National Assembly elections, the Boot Party had formed an alliance with the Labour Party in the presidential and governorship elections. And that alliance of his party with the Labour Party, according to Oluo, was facilitated by Pa Ayo Adebanjo, leader of the Yoruba social political group Afenifere. The party also adopted the governorship candidate of Lego, Labour Party in Lagos State, Badebo Roots Vivo as its candidate, while the State House of Assembly candidates will be harmonized. Well, joining us to discuss this is Mr. Olawale Oluwo himself, the governorship candidate of Boot Party. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you very much, presenter. Okay. First of all, you were in the APC, and in fact, we know that you were the commission, a commissioner in the Ambode administration. What changed your mind to leave the party for something else? Okay, I think uh, basically it was because of lack of internal democracy in the party. If you remember, I participated in the APC primary election mm. with Governor Sonwulu and one other person, Mr. Mustafa. But a lot of things happened. So, some things you could call government magic. So we find a situation where three aspirants have applied for the position. They have paid for the forms. They've been cleared. And you, you ended up having a sole candidate on the day of the primary election. So a lot of wrong things happened in that, during that process. And I, I wouldn't lend my name to such. So I left the party. 
because it's my democratic right to leave. If you can voluntarily enter, you can voluntarily exit. So that's why I went to the Boot Party. But I've always known that no matter what we do in Lagos, the opposition cannot afford to split votes because we are dealing with a formidable foe. Uh, let me not call them foe. I'll say we are dealing with a formidable adversary, and that adversary has been in government for about 24 years. So it's not the kind of adversary you go into an election with and you start to, to, to split your votes in different directions. So I made that determination that the right thing to do for Lagos, if Lagos is going to be free, is to join forces with comrades who have the same ideology and the same vision as I have. And where there are differences of vision, we can harmonize and come to, 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 to a consolidated approach in terms of agenda, in terms of manifesto, and we can drive the strategy and win the state. That is what this is about. Okay, before we go to specifics on uh, what kind of ideology that Labour Party and Boot Party share uh, together, uh, I'd like to know, is it not part of uh, internal democracy to have a consensus candidate? Because you said on the day of election, uh, one candidate alone was remaining. I just wanted to understand that. Was that not a consensus can candidate? Or... No, it was not a consensus. It was a fraudulent process. How so? It was a fraudulent process to the extent that to have a consensus, the three candidates must come together and agree that this is the person that all of us will um, support. You even had a situation where all the ballot papers that were taken to the Unicorn Stadium that day, they were pre-printed. So, Governor Sonlu's name were printed on all of them. So it was not a primary election. It was just a charade that no serious Democrats should be part of. Mm. And, and we have the evidence. We have the facts to, su to support that. Okay, so uh, if there are evidences, why didn't you take it up somewhere else, like uh, legally, to fight it? Was that not allowed? There is no, <laughs> there is no need for that. Look, okay. the nomination process has a short period to, to, to the end of it, okay. going by the next time table. So if you go to court on the basis of the irregularities in your own party, you might be in court while the nomination process will close, and even if you still lose the case in the court, you would have closed all the alternative windows available to you. So sometimes you just let it go because your focus is very clear. It is to free Lagos, and the best way to achieve that is either to go it alone, and when you get to the field and you discover that you can't go it alone, then you must now come together with other like minds, and then you create a formidable um, opposition. And the opposition must be such that the electorates will have a limited option to choose from. Because when we started, we had a five-way race, which was APC, PDP, Boot Party, Labour Party, and ADC. I was not comfortable with that. I wanted a two- or three-way race. So I joined forces with the Labour Party in order to make it a three-way race, which was achieved. Before we went for the presidential election, we had a three-way race, basically. But by the time we came back from the presidential election, the electorates themselves streamlined it into a two-way race. So what you have now is a Labour Party that is contesting with the APC, the ruling party. Okay, you, from all the parties that were available to you, you chose Labour Party. You say because you have like minds. would like to know some of these things that marked Labour Party out that were some of your ideologies as well so that we know why that marriage was very easy for you. Well, three things happened. Number one... A lot of us did not see a big coming. That is why I went for the Booth Party, because I wanted a political party structure that would be available for all comrades who are interested in this battle to free Lagos that all of us can use. So that that platform is not tainted, that platform is not penetrated by the ruling party, because I know that's their strength. As long as they can penetrate your platform and then compromise the entire structure, you are not likely going to be able to win with that platform. So I brought the Boot Party for the Lagos struggle. I didn't see a big coming. I didn't see Labour coming. So that is why we had that initial fight with this. But with respect to the similarities between my Boot Party and the Labour Party, is the fact that both parties are center-left parties. We are center of the left. We are not extreme left. 
We are not extreme right. We are not extreme right. We are center left party. So it means that we believe in the concept of capitalism to create the wealth, and then we believe in welfareism to be able to distribute the wealth that is created in a way that nobody is left behind. That is what center left is about. So all the concepts of welfareism. So the concept of welfareism, the concept of making sure um, the working class can have access to the wealth that they have created. These are the things that makes ourselves and Labour Party to be in this alliance. It was something that was well thought out. That is the first one. The second one was that the man Obi, when he came out, there was a sincerity about him. So we could also have the confidence that at the national level, we were going into an We seem to have lost the audience. Okay. That was kind of um, relationship. And then the third thing is the fact that for Labour Party in Lagos, the governorship candidates and the deputy governorship candidates in the person of um, Gwadiba Rosvival and Princess Oyefusi, we have been meeting in the last four to five years. If I've not had meetings with Gwadiba before the alliance, we must have had meetings over 50 times. Just discussing how to free Lagos, how to free our people, and how to take our states to the level that we desire. So there was a strategic fit, and it is that fit that we leveraged on to bring about this alliance. And this alliance has proven to be a very competitive alliance, and we believe with this platform we can win this election. Okay, you keep saying free Lagos. Free Lagos from what exactly? Because free it, Lagos from the APC. What did they do? Because you were part of this government, and what did they actually do, or what are they actually doing that Lagos needs to be freed from? Yes, I was part of, I was part of them to work, with, to work for Governor Ambody, and Ambody was doing the work, and at the time, the, uh, going forward, the PC was not seeing it as something that should continue to do the work for the people. Rather, a lot of interests were being played out. And I know it had to do with the presidential ambition. I respect that. I don't have any problem with that. But at that point, somebody was performing. And I thought if it was about performance, which we were doing very well, and about the people who were getting the dividends of democracy, yes, I would be part of that. Even if PDP transforms in, in Lagos into that, I would join them. Anything that, that would benefit from that is no longer about the people, it's no longer about performance, it's no longer about dividends of democracy and all that, then you can take your excuse. There's nothing that ties you to any part. So now that um, you are joining forces, or you have joined forces with the Labour Party, how do you intend to superintend over this state, Lagos, uh, as two parties? Or are you now just one party yeah. and there's no longer anything like boot party? There's still boot party, but um, with respect to Lagos, it's Labour Party that we're all working for. So there wouldn't be a time in the future that uh, people from the boot party will now begin to say we are being marginalized or that. Have you worked out the modalities of how to uh, govern this state together? What role will you be playing? No, no, those, those will be very presumptuous. You know when you go into this kind of alliance, and if you are going into it in good faith, you're not going to start to make it look like a deal. Mm. That's what typical politicians do. I'm not a typical politician. I have never been. I've been a man in the corporate world. I'm an investment banker. I'm a capital market operator. I'm a chartered accountant and all that. We don't approach public sector activities like that. So what we want to do is to say, do you believe in the philosophy of what you are doing? Can you create a value proposition that the people can uh, associate with, something that resonates with them, and that can be the basis upon which you end their votes? You end their votes. It is when you have um, won the election that you now begin to sit down and say, who has this capacity? Mm -hmm. Who has these capabilities? And then you begin to see how government will be formed based on people's capacity, capabilities, competence, and all those things that Peter Obi normally talks about. I believe in them. Mm -hmm. But when you start saying, you sit down, you take 30%, 30%, 30%, then that's a deal. All oh, this should not be a deal. All oh, this should be about service. Okay. Now, let's just have a dream, your dream of Lagos State, 
if you do win the, the governorship election on Saturday. What is the Lagos state that we are looking at if Labour Party should clinch the, uh, the throne, as it were? I'll summarize it um, very quickly. The Lagos state we want is a Lagos state where people can sleep in the night and they feel safe. That's security. It's also a Lagos state where people can wake up in the morning and they have somewhere to go or a business to do or a venture to pursue. You have situations where a lot of young people are just milling around, um, uh, clustering in different streets. Even in front of my office, I see people cluster every day. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. So I wonder how those guys plan their lives, how they, how they think of where the next meal will come. So people want to sleep and sleep with their eyes closed because there's security. People want to wake up and have somewhere to go and how to earn revenue. People want to leave their homes and not be in excruciating traffic. People want to be able to send their kids to good schools. And when they are healed, they want to be able to go to hospitals that can take good care of these things that Libo is talking about. And with respect to how we will deal with the traffic situation, it's going to be medium, uh, uh, short, medium, and long-term uh, approaches. Number one, the short-term one is that as much as possible, we extend the BRT lane to so many, so many lanes. Because that BRT lane, in the first rules or for those alignments that don't have railways. Because once you build the railway, that might take you three years. Uh, three years, four years, five years. The traffic, the people in traffic are not going to wait for that. So we must quickly expand the BRT lanes to almost all the available roads that we can get space to extend them to. And that will bring immediate soup up. All the bottlenecks will break them down. Governor Sonolu promised us to take care of the bottlenecks. I've not seen much work in that regard. So for me, with respect to the health sector, we have a very good plan. So that's what this is about. This is about where Lagos was when this governor took over and where Lagos is today. I will be better off. A lot of folks have had, have had in this Lagos. They don't seem to say they are better off. Mm. Uh, let's just let's just as brief, let's just as briefly as possible a round off uh, on on this on this note. Lagos has been administered for the past twenty four years by a particular group of people. Call it a party. Call it some godfathers. Call it the establishment. Whatever name you want to give it. How do you intend to succeed? breaking away totally from this establishment that has run Lagos for this long? I don't know what you mean by breaking away. Look, when you go into the elections and we win, mm. the thing has broken itself. We don't need any process to break it again. A lot of things will change immediately. Number one, any government that comes in that is not actually installed will immediately cancel the alphabet. Most likely on the day of inauguration. That one is without thinking. Any government that is not installed by Ashwaji in Lagos, we immediately cancel that, um, what do they call it now? That uh, apex body of the APC. I forgot to see that name now. Um, the one that takes decision for Lagos. I don't know if you can remember, but whatever their name is, it will not happen again. A lot of concessions that are not consistent with the process and the rule of law will be cancelled. So it's a political party. When a new political party takes over, the old order is swept away and a new order is installed. And sometimes, so in some, sometimes old order, jettisoning the old order and taking the new order gives us concern because no matter what party it is, there should be some kind of continuity. Whether Alpha Beta is owned by Tinubu, What do you mean by continuity? Let me, let me just land. Whether Alpha Beta is owned by an APC stalwart or not, is yes. it doing the right, the good, a good thing for Lagos, or is it just because it is being owned by the APC or a stalwart in APC that is going to be jettisoned? We need to know why some things will be left and others taken, new things taken. No, because no, it I, shouldn't just be because Alpha you are Beta, fighting. I, so let us know the alternatives that you will have to either Alpha Beta <laughs> or any other thing that you want to jettison. 
Just briefly, please. No, let me tell you. Let, let me tell you this very quickly. Alpha Beta is not doing any work. That's the truth. They don't collect the revenues. Okay. The revenues are being collected by the Lagos State Internal Revenue Service, LIRS. So Alpha Beta must have been an SPB. Probably they have some computer support that they are given. The LRS collects the money. That is sufficient for us. Because Alphabeta is a consulting uh, company. You cannot be a consultant forever. There cannot be permanent consulting. Everything must have an exit date. That is what I'm saying. You don't need any extra platform when you have a government platform that is being paid every month to collect the, the revenues for government. Okay. And so we're not just saying, let's stop Alphabeta. No, 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 no. Okay. We're saying, let's stop Alpha Beta because Alpha Beta is a preference of the APC. Okay. If another party comes, we, we will not we understand install that another now. replacement of Alpha Beta. We just leave it for the LRS to do their job. We understand that now. I, I just don't want to uh, lose sight of this question that I'm going to ask you as the final question. It was alleged that you were attacked. You said so yourself. Can you give us an insight into what really happened? And, and then after that, you talk to Lagosians. Just briefly, let's, let's wrap up. Okay, this is what happened. Um, so to do our primaries, we've done it in uh, Limoshua and a few other places in Lagos. So um, we contacted the KBC of the town, the Ologia of Fekpe, that will be coming the next day. And he said he will not host us in his palace, but that we are free to do our campaigns. There will be nobody disturbing us. But the kind of almost like 50, 60 vehicles. And prior to that, we had already concluded the deal between the APC and Labour Party that, uh, that made the P as APC between the PDP and Labour Party that that uh, culminated in the lapse of the PDP structure in Yekwe, the total strength has strengthened the, the opposition platform without announcing. So that rally itself was the announcement of that um, collapsing of the PDP structure into the Labour Party. So that's what some of the PC folks could not undo on that day. And they responded violently, I would say, because there were gunshots, um, myself and the Honorable, Honorable Nohin, who is the House of Reps candidate for PDP in a federal constituency? Two guys with guns aimed at each of us and opened fire. Two bullets were targeted at me, about two at uh, Honorable Noim. But thank God for my for my security security detail who responded. The bullet missed narrowly. So I heard what the police spokesman purportedly said. I will not confirm whether I was the one that said that really. To say that there's no evidence of somebody wounded or a dead body or stuff like that. But <laughs> we did, I didn't report that if the bullet hit me. So you are not going to see a wounded part of my body. But the bullet missed. And it was not only that. Twice they tried to disrupt our rally. At Eridu, they tried to disrupt our rally. At Itapu, they tried to disturb our, uh, to disrupt our rally. So what I've seen in Ekwe is that political intolerance that has been building before now. And it has gotten to the to the crescendo. So it is important that the security agencies in their planning should know that Ekwe is going to be a very hot spot because we are going to be very competitive there and we are going to stand for our rights and fight for our rights. So as so it stands now in Ekwe, as it stands now in Ekwe, PDP is now Labour Party. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it's a two way race. And that is how we are cascading it all over Lagos. You see that by Thursday or Friday morning, we would have cascaded almost all the local governments to make it a clear to witness. Hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Oluo, for, for the insight you've given us and everything you have said today. It's been a pleasure having you on the program today. Thank you, my friend. Just take a final word for Lagosians because Saturday is coming. It's fast approaching. In fact, it's here just in a sentence or two or in 30 seconds. No, no, this is what I'll tell Lagosians. We want a peaceful election. We want a non-violent election. I know the youths are agitated. I want to appeal to them. Fighting will undermine the election. Responding to violence with violence will also undermine the election. So what I will, what I will expect them to do is go in large numbers to the polling booths, go and vote for your preferred party, but protect yourself because the law allows you to defend yourself. If there's somebody who is aggressive, if you can use reasonable force to contain the person and restrain the person and hand the person over to the police, that's how it should be. But it's not good to just wait and let people kill you. You must defend yourself. 
And then for the security agencies, my plea to them is let there be good security presence, let there be sure of force, so that these bad guys who are merchants of violence, they will know there is no place for them in Lagos uh, elections come Saturday. All right. Thank you so much again, uh, Mr. Olowo, for coming on the program. Thank you, my friends. Well, we've been talking with Mr. Olawale Oluwo, uh, who used to be a candidate for Boot Party, but now he has just confirmed to us that Boot Party has collapsed its structures even before the presidential election into Labour Party, and they are going into the polls as one united body. It was a pleasure talking with him, and that is how it's been on Plus Politics today. We thank you so much for being a part of it. Let's do it again tomorrow. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. On behalf of the team, saying thanks for being there. Do not understand who was stigmatized. What you can see is the remaining of the tanker that exploded. The suffered equally confessed. A 500 naira they collect them. With no talk, they will beat you. Now two to other five and they pay. My name is Akin Adeoya. Let me add my voice to this laudable project, the Good Old Days series. My major focus will basically be on my passion for reading while growing up, the extent I went in funding this habit, lessons learned, and values associated with the correctional methods employed by my dear mother of blessed memory. How did this adventure into Storyland begin? My earliest memory of how it all started was my mom gathering us for informal afternoon and weekend storytelling sessions. She would tell us the irresistible and fantastic stories by authors like Sir Ryder Agard, King Solomon's Mines, Shakespeare, The Merchant of Venice, and the like. Yes, she clearly had fun telling these stories with the way she used to repeat the names of some of the characters with emphasis. Tuala the King, Gagool the Wish, Captain John Good. Firstly, let me share what I call my carton room experience and how it shaped my views in my growing up years. Though of Ifaki Kitty origin, I grew up in Sapley and Lagos. The carton room was a room devoted to storing hundreds of cartons of scald beer either empty or full, because my mom used to be a beer distributor for an Ugeli-based company called Superbrew, and even ran a chemist on the side. At the same time, she was a nurse, a midwife, with Sapele Health Center. The carton room was my secret hiding place. I loved to go there and do things privately. At just about 12, I already had a whole need for privacy. You see, the many cartons provided a million hiding places for my secret things. Not all the things I did there was bad. That was the room, sitting among the scattered cartons and bottles, where my innocence was shattered, reading hundreds of pulp fiction novels and plays. In that private world, nothing outside mattered. All I wanted to do was get up and run to the neighborhood bookshop to get the next James Alley chase or some pre-setter paperback. In my mind, I had an easy familiarity with America, England, Vietnam, Russia, 
and many of the great cities of the world. Even though I had never been there, I was a citizen of the world by virtue of my readings. My eventual adventure into African stories gave me a powerful sense of identity. From Chino Achebe's Arrow of God to Ngugi Watengo's The River Between, Grain of Wheat, Kamala Lai's Whip Not Child to Aikwe Amas, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born. It was a wildfire of politics, mystery, romance, war, and peace, all in the mix. Mine was the story of a young man in formation. Let me quickly reveal that I also love to steal into Olympia Cinema, which used to be very famous in Sapele at the time. It was at the very end of Ope Road, the most commercial road in Sapele, to watch Indian movies and other popular American movies. I also had a once-in-a-lifetime experience of watching the epic by Hubert Ugunde titled Jaisime. This was in the early 80s. How does the 12-year-old finance this rich taste in books, music, and culture? I started by helping myself to leftover coins on the table by the bedside, in the pockets, I became bolder in my desperation to finance my addiction. I would pop into dad's room and rummage through his jacket. Sometimes I would watch mommy's use milk tin, where she used to keep money from sales. Many times I was caught in the act, and then my parents, both of them, would unleash hell. I would get an insane flogging with the used fan bed of my father's car. It was terrible. But my mother could see that the beatings were not working, that the stone in my heart was gradually become a diamond, and that if nothing was done, this boy could go over the edge. One day, she caught me red-handed, then walked into the cotton room, looked straight into my eyes and asked, my son, Aki, should I nail down for you? This struck me as very odd and stiffened. I could see the tears well up in her eyes and it almost broke my heart in two. How can I cause her so much pain? This woman that I love so much. It was this time a different kind of fear, born of love and admiration. She continued, Don't you know it is very wrong to steal? That's why I want to nail down to beg you to stop. It will destroy your life if you don't stop. Pause and touch me. That's why I want to nail and beg you to stop. Let me nail. I was alarmed that she would do it. It suddenly occurred to me that this wasn't a game between me and my parents, that there was something much bigger at stake. It was my very first attempt to grasp the eternal conflict between utility and and morality. Until this day, I can still hear the clanging as the coins dropped. You must promise me never to do this again. And that was it. One amazing thing about her was she never doubted my word. And also, I never lied to her. Lessons learned. If your child lies to you, that means you must have been overreacting to his past errors. Take it easy, parents. Now, Let's leave those childhood fantasies and talk about the reading culture. How many of our children these days crave for reading books and stories that can enrich their knowledge and broaden their views on global matters? Do we even have mentors who are willing to ignite the youth's passion for reading? Just like my mother did. I once read a sad commentary that if you want to hire an item from an African, you don't want him to find it, hide it inside the book because it will never open to read it. So sad. That was not the norm in those good old days. How did we get here? How or when did that passion and quest for knowledge take flight in our lives as a nation? What do we need to do to bring back those scariest good old days when we compete with the number of books read and not with the number of social attendees attended? Is it too late to change the narrative? No. We can bring back that reading culture. Our children must not only be told these stories, they must be made to read them. The way to make the difference is all we need. Our children certainly deserve a brighter and better tomorrow, not the good old days. I therefore join Sal Shemore Badejo in this collective drive towards a greater tomorrow. Thank you.
Hello and welcome to the Run Up on Plus TV Africa. I am Maureen Menongwe Zigwe, and today I don't have Adebayo Olowoke with me on the show, so I'm alone with you. Nevertheless, this show will be an amazing one. Exactly 10 days after the Supreme Court judgment mandated the use of old 1,000 Naira and 500 Naira notes as legal tender till December 31st of 2023, that's the end of this year, the Central Bank of Nigeria Governor Godwin Amirfale on Monday bowed to pressure and officially ordered commercial banks to comply with the court verdict. He also announced that the old 200, 500 and 1,000 Naira notes will remain legal tender till the end of the year. The development has put an end to the confusion over the legality of the old Naira notes. The action is also expected to ameliorate the suffering of Nigerians who have faced severe hardships over the scarcity of the new Naira notes amid the controversial ban on the old notes. Now, today we'll be discussing the CBN pronouncement on the 200, 500 and 1,000 Naira as legal tender. We'll go on a quick break and when we return, we'll be joined by our guest to discuss this. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's the run-up on Plus TV Africa. In apparent reaction to public unease over the federal government's long silence and delayed response to the March 3rd Supreme Court ruling on the currency redesign, the presidency yesterday said the CBN did not need a further directive from the president, Mohamed Buhari, to comply with the apex court's order. Well, joining us to discuss this is Vincent Essien. He's a legal practitioner. Hello, Vincent. Yeah, good, good morning, Mary. Good morning. <laughs> yes, and along the line, in the course of this discussion, we hope to be joined by Tunji Andrews, who is an economist, so that we'll be able to balance this up. However, as we wait for Tunji to join us, Vincent, well, I'm going to quote from, an, I'm going to take an excerpt from uh, a statement issued yesterday by the Acting Director of Corporate Communications. Isa Abdumumin, that's of the Central Bank of Nigeria, so that we can uh, begin to dissect this uh, piece by piece. Well, the statement, part of it read, in compliance with the established tradition of obedience to court orders and sustenance of the rule of law principle that characterized the government of President Major General Ibrahim ba uh, Mohammed Buhari retired, and by extension, the operations of the Central Bank of Nigeria as a regulator, deposit money banks operating in Nigeria have been directed to comply with the Supreme Court ruling of March 3rd, 2023. So I'm going to start, Vincent, by asking you just how obedient has the CBN been to court orders in this administration? Um, 
in this administration, um, has the CBA really been involved in legal matters? I think um, it's come up basically in regards to the um, currency exchange program. It's been an unfortunate scenario that has happened, especially in view of the hardship that has been wrought on innocent citizens. Very, very many pathetic stories have happened and I've seen. Thankfully, that has come to an end by that statement by the CBA. And that statement actually was, um, was a follow-up to a statement that came from the uh, media advisor of the president that said that um, the CBN doesn't need further directives because the president is well known for his um, obedience to court orders, legitimate court orders, and um, court orders that are not that are not um, disputed. You know, because we have to make a distinction between a court order that is an appeal that is appealed. You know, but once the, the Supreme Court makes a ruling. And that's the final, that's the apex court in our jurisdiction. And there's actually no need for anybody to, to second guess what the step of the president would be. And that's what the statement of the president, uh, the president said. So clearly, um, maybe the CBA was waiting for some directive. I don't think that was necessary. And the president came out to clarify that the CBA has complied. Thankfully, it's the, the compliance, that statement will follow by steps to ensure that. Um, we start to ease off this choke of the economy that has unfortunately involved this policy. Hmm. Well, Justice, according to a judgment delivered by Justice Emmanuel Ajim, uh, the mm -hmm. president did breach uh, the constitution in the manner he issued the directives for the Naira mm -hmm. notes. Please comment on this. Well, um, I, I saw that aspect of the judgment, and um, hey, this. this there's some elements in, in, in that judgment that you could um, subscribe to because clearly um, the initial ruling of the, of the Supreme Court on the 8th was that uh, the old and new notes denominations should be allowed to run until pending determination of the suit before it. So um, there was a decision by the, by the president to say that they had allowed the 200 uh, notes and they didn't really mention the other notes. So maybe there wasn't full compliance with the reserved ruling of the Supreme Court in that in that but thankfully that we corrected. All right, well still staying with statements from the Justice Emmanuel Ajim because this is something that borders on obedience to the judiciary. You know, and the deepening of our democracy. And so, in further, in further statements from this same justice, I'm going to quote, the rule of law upon which our democratic governance is founded becomes illusionary if the president of the country or any authority or person refuses to obey the orders of the court. The disobedience of the orders of courts by the president in a constitutional democracy as ours is a sign of the failure of the constitution and that democratic governance has become a mere pretension and is now replaced by autocracy or dictatorship. How do we deepen our democracy if the apex court is now being seen as a toothless bulldog? Well, um, I wouldn't really say that we have got to that point. Um, things their processes to even implement new rulings and government has their processes. I'd, I'd like to say that those processes have come to fruition now. The government has um, complied fully with the ruling of the Supreme Court. Um, Ten days after. Clearly the, judge, clearly the ruling by the, the ruling as pronounced by the justice made some strong statements and to reinforce the fact that the judiciary should be supreme, the law should be supreme, the constitution should be supreme. And that, that, that's, that's the foundation of democracy. So mm -hmm. um, I'm happy that the president and the CBN have fallen in line with the judgment of the Supreme Court. I, I think that we should move forward from there and probably learn from his experience uh, and, and ensure that this only strengthens our democracy. I don't think there's any need to, to keep playing 
not going to help. I think what we need to do is um, ensure that um, we move to a situation where we start to ameliorate the pains that have been um, brought upon our citizens by this policy. This is how the boss of pains, in spite of what I think are the noble intentions, and maybe there are some gains as well, but you know, at the end of the day, um, I think the government is about the best for the people. So hopefully we can get to that stage. Yeah, well, you're saying move on from there, but you see, ordinary Nigerians like us, uh, who are not lawyers like you, we do get worried when it does appear. Even the NBA has spoken and warned. You know, matter of fact, the NBA president, Yakubu Mikel, SAN, spoke on this matter, and he warned that the bar would resist any action undermining the rule of law, constitution, and democracy in the country. Now, this delay has also led to labor, the organized labor, threatening and giving the federal government seven days ultimatum to fix all of this mess caused by this narrow redesign. So this is a very serious issue with borders on our constitution and our democracy. Yeah, it, it, these are serious issues. I mean, the NBA spoke, the labor made, and we not, definitely we didn't want to finish off uh, uh, the second elections and head into a national strike. You know, um, but thankfully, all this has been averted. But to me, I think it, it, our democracy still has a call that we have to, to look back and learn from my experiences. And this is just one of them. But the most important thing is that at the end of the day, um, the Constitution has been respected. The authority of the Supreme Court, which is the apex court and the final arbiter in our judicial system, has been, has been consolidated. And the, the executive has ensured that there will be full compliance with the rule of the Supreme Court. And this is, is, is actually a precedent that will be made for future governments to understand. The delay is unfortunate. Uh, the the non-immediate in, in compliance is unfortunate. But I think where we are now is that there's full, there will be there's full compliance, in effect, by the statement by the CBA. I think we should move forward from there. That's my, that's my advice. All right. Um, some would say that the purpose for all of this NARA redesign policy may have been defeated because the politicians did have access to this money from what we saw. Um, they had access to this money. Nigerians suffered. The unbanked Nigerians suffered. Those who do not have access to the internet or who could not use the internet to uh, transact, you know, with the banks, they all suffered. We saw all of it on social media. And even as you went around the street yourself, you saw Nigerians suffering from all of this. So it will look like the purpose has been defeated. Well, um, it's, it's, it's for CBN to, dis to define what the exact purpose of that policy was. CBN is visually... Um, strictly to confine itself to monetary policy. And clearly, uh, management of currency is one of the areas that fall within the ambit of monetary policy. So they, have the, uh, they, they actually have the authority to regulate monetary policy, currency, and the, this is one of the things. But in the, a lot of things came out in the course of this that seemed to indicate that they were stepping beyond their core focus, not their mandate, their focus. Because it's you know, you, you, you can use currents to, to control a lot of things, but clearly the most important thing is inflation, the most important thing is public exchange rebate, you know, money supply deals with all this. And, 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 and then they have to look at how much of that has been achieved by this policy. You know, but unfortunately, I think some ground, some initial preparatory groundwork was not laid because clearly there is a, there is, there is a, there is a push to move Nigerians towards cashless, and which I support, I totally agree, you know, but I think the infrastructure to move the, the, the number of people and the volume was not there in the first place. And that's why you found out that um, even the digital transactions went on choke, you know, because it, 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 the capacity must be ready. So I think CBN needs to look back. The policy itself is not bad. 
but the methodology of implementing the policy has to be looked at it. And this, this six months actually gives the CBN, the policy has not been scrapped, really. I mean, the new, the new NARA laws are still valid, they've already been issued. So, the, the, what the CBN has done is wisdom, which everybody agrees, is that they've given CBN more time and more, a larger window in which to implement this policy. And hopefully, they'll take advantage of it and uh, cure some of the um, fears and concerns that people had that there were some ulterior motives. Which, which also affected the reception of the policy and the perception of the policy itself, which was not necessary, in my own view. Yeah, it, it actually has thrown up so many things, which is uh, the fact that we have so many of our people still unbanked in the villages, mm -hmm. you know, in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. Also, it did throw up the fact that the digital payment solutions, it still has mm -hmm. lots of challenges that the banks should look into. Clearly, clearly, but if you, for me, uh, the key thing is it's, it's also it's, it's a, that challenge is also an opportunity. So I, I'm, I'm expecting the um, the fintech sector in Nigeria, which is very dynamic, mm. to take advantage of that opportunity. It's an opportunity, and it's, it's something that I'm sure will, will happen in almost simultaneously. You know, I think that the fintech sector should step into that. To that and try to fill that space, expand the infrastructure, and then we will get there. You know, one of the things that happened that I expected to have been done was CBN license to GSM companies as um, we had the MOMO, which is already been done. But those things haven't been deepened before this policy came in. Mm -hmm. So I think the fintech sector needs to expand that digital space because a lot of Nigerians are actually on the internet more and and and, and, and um, our internet penetration has actually been deepened all over the country. But the culture is also the second part. You know, you don't, you, you don't just migrate people from from, from um, cash to cashless without assessing the cultural factor. How much how much of preparation did you make for people like you said, the rural population who are used to cash, the market women? That's where we, we had this choke really. You know, and and, and even Transportation systems. Why, why, why are we majorly paying cash to to get on board our transportation and our buses? That's not necessary. So, I mean, the the the, the, the necessary steps, the first step that need to have been done before this policy were was rolled out, we're not done, and that's why we had the choke. You know, people can't get to work because they can't get on a bus and they don't have cash to pay and they have money. They have money in their accounts, but they don't just have it in their hands. So it, it, it's something that CBN needs to go back and reflect upon. Like I said, the policy itself is, is, is a good one, but it's, time, it's, it's something that needs to be done with a lot of deep thinking and not so that people don't have the impression that you're trying to achieve some kind of agenda. Yeah, the CBN no doubt has its work cut out for it. Um, one of the things that this also threw up is the issue of how, how much monitoring goes on in the banking sector. How much of a grip does the CBN have on the commercial banks? Because we did see at the initial phase of all of this, uh, the DSS broke into, well, got into some banks and saw that they were hoarding money. They were hoarding money that the CBN supposedly had given for them to dis disperse to Nigerians. Yeah, um, I think the CBN is the regulator of the bank system. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, the instances which you spoke, we spoke to, uh, whenever you have scarcity, whenever you have scarcity, inadequate supply of the product, then you start to have those kind of scenarios emerging because too many people are trying to choose. First of all, I don't think adequate numbers of the new currency were pushed into the money supply system. And that created a scarcity. And that creates an arbitrage. People are taking the banks, not just the banks, even the um, the uh, one the POS system, which had come into play and had been, had been very helpful. So the thing is, the thing is, CBN is to look the whole structure of the bank. It's not just the banks. Because how many people can go? I can tell you that I have a local government in my state in a private that doesn't have a bank. You know, so I mean there are many local governments that don't have banks. 
So it's not just the banking system, it's a whole financial system. And again, you have to go to digital banking. I just opened an account with the bank. I don't have to mention today. I didn't step into the bank. They sent me the account to pay forms and I paid it online and the account is open. So we need to start to deepen that kind of system. And of course, there are online banks in Nigeria. So what we need to do is ensure that we deepen that kind of infrastructure. If once there is not adequate supply of any product, any product, talk less of cash, then we're going to create a scenario where um, people are going to take advantage. Because, I mean, scarcity creates an advantage for people who have it. Again, over people who don't have it, that's what's happening. All right. Um, let's still go back to the fact that we have a large number of our people unbanked and how the CBN would have to go about getting them to adopt to digital banking. Don't forget that most of these people who are unbanked are also not literate you know, enough. How do you think the CBN can achieve this? It's like we have a peculiar situation here. Mm -hmm. I still think that um, the, phone, the, the phone networks, and I, I still go back to the fact that they license most of the GSM uh, companies to provide um, money banking services. And most, like, actually, I think the penetration of the phone penetration in Nigeria is, is pretty, is considerable, maybe like 60, 70%. You know, not, not everybody needs a bank account. Children who are under the age of 18 or 17 well, you can have children accounts, but they're not actively banking. So for the population that is economically active, I think that our full penetration is good enough. So we can leverage on our, the penetration of our um, uh, what, what GSM networks on that, we can ride on that, and then take, like you said, there's a culture for that, for the, for for the people who still want to hold the money in their hand, there's a culture thing. And you shouldn't lose gap. You shouldn't lose track of that. So you need to make a deliberate effort to allow people to understand that the money in the phone, the money in the account, or in, the, or in, or in your digital money is still their money and can serve the same purpose as the, as the money in your hand. And it's a cultural thing. And there was no, there was no attempt to try and reach people in their languages, in different looks and crannies of the country. No attempt at all. And you just expect people to go into a system that they're not culturally in tune with. You know, I still have people, who, even before this policy came, I still have people who you want to make transfers to and they don't want it. You know, people are, most people want to do is go to ATM and collect money. So I think that the, the cultural aspect, the education has to be pushed in as well. And that's the job of CBN. They need to do that before, before we actually get to the point where um, we can start to compare. But truly, again, one of the things they have to do is that they have to look at the, the, um, the bills in circulation. They, they both have their own content. You know, cash handling is expensive. So what are the options for them? Do, do we need to coin some of our, some of our bills? You know, I mean, Nigeria is the only country that doesn't use coins in, in modern that I've been to around. So, I mean, those are the other options that you should look about. If they are concerned about the cost, the cost of cash, then they have to look at those options so that they, and they stay away from all thoughts of saying you, you don't want to use money for for buying votes. That's that's not the job of CBN. I looked at the CBN. CBN has no problem. That's no business going there. Even even people where you talk about kidnapping and all that, that's not, that's not it. That's the job of the police and the security services. So what you need to do is focus on core monetary policy functions. And once you get it right, you will you trickle off to the other sectors that you're concerned about. It, it would appear that you're sharing the opinions of some who argue that uh, Godwin Amirfele, the CBN uh, governor, does not have an idea of how the economy should run. <laughs> No, I wouldn't say so. I mean, I, I think that I think that um, the CBN governor clearly has become very controversial. Um, there were some areas in which I, I bought into his strategy. Um, clearly, there have been options as to the rapid increase in money supply. People say printing money, 
and uh, his interventions, CBN-led interventions in many sectors of the economy, which have been more direct than usual. But I actually support some of these interventions that have been made to spur production, you know, uh, especially the um, agricultural sector. We've seen that in the, in, the, in the loans that have been pushed down in the agricultural sector, and they've had some impact in, in terms of agricultural production. So I support that. You know, there are some that are very radical, like CBN getting leading the banks to get involved in the movies, national theatre has been done. You know, CBN that's radical, but you know, provided it is it's supporting production of goods and growing the economy, well, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, but. I don't. I won't say he doesn't have an idea. Uh, clearly, he's been CBN governor for uh, two terms now. One of the few to actually last his long. I don't think he doesn't have an idea. But you know, the office does come with some pressure. So I don't know what kind. I'm, I'm not there. So I don't know what what he's feeling. But clearly, um, he has he's been compelled with this uh, CBN ruling to think out with this particular policy. Hopefully, he will do that. You know, and um, get it right. Again, uh, it needs to ensure that he's working in sync with the fiscal authorities. I think sometimes he, 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 he was played in that space as well. So hopefully, it's, there's still time. But anyway, the new government is coming in. Hopefully, they will, they will be in charge of this. All right, you are watching the run up on Plus TV Africa. Our guest has been Vincent Asian, a legal practitioner who's joined us virtually to discuss this issue, uh, the borders on the Naira redesign and the directive to make funds available to Nigerians. We'll take a short break. We'll be back. Stay with us. So what are the top decisions that the United States considers necessary that Nigeria must take? I like to think of my interactions as conversations, not interviews. And that's why I say asking questions is both an art and a science. Everyone says in Islam, you are allowed to have four wives. Is it mandatory? The right question enables answers that educate, inform, clarify, and help you, the viewer, to better understand the issue before making up your mind. Our goal is to reduce from 10 to 2 days the time it takes to register businesses in Nigeria. Join me every week on this station, Plus TV Africa, and gain exclusive access to my conversations. I'm Angela Ajitumobi. It's still the run-up on Plus TV Africa. And we're taking a look at the Naira redesign policy and the fact that the CBN governor has finally bowed to pressure and has given directives, you know, ordering the commercial banks to allow the use of the old notes and that the old notes remain legal tender, just as pronounced by the Apex Bank. And I have Vincent Asian, a legal practitioner, with me taking a look at this. Vincent. Vincent. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's a good thing that the CBN has finally bowed to pressure 10 days after the judgment by the CBN and uh, 10 days after Nigerians have been in the limbo, in the dark, wondering what next? What next? Should we use this money? Should we not use this money? The president has not spoken. The CBN has not spoken. So finally... Finally, all those uh, doubts are put to rest. But we have to also project and look forward uh, to the future because I'm looking at January 2024 at this point and wondering, by the time this judgment, which has said that these old notes 
uh, remain legal tender to the 31st of this year. What happens in January of 2024? How confident will Nigerians be that when we get to that, will not be back, history will not repeat itself? Well, um, like I said, six months is it's not so it's not such a long time, but I think there's some things that are like that need to be done. I keep emphasizing the, the cultural aspect of it and the, the social aspect. A lot of education needs to be done. We have agencies, Nigerian orientation agency, push this push this information out there. You know that we are slowly and certainly migrating to. Um, cash this. So let's let's have that. CBNC has an element of control. You know what I mean? It, 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 and I'm saying it because they, it, 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 it depends again, they, can, they have the power to control the money supply and determine the quantum of money that's in the system. So it, it, even, even, even in a situation where they are obeying the, 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 the judgment. So what I'm saying is that uh, the, the, the move towards cashless is a certain is a certainty. In six months, what the, what happens? In six months, they could very well decide that by then the, the old currency may, may may continue to run. They, they have the mechanism to slowly take it out, which is what a lot of people were advocating. It was a, it was a sudden shock. It was a sudden shock treatment that that actually aggravated brought us to the point where we are in terms of the pains that have been inflicted. So what can be done by January is, again, hopefully a new, a new, a new administration is coming to place, maybe with a new, um, they, they have to factor that as well, that they will have, will have their own policies. And um, that's, my, that's also a candidate of my party. So we have, we have our own programs and our approach to dealing with this. And just definitely will have a positive impact on the money supply situation. But for now, in obedience to CBN ruling, um, we should just ensure that the old and new currencies continue to run concurrently so that we can relieve this trick. Because again, that education is important. But we find out that a lot of people were just on their own refusing to take the old currencies. And so that, that's where education needs to be. You can't, how many people with that circular that was on the internet? How many of the people in rural, rural communities mm -hmm. who are trading, who are buying cow, cattle and cow agriculture produce? You know, we do see that circular. It's, uh, it's available to you and me. So they, they need to be pushed down to different, um, different segments of society that this is a new policy, you know, and that, that will take some time, but hopefully that's one of the things that CBN should be doing immediately. Ensuring that this um, new secular and new position of the bank get penetrates to all the, the different sectors of the economy, so that we can relieve this chokehold. Because really, it is it's, 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 it's killing it's killing the economy in many ways. The, the, the additional cost of just getting money, you, naira. No, no, you're not dealing with foreign currency, yes. naira. The additional cost of getting naira is just unnecessary and it's, it's really unbearable. Yeah, the additional cost of getting Naira. I mean, Nigerians saw yeah. a lot this period, having to buy the Naira <laughs> with Naira. We also <laughs> saw goods wasting at the major markets because no transportation, there was no mobilization. A lot of things just went wrong uh, with this yeah. whole thing because of the way it was implemented. And as you have said, and most Nigerians, well, some Nigerians do agree with you, that this is a fantastic policy. It's just the implementation. The implementation is the problem. Now, we are wondering, you know, because um, the CBN, no doubt, mopped up a lot of money this time around. And uh, no one knows, well, the CBN is in the position to tell us how much of the monies mopped up will be re released into the economy. We also saw lots of monies messed up bags of money stashed that were um, destroyed, mm -hmm. expired, so to speak. We saw yeah. videos that just made you wonder, what is wrong with Nigerians? Well, some Nigerians. Why would people pile up such huge mm -hmm. amount of money 
and allow them to waste when they have poor people around them? Well, um, clearly there, there's illicit money. There's illicit money, um, and that's it's, it's very economy. And another point, another part of this policy that people, plan for this policy that people don't understand is that there is actually black money. There's counterfeiting, and counterfeiting has even started of the of, of the new currency. Mm -hmm. And people people don't. There's no clear figure on the volume of counterfeit currency in the in the economy. You know, and counterfeit currency also adds to inflation. So um, the policy for me, one of the winning points of that policy would have been that counterfeiting currency counterfeiting would have been countered because some people are practically printing money in this country. So again, hopefully all those monies like you talked about, the one that was in bags and all that will come back to the system. They're, 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 not, in, they're not in good condition anyway and they'll be mm -hmm. turned in. And again, CBN does have the power to regulate how much is going to put back. Because clearly they have an intent. They are determined, and that was a statement, they are determined to ensure that we move towards less cash. It's just that they need to ensure, in conjunction with the banks, in conjunction with the fintech community, ensure that the, the infrastructure is there to accommodate the people who are going to move. Already, there has been a 40 something percent. Um, increase in digital transactions, that should not reduce, in my own view, because we, we, we bought a lot of pain. So there must be some gain from this policy. That's what, that's what I would say. Yeah. So that should not reduce. As a matter of fact, that should grow. But again, we need to onboard more people on that. And that, that takes education. That takes penetration messaging. The National you know, Orientation Agency would definitely need to work with the CBN to send the message. You didn't see them throughout this. So that's, that's one of the mandates. That's some of the things that need to be done. And that's why I say, they, they, and, 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 and I don't actually blame them, because it seems that CBN executed this policy in silence. You know, they, they didn't carry anybody. The finance minister didn't even know about it. You know, which is yeah. At the beginning, she did say she was not aware. Yeah. So, so, uh, uh, you, 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 how can they? How can how you can carry people along when you don't you don't do the necessary groundwork? So, I think that that's what CBN needs to do. I mean, we are not running a voodoo economy. I mean, nothing. It's nothing's going to be kept secret. It's money anyway. You, whatever it be you're doing about fire monetary policy, you have to bring it out because people who run the economy. So I think that um, unless there's a different agenda, which a lot of people subscribe to, but that can't work anyway. They need to get people involved, get people buying in this policy. It's not a wrong policy, it's just the implementation of the policy that led that, 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 that us to where we are. All right, one of the things, uh, the challenges that this threw up uh, was the issue, well, I mentioned that earlier, the challenge of the digital payment solutions. And so I want to ask you, what legal redress do Nigerians have? Nigerians whose transactions failed but did not get the necessary uh, reversal of such payments that failed in real time. And some still, as we speak, weeks after their transactions failed, they still did not get their monies reversed to them. What legal redress do they have? No, clearly, clearly, um, that's that's legally enforceable right. It's your money. It's your money. If you if you if you if you put your money in a bank, you're entitled to get it. If you if you transfer money to somebody, and the money doesn't through the banking platform, and the money doesn't deliver, and, and it's not at the other end, and it's not at your end. I mean, it really, it's something that you can enforce. But you see, you see, what happened was that, and I have a lot of situations with this that I'm dealing with right now. I have people who have issues with that. But the first point is that because of the way the policy was implemented, a lot of people couldn't even get into the bank. The banks, the banks itself were overstretched. I mean, banks can, were trying to control the people who were trying to get in because everybody was in the bank at the same time. So, I mean... That those kind of those kind of issues now went to went to the background, you know, because you can't even get to the customer customer service. You don't even try going to customer service. So those are customer service issues. So, so I think that the policy itself overburdened the banks. 
stretch their capacity to deal with these issues. Hopefully, as the ease of, then these issues can be resolved. And where, where people have had, uh, had money missing, they can sue. I have, a, I have a case that I'm actually dealing with, uh, one, of my, one of my staff who, whose money was withdrawn, ATM issues and all that. But the point is that you can't even get it to the bank in the first place, because the banks are ever stressed. So but hopefully we will ease off the, the chokehold of the, of the financial system and the people can resolve these issues. So it's like, again, it's, it's a monument of digital, the money may be hanging. This, 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 the, the inf infrastructure itself wasn't ready to accommodate the volume of transactions that came on board at the same time. So you found out that most times, um, Transactions and I, I, I advise people that you do your transactions later in the evening, late in the night. That's when the traffic is less. It's, it's, it's a simple, it's a simple thinking. You know, if you, if you build a, if you build an infrastructure for gradually build your infrastructure, and then all of a sudden, uh, how many millions of people get on board? You're going to have a problem, and that's what happened. Give us more information, again, if you will, about the rights of bank customers with regards to the reversal of their money. There is supposed to be a 24-hour time within which their money should have gotten back to them, right? Yes, ordinarily. Um, that's what they say, but there are some instances. I have, I have one until today, and I haven't had a reversal. I just can't afford to go to the bank because I can't afford to go in there and I see the whole banking all crowded and I'm trying to explain what happened to my, I think it was how much, 15,000 or something. So what I'm saying is that they tell you, and ordinarily that's what happens, it, re it reverses. Now, well, if it doesn't reverse, then the banks have a mechanism in which they deal with the interbanking system to, and of course, if it doesn't get back to you, you can sue. So legally, I, 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 even my daughter has a situation with the bank as well. So these are enforceable because your money cannot get lost in a bank. Your money inside a bank is not supposed to get lost. That's why you take it there. Or else you, why would you keep, you would keep it at home? Once your money is in a bank, it's supposed to be secure. And so anything that happens while your money is within the banking system, the liabilities of the bank, so you can sue. Mm -hmm. You can sue. Nigerians sure. should have it. You can sue. <laughs> I'm sure many Nigerians who didn't know will be very happy to hear that they can sue. You can sue your bank for not reversing your money that was supposed to have been reversed as a result of failed transactions. Vincent Asian, thank you so much for your time and insights on this very issue that every Nigerian is very concerned about. So finally, the confusion over the legality of the old Naira notes is over. Let's hope that this week, before this week ends, that things would have normalized. Your final words before we go. I think it's going to take time. It's still, it's still, it's still, um, it's still the call on CBN on how, how quickly, um, but clearly they also have their own um, mechanisms how much um, how much of the old naira is they going to release back into the system and they should concurrently be printing the new notes as well because i, I don't think we're going to have a reversal on that policy i, I would actually if i were to advise focus me on the lower bills you know and, and, and that, that's something that can be done but as for the fact that the currencies are legal tender that has been determined by Supreme court all the currencies, 200, 500, and 1,000 remain legal tender. And the CBN has the capacity and has the instruments to determine how they manage money supply. But they should do it in such a way that we, we are out of the chokehold in which the economy has been put for the last one month. It's really unfortunate. And a lot of people have already suffered. There was an incident, I have to say this, uh, really, because there was, there was like, a man who told a story about his daughter who was involved in the unfortunate train, train bus accident in Lagos. Oh, my God. And he said that the reason why his daughter was on that bus was because she didn't have cash. 
Oh my goodness. Yeah, but, but I have to say this, Maureen, and it brought tears to my eyes. And and this, unfortunately, this policy reversal has probably come too late. Just yesterday, I heard of someone who trekked to work because he didn't have cash for transportation. Yes. And by the time he got to the office, I he slumped, all the time. He slumped I, and I, died. Yeah, I have people with, I, have, I deal with that all the time. But the case of that old man, I have to see because then he said that's it. That the only reason why she was on the bus was because she didn't have cash. So she took a start bus, otherwise she'd be safe. That's what happened. Very sad. Very sad. Oh, Vincent Asian, thank you again for your time. Thank you. All right. Many thanks for watching. I am Maureen Menongwezi. We do have a good day. do not understand we will stigmatize. What you can see is the remaining of the tanker that exploded. The suffered equally confessed. A 500 era the collector. With no talk can go beat you. Now two to other five and be. I looked away and tried to imagine Mama's reaction when I told her about Gozi. She had been waiting eagerly for me to bring someone home. I needed to marry early, she said. I lacked the traits and beauty to attract many suitors. Thus, I had to make to do with what I had before I was too old and educated to catch a decent man. Maybe I made a mistake by letting your father send you to university. That's why you like arguing like this. Too much book is inside your head. She lamented one day after interrupting a heated conversation between me and my brother. Today it's politics, tomorrow it's football. Instead of you to come and join me in the kitchen, you're shouting up and down the house like a street boy. My grandmother used to say, 
Only a foolish rat dances with the lizard in the rain. You're a woman. Your brothers will have wives to cook for them. After all this book, better bring, make sure you come home with your husband. You better not bring just a certificate. Adugo has that young man who's on do. Even Chinelo has somebody. Mama had been born in a time when education had been a luxury, if not a waste, for a girl child. But my grandmother had been a troublemaker. She'd insisted her husband send all their daughters to the local primary school to learn to read and write. Mama had spent the years afterwards learning to be a wife, and then her father shipped her off to be married long before she turned 18. I had other ambitions, desires she did not understand, to be something other than a wife. I hoped telling Mama about Gozier would restore her faith that I would be married someday. I was tired of being introduced to friends' sons, cousins, uncles, friends. Tired of Mama telling me every time the daughter of someone we knew got engaged or married, and that she be they were all planned to wear. Tired of congratulating others and watching them respond with oily smiles of those who had achieved all you aim to, saying, don't worry, God will do your own. Um, my name is Iwan Osir Odafin, and I'm the author of um, Tomorrow I Become a Woman. Um, growing up, my parents were very big on reading, and um, my, my dad would buy me a lot of books. You know, my, my mom made us read academically, like she would always make sure you had to, but then my dad would also like buy me, like, you know, like um, Charles Dickens, you know, those, like a lot of the classics, you know, I, I, my dad made me read them. And I, I just loved reading. And it got to a point that I started disturbing him to, to buy me books. And then he would like, and then we'd, we had this book shopping days where I like would go shopping for books together. And once I finished reading the books after, after a while, I'd go back to him again until he got tired and he was like, leave me alone. <laughs> but I've always loved reading. Like I explained to you, like, it, like growing up that way, well, writing actually was something I discovered in reading really pretty recently. Um, it all started in 2015 when a friend was going through a very difficult situation and I remember I was so frustrated about it and I was talking to someone, the person said something I didn't agree with, you know, basically repeating a lot of societal talk and I was really upset by this and I remember I told him, this friend of mine, I was like, I'm going to write about this and he was like, can you go ahead now, where is it? <laughs> and it's Obviously, because something I was so that you know, I'd, like I'd written it, um, I, then I used to write essays and I'd con contributed to like some non fiction things in school, but I'd never written like a novel, which is which, so it was very, a, a very bizarre thing to say I was going to do. But then in 2016, um, I had some free time because I was applying, I was like in between jobs, I was applying for a job, and and I was like, I want to write about this thing, I was really bothered by, by it, and I, I just started asking about writing, you don't get better. You, it's all like you don't get better if you don't write. And I started, and my very first attempt was terrible, but I continued, and I continued, and it just, just gave me so much peace. And, and that's how I really discovered my love for writing. Oh yes, definitely. When I attended um, the Purple High Biscuits Writing Workshop in 2019, at that point, I'd never, I'd, because I, I come from a very finance background, like, um, so like I studied accounting, like MBA, like everything was just very finance, consulting. And but it was the first time I was actually surrounded by writers, like, oh, like everyone around me was actually a fellow writer that wanted to write. And just to be honest, um, I think it's under, it, we really underestimate how much just reading other people's works. Like, so when we, like, you actually you know, have to workshop each other's works and just reading and being inspired, like, wow, what more people are writing, you know? And just listening to other people's experiences. And I remember also a, a lot of the tutors um, at, the, at, the, at the workshop were also very insightful. Just little things, nothing about writing, you never know what will change. And I remember at that point, I, I had a draft for my novel then and I was stuck and I didn't know what to do. And I remember um, Chimamanda, who was in charge of the workshop, said that particular, work, um, that particular session I was in, she said something around, you know, sometimes you're writing and then you're, you're so focused on your agenda and you forget to tell the story. It sounds like a very simple advice to a writer, but then it clicked that that was what was wrong with my draft. It was a, <laughs> it was a lot. Um, it was it was a very long process in the sense that 
because I had to even gain confidence as a writer. I had to be sure in my own voice, you know, I had to find my own writing voice. But it was, a, it was such a learning experience for me because I, I learned so much, not just, uh, not just about the subject that I was writing, but also about myself, because I had to, to other times I had to interrogate some things that I accepted and some things I thought were normal and some things, and because so, I just, because I had to also think back over my own experiences to reflect them, because I really wanted the novel to be a true reflection of society. I wanted everyone to be able to see themselves. So I'd talk to friends and then I had to even interrogate myself that is this, you know, why are you comfortable with this? You know, why have you accepted certain things as normal? Um, so it was a very insightful experience. It also taught me a lot about betting on yourself because it's so easy to give up when you're writing as a writer. And because you get new, there's so many like, why, why are you special? You know? And but it really taught me resilience. I stopped so many times and then I kept going back. Um, the first draft took me about two and a half years. Yes, so I started writing the first draft in 20, February 2016. I had a draft by 2018, September 2018. But then I had to keep editing, editing, editing. And I had something close to my what, what is published now by 2020. Yes, yeah, so it was a long process. <laughs> okay, so it was, again, publishing. I think a lot of people don't really understand how, pub like, the publishing process, you know. Um, so generally, okay, it's different for a lot of people. And also, in Nigeria, it's a bit different from the West. So, like, the, the very first edition of my, of my book was published in the UK. And to do that, I had to, like, query a lot of agents. So I got a lot of no's. Like, I got over 50 no's and from like the first draft I had and that's kind of what you know spurred me to keep editing my draft but um I think around after the workshop in 2019 I went back early 2020 and I rewrote my entire draft in three weeks and I finished it and I just felt like I can buy this book as I, I could walk into a bookshop and I can pick no I know and I was at that point I knew I was supposed to so like this 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 can go out and, and I started querying again I think, I think um, one thing people don't prepare writers for is actually rejection and the reality of publishing. And I think um, accepting that you're going to be rejected is the first step. And it sounds like a crazy thing to say, you know, like, why would you tell me that, you know, that I, that's a defe defeatist mindset, but then that's the thing, you're going to be rejected. But then, all like most of the time, all it takes is one yes. And it's about keep, not 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 stopping your work just keep writing because the thing about writing is you the only way you can get better is actually by writing and it's crazy it's like oh but my writing isn't good but then you won't get better if you stop you know it's about reading more it's about also finding works that connect with your writing works works that speak to you and also improve your writing you know just consistently improving your craft and never stopping you will get news you get news that and I'm, and, and, and the thing about it is accepting that those no's will come and you will be discouraged. Because you will be discouraged. I was discouraged so many times. Like there are times like I paused writing for months. Like it, it will come. But then it's about not stopping there. Refusing to allow that be the end. And just believing and having insane self-belief that at one point, at some point in the future, this will work out. And so that's, that's my encouragement to just keep writing and to just not stop.
today on The Breakfast, INEX set to release 7,778 documents required by the Labour Party to prosecute its case challenging the outcome of the presidential election. Also on The Breakfast, report from 2022 says... says 1.1 to 1.4 million people have glaucoma in Nigeria. What are the key lessons of the last decade of this campaign? And don't forget we also be looking through today's newspapers, analyzing the biggest stories of the day. Welcome to Breakfast. It's a brand new day and we're here with discussions and analysis of the issues of the day. That's what we bring you right here on The Breakfast. My name is Kofi Bartels. And I am Messi Bopo. It's good to be back on your screen. All right. And uh, we employ you to sit back, relax and enjoy the program uh, as we have uh, very interesting discussions and very interesting guests ahead. The pressure is getting worse, is what uh, Gen Z would normally say. The pressure is getting worse. And that's a caption one of the um, news blogs and news websites put um, up in uh, description to describe what exactly we're about to show you. And uh, the first story on our top trending segment, we roll the tape. And when we come back, we'll talk about the background to that video. <laughs> That caption, the pressure is getting worse, it's a Gen Z uh, uh, <laughs> term. And that's the way, like I said, a news blog put it in, in describing this incident. Of course, that's um, Honorable Desmond Elliott, who happens to be a member of uh, Lagos State House of Assembly representing the good people of Surulere Constituency 1. And um, he's filmed there. Uh, you know, people are always with their phones these days. Ah, that's Palenos is here. They take their phone up and they want to film. You know, he is uh, filmed there asking, uh, reaching out to his constituents uh, at a church service, at a church service, and um, just informing them that he's uh, partly Igbo. His mom is from the southeastern part of Nigeria, and it's not it's something nobody can take away uh, from him. And, uh, you know, pushing his credentials, maybe to appeal to those in the con congregation, the congregants who may uh, be largely Igbo speaking, and you can see they responded and reacted to what he had to say. But the background to this will not be complete if you don't tell it. Of course, Desmond Elliott has um, been the recipient of a public backlash uh, following his uh, utterances and his remarks um, on the floor of the Lagos State House of Assembly uh, in the aftermath of the NSAS protests and then the um, uh, the riots that followed after the NSAS protests. Uh, so this is the background. Desmond says he is running for election again. This is the third time he's going for that uh, seat, and he's telling the congregants, who are possibly members of his constituency, that his mother is Igbo from the southeastern part of Nigeria. Now, Kofi, you know, the, um, this is actually going to speak to the fact that there might just be a disconnect with uh, Desmond Elliott and what the people think. Now, I don't know because you, you trying to say, okay, uh, Desmond Elliott 
is reflecting his Igbo dialect, trying to speak in Igbo. Yeah, I'm, I'm giving the background. No, 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 I understand. No, you, okay. Not, not my view. No, not your view. I mean, of course, what has actually been done, you don't need to have that spoken in, you know, black and white. I mean, you don't need that to be written in the exact sentence for you to understand what that means. So, but this is actually beyond what's going on in Nigeria. It's beyond, uh, it's just beyond tribe. And that's what the people are failing to see. Or the politicians or those who are what, what, what is beyond tribe now so what's actually going on it's beyond tribe you know you see you know the reawakening you see the level of involvement of the people in the politics it's not about whether you speak a certain dialect or you don't speak a certain dialect that's actually what you know is going on now but you know the narrative that's also been pushed out over time is that a certain tribe seem to want to uh, you know be on top of the situation and maybe that might just be the reason why you have this uh, him, you know, going out, out there trying to speak Igbo and say, hey, my mom is that, you know, just to get the sympathy. But if you look at the consent of Lagosians and those who have been speaking, a lot of issues, there are too many issues. For instance, there's a bridge. I'm not sure we have that picture or we have a video of that uh, somewhere around Surulere or, you know, somewhere around. There's a certain bridge that was constructed. And way back, uh, a lot of Nigerians also remember what happened during the NSAS protests, where Nigerians took to the street across, you know, different parts of the, the, uh, the country, talking about ending uh, police brutality. And the statement that, you know, Desmond Elliott made following all of that. Now, people have moved beyond that kind of politics, whether you're from a certain region. We're not saying that that's entirely the whole fact. But uh, if you look at it, uh, looking at some elections, you'll find out that uh, the, 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 you know, the tables are really turning. And it has nothing to do with whether you speak a certain language or you're from a certain tribe. It feels like people are moving towards individual and their capacity or how they have performed over time. For instance, Kofi, you're very conversant with Corsiva State and Calabar. A certain Isina year has been in power for almost 24 years. When I say 24 years from 1999, where he was chairman, and then after the period of being a chairman of Calabasa local government, he so he, he he's be, been in politics active. Uh, he's been opposition. in active for, for 24 years. He was chairman of Calabasa local government, you know, around 1999 when Donald Duke was governor. And then afterwards, he was there in power. Then he moved to, the, you know, the House of Reps. He's occupied that office up until, you know, 2023 when the people decided to, you know, take a different turn. What they call him is Isantam. And if you look at the meaning of Isantam, it's called Hippopotamus, right? It's so okay. he's occupied it's that okay. office. So my point yeah. is, people, you, don't, you don't mean to, you also, to, to use a derogatory remark, but it's just No, it's not derogatory. I'm not trying to say... He's an elephant. He cannot be moved, sort of. No, that's not even derogatory. It's, it's, it, I think that that it's word is used to... Is, yeah. Yes, to describe right, strength. His strength, yes, yes. Yeah, yes, so yes, it's yes, not yes. in a sense to say that he's, you know... But I'm just saying that it feels like there's a disconnect. It feels like the elites or the, those who are vying politicians are not getting the message that the people are moving away from tribe and where you're from. And then they're, they're looking at you as a person, your, your, you, you know, your credibility. They're looking at you, your person as an individual. Did you tell lies? What have you been up to? How have you treated your family? People are beginning to move from, you know, all of those rhetorics that we know about and, you know, to the real issue, which they think. So people are not even voting, you know, along, um, as much as we see others, but it, it seems like a lot of people are voting just along what they believe. They're looking at individuals. And that's why you find out that in that particular state, look at, um, uh, you know, the governor of Cross River State. I'd like to use Cross River State as an example. Ayade wanted to go back, you know, again to the Senate, or he wanted to go back to the Senate. He came from the Senate to become the governor. Now he wants to go back, you know, to becoming, you know, Senate, go, going back to the Senate. And the people, you know, spoke. That's exactly what it is. So, um, well, I understand the narrative that's been pushed out, but it's unfortunate that those who should understand that we're in a very sensitive situation, I mean politicians and the ruling class, that we're in a very sensitive period, they shouldn't be the one pushing the card of ethnicity, tribalism, and what have you, but unfortunately that's what's going on. And, and, and the people are speaking, and so if you have this kind of video, it probably might not say, you know, in its real sentence, that small has not come out to say, hey, I'm Igbo, you know, I have some passion. But, you know, putting all, all of that out, appealing to the Igbo community and speaking the dialect might just mean that you don't understand what the people are saying. The people are not pleased with the, you know, the way a representation has been done over the years, how their interest has been represented. And I've cited two examples. I've used the states that we both are conversant with. And we have seen how the people have acted two times now. 
the, the people decided to speak. You can, would you ever imagine that a sitting governor, that those who are in position of authority would be overturned and the people would, you know, unseat someone who has been in power for 24 years? It's, you know, it's a lot. And so, you know, that's where we are, Kofi. All right. Uh, uh, Messi, uh, I mean, you've said a lot. Um, and, uh, I mean, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, uh, Desmond, of course, you've said that uh, this isn't a time for people to vote for those who speak their language. Um, people are becoming wiser and uh, are looking for more than just that. Um, it's a time when the people are saying, okay, well, I'm not, we're not going to vote my brother or my sister anymore. I'm going to vote you for competence and that uh, for, for capacity to deliver. Um, that's true. That's true. But at the same time, I mean, we see this going on, this happening, not just uh, with Desmond. Um, we see it happening all over the country, where we see um, uh, the Igbo-speaking communities in different states of the country. And the Southeast as a zone, um, rising up to really get involved in this election. Uh, we've traditionally seen low votes from the Southeast. I mean, the lowest amount of uh, number of voters in terms of geopolitical zone, you find them in the Southeast. But there's a sizable and significant Southeastern population in the, in the local diaspora, if you want to call it that. So you go to the North, you look at places like Kano State and Sabongari, you go to places around the South South, like um, uh, River State, you have a sizable uh, southeast population. You come to Lagos State, you know, some of them are, are in the House of Assembly. There's even one who is a House of Representatives member. Okay. So, so it, it, it is, th th there's a sizable voting block. Now, politicians always appeal to, to bases. Yeah, all over the world, Messi, politicians appeal to bases. Um, they appeal to religious base, they appeal to ethnic base, they appeal to tribal base, they appeal to, um, uh, you know, even uh, sexuality base, you know, you don't talk about maybe the same sex community. Um, they are built to nationalistic base. Um, those who are right wing, you know, those who are left wing, um, they appeal to those bases. And I think it's becoming increasingly evident or clear um, that the southeastern Easterners, those from the southeastern part of Nigeria who reside in different parts of the country, are um, a bit more interested in this election. Um, than in previous elections. Why? Because there is a there has been a high possibility to have a southeastner as uh, as president. However, however, it must be said, Messing, you are right that um, people are, are voting now because, especially younger voters, because of capacity. And if you look at those who are supporting uh, Peter Obi of the Labour Party, um, a sizable amount of them are not even from the southeast. You have people from Nigeria Southwest, South South, you know, North Central. And past, you know, partly even the North um, supporting him. So that's absolutely true. But as a politician, what do politicians do? Politicians are always politic. Um, you try to do everything you can to appeal. You try to do everything you can to reach out. And um, I personally will not blame a politician for being a politician. You know. That being said, the backlash Desmond Elliott faced um, uh, after the NSAS protest, Mercy, is... Um, is one something to be talked about. I've seen a lot of videos and pictures. They said Desmond Elliott um, has done nothing as a uh, representative of Surly Reconstituency 1. You know, he built only one wooden, wooden bridge uh, across one. He put a picture, he built a public toilet, which isn't a bad thing if you build a public toilet. Public toilets are unnecessary. They showed it and people lambasted Del uh, Desmond. They, he built, uh, he provided hand washing basins for uh, uh, the COVID-19, you know, sanit sanitization and all that. Um, people ambassaded him. You know, but the thing about this is that, um, you know, these are all not also fair to the man because he has done a lot more than these things as uh, a member of the Lagos State House of Assembly representing Suriliri Constituency 1. Recently, he donated eight transformers to Suriliri. Um, what, I, what I thought was that they were donated at one day, at once, but... From what I gather, from what I gather, from what I gather, it's um, from what I gather, um, he had been they've been on this project for some time, you know, for some time. It wasn't just uh, in a day. He donated those transformers. Okay, um, so he's been on for some time. Some people said, ah, is it because of election or donating transformer? Yes, but. From what I gather, um, he's been doing it over time. It wasn't you can't you can't install you know eight transformers 
in in one day. Okay, I also hear his impact on on um, uh, what do you call it uh, health um, outreaches to his community. But the important thing for me is Nigerians want to see legislators do things that they can see with their eyes. But I think um, that is a distraction. You see, what legislators are meant to do is to offer effective representation. Okay, and there are a lot of things that come under effective representation. First of all, you're meant to protect and defend the interests of your constituents. Okay, you're also meant to interact with them to know their needs so you can push their interests um, on the floor of the house. You're meant to sponsor bills that will protect and their promote interest. the interests, not of your constituents, but of Lagos State in general, if you're a member of the Lagos State House of Assembly. You're meant to perform oversight function in a way that will benefit Lagos State, including your constituents. So the most important thing for me, for me, for a legislator, is not the physical things that he brings. It is effective representation. You're talking about laws, lawmaking, you're talking about passage of bills, you're talking about oversight function, okay, you're talking about lobbying, you're talking about influence, using your influence to attract development to your area. I don't need you to build a road. Okay, those are the things that they, that they used oh, to be I'm, I'm compromising. I don't need you to give me give me effective representation that will translate to things that are more than this. So the question I'll ask for those who say, what has he done or has he built roads is, I think we should look more at, at the effective representation. And some will say, oh, Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, Bajai B. Amila, who is from that constituency, has done a lot of things. You know, uh, has donated cars, has donated bonds. But we need to understand that, first of all, a, a member of the House of Assembly or House of Reps is not giving any money as constituency allowance. What they, are, they do is they're allowed, probably because of their influence, to nominate constituency projects, which the government carries out. What some have accused them of doing is they always want to corner it, some of them want to corner to their own contractors. But they don't, they're not giving any money. Okay, so, so for people to compare Desmond to Bajabi Amla, I think it's, they need to understand that Bajabi Amla is the fourth citizen of Nigeria after the president. One, two, three, four. All right? And he, the access to the funds that he has or influence is greater than, than Desmond. So for me, judge Desmond on effective res representation. He has come up to say he's sorry, Messi. Just finally. Um, he has come to say he's sorry for what he said you know, on the floor of the Lagos State House Assembly, you know, the two things he said. First of all, he talked about those who, who looted stuff, shops and all that, those pregnant women who went there. This is, this picture is actually from that session, maybe. He also talked about um, uh, youth who went to destroy things, okay? Then he talked about those who were on social media, he called them children. Now, this one came out to apologize for that. It remains to be seen if that will translate to uh, support for him, people will forgive him. Um, some will say that he did nothing wrong, so there was nothing for him to apologize. But finally, there's a catch here. The catch is that he has a challenger who is popular. Why? Because we watched him on, on, uh, on, on screen, one of the actors from Far From Home. Now, I'm not a fan of, of this boy uh, from Far From Home in the movie because he, his character was, uh, was a bad character. But as an actor, he is a good actor. And he's also from Nollywood, which is Desmond's constituency. Um, so it makes it, it, makes it a very uh, interesting, uh, how do I call it now, uh, a very interesting uh, 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 plot that the person who is challenging you is from your constituent, and he is representing the Labour Party, you know? So that, that is amazing. Um, you have a youngster, a Gen Zer, an actor who is also yeah, a Donald member. Sure you can say Gen Zer. That might just be, uh, you know... Well, a, a millennial, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Who's yes. in between... Uh, not a yes, so, so because the, he looks, yes. I mean, the character that he played was that of a Gen Z here, but yes. necessarily if you yes. look at it, yes. you know, it's in the millennial. So, so the, the plot is set, you know, for, for that battle. Yeah, but uh, just before we move to the next one for the want of time, Kofi, I think that it's within the, you know, the, the confines, it's within the... Uh, the space of the people to decide. Uh, we have spoke about what we have spoke about. And if, whether or not it's in the character of politicians to go about lobbying and you know, trying to seek for whatever it is, like votes and appeal at every base, whatever opportunity they have. And that's because the people have set the tune in that way. And now the people are changing the dynamics. It's also important you know, to dance to the tune of the people. But for me, I think that he, uh, there seemed to be uh, a disconnect when you don't understand what the people are saying. 
and what you were saying because what he's saying and what the people are saying are quite different and yes i understand that this issue of representation i mean this you know uh, as a house of representative member of a house of representative or whatever it is your your duties are quite different from what a governor should be performing but however at the end of the day it's the interest of the people and we say at the end of the day how many legislation i would always like to make reference to the part where we are very conversant with we have lawmakers at the state and the federal level do you know up until now the kalaba odupangi road is a very it's a federal road and kofi does it not shock you that uh, because if politics is about lobbying then how many times have you had those at the federal and the state level lobbying you know pushing for you have people who are represented kalaba odupangi was very critical for economic development Unfortunately, the state is geographically located as it should be. It is nobody's fault that, you know, that state is where it is. But you have states, like, you have people who are representing at the state level and at the national level, and what have they done? You also have a neighboring state where economic activities, you find out that there's, you know, you want to say there's a twin relationship. What has, how far have they fared? Now, these are some of the issues that the people are speaking to. And so let the people express their concern and, you know, let them go. The, the, the music is actually changing. I rather think that politicians should be dancing towards the tune of the people because that's what it should be. But Kofi, quickly, the next one that's also very interesting is that the NLC is urging President Muhammad Buhari and the Mifili to end the cash scarcity. Now, let's not also forget that there's also been uh, a directive prior to the ruling that happened on the 3rd of uh, you know, March right here from the Supreme Court asking that the old Naira note should be valid, remain valid up until the 3rd of, I mean, to the end of the year. That's the uh, 31st of December, uh, 2023. Uh, we actually waited, because when I say Nigerians, it feels like I'm excluding myself. We all were waiting to hear, even though uh, arguments have been as to, should we have waited for the NLC, I mean, to wait for the president himself or the CBN, whether as a body or as, as the CBN governor, to make a statement to that effect. But however, there's been a directive, you know, from the CBN asking that, hey, there should be compliance with the uh, Supreme Court ruling, allowing the 500 naira and the 1,000, among others, to, you know, be a legal tender. So that's what it is. But uh, the NLC is still, without that ruling, is saying that they are giving the federal government and its agency under it, including the CBN and other banking institutions, seven working days to address the cash crunch. And if they fail to do so, uh, at the expiration of seven working days, the Congress is directing all workers in the country to stay at home. So yes, that's what the NLC is saying. And as a yesterday one had a conversation, I remember asking the guests on the show if this ruling and this directive would actually earn the scarcity of the Naira. But one of the things that I have observed, Kofi, so far is that people are already collecting their own notes. Uh, so we, you know, there was also uh, uh, some sort of withdrawal or resistance as to collecting the old 500, the 1,000 Naira note. But that's also been accepted now by, you know, some persons who are in business rendering services and those who are also buying and selling. So it might be a plus. I really don't know if that's going to trickle down to having the cash crunch being taken off. I mean, having cash being available, but fingers crossed and let's see how that pans out. All right. Um, let's not waste. Uh, out, uh, I won't say too much on that. <laughs> like I'll just say, let's uh, let's keep our fingers crossed uh, uh, on that, and of course, see what happens. Uh, the NLC, uh, uh, through its chairman Joe Jero, uh, seem to be stepping up to the plate. I mean, they've been quiet and silent. <laughs> it's their party now that uh, they're asking Nigerians to vote for, though they are not meant to be partisan with the funds of NLC. Okay, but the Labour Party is said to represent uh, Labour. Okay, now when things are pinching Nigerians, the issues are pinched, you come out, but you only come out when it involves the welfare of workers, you know, when we talk about the youth, we talk about you know, police brutality and other things, what do you say? Because the NLC should be leading some of these uh, charges, you know, some of these things. So anyway, um, there's one thing they talked about, which for me is very important, uh, the, the clandestine, Nicodemus increase in electricity tariffs, nothing George Ero talked about. You know, in that statement, you know, Nicodemusly, Messi, Nigerians just woke up and realized that whatever they were paying for electricity was not sufficing. For those who use prepaid meters, it was getting finished in a matter of days. Nobody explained anything. Nobody called the people. Nobody put out a statement. Till now, Nigerians don't even know how much they're paying per kilowatt hour of electricity. It, it, it's baffling, really. Well, they've said that they won't, they won't take it again, it happens next time. But I think the NLC should have included this in their 
in the, in the protest because people are going through a lot. With what's happening in the economy, that you load 5,000 naira on prepaid meter and then it won't last you up to four days when you're even doing, using next to nothing. You know, so I think they should have included that in their in, in list of demands. But we see what happens. I think at this point, people will not mind if there's a shutdown of the country because already, I mean, are we not shut down? Hey, when you don't have money to buy food, you don't have money to pay for a transportation, you know, <laughs> what are we doing? Anyway, um, the last one is that the Nigeria Railway, Railway Corporation, um, in reaction to the accident, very unfortunate accident that took the lives of, of, of people who were just trying to get to work. Um, at uh, the PWD junction, rail crossing in Lagos, in Ikeja, Lagos. The, uh, the Nigerian Rail Corporation is saying they're going to build, uh, construct several overhead bridges at 11 level crossings in Lagos. Mm -hmm. So where the cars or vehicles normally cross, they're going to build overhead bridges. Mm -hmm. I know that some time ago they said they don't have funds to reconstruct the protective barriers at that place. You know, they don't have funds. I wonder where they're going to get the money from uh, to construct these bridges. It's not, it's not cheap. It's okay. not cheap, you know. And uh, this thing should have been done before now, Good. you know. And we should have had some of these safety um, uh, devices, okay, not just somebody waving a flag. Actually, a barrier stopping you from crossing if the train is coming. Uh, so they're complicit, they're complicit in all of this. Um, anyway. Well, um, uh, first of all, I mean, I think you have raised valid questions as to why haven't we had this before now, and it's a, it's a good development. Uh, that's on the one hand. When you talk about the funds, as long as they have the wheel, they will, the funds will come out. It's not rocket science. I haven't seen any country or an economy that complains of, uh, that says, oh, we have a lot of resources. I'm yet to see, including, you know, those we look up to, the United States of America, the United Kingdom, China, Russia, Germany, just begin to mention, you know, powerful countries in the world. You ask yourself, uh, have you ever seen, you know, a time where these persons wake up and say, hey, we have a lot of resources? So, yes, I don't think that funds will be the issue. If they have the will, they will find a way to solve it. And that's still part of the issue of governance and ensuring that lives and properties are protected. It is government responsibility. They don't need to forget about that part. Whoever is responsible need to think in that direction. But, Kofi, you know also, another thing that we, that you have also mentioned, like I have highlighted, is that uh, why haven't we thought about this? There should be all of that barriers. I mean, looking at the pictures of um, people having to, you know, find a way to scramble, to cross, it's also a very disturbing one. Now, let's come back to town. Let's come back to, you know, normal vehicles and all of the uh, flyovers that we have or pedestrian bridge that we have in the cities. Now, what's the level of compliance? Over time, you find out that people do not use this... Uh, you know, sometimes so you have those who will use it and those who will not use it for several reasons. Now, those who don't use it, especially at you know some time of the day or whatever time of the day is, it's for security reasons. Because even you have those bridges, you have uh, the fact that the security of the persons are also in question, where people can also be there, you know, to cause mayhem. And so most times, people resort to wanting to cross when the barriers have been put in place. So I'm, I'm also wondering, even if we have the barriers put in place, would you not still have people who want to find a way to break the barriers uh, for whatever reason, whether the accident will happen and the barriers are broken or they'll find a way to break it and then cross using that part, you know, to cross. So I think that we should look at the reason why people, even when we have the barriers for normal vehicle pedestrians, why people are not using it. And one of the major, you know, reason or a factor that I have seen, I have, you know, seen real time, and I know for sure, is the issue of security. Now, most times for the pedestrian bridge, you have people afraid for their safety and security when they are using the pedestrian bridge. And I think that government should pay attention to this, where, uh, you know, there's no security you don't have. I don't know if we're going to be deploying police officers. How many police officers do we really have? But those, you know, overhead bridges are not very safe, and so people are scared. Most times they don't want to use it because someone could be there just to, you know, ambush them, take their bags, take their phones, or follow them, stab them, and it could be very lonely. So, yes. That's also another concern. It's a good thing that we have it, and then we progress to thinking about providing security. But that's it this morning. We have to move on because we have Kola Wale who is joining us uh, on uh, for, via phone, by the way, for Off the Press this morning. Please stay with us. Good morning.
it for upcoming artists to blow in Nigeria. Welcome to Plus Trending. I am Wiki November, your host, saying thank you for joining us on today's episode. Welcome back. It's tea time on Plus TV Africa. Practice makes me perfect. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. He's a king. He's entitled to marry a hundred if he wants to. Change is inevitable. That we don't get it wrong at this point in time. We cannot continue the lamentation of the past. You're a leader. Don't go away when Bahasa is under the water. Don't leave Jigawa to die. Don't say, oh, I cannot go to Southern Kaduna because of the problem. Join us on Ballot 2023 all day on Election Day on Plus TV Africa for nationwide coverage with seasoned reportage and analysis. Ballot 2023, Nigeria's moment of decision. All day on election day on Plus TV Africa. A new day has finally come for citizens with disabilities in Nigeria. You can now participate in the electoral processes without any worry whatsoever. The new Electoral Act of 2022 has made robust provisions to ensure persons with disabilities are not left out of the electoral process. The Disability Act and the Electoral Act has mandated INEC to provide special assistance for citizens with disabilities at the polling booth. As a citizen with a disability, you are entitled to non-discrimination, priority voting, braille ballots for the blind, magnifying glasses for albinos, election day instructions to support the deaf, among other provisions. So, when you arrive at your polling unit on election day, all you need to do is present yourself to the polling officer in charge and you will be given the required support. It is your right by law. Now, nothing can stop you from being part of the electoral process. You are a citizen and with your voter's card, you are one of the owners of Nigeria. Go out and make your voice heard as we recruit those that will serve us on election day. This message is brought to you by the Campaign for Equal Voting Access, a program of the Center for Citizens with Disabilities with support from MacArthur Foundation. It is engagement we need to have. Those who suffer miscarriages are never taken into account. Members of the National Assembly are also influenced by the last. You are sitting on Nigeria's money. From the barbing, I pay my land. From the barbing, I send my, my children to school. A consultative engagement. No any tangible notification before the banners. It's one thing for people to be at your back and the future of the moment. And then that's for them to still be able to be when push comes to show. Welcome to this edition of Timeless Conversations. We welcome Remy Ubunquito. He's the founder and managing director of IBST Limited. For quite a period of time, almost like a year, I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I think that we don't invest enough in our people. You said your dad was a politician. Yes. Are you a politician? No way. Timeless conversation showing on Saturdays at 8.30 p.m. on Plus TV Africa. I had no desire to study law, none whatsoever. Um, I was more inclined to fine arts. My only ambition, I would say, was to become the chief prosecutor. For me, politicians are a bit too playful. That's what I believe. And since 99, we've seen how much investment... Tunde, it's good to have you join us. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Mercy. 
Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining us. Well, we'll start off with the Punch newspaper. Banks, Russian, all notes, NLC insist on seven-day ultimatum. Uh, talking about the Naira crisis. Then you find customers lament as CBN retains withdrawals, old notes, deposit limits. Well, the limit is still there. I think every other time you've been told that you have 5 million Naira. Uh, your limit says 5 million. You can't spend more than that. Fuel station traders and motorists accept old currencies, POS agents slash charges. Okay, feels like we're returning to normalcy. And CBN mum on disbursement of old 1,000 and 500 naira notes uh, to banks. That's what you find. These are the riders. Now, but moving away from that, you find another header that says dollar shortage, banks slash travel allowance and foreign school fees. Okay. And foreign airlines trap funds hit $743 million. And then you also find another that says almost 13 million cyber attacks recorded during the polls, according to the federal government. Just before we move away, INEC will prosecute electoral offenders with speed. But how do you, you know, find them? Uh, have you been able to apprehend any? That's the question. Review 1000 NIN fee. Council tells the uh, NIMC and or your SDP candidate withdraws back or withdraws and backs marking day. That's what you find this morning on the punch. Let's quickly go to the nation newspaper with these headlines. Uh, the big one there, banks limit customers to 20,000 naira over the counter. Right after that, branches expect more allocation from the Central Bank of Nigeria. Don't reject notes, say governors. Foreign airlines trapped cash, now $743.7 million. Federal government promises to clear uh, backlogs. Uh, three years after, China reopens borders to foreigners. And, uh, of course, we have a lady kills landlord over electricity bill. A oh, really uh, bizarre one there. And uh, reverse assembly candidates abducted. So the headlines on the front page of the nation. Well, you, we, we look at the Guardian newspaper this morning, uh, reporting what's quite related to what the punch has this morning on its front page. Now, a crisis, slow compliance, despite CBN order, and banks rotate uh, ration old notes. I take that again. Now, a crisis, slow compliance, despite CBN order, and banks ration old notes. Business owners, traders defer CBN and reject old 500 and 1,000 naira note. CBN silence and return bank notes, warehouse cash, uh, residual notes amount to drop in ocean, and an analyst insists. You also find e payment recorded series of failure transaction in February. Ariwa charges CBN to disburse old and new notes uh, to the bank. So there might just be partial compliance you know, with uh, the use of the old, and, uh, the old notes, apparently. Now, rule of law, over 130 CSOs and lawyers insist Baal must go. Hmm. Don't present Igbo senator with EFCC baggage, as the uh, Senate president says, or Hanese. Don't present Igbo senator with EFCC baggage, as Senate president says, or Hanese. Delta PDP Guba candidate escapes assassination. And then you ask yourself, what's the essence of the peace accord? Uh, the governorship poll, INEC, NSA, read riot acts and one against violence. That's it this morning on The Guardian. All right. Uh, uh, an addition, a new face on, uh, uh, of the press, Nature News. Uh, this seems to be an environmental uh, publication. Uh, the lead story there, AFDB, OK's 362 million euro funding for Yobe Basin Trust Fund. And you have a bit of other very nice stories on the front page. We won't waste time. Uh, let's quickly go over to Tunde Kolawole. Uh, 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 Tunde Kolawole Esquire, let's, let's start with a story that I think the papers are all, um, uh, you know, interested in this morning. Uh, and, of course, kudos to those papers who have been able to capture the picture on the front page uh, of Nigerians going through what they go through every day recently, which is to queue at ATMs for nothing more than three to 5,000 naira for hours. Um, we're told that the banks are rationing the old notes, like we saw in the Punch newspaper, like we saw in the Nation newspaper, they are not giving more than 20,000 naira over the counter. 
And in your opinion, has anything changed? You know, been shouting Supreme Court, Supreme Court rule of law. Uh, has anything changed? Well, uh, a little has changed. The mere fact that the Central Bank of Nigeria has given directives to the bank to start accepting the old note, that is the 1,500 naira note. You will want to say that uh, at least that is a compliance. I mean, we are, I mean, a step into full compliance with the decision of the Supreme Court, with the Naira legislation. The challenge in there is that uh, there are not enough money yet in circulation. Immediately the Naira was signed, the Central Bank of Nigeria started mopping up all the old notes that they don't want to spend again. But that when you even get some of these old notes now, they're looking so ragged and very unsightly. Furthermore, uh, we are all living through this. There is no exception to the rule. I go to the bank, and most of the things you have mentioned being reported in the paper is what I go through when I also go to the bank. The issue now is uh, do we have to subject ourselves to this uh, inhumanity? This is a very crude way of uh, managing the nation's uh, the currency. The answer is no. Secondly, is the economy likely to, I mean, to recover from the contraction that this redesignation of the Naira has really caused? Furthermore, we are also reading the newspaper that a fake currency, that the new Naira is already in circulation. So when you look at all the ramifications of all these things, it would appear that we have merely cut our own losses in order to spite ourselves. The tragedy that this Naira redesignation has uh, uh, befallen on Nigerians is what we will be counting and measuring in the next 10, 15 years uh, to come. We may not be seeing it physically now, besides the, the suffering that the people go through when they go to the bank. But what about the economic implications of all this? Thing? So uh, I think the CBN and MPs government has not done well at all. In some other countries of the world, the bandwagon effect of what they have done, the ripple effect, will have taken a toll on the government of the day. Turn our attention to the punch now, where uh, the umpire, INEX chairman, is quoted to say that uh, they are willing and are ready to prosecute uh, electoral offenders with speed, hoping that uh, the police would hand over case files on electoral offenders to INEC for prosecution. I quickly like you to share your thoughts uh, on that particular one. Uh, have we made any arrests? Those who have been involved, those who have also made inciting statements, we saw that. Uh, also suppressing and threatening voters, even in Lagos State, have we seen any arrest that has been made? And do you believe, you know, uh, on the statement of the umpire? Well, um, um, I mean, for what we read in the newspapers, it would appear that arrests were made in uh, different parts of the country. You will recall, I think, in Kano, a member of the House of Rest. It's already been prosecuted by the police for very egregious uh, crime, murder, arson, infliction of grievous bodily harm on uh, people. I'm also aware, I think, in Bauchi, another House of Rep, or is it a senator, uh, has been declared wanted, I think the member of House of Rep, has been declared wanted by the police in connection with the last election. But what I want to say is this, like I've always said, INEC does not need to sit in Abuja and start saying that they want to prosecute an electoral offender. I have always said, times without number, that we don't need any commission to prosecute an electoral offender. All the offenses that have been committed when elections have been conducted are what the local DPO in the different police stations in Nigeria can handle. People will uh, commit arson, they will destroy public property, they will uh, engage in man, I mean, uh, murder and all manners of a crime. If the DPO in the respective places 
that are close to the ballot boxes, and like to their duty and empowered to do the work. All they needed to do when anybody try and go somewhere to compromise the integrity of the victim, they arrest the person and prosecute the person. By the time you start uh, establishing a electoral commission and then put especially them in Abuja and asking them to be prosecuting electoral offenders in about 770, is it? I mean, is it 176 polling booths all over the country? You are never likely to get good results from there. You and I will see, we establish the ESTC to be policing a country of about 200 million people. Has it work effectively? The answer is no. We have IICPC. I mean, have they been able to cover the ground effectively? The answer is no. Let us justify this idea of uh, having an electoral offensive commission and then prosecuting people from Abuja. The local DPOs, if they are not compromised, have the wherewithal well and the law empowers them to prosecute anybody who engages in any of the infractions that are usually associated with the Nigerian election. For me, centralizing this is like not ready to do anything. Interesting. Uh, the nation Nisipa, gives us an update on the, uh, the situation between the federal government and foreign airlines. If you remember some time ago, uh, some of them suspended their services because of their funds that were trapped in yeah. the country, yes. And the paper is now telling us that um, now the money has gone to $743.7 million. And the uh, federal government is planning to clear uh, the backlog. Um, the International Air Transport Association, IATA, has gotten involved because they are the ones that made this revelation that the foreign airlines have uh, that amount of money, $743 million, trapped in the country. Um, in December, we're told that it stood at $549 million, but it rose to $662 million in January, is what um, we hear. Uh, the amount is contained in a letter titled Special Appeal on Airlines Blocked Funds in Nigeria, signed by the Area Manager of West and Central Africa for IATA, uh, Dr. Samson Fatukum. This is surely embarrassing, uh, Tony Kolewale. Would you say that? When I read that um, in the newspaper, my heart uh, uh, skipped uh, some of its uh, bits. Why do I say this? When the international community begins to raise this kind of issue, it is sending the wrong signal to the rest of the world that the economy of Nigeria has become a bankrupt. It is a nation like Lebanon, like Tunisia, like Ghana. That are, able to meet, that are unable to meet their foreign obligations to their business partners. And when a nation begins to fail in its financial obligations to foreign partners, foreign businesses and institutions are in order. That means there is a fire on the mountain. You know when these issues first arose, I think the presidency stepped in and then some of the debts were cleared. And then it has now accumulated again. Rather than make a at the Central Bank of Nigeria, that as soon as this money is uh, accruable, it's uh, matured, to be paid to all the foreign airlines operating in Nigeria, you remit their money to them. You don't have to start lobbying or start writing letters and go to the presidency to beg before Nigeria begins to meet its foreign obligations to some of these international agencies and bodies. And you know what? Just as it is happening in the airline industry, they are also challenging so many other areas, like the education area. Some of our foreign, some of our some of our children who are schooling abroad are already complaining that they are finding it difficult to get their school fees paid in some of those places. Some state governments are finding it difficult to remit the scholarships that they promised or that they gave to some of, the, some of their citizens who are studying abroad. So this is a very, very serious matter. And uh, I would want to say that these are things that the military should take uh, serious interest in, rather than designing the Naira and then uh, begin to play politics. Why is this city as a CBN uh, government? 
It's not a charity means at all, especially when we look at the ramifications. These are these Nigeria's obligations to his foreign business partners and associates. Well, um, I'd also like us to, you know, to look at uh, uh, the Guardian newspaper this morning and still with that, it talks about uh, the rule of law, the fact that you have 130 CSOs and lawyers insisting that Bauer must go. Tunde, uh -huh. can you yeah, hear yeah. Can you? Can you repeat that, please? Can you repeat that? So, yes, on The Guardian, you have a caption or a headline that says, the rule of law, over 130 CSOs and lawyers insist that Bauer must go. So what are your thoughts, really, uh, as regards this? You mean the... EFCC box. The position of the... CSOs and lawyers. On the, yes. on the rule of law. Exactly. Oh, well... You don't need uh, any uh, specialist to realize that uh, the rule of law has been receding for so many years now, especially under President Muhammadu Buhari and the APC government. And it is not surprising. Uh, why do I say this? When you look at our history books and uh, the rules, uh, the antiquity of President Muhammadu Buhari, this are this rule of law when he was in the head of state between 1984 and 1985. You will remember that he is somebody who is not too disposed to all these niceties about the rule of law. For him, if it were possible, uh, he would do away with the justice system. And then you probably would just even have, and even the legislator, you probably would just have only the executive arm of government. But good societies are not money that way. Let me give you two examples. There was a young man and a lady who were said to have criticized the Muhammad Dubari said why. And you recall what happened to those young people. The DSS and the police went and kidnapped them in their respective places. And they were taken to Ansel Rock, where they were led to have been uh, tortured. It was the outcry in the newspaper. And then the stand of the uh, National Association of Nigerian Students that uh, compelled the government or that treated the arm of government to release those people. The mere arrest of those people, taking them to Ansel Rock, which is not a police station, uh, is enough to, in some other jurisdictions. To bring down the government. Nigerians are very tolerant people. They take all manners of things from their leaders. There it shouldn't be that way. It should be able to put the government on its toes. The rule of law is not just meant for the lawyers. It's not meant for all the teachers or the media men. Every segment of society, every person that leads society benefits from the rule of law. Even President Muhammad Buhari himself had in the past benefited from the rule of law. He went to court several times when he felt he was cheated or uh, the integrity of the election was compromised. That is rule of law. But I don't start engaging in self help you know? Furthermore, so many other people are complaining of being arrested, of being uh, tortured, of being uh, uh, dehumanized by different security agencies. And we have never seen this government I think I like yes. us to stay, you know, with the crux of the conversation here. Now, yes. I, I want you to look at the crux or the content at which, of which these frontliners, 130 of them, are pushing for. They are saying that Abdul Rashid Bawa, uh, uh, Abdul Rashid Bawa, of course, the uh, chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, has to yeah. go over alleged politicization and uh, disobedience of court orders and infringement yeah. on human rights of Nigerians, among others. And so they have yeah. joined 20 constitutional lawyers by, um, you know, saying that, hey, he has to go. And prior to this time, don't forget, there's also been some ruling from the court as to his uh, disobedience to court orders. So I'm asking your thoughts on the fact that you, we have to have civil society pushing 
for his resignation and his sack. Yeah. We 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 saying the same thing. Why do I say this? You remember that even the Inspector General of Police was uh, convicted not too long ago for disobedience of the uh, court order. There has been times so I think it was um, uh, one of the speakers of House of Representatives, I can't remember him now, who was also convicted by our court. And then the man refused or did not uh, obey the court order. And nobody was able to arrest them and take them to the custodial center as the court have ruled. The challenge we have always had in those areas are this. When the court convicts uh, a high profile public official, our government official or a politician, it is the executive of government that will enforce that conviction because the court doesn't have the coercive power to really enforce its own decision. So if the court, I mean, if the executive of government refuses to enforce that decision of the court and all that, there is nothing that the judiciary can do. In fact, in some other crimes, immediately Bauer was convicted by the court. He will run his own position, resign his appointment without being told by anybody. And if he didn't resign, those who appointed him, the people in government, the president or the prime minister or whatever, would compel him to leave the office or remove him. Or his case would be stable at the National Assembly because his appointment is usually confirmed by the National Assembly, I think the Senate. And then a person will be written to the Senate or there about and say, look, look, this man has ah, a for cause of that convicted and all that, but he has refused to submit himself to the custodian people. And from there, the executive arm of government will uh, will the sixty. But here, like I said, because we have no respect for the rule of law, very highly placed individuals, very few people in government, thanks to that member, have always uh, disobeyed uh, court order. And uh, there has been no consequences. That is why we are in this. The approach to it is two ways. Is either we compel that person to voluntarily resign the appointment, or we put the each on the executive arm of government to remove them from those places. And if we still don't get resolved from those places, then the National Assembly, or under whatever division that they might be, should be compared as public official. That one won't be the third person. The idea of police, the big army officers and all that, so, they so, have also but, in the past. Um, but Tunde Kola Wale now, how do we enthrone the rule of law? I mean, just quickly, as you know, Kofi comes well, in there. Very, very simple. We must get into governance those who have respect for the rule of law. Secondly, uh, we need to overhaul our police system. The situation in which the police and all the different security agencies see themselves as beholden, as responsible to only the executive arm of government, to only keep the executive in power, then you cannot have uh, the rule of law as a place. And of course, too, you must encourage the Nigerian people to always insist on their rights, no matter how difficult. No matter how bad, no matter how expensive it could sometimes uh, become, it's a failure of most of our people turning the other cheek when they are slapped or leaving everything to God that has led to some of this uh, uh, rot that we see in the area of the teacher. And of course, too, we must make sure that those who get to the end and the lawyers who fly their trade in the court and all that are committed to the rule of law. The man that justice did not do in Lagos. When he gave an order, and then the military at that point in time refused to obey his order, Justice Genevieve said, look, I have no business continuing being a judge in Lagos State. If the executive of government, if the army, or whoever is in power will not obey whatever orders I gave. And the man resigned. He resigned as a judge. And if you have one or two, three people, one or two, three judges, who are able to do that, I am sure will be on the path to ensuring that we have the rule of law deeply ingrained in our DNA.
All right, then well, let's see how, you know, uh, what happens. I mean, let's see if we ever get to that point. But well, we here will continue to talk about these issues and raise, you know, pointers to the fact that uh, we haven't really been great and doing well uh, as regards the respect for the rule of law. And that's it this morning on Off the Press with Tunde Kolawale. Thank you so very much. Well, He's a legal yeah. practitioner. Mm -hmm. Tunde, thank you so well, much. Uh, we wish you the same then. Uh, Tunde Kolawale is a legal practitioner. Uh, he joined the show this morning from Lagos, and we appreciate your time. We take a break. When we return, it will be time for us uh, to look at, you know, our first major conversation right here. And the consent for us would be that Labour Party uh, is going to inspect election materials, which will help, you know, the prosecution of their case. However, the umpire has also accepted and uh, will be set to release several documents to help, you know, with this entire process. Please stay with us. When you hear of drug abuse, what comes to your mind? When we say drug abuse, it seems like something that is so distant, but it's happening every day in our homes. One in every four persons is, has mental illness. Regardless of your notion of what drug abuse is, you are sure to get the right meaning here. Welcome to Regardless, an anti-drug abuse television show put together by Christ Against Drug Abuse Ministry. Regardless, the anti-drug abuse show airing on Plus TV Africa every Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. What we see and envy in other countries, we don't even, we don't pay enough attention to how it is done. Mm. So for example, the people are always talking about, oh, you know, we should tell African stories. I smile. Mm. You know, I I'm one of those who says that. You know, I, mean, I think that we should talk to ourselves first before we're even worried about what people are thinking about us. You know, mm. we overvalue the opinion of other people. We don't value ourselves. We don't value our people. But isn't that why we should tell our own story? To ourselves. Yes, first. Do you understand? Yes. So we won't be talking about telling African story because we didn't wake up this morning and think first and foremost, I'm African. I think I'm, I'm Nigerian. Mm, that's what I'm you saying. You understand? So in Nigeria, yes. first and foremost, we need to talk to ourselves. How do we talk to ourselves? What do we say to ourselves? What's Every our day? reality? So what does reality mean? Mm -hmm. Reality. And what lens are we looking at reality from? Mm. So what are the top decisions that the United States considers necessary that Nigeria must take? I like to think of my interactions as conversations, not interviews. And that's why I say asking questions is both an art and a science. Everyone says in Islam, you are allowed to have four wives. Is it mandatory? The right question enables answers that educate, inform, clarify, and help you, the viewer, to better understand the issue before making up your mind. Our goal is to reduce from 10 to 2 days the time it takes to register businesses in Nigeria. Join me every week on this station plus tv africa and gain exclusive access to my conversations i'm angela ajitumobi nigeria by extension africa is faced with a lot of challenges the growing youth population with little engagement that is a ticking time mark. we are a blessed people with diverse culture and highly cerebral minds who have a lot to say. And yes, we are talking. It is important we drive the right conversation that informs, inspires, influences thoughts and action. If we say there's beauty in our diversity, then let us embrace our diverse culture. We must continue to courageously be the voice of transformation as we are the hope for the future. Yesterday's conversations shape today. What are you saying to shape your tomorrow? We know you have a lot to say and we are here to hear you. How can we have peace without justice? Plus politics. It's not just another political conversation. It's about keeping you in the know. The relevant interviews asking the tough questions to those that matter.
get the answers you need. Does it mean that the people who were injured, people who were shot at, those who were involved in that stampede are not going to get justice? It is unfortunate, it is sad that we have a government of deaf and dumb. Analysis from top experts. The last election was not really an election. We feel that Obasanjo has a very special place in his heart for hating Ijo people. I think it really boils down to two things. One, trust and accountability. Plus politics every weeknight at 7 p.m. on Plus TV Africa. Hello and welcome to Space and Staff. A property show designed to connect various stakeholders across the property value chain. We can also provide realistic solutions and deepen your knowledge about the interesting world of real estate. We can showcase architectural design, interior design trends, lifestyle, and real time property news updates, and the right way to navigate through property development and investment. Join me every week on this channel as I take you through an exciting journey in the world of real estate. Space and Style, 6.30 p.m. on Saturdays and 5.30 p.m. on Wednesdays. Hey, what's up, guys? You're welcome to another edition of PLUS Event, and I remain your host, Ifeoluwa Oshuke. <laughs> Your absence isn't an excuse anymore as PLOS Events is all you need as we bring you the glitz, the glamour and loads of fun. Oh, definitely. By no question. He's a living legend. Oh, God forbid. Holy Ghost fire, I know. I just want to be blown away. I want to be wild. This is 11 years of doing this. I'm surrounded by so much positivity. No way, it's okay. Yo, what's up, my people? It's your boy, Starboy Terry. You're watching Plus TV on Plus TV. Stay glued to Plus TV Africa every Saturday and Sunday, 4.30 p.m. West African time. Businesses in Africa can be very challenging. In Nigeria, it is particularly intimidating. And successful builders have learned how to navigate a hostile environment to unlock opportunities. But one major challenge businesses face is how to filter through the noise and identify where their ideal customers exist. A get insight and practical steps from industry players and captains of industries. Hear success stories to help you make informed decisions as you scale your business in Nigeria. Watch Business Insights at this time on Plus TV Africa. Increase the reach of your events or business services. To advertise on Plus TV Africa, please call 0906 000 5719 or 0909 040 or send an email to marketing at plustvafrica.com. Plus TV Africa. Big stories live here. Right, welcome back. It's still uh, the Independent National Electoral Commission, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, has declared that the electoral umpire has nothing to hide uh, when it comes to making uh, materials and documents used in the February 25 presidential election results available to political parties. Yakubu said this uh, he, when he received the Labour Party's 
and legal team on Monday, led by Dr. Levi Uzoku uh, at the commission's headquarters in Abuja. Uh, the legal team made up of about 60 lawyers. Yes, you heard it right. About 60 lawyers were at INEC uh, to discuss modalities for obtaining uh, key documents that will assist the Labour Party in prosecuting its case at the presidential election petitions court. Now, the meeting with INEC officials, which, is, uh, which was held at the commission's national headquarters, as we said, um, it seems, seems to be the start of uh, the process to inspect the electoral materials used in the February 25 presidential poll. After the meeting, Uzoku, uh, speaking to pressmen, said the team visited INEC because it was yet to receive any electoral materials for inspection on behalf of their client. Now, recall that the party had earlier obtained a court judgment directing INEC uh, to allow it inspect the materials used for the February 25 polls. Um, let's look at what this represents for uh, the legal tussle that lies ahead. Um, uh, we have joining us this morning, I guess, Dr. Moshala Deji. Um, he's a public or political scientist, and uh, he joins us live this time, not via Zoom, from <laughs> Singapore. <laughs> All right, you're welcome. Great Thanks to have you. Having me. Um, <clears throat> what exactly, the confusion is still out there. We're having discussion of the air before we came on. What is INEC going to give to the legal team of Obi and the legal team of Atiku? Are they giving them the result sheets, copies? Are they giving them uh, copies of ballot papers? Are they giving them access to the data from the beavers? What are they getting? Well, the order of the Lord Justices at the Presidential Election Tribunal says that they should release election materials. Now, that has a wide definition election materials means that both the ballot paper the result sheet even the beavers anything that has to do with the election anything at all that pertains to be to the election could be regarded as an election material so um, for the other political parties to now begin to determine what election and what INEC will release to um, the obese legal team, definitely that is not um, permissible because the order of court says election materials. So the obese legal team will now ask for what they want. Election materials varies. There's a, um, it takes a lot of materials for you to organize an election. So when they say election material, a lot Everything. of things is involved. Mm -hmm. So it will now depend on the legal team of the Labour Party presidential candidate to now ask for what they want. So if I have an order of court that says that, okay, I can um, inspect this studio, the, um, the owners now lies on me to determine where I want to inspect, what I want to inspect. But the order of court says election materials which covers both the ballot paper the result sheet and every other thing that has to do with the election itself well but let me also you know add this uh it's a major concern and it's that do, do you think that the legal team need this to have a comprehensive review of the process don't forget that you know peter obi had mentioned that he's not looking at the outcome but he's looking at the process that led to the outcome i'm just wondering if you can you know, uh, the process is what led to the outcome. And let's not even talk about that. Okay, I but think, I'm asking, okay. uh, all of this that you're asking, do they really need this to review the process? They need to review the process because the process... Do they need it, this? They really need it because the process was what led to the outcome itself. And I think the presidential candidate of the Labour Party is being smart in the sense that he says he doesn't have any problem with the result being declared is only challenging the process but we all he, know he that he legally have a pro a he's not challenging the results it's but he's challenging the, the process, the process and, and the declaration the and the declaration yeah, now came out on Twitter we all know that if the process is wrong then the result itself will be nullified just like we have recently in Kenya whereby the process that brought about the emergence of the candidate that won the election was faulty it wasn't followed according to the guideline. And the Supreme Court of Kenya was bold enough to say that, oh, you didn't follow this guideline, the process is faulty, thereby the declaration 
it's also nullified as well. So I think it is, it is, um, it is a clever move by um, the, the presidential candidate of the Labour Party to question, to query the process. And another reason why he needs to query the, the process is that it has to do with the electoral body itself. That is not quite good for our democracy. We should have a situation whereby politicians will query their own actions and inaction. But in this case, they are querying the conduct of the electoral umpire itself, which is supposed to be, to, 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 to be unbiased, which is supposed to follow what it has stated in black and white. But the electoral umpire, having allegedly failed to follow its own guideline, that's why you, you see that a particular candidate is now questioning the process, saying, hey, you said you were going to do this, now you've not done it, and now I am going to call to challenge the process. That is quite commendable on the part of Peter Abi, but I think it leaves much to be desired on the part of INEC itself, because most of the cases that we used to have in court is the political parties challenging the actions of each other. You change results, I didn't change results, you send talks, I didn't send talks. Those were the things that we should perhaps be seeing at the presidential election tribunal now, or the conduct of the um, of the people at the coalition officer, not INEC itself. And what we now say INEC, not the INEC of a state, two states, three states, you know, the national body of INEC itself. So that leaves much to be desired for our democratic system. Right. The, the Independent okay. National Electoral Commission has uh, uh, had some things to say about this. Um, I, I like the way one of the papers put it. Uh, I, I think it was a punch who said that um, beavers, political parties, can't regulate INEC, says Okoye. And I'm talking about the head of um, information and voter education at the Independent National Electoral Commission who said, you're political parties, you can't regulate us. We regulate you. So you can't come and tell us what we should show you. We are going to determine what we reveal to you. Um, people have hopes that the the parties will be who have approached the court, namely PDP and LP, will be able to look at the beavers, for instance, and that's why when INEC applied to the court to reconfigure the devices, and uh, there was a lot of uh, there was a furor and uproar. And um, but what INEC is saying is that um, political parties cannot serve as watchdog uh, to the electoral umpire's activities. And um, uh, first of all, he also said that the brain things like the brain of uh, the uh, the beavers will not be accessible to the political parties. You know, he also said something like the um, result portal uh, of the, the 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 commission will not be accessible to the parties. You know, this is information they can't be given. Even the ballot papers, the the, the, the parties can have access to that. Well, INEC has right to regulate the parties, but uh, let me just use an example. You can decide all your life to say you don't want to give birth. It's your right. Nobody will come and force you that, oh, you must give birth. But once you give birth to a child, you don't have the right to kill it. You cannot murder that child. You've gone against the law. So INEC regulates the political parties, but INEC itself is regulating the political parties according to a particular law. INEC is not the law. INEC is subjected to the law as passed by the National Assembly via the Electoral Act, first the Nigerian Constitution, the Electoral Act, and INEC guideline itself. So if you say you're going to do this, because even um, I watched a video, I think, in November 2022, where the INEC chairman restated that the election result will be transmitted electronically. And I am disappointed. I am ashamed that a professor of political science, I as a political scientist, um, in any organization I find myself, somebody like Professor Mahmoud will be my boss as a professor. But I am ashamed that we can have a professor of political science conduct such a shabby election, election that is very disgraceful. Because you said it is clear that, okay, electronic transmission first, manual second. That's what you promised. We didn't force you to bring this um, electronic but, but, yeah, but, but, transition but, but, kind of thing, but once yeah. you have introduced it and you have stated it in your guideline, you have to stand by it. But but what kind of parties now? Um, this is about the beavers. You know, parties like Labour Party have been saying they want to go monitor how INEC 
is backing up the information in their, on their server. You know, and, and the, the commission is saying, you can't come and monitor what we are doing. We are independent. You know, these are probably, you know, sensitive, uh, uh, sensitive, uh, you know, uh, uh, things that the party, the, the commission will want to keep away from, from the public, looking at how we are backing up, uh, looking at the brain of the rivers or the biometric information of voters. They're okay. saying that you can't come and then tell us to give these things to you. That's I'm like, looking at maybe some compromise of, you know, of, of their, their information. What I think he's saying is like a citizen and a policeman that has a search warrant. The policeman has gone to court to get a search warrant to search your home. Once that policeman has the search warrant, you won't tell the policeman that, no, don't enter my kitchen. Don't enter my bedroom. Just search my sitting room. But as at that time, it's beyond your powers, despite the fact that you are the owner of the home. So the order of court says election materials. Election material. That is anything that has to do with the election. So what would INEC be hiding? Whether it is APC, whether it is PDP, whether it is Labour Party or any other political party. What are you hiding? Why won't you allow them access to anything just for the sake of transparency? You have failed in the first instance. People are disappointed. Now they are challenging the process itself. Why can't you allow them to have that transparency? The politics that I think INEC is playing, which, it's, which should not be tolerated in our de democratic system, is that if people had uploaded the result, if the electronic had come first, definitely anything INEC declared can easily be challenged. But now that the manual had come first, INEC will now work, or, and maybe the tech guys, will now work from answer to question. In the sense that INEC has already made a declaration. So if anybody now sits down at the back end and starts inputting the figures according to what INEC declared, now how do we verify that? So INEC, it's, uh, INEC has messed up in terms of the transparency itself. So have we failed? As regards the transparency, what you can do is to now be transparent as regards the, the, you know, the materials in your possession. But when you are not transparent as regards the material in your possession, definitely you will put, you, you will cast more doubt on your credibility. That's okay. what I think. But I, I'd like to also ask if you don't think that INEC on the 25th of February acted within her capacity. Now, the first time the results were protested was during, uh, you know, the, at the coalition center, the national coalition center. We saw uh, agents of political party mentioning uh, the various discrepancies that had happened. And we saw the likes of Dino Dini Milaye, amongst other political agents, party agents, that stomped out, you know, of the entire process. And I, I also remember vividly as one who was involved in reportage and you know coverage of that election, seeing uh, someone who was also questioning, who was also saying, hey, INEC is acting in accordance to her capacity. So it was within the ambit of, or it was, was it in her you know, jurisdiction to whether or not you know, go on with the uh, election coalition, uh, res coalition of results and the announcement. So, uh, uh, so again, I ask, was INEC not acting within her powers, the powers that they had the right to stop or continue with the process? And they decided to proceed. Good question. They, ask, they have the right to stop or proceed. Now, under the circumstance that we found ourselves during the election, logical reasoning should come into the process. But that's prepare. not law. Logical reason. Now, you have, the law permits you to go left or right. Then logical reasoning has to come into play that, okay, it's, it's best for me to go left than right. Now, under the circumstance, in an election whereby the three candidates, the, the three major candidates are from the three major ethnic group of the country, an election that People are so much interested in the outcome. I believe that if the law gives you option, logical reasoning that will favor the electorate, that will favor the credibility of the institution you represent, that will boost the image of the Nigerian state in the international community should naturally prevail, even if you have, you have other options. And what should have prevailed 
to the best of my knowledge, is logical reasoning. So even if there are itches, you could have said that, okay, we are expressing this technical itch, but we are trying to fix it, maybe give us a few hours or a few days. That will still kind of like no, but, boost but, credibility in the process. But, but, but on the part of INEC, on the part of INEC, the, the danger in the election is that INEC portrays itself as if it is an extension of a particular political party. And that's the problem. So now, even if <laughs> INEC, even if INEC was acting maybe the, the way it thinks best, the, 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 kind of, the outlook itself doesn't show. If the election result were being uploaded in some state, maybe we have 36 states and the FCT, maybe it was successfully uploaded in 25 states, then we, we can take But a situation whereby it wasn't uploaded instantly in almost across the federation. No, no, That's you, more like a clear sabotage. No, but, but apart from the fact of uploading, there were also other issues that were, you know, I don't know if we seem to have forgotten. There were centers where elections didn't hold because these elections were disrupted by, you know, criminal element thugs and what have you. And the law is also very explicit as to, um, you know, these issues. I really haven't heard that well, we know that they had continuation of elections, but there were some centers, you know, even in Lagos and across other parts where elections didn't hold. People had complained that elections didn't hold and results were declared. Now, there are also some parts where election held, but they were disrupted. And the Electoral Act also has been very explicit. Let's come back to the issue of INEC having the jurisdiction. It's within her jurisdiction to decide whether or not to continue at the time where they were being questioned and there were a lot of reports as to the results that were being announced. But don't you think that we should be blaming the law now, the Electoral Act, and, you know, including the Constitution? Because we see a lot of lacunas. You can't expressly see, say what exactly is logic reasoning. It's not stated there. So because what, is, what you're saying now might just be what you should think it is, but it's not clearly stated. And even what is clearly stated has not been respected. And so what when you now leave things to... Uh, you know, the decision or choices of people and, and hope that the umpire should be, you know, uh, rational. What if that is rationality? Going ahead, you know, to declare the results and announce the results and continue with the coalition center despite all of the complaints. So should we not be blaming the Electoral Act and the our Constitution for all of those gaps? Well, I think the Electoral Act, as it stands now, would give us a more credible election than the one we had during the... So you're saying there are no lacunas? The are you saying there are no, no lacunas? I, I'm not, there's no perfect law. But the one we have, is it that bad that the election should have gone that route? No. I believe that the Electoral Act, as it is now, should have given us a more credible election than we had if the people that are going to... Up, that have the decision makers decide to follow the electoral act truly. I'm not saying, I need to be clear, that I'm not saying that logical reasoning should be above the law. No. I said when the law gives you options to do A or B, then logical reasoning should prevail as regards who you are representing or who you serve. I make in this case is serving the Nigerian people. But how do you uh, define logical reasoning? So what if the decision to continue with the, the announcement of the result is logical for the chairman of the umpire because he went ahead? And so what, what if that was his logical reasoning? Well, if... So I'm saying that because the constitution has not expressly, for the fact that you allow you know, the umpire to decide whether or not they can continue, it's within her... Uh, you know, powers to continue or not continue, I mean, use her discretion to go ahead. Now, how do you define discretion? Discretion is relative, depending on who is defining it. Okay. That's the point. So again, it, it shows that we're not being very precise. Maybe we didn't see this coming, and that's why the Electoral Act was not able to capture some of these excesses. Well, I make guideline for the election. It's what I stand by. Before the game, you said, okay, this is going to be the rule of the game. No offside. And when the game starts, you can't change at the middle of the game 
if you are going to change, then you, you need to seek the consent of the participant of the game itself, which is the political parties. You need to, the political parties are well represented at the collation center. Nigerians are watching. Now, what is the value of an election that the citizens at which you conducted the, the, the election for doubt the transparency? Oh, what is the value of that election itself? What we would have if it's a situation whereby the court will keep deciding. Because, okay, now, at the end of the day, people have died because of this election. Nigerians have spent money because of this election. They have wasted their time to r register, get their PVC. And at the end of the day, now, the beauty of democracy is, that, is for the process to be so transparent to the extent that when the winner is declared, at least the transparency alone gives you the joy to have participated in the process even if you lose that election. But in this case, the transparency, not because you state that you won't be transparent. The INEC guideline shows a lot of transparency. But at the end of the day, you told us, you know, one, one um, server and, and one IRF, you, you couldn't upload the result. And at the end of the day, I was listening to the, um, the PDV chieftain in Lagos on um, a sister channel, Chief Body George, saying that the, the, um, one of the tech guys at INEC is a former commissioner in Lagos. Imagine that. And the presidential candidate of the APC itself is a former governor of Lagos State, and we know it is a matter of public knowledge that directly and indirectly he has been in charge of Lagos State since 1999. Okay. So you shouldn't okay. take steps oui. that will question the transparency of the process itself. Right. You should at least do your part because you said you are independent and you promised A, try and deliver A. So not that you will now say that, okay, you want to proceed when there are options that you can take Dr. that Deji, can we, improve we, yes. the credibility we, we of the process yeah, itself. Yeah. You, so you, I you're think that independence and credibility, you know. But uh, we may have to do some more investigations to know if you know more about this person. No, but, I gave you reference. Yes, it's yes, not yes, my word. I it's know, the I, word of I know, Chief I know. You've said that. You <laughs> so that's why I gave you yes, reference. Yes, yes. But um, um, <laughs> you know, not to conduct a media trial. But um, uh, what, what do you expect? You know, um, the, the likes of the legal team of Atiku and Obi to do. Um, when they get to court. Um, we have said that they deserve and they have a right by the order of court, uh, the highest, uh, the presidential election petition court, to, to get anything they want. Mm -hmm. And I keep saying, no, you cannot come look at uh, sensitive information, in like the biometrics of the, uh, the voters, the brain of the beavers, etc. You know, the cloud server and all that, you can look at that. We're simply going to give you the results sheets and, and all that, and which by law actually in the Electoral Act, you are anybody, you can apply for it, they will give you a printout. But going forward, if they are to make a case, what do you expect the legal teams to, to say you know, to the court? Um, do you expect that we can see something on the screen here? This is Sam Amadi, former um, commissioner for NEC, Nigerian Electricity Reg Regulatory Commission, and he is talking about the Obiapo uh, federal constituency uh, uh, um, there will be a local government elections, the presidential uh, uh, elections. And there's a claim going around, you know, I think Renaud Mokri has also done a video about this, that um, in what you see from the result sheets that the party agents submitted, and first of all, said the agents themselves have, the party's agents have the result sheets. So there's nothing they need from INEC, really. Um, he says that, Hail INEC free and fair election, will be a poor result. They're saying what they saw on the, on the uh, portal was APC 80,000 plus, LP just about 3,000. But the result sheets that the agents have, they are claiming that they have 70,000 and APC 12,000. Now, if we see these discrepancies on the INEC's IREV, okay, do you think the parties will be able to make headway by presenting such as evidence? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to add a, 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 a sub-question okay. to this. Bearing in mind what happened between Oyetola and Adeliki in Osho State, where, yes, the electoral access, if you count, if you see a notice about voting, cancel the election and order a fresh, ele fresh election right there at the polling unit. But the courts, they counted everything and said Oyetola is the new, is the, is the winner. And they are saying that even if they were to 
order a fresh election, then the result of that fresh election would not affect the outcome of the election. So I want you to look at that, if they have this evidence. Okay, now, let me start with this. There's a football match, and your opponent scores, and you are doubting whether it is a goal. Then the referee team says you can't look at the VAR. You can't send your team to the back to check the screen through slow motion to determine whether it's a goal or not. How would you feel? You will feel bad. So I think that there's no, there's really nothing to hide. But the results, the, 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 the result, result, yes. Yes, the result as uploaded by INEC, INEC has its own tech guys. Peter will be. Um, Bola Metinumbu, Atiku Abubakar should bring their own tech guys and they review it together. Okay, but, but if, 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 if I'm Labour Party, now, okay, okay, guys, <laughs> I'm not Labour Party, it's just an example. What <laughs> was attacking me on Twitter? I'm Labour Party now, for instance, and I say, Alec, you have this result that shows XYZ, like Obi where somebody is making this claim. Mm -hmm. But I have different results. And even look at PDP2 says, yeah, we have these results. And it's different from what you presented. Of course, it's okay, fine. Yes, indeed, that is the case. We are going to recount everything and we'll give it to Labour Party or PDP. But that the that count does not affect the overall result of the election. Even if we add all those votes for you, Obi, we add it uh, for you, Atiku, it still will not make you the winner. Tilbo will still edge you. So we can't do anything at that time. One it's, thing, it means the case is dead. Well, no. One thing such case would do is to strengthen the electoral process and the law that would emerge thereafter if there's going to be any amendment to the electoral act. Law comes through the pronouncement of the court, through the um, different judgment, especially at the Supreme Court level and at the appeal court as the case is right now so even if it's not going to um, maybe benefit or change the outcome for the fact that it will strengthen our electoral system it will strengthen our legal political jurisprudence i think it's worth pursuing sincerely but it seems to be a fair company or an exercise of utility because if the parties are seeking to be declared winner nothing may come out of it well the thing is uh, well we never can say. It depends on how the parties were able to present their argument in court. It depends on the logicality of their argument and their prayer in court. The court is not for that Christmas. Do you so if so, they are so, praying you, for yes. a moment and they can prove it, then maybe at the discretion of the court, it's so do, you, do, you, do you foresee the OB legal team or the ethical legal team being able to put together enough numbers and result sheets where you have discrepancies, if the court says, okay, fine, we'll take it, to make up the numbers. That's where Peter Obi is being smart, in the sense that he is challenging the process. If he successfully challenged the process, the Not result the will be a no. We have to go. We have to go. <laughs> so we, we see the wisdom in what, what Obi is saying, where it says challenging the process and the declaration, but not the outcome. So, so Obi's advisors are very smart, because they might have done the collation. In fairness, Bola Tinubu may have won fair and square, but I neck itself might end up putting Bola Tinubu himself in problem. Okay. Because at the end of the day, if Obi successfully challenged the process, if the process is wrong, the outcome is wrong. Okay. That's it. So Obi is being smart, being clever to challenge the process, and if he could prove his case that INEC has not followed his guideline, then the election at the wisdom of the court might be annulled. Now, to whose disadvantage? Bola Metinumbu. So why should I neck itself okay. play against this? We have to go. We have to go. We're out of time. I want to thank you so much for uh, your time, Dr. Moshola Deji, political scientist. Thank you. Uh, very interesting very analysis. Good. We look forward to more uh, interactions with you while you're still with us. That was my pleasure. All right. We have to move on, Mercy. Well, that's it this morning. Thank you so much uh, for being part of the show, Dr. Moshola Deji. Uh, we'll we just take a break now, and when we return, it'll be time for us. You know, to be looking at our second conversation now is the week for glaucoma. We'll talk about this glaucoma uh, globally. It's a global issue and we'll be having, you know, experts in the studio this morning. Stay with us. Good morning. Nigeria's Niger Delta region 
from where the black gold fuels Africa's largest economy, where the lines between wealth and poverty has never been thinner. Conflicts, poverty, insecurity, and environmental challenges daily confront the region. How can the Niger Delta story be changed for the better? Join Mamude Akuga at 9 p.m. every Friday evening on PLOS TV Africa as he probes deep in search of solutions. Inside the Niger Delta with Mamude Akuga, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil-rich region. our kids parents should stop playing god the internet is actually using the people but when you are looking for money to help other people then it becomes easy don't rush into marriage i always say if you rush in you rush out family is the bedrock of every society and the essence of life on today with john and helen we dig deep into family values in every sense of the word join us every saturday at 9.15 a.m. on Plus TV Africa, DSTV channel 408. With you, we play a part in strengthening the values passed from generation to generation. See is it for upcoming artists to blow in Nigeria. Welcome to Plus Trending. I am Wiki November, your host, saying thank you for joining us on today's episode. Welcome back. It's tea time on Plus TV Africa. Practice makes me perfect. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. He's a king. He's entitled to marry a hundred if he wants to. Do not understand, we will stigmatize. What you can see is the remaining of the tanker that exploded. The suffered equally confessed. A 500 dollar the collector. If no talk, then go beat you. Now, two to other five and they the fact that this is a glaucoma week for awareness and uh, the world glaucoma week was launched in 2010 by the world glaucoma patient association and world glaucoma association to provide a forum for anyone seeking to enhance eye health to a better or to better comprehend the serious implication of glaucoma however glaucoma is believed to be the cause of blindness in 4.5 million individuals according to the who 
glaucoma is a major cause of permanent blindness in India, affecting approximately 12 million people and leaving 1.2 million blind. At the community level, more than 90% of glaucoma cases go undiagnosed. Now, in 2022, it was estimated that 1.1 to 1.4 million people have glaucoma in Nigeria. Now, glaucoma is one of the leading cause of blindness in Nigeria, according to that statistics in the world as a whole. Now, due to the low awareness rate, that's also some statistics saying that there have been more cases of glaucoma uh, cause blindness, which could have been avoided. Now, early detection, according to experts, says it can be reduced and the risk of going blind uh, due to glaucoma. Now, these can be assured by awareness programs and, th uh, you know, thorough eye screening. But the question for me is 10 years after the awareness campaign program, 2023 makes it 10 years. Uh, how far have we fed? Uh, we have uh, professions or uh, professionals, I beg your pardon, who are in the studio this morning. Uh, we'll have a doctor, Dr. Onehi. Did I get it? Yes, Dr. Onehi. <laughs> Dr. Onehi is here, and Dr. Mir is also here this morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you very much. Good morning. Yeah. All right, so quickly, let's even, uh, maybe I'll start with you, uh, ladies first. That's what they say. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Can you please bring us up to speed now? For those who are watching, and we know that this is week four, you know, the campaign and awareness, what exactly is glaucoma? So glaucoma essentially is something we define as a multifactorial disorder. And this multifactorial disorder has to do with three different things. We are looking at the intraocular pressure, we're looking at your optic nerve and your visual field. So once these three are affected, then they can cause severe damage to your optic nerve and eventually it will lead to blindness. Now the problem with glaucoma now is because once the optic nerve is damaged, it really cannot be repaired or reversed. So it is the second leading cause of irreversible blindness. And so why we tell people that as much as you can, try to come into the clinic, have your eyes tested. Prevention is actually the key to catching it. So it's pretty much nicknamed the silent thief of sight. And that is because it has no symptoms, no signs. People literally wake up blind. So what we try to advocate for people is check your eye pressure, check your optic nerve, and as often as you can, check your visual field as well. Because there are certain factors that could predispose you to having all of this. Some of that being that glaucoma is very hereditary. So when you have a family member who has so gone blind, oh yes, that's the number one risk factor. And so the thing is, with Nigerians, we're not very health conscious because, I, I mean, Nigeria is Nigeria. There's a lot going on. So before you even present in the clinic, you really have to have something going on with you. But that luxury is not afforded us when we are dealing with glaucoma. With glaucoma, if you do not attack it early enough, damage would already go on and that damage cannot come back again. So once you have a family history, somebody has gone blind in the family, or you know somebody who has glaucoma in the family, at least once a year, you're expected to have your eyes tested. Another thing is for people who are very long-sighted or short-sighted, this is just because of the structure of the eye. Patients who are over the age of 40 as well tend to present with glaucoma and people that are melaninate, melaninated, that's when we talk about black people, Africans, Africans. we have a very serious risk factor. And that's because our iris, what we call our iris. So you have people who have blue eyes, green eyes, gray eyes, and we have our black eyes or brown eyes. Uh -huh. Exactly. <laughs> so with our brown eyes, our iris has melanin in them. And this melanin pigments from time to time can come off and block what we call the anterior chamber angle. And this also can lead to glaucoma. So it pretty much just has to do with either overproduction of the aqueous humor or lack of drainage of the aqueous humor. So that is what we're actually targeting when we are dealing with glaucoma. How do we manage that situation to make sure that the pressure does not continue to cause damage? And as it You know what, we'll get back to how we manage because we're almost out of time, but quickly I'd like to come to you now yes. and, and let's talk about the fact that 10 years, 2023 makes it 10 years since you know, the campaign and awareness has been created. And how would you rate, you know, the level of awareness in Nigeria, Africa, and globally? Uh, it doesn't look like for Nigeria that we have recorded uh, some kind of uh, success. No, we have. We have. I think um, as a professional body, we take this month, not just this week, which is a glaucoma week, to go out on the streets. And most of the professionals, the eye clinic, actually do a free eye pressure check right and we have a lot of people on the streets conversing for pressure check right and if you even have um, issues like blood pressure 
it's very, very important that um, it's a disposing factor to having glaucoma, not to put fear into anybody. As much as it is irreversible, it is also preventable. So it's a leading cause of blindness and it's also a preventable blindness. You, you also remember that I, I, I reeled at statistics and we're looking at 1.1, 1.4 million. Would yes. you say that that's a lot of progress in terms of awareness for Nigeria? So the, so the thing with glaucoma is, to be frank with you, I don't know what causes glaucoma, right? But I know what are the risk factors of glaucoma. So the first risk factors are genetic, right? So if your parents have um, BP or glaucoma, there's a tendency that is passed down to the offspring. If you're more than 40, Everybody is going to age. Everybody is going to be more than 40. Those are risk factors no, no, too. No, 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 I understand. You know, I understand all of that. Well, my point is uh, we're looking at the level of awareness and the lessons will be, I mean, you, the question will be 10 years after. Yes. What are the key lessons that we've learned? I mean, for Nigeria now, if we look at statistics from 2022, yes. uh, saying that 1.1, 1.4 million people will have glaucoma in Nigeria, uh, is that really impressive? Do you say, if we say that we can't prevent it, I mean, we can prevent it, but there's no cure to it. Yes. Are we saying that we have recorded some level of awareness? Are people checking? Because if you have this uh, figure, that's a lot. Yes. I, I mean, 1.4 million is a lot, yes. uh, you know, of, uh, you know, numbers or persons who probably have glaucoma. So in terms of the level of awareness and since the inception of, you know, this campaign, however, yes. do you think that we have done enough I to create the awareness to reduce persons that have glaucoma? Because if you dictate early, you can treat. That's what you said. Yes, I think we could even increase the, the number of people being captured. If we go into the villages, the rural areas, there are a lot of people that are not being served there. So those people too can be captured, you know, and being um, able to go to the roots, to the grassroots, where um, health care is not really at the optimal, right? So I think we can do a lot more in that um, aspect, but I think largely we've done a lot. The government have also done a lot. Um, the state government, Lagos state government, we work together with all the health professionals, the eye care people, the ophthalmologists, the optometrists, we all come together to make sure that we save everybody. Okay, so um, let me get back to you now, Dr. Mary. So quickly, how do we, what do we now do, you know, to reduce the number of persons who are on this list? Uh, now that we have this, and we're just talking about cases that are reported, mm -hmm. we haven't looked at cases that are not reported. Of so, course. but generally, what can be done to reduce the pressure and to ensure that people are aware? Okay, so like he said, most the challenge we have especially is with the people in rural areas. So when you have a case that is underreported, most times you are not getting the right statistics or the accurate um, number of people. So what every eye clinic in Nigeria or around the world at this time is trying to do is offer free eye tests all through this week, starting on Sunday and until Saturday, frankly speaking. But because Lagos decides on Saturday, we're there till Friday, just offering you free eye tests, having your pressures checked. So you really don't have to have any problem. Just walk in, take advantage of the free eye test. Once you have your eyes tested, then it's a starting process. Once we are able to know, okay, everything is fine as of this year, next year you take an advantage again. When they look at you and there's anything suspicious, then they flag it and then they start further testing. But when you don't present to the clinic, there is almost nothing that can be done. And like we said, it's silent. So you will never wake up saying, oh, I'm feeling pain or anything. One day you just wake up and then there's no more vision. So that's why we always advocate people coming to the clinic. Wherever you are, most clinics at this time, they are running free eye tests. So just walk into any clinic, have your eyes tested, and then let's see what happens from there. All right, then we have to go uh, for the want of time. But we we'll definitely have this conversation some other time, hopefully still the week definitely. or the month of it. And so we hope that we have you some other time in the studio. Thank you so much, uh, lady and gentlemen, Dr. Mary and Onye. I hope you got that well. <laughs> My name is Messi Ibuku, and that's the size of a conversation this morning on The Breakfast. We'll join the newsroom at 9 o'clock for the news brief. Please stay with us. Good morning.
Nigeria, by extension, Africa, is faced with a lot of challenges. The growing youth population with little engagement, that is a ticking time mark. We are a blessed people with diverse culture and highly cerebral minds who have a lot to say. And yes, we are talking. It is important we drive the right conversation that informs, inspires, influences thought and action. If we say there's beauty in our diversity, then let us embrace our diverse culture. We must continue to courageously be the voice of transformation as we are the hope for the future. Yesterday's conversations shape today. What are you saying to shape your tomorrow? news brief. The federal government has revealed that not less than 12.9 million cyber attacks from within and outside the country were recorded during the just concluded presidential and national assembly elections. The Minister of Communication and Digital Economy, Professor Issa Pentami, who disclosed this on the election day alone over 6.9 million attacks were recorded. He announced that the attacks were successfully blocked owing to the sophisticated infrastructure on ground by different agencies of government charged with the responsibility of protecting the nation's cyberspace. Bantami commended President Mohamed Buhari for providing the enabling environment for agencies of government to perform the assignment without let or hindrance. The, ongo the outgoing British High Commissioner of Nigeria, Katriona Liang, has described the presidential and National Assembly elections as fascinating and offered future obsidians for democratic government in the country. The British envoy made the declaration while filing questions from journalists after a courtesy visit on the Senate President, Ahmed Lawan. She said that's by the contestion on the process of the election by some political actors. It was interesting and it portends bright future for the country. Earlier at the Katsi visit, the Senate President Ahmed Lawan in his remarks recommended and commended the British envoy on her positive disposition to the country. Um, I've had some highs, many highs, a few lows, but overall it's been an absolutely wonderful experience. and. Uh, it's a very strong foundation of that has been a really good working relationship with Mr. Speaker and his team. We've worked together on a number of very important electoral bills. Um, his own initiative, the foundation he set up to support young legislators. And I was very privileged to, to support that. Um, congratulations, obviously, on the success of your party. So I'm sure my success will be working with you in a different capacity of some kind. And I will be passing on um, great encouragement to him to continue to deepen and strengthen the relationship in whatever that capacity is. Your, your, your time here, your time here, uh, um, sometimes I think your, your passion uh, was, so, was so evident in many of our discussions. And uh, my, hope, my hope and my prayer is that whoever succeeds you will carry on in that same trajectory. Uh, uh, in building and fostering um, uh, an even more sustainable relationship between our two. Ebony State Governor Dave Umai says zoning should be used to determine the leadership of the National Assembly. The governor stated this after meeting privately with President Mohamed Buhari in his office. Umahi, who also recently got elected into the Senate to represent Eboni South District, told the State House correspondent that the party considers certain parameters to carry all region along rather than allowing everyone to jump into the race. He, however, declined to speak further on the issue of on the issue following directives by the party leadership to hold conversation on the matter until after the upcoming governorship and state house of assembly elections on the 18th of March. 
The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, says political parties should prevail on their supporters to refrain from acts of violence during the governorship and state assembly polls. INEC Chairman Mahmoud Yakubu spoke during a meeting of Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security. The INEC Chairman thanked security agencies for the professionalism of their personnel and large peaceful conduct of the presidential election. He said INEC state officers have provided the police with the details for the governorship and the state assembly elections, including the location of polling units and coalition centers. I wish to express the commission's appreciation to the security agencies and other members of excess for the professionalism of personnel and the generally peaceful conduct of the last election. We look forward to improved performance in the election holding this weekend. The governorship election will hold in 28 states of the Federation. As we are aware, governorship elections in eight states, Anambra, Bayelsa, Edo, Ekiti, Imo, Kogi, Ondo, and Oshun states are held off cycle and therefore not conducted during the general the national security advisor nsa baba gana Mungono, called on political gladiators in the country to call their supporters to order ahead of the forthcoming governorship and state assembly elections he also said security agencies will work round the clock to ensure that polls are conducted safely in the country of course the elections we're going into on saturday are going to be much more complicated. Contextually, they're going to be different. But first of all, we're going to have 1,021 constituencies, meaning we're going to have more people interested, more people voting, more coalition centers, and obviously the dynamics will be much more different than the elections that we that were just uh, concluded. I want to also urge the same individuals, especially at the state level, to demonstrate the same level of maturity, the same level of discipline by calling their supporters to conduct themselves in a manner that is congruent with the expectations of the larger Nigerian society. Meanwhile, the National Security Advisor, Baba Gana Mungono, has warned those planning to cause troubles before, during, and after Saturday's governorship and assembly elections to perish the thought. Mungono and Yokobo also spoke at the meeting of the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security at the Commission's headquarters. He acknowledged the fact that Saturday's election will come with its dynamics. Meanwhile, just a few days to the governorship and House of Assembly elections, the Lagos State Chapter of the Accord Party, AP, has declared support for the re-election of Governor Babajide Songwulu for another four-year term. Addressing a press conference in Lagos State, the chairman of the party, Dele Oladeji, said the decision of AP is premised on the grounds not to sacrifice various achievements of Songwulu-led administration on the altar of bitter politicking. Coming into the state election, we still push at INEC to see if we can get our legitimate list on the list. But like some few parties, we were unable. I think Labour Party had that issue too. AA had the same issue and ADC. So we can still sit back and allow imposters to blow the trumpet of a king. Today, we are adopting a gubernatorial candidate of choice. We didn't just choose someone. Because this will be a watershed in the history of Accord. We have never, at any time in Lagos State, had any alliance with APC. APC had been the ruling party from 1999. They were AD, AC, ACN, then APC. We've never had any alliance with them. The only thing we've had that is close to them is whenever anybody is disgruntled in APC, they look for someone that can midwife or deliver their mandate. We welcome them and we work for them. So going into this election, we had two options. APC, Governor Vajire Sonwulu to continue in his efforts, 
in governing Lagos State. The governorship candidate of the new Nigerian People's Party in Lagos State, Olariwaju Jim Kamal, has distanced himself from the purported endorsement of Governor Babajide Somwolu by the Alliance of Registered Political Parties. Jim Kamal said the inclusion of his name and the NMPT, NNPP was a sign that Somwolu and his party, the All Progressive Congress, were desperate and had lost the support of the people of Lagos. While advising Lagosians to ignore the threats from streets, hoodlums and thouds come out to vote uh, Somwolu on Saturday, he said the unauthorized use of his name and party could be done in a near lawless country by a party that has failed the people of Nigeria. The police command in Bauchi State has declared Yakubu Shayu Shuai, uh, a member of the House of Representatives, wanted over an alleged homicide and a case of criminal conspiracy, causing grievous hurt, inciting disturbance of public peace and culpable homicide as police places a bounty of one millionaire to anyone that finds him. The lawmaker is representing Bauchi Federal Constituency in the lower chamber of the National Assembly. Ahmed Wakali, the, Bo the Bauchi police spokesperson, released a special Please Gazette Bulletin declaring him wanted on Tuesday. Now, tension has grieved residents of a uh, community in Pantani, local government area of Delta State, as three farmers were killed by suspected headsmen who invaded the community. Many farmers were also reportedly abducted during the attack. The hoodlums killed one Danis, his son, and other persons while they were working on their farm. The disease was slain while trying to fend off the gun touting headers and their cattle from grazing and destroying crops in their farms. A former president of the Ijo Youth Council, Dr. Chris, hailed the Pantani local government area and appealed for calm among members of the community, advising them not to take the laws into their hands. When contacted, the police public relations officer for Delta State could not ascertain if a report of any such incident was formally lodged to the command. The candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, for the March 18, 2023 governorship elections in Delta State reportedly escaped gun attack along the Wari Sapale Highway. In a statement by his chief press secretary, Denis Otu, he said he was on his way from Sapale heading to Osubi when the incident occurred. The court candidate for the constituency in River State House of Assembly Ogba Egbemba Ndoni Chukudi Ogbonna has been kidnapped by gunmen in the state. Ogbonna was running for the office in the rescheduled March 18th elections and was reportedly dragged out of his vehicle by gunmen on Monday night around the uh, Rumibo area of Port Harcourt. A member of the Ogbonna family confirmed the incident to journalists. Reacting to the incident, the police public relations officer, Command Grace. Coco said they were aware of the situation. The Do State Police Command has arrested four persons for posing to be military personnel to rob innocent citizens of the states, parading the suspects to journalists at the state force headquarters in Benin City, the state capital. The police public relations officer Chidi Mwabuzo revealed how the suspect committed the said offense. The suspect also spoke of the level of involvement in crime. Armed robbery, unlawful position of military camouflage, and arrest of four suspects, whom you are seeing here as military personnel, but they are not really military personnel. They are armed robbers. These four suspects, on the 4th, 14th of February, 2023, at about 1.52 a.m., that is morning of that day went into a woman's apartment named Grace and bust into the house through the ceiling found their way into the house and robbed them of their personal effects. This woman please when dinner and when is bring home Understand? I say, okay, I will take go there, and I want to see money for them because me and I know say we only get money for all this plan. 
So we can say ain't no idea of all those things. See a transfer. If we read it, we call it, it as a woman, a, a pin number, then we we'll go to transfer. It is a friend of mine that brought the car, the car on out. We went uh, to go and evade. We do the evasion and we collected the money from the from the woman, which we collected the pin from her to transfer, to make a transfer. So we transferred the money to the aboki and they gave us the dollar. So the dollar they gave to us, we exchanged it to between ourselves. Money that rich man is up to about, let me just say, it's 100 plus. The Nigerian police has recovered 182 illicit arms and 430 ammunitions of various calibers across the nation in its efforts to tackle crimes. The first public police relations officer, Olari Wa Adejobi, announced this in a statement saying the arms will be handed over to the National Center for the control of small arms and light weapons. He said the Inspector General of Police, Usman Akali Baba, ordered all commands and formation to intensify efforts towards decimating the proliferation of illicit arms. Baba was said to have also extended additional human and logistic support to command and formation across the country for effective election security management during the forthcoming governorship and state house of assembly elections scheduled for Saturday the 18th, 2023. And now to other parts of Africa, Gabon has begun three days of national mourning following a ferry accident that left six dead and around 20 orders missing. Esther Miracle Ferry, a mixed passenger and freight vessel, sank off the coast of the capital, Libreville, on Thursday night. The government has since suspended four officials and public prosecutors has announced the opening of an investigation. The search continues to find missing people. Civil society organization plans to file a complaint against Gabonese state and the ferry owner and Royal Coast Marine. President Ali Bongo announced three days of national mourning in a brief address on national television on Monday. Over 1,000 supporters of Senegalese opposition leader Usman Sonko mass at a field in the capital Dakar, the first of three days of planned protests in support of the aspiring presidential candidate who faces a libel case set to resume this week. The demonstrators and demonstration are the latest expression of growing tension in Senegal in the run-up to the 2024 election that could see President Macky Sall vie for a controversial third term, which the opposition says it's unconstitutional. The election would pit him against an opposition which was signed by Song Ko, who came third in the last election, but has since gained the clout, especially among delusional urban youths. And outside Africa, the United States military was forced to crash its MQ-9 Reaper surveillance drone because of the damage caused when it was struck by a Russian jet. The Pentagon said this on Tuesday. Brigadier General Pat Rayadi, who made the revelation to reporters, added that the drone was basically unflyable after the damage. It was also said that Russian had not recovered the crashed drone at its point. You know, we are uh, continuing to assess exactly what happened, but I think um, based on the actions of the Russian pilots, it's clear that it was unsafe, unprofessional. Um, and I think the actions speak for themselves. Um, what we what we saw again were, were fighter aircraft dumping fuel in front of this uh, UAV, uh, and then getting so close to the aircraft that it actually damaged the propeller on the MQ-9. Uh, we we assess that it likely caused some damage to the Russian aircraft as well. President. Uh, Pakistan's main opposition leader Imran Khan says the authorities are acting outside the law in their attempt to arrest him. It was also reported uh, that police clash with supporters of Khan and the former prime minister outside the residence as they try to detain him on a court order. He is facing an allegation that he sold state gifts while in office. He says the case is politically motivated. Meanwhile, in business news, the International Air Transport Association has said airlines funds trapped in Nigeria has increased to $743 million from $662 million. The blocked revenue, which stood at $549 million in December, 
rose to 662 in January. The updated amount is contained in letter titled Special Appeal on Airlines Block Funds in Nigeria, signed by the area manager of West and Central Africa. An address made to the aviation.